adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. Our detective friend, Mike Shane, solves most of his cases by a combination of clues, shrewd thinking, and daring action. But he's also a great student of criminal files and case histories of famous crimes. This morning, Mike is at his desk, deep in study of the latest exploit of another well-known detective, Mr. Dick Tracy, when suddenly Mike's useful and very ornamental associate, Phyllis Knight, opens the office door. Psst, Mike, Mike. Hmm? Huh? Uh, yes, Angel? Hide that funny paper. There's a client in the waiting room. Oh, just when I was getting to the... Come on, come on. Okay, okay, show him in. Uh, Mr. Shane will see you now, Mr. Carter. <clears throat> this is Mr. Shane, Mr. Nelson Carter. I'm glad to know you, Mr. Carter. Won't you sit down, sir? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Mr. Shane, I'll have to be very brief. I'm an attorney, and I'm on my way to see a client. It's, uh... It's about him, about Mr. Dixon, that I've come here. Mm hmm I see. The situation is so uh, fantastic, really, I'm afraid Mr. Dixon's life is in peril. I fear for him. I really do. Is it a case that the police department should handle, Mr. Carter? Well, no, no. I, I don't see how the... Mr. Shane, three days ago, when Gregory Dixon walked into my office, I, I screamed in terror. I almost fainted. Fainted? But, but... Yes. What? Two months ago, we had buried Mr. Dixon. Oh, you had buried Mr... What? Yes. Oh, oh, yes, it was a perfectly proper funeral. Hmm. Well, I thought I was seeing his ghost. We'd received word that Mr. Dixon was killed in an accident down in Mexico, in Yucatan. Imagine, imagine my consternation. Here he walked into my office while I'm administrating his estate. Uh-huh, that would make anybody do nip-ups. Yet you say you buried him. Oh, it was a mistake, a horrible mistake. Oh. Somebody died in Yucatan. They thought it was Mr. Dixon. The coffin was shipped to Mr. Dixon's cousin. We held a funeral, and I was appointed administrator of the estate. But, uh, uh, just a minute, sir. You started off by telling us Mr. Dixon's life is in danger. Yes. His heirs have received his bequests. Now, they'll have to refund the money, and, uh, <coughs> well, with all respect for Mr. Dixon's relatives, I must say several of them are extremely unsavory. Well, that's no reason for thinking that they will uh, try to kill him. Well, I think there's every danger they will, Mr. Shane. One of his cousins came into my office yesterday. He was absolutely furious because he was cheated out of his inheritance. Hmm? He asked me about Mr. Dixon's health and how long I thought he might live, and so So on. you want us to protect your client? Yes. Now, I'm going out to his house right now. I... I'd like you to come along and talk to Mr. Dixon. Well, I would rather prevent a murder than solve one. Then you will come with me? Yes, Mr. Carter, we will. Well, well, Carter, you're an old worrywart. A good attorney, but an old worrywart. Now, now, Mr. Dixon, you don't appreciate the serious danger with your hand. <laughs> Do you, Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, feel that I'm a man about to be murdered? Well, we really don't know, sir. You see... I uh... can understand Carter's feelings. He doesn't want to have to probate your will a second time. Every time you die, you make more work for the poor man. <laughs> Clarence, than you heard. <laughs> As I was coming in from the garden. I'm Clarence Fisher, Mr. Dixon's cousin. How do you do, Mr. How do Fisher? You do? Of course, Carter may be right. I'm worth considerably more to you, Clarence, dead than alive. I can talk like that to Clarence. He's got a fine sense of humor. Not like his cousin Howard. Howard is sober as a judge with a toothache. Assuming Mr. Dixon's life is in danger, who would be the most likely suspect? Why, several. Before I left the office, I made a list of Mr. Dixon's beneficiaries. It, uh, well, if you care to read it now, I... Thank you, sir. Clarence Fisher. Oh, that's me. Oh, yes. Uh, bequest uh, $10,000. Howard Connell, 20000 William A. Wilkinson, 25000 and a farm at Redwood City. Various charities, 200000 Mm-hmm, I see. Apparently, Mr. Carter's modesty made him omit his own bequest to the tune of $25,000. Well, uh, <clears throat> but uh, after all, uh, surely I couldn't be a suspect. You know, there's one thing which puzzles me and which none of you gentlemen has explained. Mr. Dixon is here alive and well. But uh, who is buried out in the cemetery? You know, I've wondered about that myself. You see, when I was down in Yucatan, I fell ill of a fever. I'm still about 30 pounds underweight. It ruined my eyes, and I had to get glasses. But that's beside the point. 
When I got up from my sick bed, I found my wallet had been stolen. So had most of my papers. I assumed the thief was later killed. Uh, suppose somebody down in Yucatan received orders to kill Mr. Dixon. Suppose the person who did the killing or uh, ordered the killing now realizes that a mistake was made. Yes, he may try again. Mm, that's a grave thought, and no mm. pun intended. May I ask who received the coffin here? Uh, Mr. Dixon's cousin, Howard Connell. Actually, the body was not buried. It was interred in the mausoleum. We followed the instructions in Mr. Dixon's will. Say, you brought up a good point, Phyllis. If we could find out whose body's in that coffin, it just might be a clue. We might even find out if the man had been murdered. Ah, yeah, and if it were murder, we would know definitely that Mr. Dixon is in real danger. Well, then I suggest you have the body exhumed, if that's possible. It is possible, Mr. Dixon. I'll ask the inspector of homicide to use his influence with the coroner's office. Sometimes dead men tell very interesting tales. <laughs> know that I can think of a lot of things I'd rather do, Mike Shane, than visit a mausoleum? Yes, but we'll make it as short as possible, Angel. Now, let's see. According to the superintendent, it should be down this next corridor. All right. Hello. Mr. <laughs> Shane, Miss Knight. Oh, hello there, coroner. Mike, I'd like to know what's going on around here. What's wrong? Take a look in the coffin. There... There's no body in it. You're right, Angel. Nothing but gunny sacks and granite rocks. Mike Shane and Phyllis have dropped in at police headquarters to talk over their problem with the inspector. With them is Nelson Carter, their client's attorney. The whole situation is completely screwy, Inspector. A man is reported dead. Uh -huh. His coffin arrives from Mexico. He has a funeral. His property's divided. Two months later, the fellow turns up alive and kicking. And his coffin is filled with gunny sacks and granite rocks. It's a new one on me, kids. Unless this Gregory Dickler think he was dead. Well, then why would he come back at all, Inspector? He almost lost all his money and property. Uh -huh. Well, I don't see you need worry, Mike. Dixon is alive, there's no corpse in the coffin, nobody's dead. No, but it's got our curiosity up, Inspector. You know, Mike and I do handle other cases besides murder. This time we've drawn a completely wacky mystery. Well, you can make light of it, Miss Knight. But since finding that empty coffin, I'm more convinced than ever that there's something diabolical afoot. All right, diabolical what? It's only three days since anybody knew Mr. Dixon was still alive. Several of the heirs would stop at almost nothing to hold on to their inheritances. You said that before, Mr. Carter. Now, let's see, you gave me a list of the bequests. Uh, which man stormed into your office yesterday? The uh, one who wanted to know how long you thought Dixon might live? Yes, that was Wilkinson, William A. Wilkinson. Oh, yes, yes, yes. He's listed here for $25,000 on a farm near Redwood City. Yes, he's living there right now. He was furious because he'll have to turn the farm back to Mr. Dixon. And then this Howard Connell, he's down for $20,000. Uh, what about him? A cousin of Mr. Dixon. He gambles, plays the horses, will do anything to keep out of work, and can't hold a job anyway. Well, I suppose we might... I'd interview those men, though I don't know what we could ask them. No crime's been committed. Well, you won't be able to get hold of Howard Connell. He left for New York after Mr. Dixon's funeral. Well, we might start in with a little talk with Clarence Fisher, the uh, cousin we met in Dixon's house. Uh, if I were doing it, Mike, I know where I'd begin. Yeah? Where, Inspector? Well, you say Cousin Wilkinson lives on a farm near Redwood City. Yes? Well, it's a very pleasant sunny day outside, and twice as pleasant down country. I know a tidy little inn on King's Road, west of Redwood City. They serve swell hamburgers, and there's a cute little Irish waitress with a green apron. Ah, oh, <laughs> say no more, Inspector. Say no more. You've sold us one trip to Redwood City. <laughs> If you don't mind, Mr. Shane, we'll sit and talk under this apple tree. I've uh, got to keep my eye on Alec, the hired hand. Laziest man you ever seen. Whatever you wish, Mr. Wilkinson. Oh, an old-fashioned hammock. That's for me, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, when I got Carter's letter about Dixon being alive, I couldn't believe my eyes, so to speak. Sort of upset my plans for the future. 
By the way, it's sort of a warmish day. You folks like a drink? Uh, you, Phil? Huh? Not now, thanks. Maybe some water later on. Well, we'll make it apple cider. Water here doesn't taste right to me. Dixon just got done putting in pipe water. Bricked up the old well over there and went modern on it, so to speak. Uh, well, what'd you folks say you came down here about? Uh, we didn't say, sir. Mr. Carter seems to think Mr. Dixon's in some sort of danger. Now, we'd like to ask you if he has any enemies who might... Uh... Carter? I told that lawyer yesterday that... Well, I guess maybe he repeated it to you, Mr. Shane. You can see this is a very nice little farm, and I was expecting to make myself a piece of money off it, so to speak. Handing it back to Dixon now is going to hurt like pulling eye teeth, so to speak. Maybe you could buy it back from Mr. Dixon. Did he make much use of the farm? Oh, spent all of his weekends down here, and I haven't got the cash to buy it from him. Mr. Wilkinson, you say that Dixon bricked up the water well? Uh, yes, he did it a couple of months ago. Left it in an unsightly mess. Alec cleaned it up for me, dug a new rose garden, and shoveled the dirt down in the well. Quite a number of stones missing from the coping around the well. Oh, Mike, I know what you're driving at. Yeah. You and I, Angel, have seen those stones before. The identical size and shape in a coffin in a mausoleum. <laughs> Water, I'd broken through. Mike! Mike, can you hear me? Mike, have you found anything? Yeah. Yeah, plenty. A body. Germany. Germany Christmas, Mr. Wilkinson. This is bad. Awful bad. Oh, stop your jaw, and Alec. You make me nervous. Mr. Wilkinson, do you know whose body this is? Of course not. How do you suppose I could tell? Mike, there's a ring on one of his fingers. Yeah, yeah, I see it. A gold ring. The band's in the shape of a snake. There. Let me look at it. Mean anything to you, sir? No. This hole in his head means something to me. He was murdered. Mike, we better get hold of the inspector. Yeah. Yes, we're heading back to San Francisco and pick up the inspector, and then... Yeah? Then we're going to have another talk with Mr. Dixon. <laughs> Say, when I suggested that you kids take a little run down country, I didn't expect you to come tearing back to me with a body. No, oh, and now that we've found it, the question is, whose body is it? Yes, and until we know that answer, we're not going to spill the news to Dixon. Remember that, Angel. All right. We've got to tiptoe very cautiously. There's Dixon, out in the garden, talking to Mr. Fisher. Yes. Look, Inspector, if you don't mind, I'll do most of the questioning. Mm -hmm. We've got to approach Dixon downwind. Suits me. Well, Mr. Sheen, Miss Knight, I was wondering what had become of you. We uh, brought along a friend of ours, Mr. Dixon, the Inspector of Homicide. The inspector of Homicide? Yes. You see, if anybody should succeed in killing you, this is the man who will lose his sleep over. Well, glad to know you, Inspector. And may your slumbers be unbroken. Uh, this is my cousin, Clarence Fisher. Well, how do you do? How do you do? Uh, suppose we go into the house so we can sit down. Okay, sir. Uh, Mr. Dixon, we just got back from a little drive down to Redwood City. We talked with another of your cousins, William Wilkinson. That's so? Hates to give up the farm, doesn't he? Oh, very much. He's put in a new rose garden. We noticed that the old water well behind the house has been bricked up. Oh, really? Wilkinson changing things around his suit, huh? Then... then you didn't fill in the well yourself? Me? Why, no. Why should I? Uh... Mr. Dixon. Yes? Did you have any people visit you down on your farm from the, uh, the, the past few months? Oh, a few... Howard Connell, Clarence here, Wilkinson, old fuss budget Carter, and a few others. I see. Well, sir, if I'm to properly protect you, I'd like to know what those people look like. Do you have any photographs? Photographs by the hundreds. I've got a scrapbook of snapshots. It's right over there on the wicker table. Uh, this what you want? Oh, that's perfect. How about this uh, group picture here? Oh, that's me wearing the straw hat. Really? Girl, yeah, uh, girl's Joan Brooks. Uh, the man behind, I uh, can't remember his name. No, I can't either. Some chap who was on his way to Canada. 
Uh, the last fellow on the far right is Howard Connell. Howard Connell. He's mm -hmm. the cousin who's gone to New York, isn't he? That's right. Last time I saw Howard was when he drove me to the airport when I went to Mexico. Does he live in San Francisco? Uh, right next door. I'm living in his house till he gets back. And when will that be? Well, I can't say. He left for New York right after Dixon's, well, funeral. The last letter I got from him didn't mention when he'd be back. Hmm. He was one of the beneficiaries under Mr. Dixon's will. I should think he would stay here in town. Oh, not Howard. He's always on the move. No telling where he is now. Here's another photo of you in the scrapbook, Mr. Dixon. A close-up. You're wearing a large, rather peculiar-looking ring. Why, yes, yes. I lost that ring some time ago. Lost it? Hmm. Have you any idea where? Why, no. It just uh, slipped off my finger one day. No idea where I lost it. But I don't see what that matters. <laughs> hey, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, thanks very much for letting us see the pictures, Mr. Dixon. And now we'll be running along. Oh, but Mr. Shane, you were hired to protect me. You're always running off somewhere. We're working on the case, sir, I assure you. In fact, we're going to police headquarters right now, just on your account. <laughs> Now, this is the way I dope it out, Inspector. Check me if I'm wrong. Okay. First of all, we may be up against a colossal conspiracy. Mm -hmm. The attorney Carter comes to Phyllis and me and says Dixon's life is in danger. Because Dixon was reported dead and now turns up alive and his heirs hate to part with their ill-gotten gains. Then we find that Dixon's funeral was a fake. Yeah. We find his coffin filled with stones from Dixon's own water well, and we find a murdered man hidden inside the well. And that murdered man, Inspector, I'm convinced is the real Gregory Dixon. The fellow who says he's Dixon is an imposter. Yeah, I know what you base that on, Mike. The fact that the ring on the dead man's finger is the same ring we saw in Dixon's photograph. Correct. But perhaps the ring really was lost, and the person who later found the ring is the man you hauled out of the well. Well, that's possible, Inspector, but I'd like to go one step further. I'll say that the man who calls himself Gregory Dixon is actually Howard Connell, Dixon's cousin and beneficiary. I was beginning to suspect that myself. Connell very conveniently disappears on a trip to New York. Nobody knows exactly where he is or when he's coming back. But Dixon's relative ought to be able to recognize the fake unless they're all in on the deal, too. That may be, too. But there was a strong family resemblance between Dixon and Connell. Mm -hmm. I noticed it in those photographs. Mm -hmm. That's why the story about Dixon falling ill, losing 30 pounds, having to put on glasses. An alibi in case anybody began to suspect. Okay. But who killed Dixon, Phil? Mm -hmm. Who threw his body down the well and bricked it up? Both Wilkinson and Con Connell denied they closed the well. Yes, Sergeant? Mr. Shane's call to Redwood City is waiting, sir. Thanks. Take it on this phone, Mike. Thanks, Inspector. Hello? Hello, Alec? Calling me, Mr. Shane? Yes, uh, I want to ask you a question, Alec. How long have you worked for Mr. Wilkinson? Why, about a month or so. Mr. Wilkinson hired me when he took over the farm. And uh, when you were making the new rose garden for him, Alec, did you dump all that dirt down the well? Yes, sir. The well was bricked up anyway. I didn't see no harm. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you, Alec. Well... Wilkinson told us the truth. Yeah. The well was bricked up when he got the farm. Well, then Dixon, I, I mean, Connell lied to us. Practically everything he told us was a lie, Angel. Well, Inspector, what do you say? You make out a pretty strong case, Mike. But we don't have any real proof that Howard Connell killed Dixon and then took his place. Don't worry, we'll get the proof. Okay, I'll take your word for it, Mike. Let's go out and pick up Connell. <laughs> Mr. Shane, Inspector, I just telephoned for you. Phoned? Why? What for? The very thing I hired Shane to prevent. It's happened. What are you talking about? You don't mean to tell me... Yes, I do mean to tell you. Mr. Dixon is dead. of the late Gregory Dixon, Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector have found another body, the body of the man whom they were about to arrest. The dead man lies sprawled in the bushes directly beneath an open window on the second floor. Well, I don't understand. He fell from the window. We, we heard him fall. Mr. Wilkinson, what are you doing in San Francisco? I just got here from Redwood City. Carter and I came out to talk to him. Inspector, 
Take a look at the man's head. Yeah, I see. A deep gash in the back of the skull. He must have hit his head on a rock. Hold on, hold on. Here's something else. A revolver in his coat pocket and a sheet of paper. It's a note. A typewritten note. To the authorities. I cannot go on. You know the truth by now. I killed Gregory Dixon. Then a typewritten signature. Howard Connell. Connell. Then it's true. I, I, I can't believe it. Good heavens. So he committed suicide. All right. Suppose you all tell us what happened. Starting with you, Mr. Fisher. Well, I was next door in my house. Wilkerson and Carter rang my doorbell and asked if Dixon, er, uh, I mean Connell, had gone out. Yes, we'd been pounding on his door and got no answer. Yes. I was sure he was in, so I came over with them and let them into the house with my key. Wilkinson was all excited. He said he had some terrible news. He said the real Gregory Dixon was dead, and we'd all been tricked. How did you know that, Mr. Wilkinson? Yes, we just discovered that for ourselves, but you never told us. I, well, when I saw that body from the well and the ring on his finger, I recognized it. You told us it meant nothing to you. I know, I, I just couldn't believe it. I, I wanted time to think it out. Then I drove up to the city and, and, and told Carter. I thought Wilkinson was crazy. I phoned Dixon, I mean Connell, and told him we were coming right out. I still couldn't believe it. That's why I jumped all over you, Mr. Shane, for letting the man get killed. I didn't know it was suicide and that he was a fake. Believe me, I didn't. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But uh, to get on, uh, what happened after you three were in the house? Well, Wilkinson was trying to tell me his discovery, and Carter was arguing with him. Connell wasn't downstairs, so I went up and called him. He shouted from the bedroom that he'd be down in a minute, and I went back to the living room and started asking Wilkinson questions. He told me about the ring. Yes. And we kept waiting and waiting. The living room windows were open, and... I complained about the cold wind blowing in. Fisher went over and started to close the windows. He shouted, and we heard Connell crash to the ground. I saw the body falling past the window. Connell must have known he was trapped. He couldn't face us. Those open windows on the second floor, are they in Connell's bedroom? Yes. Now, let me get this straight. All three of you men were in the room when Connell fell? Yes, yes, sir. Right. That's uh-huh. right. Okay. Now, if you gentlemen don't mind, I'll ask you to step indoors for a few minutes. We want to examine the ground around here before you trample all over everything. Oh, yes. All right. All right, kids. I know what you're thinking. Yes. One or more or all three of them are lying. Mm-hmm. It was not suicide. It was deliberate murder. Right, Mike. That bedroom window is less than 20 feet from the ground. Ten to one, that fall wouldn't kill a man. If Connell was really planning suicide, he wouldn't take that chance. He'd do it properly. All right. And he wouldn't be so cagey about writing his signature on the, the note uh, on the typewriter. Well, I can't believe he got that deep gash in the back of his skull from hitting one of these rocks. Well, they're not much bigger than pebbles. If you ask me, Angel, that gash was made by the butt of his revolver. One terrific blow. Then the gun was stuck in his pocket. Kids, I'm worried. We know it's murder, but hang it, were those three guys swearing they were all in the room together? We're going to have a devil of a time proving a case against any one of them. Yes, yes, but remember the old rule, Inspector. When all suspects have alibis, none of them have alibis. We've just got to get in and do some good head work. Well, while you're about it, maybe you can explain one thing to me. Huh? Explain what, Phil? Look, these rose vines. Rambling rose vines cover the whole side of this house, clear up to the roof, you see? And yet when you look at Connell's suit, there isn't a single tear or a snag... There's not even a broken rose petal on his clothes. Well, that could be because he jumped or was thrown clear of the vines. Well, then how could his body fall right against the foundations of the house? Wait a minute, wait a minute. The upstairs windows and the downstairs windows both open outwards. That's it, Angel, you've hit it. You're darn right she's hit it. Absolutely, Inspector. Now we've got some business indoors. Was killed. Murder? Why, that's impossible, Mr. Shane. We were all here in the living room. We all saw the body fall. Of course you saw it fall, but Howard Connell was already dead. And he did not fall from the second floor. He did not fall? I'll uh, show you what happened, gentlemen. Now, when you three men were here in the living room, these windows were open. They were open outwards. The body was laid across the tops of both halves of the window. When Mr. Wilkinson complained of the cold, Mr. Fisher closed the windows. That took the support away from the body, and you saw Connell fall past the window. Oh, why, that's idiotic. I'd have seen the body. You did see it, Mr. Fisher. You put it there. You killed Connell with the butt of that revolver. You murdered him because you had helped Connell impersonate Dixon. You were in the deal with him. No. No, he tricked me, too. No, Mr. Fisher. You told us that you'd gotten a letter from Howard Connell in New York. Connell never went to New York. He was right here. All right. All right, I admit it. I killed Connell when I discovered he'd murdered Dixon. 
He murdered my cousin. That sounds like a very lame attempt to plead the unwritten law. But that was not your reason. You killed Connell because you knew we were closing in on him. You knew Connell couldn't take it. You knew Connell would confess and that he would tie the noose around your neck, too. But I'm afraid that you've done a perfect job of that yourself, Mr. Fisher. Well, how about it, Inspector? <laughs> Why are you so quiet, Angel? What are you thinking about? Hmm? Oh, I was just thinking about that whole fantastic scheme. What a cockeyed motive. Yeah, but it almost worked, Phil. Connell and his cousin Fisher saw a way to get a hold of all of Dixon's money, instead of just the amounts he intended to leave them in his will. First, they had to kill Dixon, get his estate distributed, then bring Dixon back to life. All the heirs and beneficiaries would then have to return their bequests to him. Oh, and Connell and Fisher would have the whole estate for themselves. Well, I've heard of killing a man for his money, but never bringing him back to life to get his inheritance. When I see a case like that, I'm almost glad I haven't got any money. Poor but honest and alive. Mm Mm-hmm. Money is the root of all evil. I'll still take plenty of the root. Mm. The uh, correct quotation, honey, is the love of money is the root of all evil. Oh, Yes, it's the, uh, the love that causes the trouble. Oh, love. Well, I'll take plenty of that, too. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for Union Oil Company and reminding you once again to get your application for your Union Oil credit card this week. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Detective agency. Me, sweetheart. Say. Oh, say. Now take it easy. The papers are on the street. I saw them. So did I. There'll be some red-faced editors ducking behind their green eye shades tomorrow. What do you mean, Sam? You don't plan up the score until the returns are all in, F. This applies to presidential elections, boxing matches, and executions at San Quentin Prison. Sam, you mean Willie? I mean Willie. Batten down the hatches and turn over your foam rubber cushion, Wonder Girl, for even now I'm homeward bound with a stride-by-stride account of a 12-hour marathon, which I shall call, for obvious reasons, the Hail and Farewell Caper. Transcribed for NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all, starring Stephen Dunn in The Adventures of Sam Spade. I've been robbed. Heffy? Sam? Brought in here this minute. Oh, yes, sir. Have I done something? That's what I was about to ask. Have you been sticking your delightful, freckle-covered, upturned little nose into my schnapps bottle? (laughs) Well, answer me, girl. Sam, you know I don't do... All right, then who? Well, the nervous little man who was here did open the drawer to find a pencil and paper and, and leave a note. Okay, you're clear. Oh, Sam, what about the little man? A good and leading question, F. Shall we attempt an answer? Oh, I'm at the ready, Sam. Shoot. Date, fill it in. To Justice Edward Benjamin, State Supreme Court from Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the hail and farewell caper. Dear Justice Benjamin. 
My relationship with the spindly little man goes clear back to a week ago, Thursday, possibly even before that. But that was the day I first noticed him. I remember it was Thursday because I was having corned beef and cabbage at Schroeder's. With him, it was a glass of water at the next table. He was paying little mind to the menu, having decided to spend the lunch hour staring at me. A couple of times, he put down his glass of water and pushed back his chair as if he were going to come over and talk. But he changed his mind. I put away the corned beef and cabbage and was halfway past the pie when he finally did it. Uh, uh, excuse me, sir. Hello? You, uh, you, sir, are Mr. Spade? I am. The uh, detective, Sam Spade, detective agent? At your service, sir. Now, what can I... I, uh, I, uh, you see, I, uh, do you have a match? I gave him a match and he thanked me and went out. On Friday, I saw him in Ben's Grotto over a plate of Rex Soul. We got just about as far, then he returned the match he owed me. The following week, I saw him four times. Once as I was going into a show, once at the post office, and twice as I was going into my office building. Each was the same. We'd get up to the point where he was about to tell me something, then he'd back down and ask me what time it was, or did I have a horse in the fifth at Golden Gate, or would I lend him a cigarette? Then he'd bustle off as fast as his spindly little legs could carry. And thus matters stood yesterday. Place, my office, time, 1.37 p.m. Sam Spade. Mr. Spade, is this... this... This is a gentleman who... who yeah, it. don't tell me I know the voice. Now, what is it this time? I do uh, like to see you, Mr. Spade. I must see you. I know. I'll save us both a trip. The it date is, is April 26th. The time is 1.38 p.m. It, All it trains, really planes, and streetcars are leaving on schedule. Most important... And for the favor to Golden Gate tomorrow, consult your nearest please, bookie. Please, sir, please, Mr. Spade, please... Do not jest. This is a matter of life and death. I see. Fine. Then I'll see you tomorrow for lunch, huh? I won't be here, Mr. Spade. Oh, where'll you be? Dead. Dead. Look, look, I'm tired of this, Mr. Spindley. Give it to me straight or sign off. Now, what is it? You've got to listen to me, Mr. Spade. It's most important. It's a life or death. It's a life... Hello? Mr. Spindley? Hello? It almost seemed as if he were in earnest this time, so I didn't hang up. I hustled down the hall to the next office, found another phone, and sweet-talked the supervisor into tracing down Mr. Spinley. It was a pay booth in a drugstore opposite the Park Emergency Hospital. The clerk in the drugstore was just getting over it when I punched in. Spindley had collapsed in the booth and had been hauled across the street to the hospital. On the bed there. Oh, thanks, Doctor. Life and death, Mr. Spade. Terrible. You've got to stop it. It's murder. He's been legal muttering murder. like that ever since we brought I him in. Yeah, hop, huh? The legal kind. You see before you an overdose of sleeping murder. tablets. You mean he tried to kill himself? I can't think of an easy way anyone could feed him two full bottles, can you? Pull through? Probably. I gave him a good pumping. Don't let them do it. Don't. Don't. All right. It's All murder. Right. Now, murder. Now, now, Mr. Doe, don't carry on so. But I know who did it. I, I, you must stop him. All right. All right. I, I know who is Take it. Take it easy. Boy, he's got a lot of strength for a little guy. Mr. Doe, huh? No name. Yeah, nothing to identify him. Funny thing, that. What do you mean? I'd almost guarantee the man's undernourished, hasn't eaten for days, shabby clothes and so on. Yet look at the roll I found in his pocket. Hmm? How much? Almost $800. Oh, did you find anything else? Yeah, this. Huh? What do you make of it? Well, front page of the Star Times. It's a galley proof, isn't it? Kind of run off in the linotype room before they start the presses. Yeah. Killer dies tonight. Willie Johnson, hitchhike murderer to enter gas chamber at midnight. Uh, innocent, innocent man. It's, right. it's murder, it's murder. Down you go, Mr. Doe. But, but I know who did it, sir. I know everything. I, uh, everything I uh, know. A frame. It's a skillful frame. You mean Willie Johnson? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know who it was. It was, it was hail and farewell, sir. Hail Farewell. Who was it? Come on, Mr. Doe. Wake up. Mr. Doe. Yeah. I was waiting for that. Hit him? Like a ton of bricks. He'll be incommunicado over the next 24 hours or longer. Hail and farewell. A broken down actor. Huh? Only an actor would think more of an exit line than an innocent man's neck. You mean you believe he knows? I don't know what I believe. The guy's been trailing me for 10 days, driving himself nuts, tries to knock himself off. It's a cinch he believes it. Hmm. Well, there's no chance of bringing him around before tomorrow. Yes, and Willie Johnson dies tonight. So what happens? 
So I'm stuck for taxi fare to San Quentin. Believe in him? Believe in Willie Johnson? Yeah, I know you're his lawyer, Mr. Grayson. I'm his lawyer because I volunteered to serve you, Mr. Spade. I've been in the law a long, long time. I've defended a lot of phonies. Sometimes you've got to if you want to eat. They all sing the same song. I was framed. Oh, I know all 89 verses. But Willie... Yeah? Willie's song is different. Because Willie Johnson's an innocent man. Willie was framed. Mm. Four appeals... Four appeals, four stays. And we've had our last one. It's folded up now, Spade. I'm going to take the walk with him at midnight. So do something for me, will you? Sure, sir. When... When you walk into a cell, remember you're talking to a man who's going to die in less than eight hours. We're trying to... We're trying to build his spirit up so he can go out with the colors flying, you know? Yeah. Don't give him a lot of false hope, Spade. Because... Because there isn't any... I don't quite understand, Mr. Spade, sir. I, I told my story so many times. I, uh... I'd like to write something about you for the papers, Willie. Oh. Yes, sir. But all the newspaper gentlemen been here and gone. Yeah, I know. Could you tell it just once more, Willie? Well, all right, sir. It was more than a year ago, I guess you know that. Yeah. I was broke, you know. Uh-huh. Things hadn't been going so well, sir. I was down to my last two bits that night. I walked into Sherry Dugan's. That's the bar on the waterfront, huh? Yes, sir. I got to talking with a fella sitting at the bar there. He bought me beer. Who was he? I never did find his name. I ain't seen him since that night. If I could find him, I don't reckon I'd be where I am, sir. Uh, he had a paper with him. Was reading the classified ad section. You know the part about autos, transportation, so on? Yeah. Well, there was an ad there. I'd say, we'll pay $500 plus expenses to drive car to Mexico City with a phone number. Uh-huh. And the fellow said if he were my shoes, he'd call up and inquire. So I did. I inquired. Uh, and I got the job. Well, sir, about an hour later, I met a man with a car at Southern Mason by the gas station there. And he gave me the 500, and I start out for Mexico City. Who was he, Willie? Never found his name, either. We tried, too, Mr. Grayson. Me. Never could find him. I see. Well, it, it was raining that night, sir. I remember. It was raining. And I hadn't gotten more than 50 miles south of town, somewhere around Morgan Hill it was. When a siren blew off behind me, and the first thing I knew, well, they was asking me questions about a girl. A girl named Georgia Lyon. Uh-huh. It was her car, it seems, and the, the officer claimed I stole it. They, they made me raise my arms, and they, they searched me, and, and there was a knife in my pocket, you see, with, with blood on it. Uh-huh. There, and I, I, I don't know how it got there, and the $500, that had blood on it, too. And, and there was blood on the seat. And, and and when they opened the turtle back, there she was. This Georgia line, I told you. Uh-huh. All double up there and dead. And they they said I'd done it for the money in the car. And I, I, I guess I just went crazy, Mr. Spade, with uh, with this all coming at me at once that way. You see, I, I tried to make a break for it, and I got away. And uh, I know I knew it was a terrible wrong thing to do. I know that. Yeah, what about the trial, Willie? Well, sir, Mr. Grayson done everything in his power. Sir. Uh-huh. And, and so did I. Uh-huh. I told the truth as close as I could recollect it, but it didn't make no sense. We never found a man in a bar or the man who drove up in the car. What about the phone number in the ad? Oh, that that turned out to be a fancy dress shop on Powell Street called uh, uh, Mason Francine. Mm-hmm. And the classified ad, sir, that, that was the queerest thing of all. Well, what do you mean? Well, Mr. Grayson went to every newspaper in the country for two weeks either side of the night. And there wasn't any such ad in any of them. Huh? So they said I was lying. They said I was lying. I made it all up I, in my head. And not, now they're going to kill me for it. Yeah. I don't know, Mr. Spade. I've heard it so long now. Maybe I did kill her. Maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. But there was something in the way he said maybe they're right. I told you they were wrong. 
I thanked him and told him I had what I wanted for my story and said goodbye. There was no hope in his face, but no despair either. He knew what was coming and he was ready. And that's all. I hit the homeward-bound commuters on the wrong side of the Golden Gate Bridge, so it was almost seven when I checked in at Cherry Dugan's bar on the waterfront. A girl was sitting three stools down from me, a class-type dame in a black file suit from Magnum's, and a hat that must have set some good-time Charlie back 50 bucks. Not the kind of a dame you'd expect to be sitting in Cherry Dugan's, least of all as drunk as she was. Well, here you are, Jack. Sixty cents. Thank you. Wait, wait a minute. Huh? This is a one-man operation, isn't it? Oh, mm, yes, why? Well, then you'd be Sherry Dugan, huh? <laughs> no, no, I, I bought the joint from Sherry a few months back. Why? Well, I'm, uh, I'm doing a story for the papers on Willie Johnson. Tell me, was Sherry here on the big night? Oh, yes, 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 only Willie Johnson wasn't. You could look it up, what Sherry testified. Where is he now? Oh, uh, South America. And there he'll stay. You know why? Why? Sherry has brains. For a man in his shoes, there's no better place right now than South America. Oh? Well, tell me more. He needed a rest the worst way, Sherry did. It's all he'd been through. Tending bar can be difficult at times, right, Tim? Uh, yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed. Show me a good bartender and I'll show you a bar and diplomat. And more besides. Mm-hmm. Well, here's to Sherry, wherever he is. Uh. Keep running, Sherry. Keep running. You know, Sherry's like a dog running away from a can tied to his tail. We all are. Who's we? All of us. All of us. The world. Give me another drink, Tim. Oh, now, listen, lady. I don't think I... Don't give me any lip. This is a first-class wake, isn't it? A send-off for Willie, isn't it? Poor. Marilyn, what are you doing here? Well, just in time, George. Sit down. Sit down. Come on, we're going home. Take your time, George. Two of the members present, one more. We'll have a quorum. Pour him a drink, Tim. You want me to carry you out of here? Might be fun. Where's Daddy? He's pacing the floor. Now, come on. You know something, George. You've got a can tied to your tail, too. No use running, George. Oh, you're out of your head. Whatever made you come here? Kind of appropriate, don't you think? Special night tonight. Black dress. Y'all fixing it. Gonna have us awake. Not here we aren't. Are you coming? Nope. All right. Where, where are we going? Going home. Bye, Timmy. And you, whoever you are. Hey, wait, wait, wait. How about to have a... Hold it, hold it. How much does she owe you? I got three forty-five. Uh, here. It's oh. worth it. Now tell me, who is she? Oh, it's a model. Some dress shop uptown. Oh? Like the Maison Francine, for instance? Yeah. How'd you know? That's the hunch. What's her name? Oh, Marilyn Hale. Her old man runs the Star Times, you know, the publisher. Yeah. The guy is his partner, George Farewell. You must have heard of the firm Hale and Farewell. I had, but it was a slightly different reading from the one Mr. Spindley gave me at the hospital. I looked at my watch. Willie was four and a half hours from the end of the line when I took off with a press room at the Star Times. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and music for you tomorrow evening with the Dennis Day Show. There'll be songs by Dennis and another typical tangled comedy situation, the kind of hilarious mix-up that could happen only to Dennis Day. And now, back to the hail and farewell caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Time, 8-11. I got out of the elevator in the basement of the Star Times building on Mission Street and started looking for the press room foreman, somebody named Joe Fortescue. I finally found his feet sticking out from under a sick linotype, hauled him out, and tried to make him understand what I wanted. 
Yeah, I know, I know who you mean. I know a little bandy like a guy. That... Can't hear you. I tell you, I say, he's a little bandy like a guy. Yeah, that's the guy. Hello, what about him? Come on. Go ahead, you first. Ah, now who is he? Ah, uh, Charlie Forrest, he's nuts. I know, but that's not what I care. Been off his rocker for a year. Look, you see that picture on the wall over your head? Yeah. That's Mr. Hale, the Iron Fist. Oh. Won't tolerate no inefficiency, you understand? But uh, uh, this screwball, this Charlie Forrest, I personally can him twice, and both times Iron Fist sends him back to me. Yeah. So, so uh, don't make no never mind to me, brother. Leave him come to work, stewed all the time. Leave him lay off for two straight weeks like this time. Uh, don't make no never mind. Yeah, yeah. Me. Now look, I'm up with you now. How long's Charlie been this way? Uh, a year or so. I know just when it started. When Willie Johnson was hauled in on the hitchhiking killing, right? Oh, you've been talking to Charlie, huh? Yeah. Uh, funny thing how that hit him. You'd find him sitting in a corner by himself, mumbling all the time about the guy being innocent. Mm-hmm. What do you suppose Charlie had to do with that? Oh, I don't know. Got real crazy toward the end, you know. Said he was killing Willie Johnson. And you'd ask him with what? And he'd say a linotype machine and a hunk of newsprint. One day he even offered to prove it, you know. How? Oh. Oh, I don't know. He said he had proof. He said he had the evidence that would save Willie's neck. It in his room. Boy, he was the office trolley. Look, I've, I've got to find out know. where he lives. They don't know upstairs. I don't know. We don't know downstairs, neither. He moved out of his apartment three weeks back, and don't nobody know where he went. Look, he was in this morning. Picked up a galley proof of page one. Uh, that's right. Yeah. I'll tell you who might know where to find him. Oh, come on, come on. Yeah, about ten o'clock, he leave here. Said he was going to look him up. Somebody, uh, somebody named Spade. Thanks. Sam Spade. He's a detective. That remains to be seen. A message, Sam? A bandy like a little guy named Charlie Forrest, F. He must have been in around 10, 10.30 this morning. Oh, dear, I didn't get here till 11. Uh, They're still clearing stuff off the tracks from the MacArthur reception. Yeah, never mind that now. Listen, write this down. Oh, oh, where did I find a piece of paper? Hurry up. Here, here, under the ashtray. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Call Jeremy Grayson. He's a lawyer, and he's with Willie Johnson in the death row at Quentin. Tell him to get hold of a justice on the state Supreme Court and hold the line open till I get him. You got that? Yes, sir. Is there anything else? No, I'll get back to you in a little while. Sam, wait a huh? minute. Don't hang up. What's the matter? <gasps> this paper I'm writing on under the ashtray. It's a note. Well, go ahead. Mr. Spade, please contact me at once. Charles W. Forrest, Bellflower Hotel, 338 Stockton Street. <laughs> It took 20 more minutes to cross town and 10 on top of that to convince the clerk at the Bellflower I had a right to the key to Charlie's room, which I had not. I tossed the room from the light fixture to the floorboards, covered everything from the window shades to the bathroom plumbing. Result, one batch of dirty laundry, six soggy cigarettes, and two empty bottles of sleeping pills. I was on my way out when I remembered one more thing. It wasn't an accident like in the movies. It was on purpose. I unscrewed the tops of the iron bedposts. Inside number three, I found it. There was a payphone at the end of the dark hallway. Sam, I warned you about this. We've had four stays. They won't come through with a fifth. I've got a fair hold card, Grayson. Did you get the judge? Yeah, Benjamin, State Supreme Court. What'd he say? What I knew he'd say. No evidence, no stay. Tell him I got evidence. It better be good, Sam. It is. A phony newspaper, a copy of the Star Times for the night of the murder with a special page in the classified section carrying the ad that Willie answered. How does that sound? You've got it now? Yeah. Well, for Pete's sake, hang on to it. I'll get back to the judge. Say, wait a minute, who, uh, who's behind it? It's a long story. I'll tell you when I see you. Hang up. Uh, when you what? Spade. Spade. Hang up or I'll kill you. Spade. That's it. You can turn around now. Well, Iron Fist. We've met. I've seen your picture, Mr. Hale. It flattered me, no doubt. Give it to me. What? The paper, stupid. I haven't read the funnies. All right, Mr. Spade, if you'd rather. (laughs) Iron Fist knew other games besides publishing. He moved up, I went for the gun, which suddenly wasn't there, and he was giving me a fast demonstration of judo for beginners. First thing you know, I was sprawled on the floor, and he was looking down at me along the barrel of his thirty-eight. I could kill you, I suppose, but why? Why... He backed off toward the window, spread out the paper, and crumbled it up. No. You know what you're doing with that match, Hale. Shut up. You're burning Willie Johnson at the stake. I said shut up. He touched the match to the pile of papers, watched them flare suddenly, lighting up the entire hallway. 
He looked like a medieval devil. I'm sorry about Willie Spade, but it has to be, that's all. It has to be. What did you have to do with Georgia Lyon? Nothing. Nothing at all. And her name wasn't Georgia Lyon, really. It was her stage name. No. Her real name was Farewell. Your partner's wife? Why, Spade, didn't you read the testimony at the trial? She was leaving George that night. She'd made a noble decision to walk out of his life and leave him free. For your daughter, huh, Marilyn? That's right. And it was such a tragedy Georgia had to run into Willie Johnson the very night she left. Wasn't it, Spade? <laughs> Wasn't it? He bent over the fire, watched it die down into a pile of ashes. I was looking at something else. A draft from the stairwell behind me had picked up a glowing scrap and set it down at the foot of a sleazy window curtain behind him. <laughs> well, that's it, Spade. The last of Willie Johnson. The last of... I hit him at the knees as the curtain went up in a blinding flash. No judo this time, just an old-fashioned hammerlock. Let me go. Come on, give me that gun. No. The fire. I'll break your arm, Hale. I'll break your arm. There. Well, that's better. Now get up. Get up. Hale, stop. as he hit the top of the stairway. He took off like an eagle, lit on his neck halfway down, and toppled the rest of the way like a loose pack sack of laundry. He was dead when I got to him. Score, with an hour and five minutes to play, no evidence, one dead witness, one unconscious one, one killer, an accomplice at large. There was only one way left to go, and I took it. Please. George Farewell's apartment. That's the penthouse. Yeah, is he home? Oh, I don't know what's the matter up there, sir. I, I think something's wrong, awfully wrong. Mm-hmm. He went up there early this evening with a young lady, and the door to the roof is locked at the eighth floor. That's never happened before. Any other way up? Well, you might try the fire escape if it's urgent. It is. So I climbed the fire escape at the eighth floor and went up onto the roof, or rather into George Farewell's patio. I worked my way through a maze of potted shrubbery around a fish pond with a fountain in the middle. Piano music was coming through a pair of French doors. But before I saw where the music was coming from, I knew it was the radio and not the piano. Because the piano, a 14-foot grand, had George Farewell sprawled across the keyboard with a bullet through his head. I crossed to the set of French doors on the other side of the house. And there I saw her, standing up on the three-foot parapet surrounding the roof, looking eight floors down into the street. Don't come any closer. You're not really going to jump, Marilyn. He did it his way, I'm going to do it mine. Don't come any closer, don't. I won't. So George shot himself, huh? Why not? Can't go through life with a can tied to your tail, no running away from that. No, there isn't. Well, you're going to jump? Give me time. Oh, you want to do it the dramatic way, don't you, Marilyn? Only 35 minutes left until Willie checks shut out up, over at the... Will you shut up! And to make it really ironic, you'll want to take off before he does, right? Shut the up. one person left who can save him. I talked to Willie, Marilyn. He must hate the world. He doesn't hate anybody. Poor jerk. I think he'd feel even sorrier for you, throwing your own life away while you can still save his. You can't run away from this tin can, but you can untie it. You can climb down off that wall and ride over to Quentin with me. You can tell him George Farewell killed his wife. That the three of you and the little linotyper made a pigeon out of Willie. Ah. Uh, I held my breath. She swayed, looked down into the street, poising herself. Then she turned round and stepped onto the roof again. Let's go. Congratulations. Yeah. Only George Farewell didn't stab his wife that night. I did. We pulled up at Quentin with six minutes to spare. The foregoing Justice Benjamin is submitted in support of the stay of execution granted Willie Johnson and will be set forth in detail in Mr. Grayson's petition for a new trial. Period. End of report. Gee, Willie can say. What can I say? 
Well, I have one constructive suggestion. I could say you're the greatest... Finest, most wonderful... Yes, but you'd only be repeating yourself, Tara. The proper line at this moment is, I shall have the report ready for you immediately following the next announcement. Right? Scoot. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Listen to the stars on this Sunday's big show. Jimmy Durante, Ethel Merman, Milton Berle, and Gordon McRae, plus Meredith Wilson and his orchestra. Your MC on the big show, of course, is the glamorous Tallulah. You're invited. Here it is, Sam. Sam? Hmm? Here's the report. Oh, yeah, yeah. What are you writing, Sam? Now, uh, look, how's this? Man of the world, dashing, debonair, cosmopolitan, temporarily at liberty, desires employment. <laughs> Sounds wonderful. Thank you. What does it mean? Uh, all right, we'll drop it down a few notches. Private investigator, accomplished raconteur, will tell troubles to listening public. Nice telephone voice. Contact Sam Spade, 1 East 48th Street, New York. 1 East 48th Street? Yeah, my address during the summer months, Cherub. You got it? 1 East 48th Street, mm -hmm. New York City. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe a lot of people will write, Sam. I'm sure they will. Think so? There'll always be a Samuel Spade Incorporated. Will there? Look ahead. Smile through the tears, Sam. I am. The day will come soon again when... When the when... phone will ring and you will say... Sam Spade Detective Agency. Yes, and I will say... <laughs> me, sweetheart. Buck up, old girl. Stout fella. Stiff upper lip. Good show. Not goodbye, but... Oh, reward, Sam. Hail and farewell. Good night, sweetheart. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed adventure of Sam Spade was produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn, Lorene Tuttle as Effie. Also in the cast were Junius Matthews, Olin Soleil, Wally Mayer, Sidney Miller, Kathy Lewis, Paul Fries, Ed Max, and Lou Merrill. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. <laughs> This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the history of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure, Missing Harold Ascort. For Nick Carter and the great kidnapping mystery. And here's Nick Carter himself to tell you the story. As you probably already noticed, I'm not going to tell you the story that I announced last week. Instead, I want to tell you a rather different kind of tale. One which started as Patsy and I rang the doorbell at the rather magnificent home of Mrs. Philip Ascort, just off the upper end of the park at about 10.30 one morning. Yes? I'm Nick Carter. Mrs. Ascort's expecting me. Yes, Mr. Carter. Won't you come in, please? Thank you. If you and the young lady will go into the living room. I'll tell Mrs. Ascort you're here. Certainly. Gosh, Nick, the Ascots must have more money than they know what to do with. Just look at this place. Yes, Patsy, the Ascots belong to one of the oldest families in the city. Old and conservative, rich but never ostentatious. Mm, so I see. Gee, I wish I could oh, have put... I think I hear Mrs. Ascot coming. Oh, Mr. Carter, I, I want to thank you for coming so very promptly. I know how busy you are, but I really am in trouble, desperate trouble, and I, I don't know who else to turn to but you. Why, Mrs. Ascot, I'd be very happy to help you if I can. This is my assistant, Patsy Bowen. How do you do? How do you do? Now, what's wrong? 
It's my son, Harold, Mr. Carter. He's been kidnapped. I found this note inside my newspaper this morning. Hmm. Well, what does it say, Nick? It says we've got your son. If you want him back, don't call the cops. We'll tell you what to do later. There's no signature. Can you tell anything by that letter, Mr. Carter? Of course, the handwriting is obviously disguised. Half printing and half writing. Papers, good bond paper. Ah, has a watermark that looks like a dragon's tail. Ah, the top of the sheet of paper's been cut off. A pair of scissors, apparently, as the cut isn't quite even. Why do you suppose they did that? Well, there was probably a letterhead on it, and the writer didn't want the paper traced, of course. Oh. But they didn't cut quite all of the printing off. Can't read what's left, but later on it may help to identify it. It looks like hotel stationery, doesn't it, Nick? Yes, Betsy, that's what I was thinking. I'll have Scabby make a round of the hotels and see if he can find the one it came from. Oh, Mr. Carter, do you think you can find my boy? Well, I certainly hope so, Mrs. Ascord. And I'll do my best. But in the meantime, just sit tight and wait until you hear from me again. Or until the kidnapped gang makes its next move. <laughs> Oh, hiya, Nick. Didn't take you long to get here. It's no time to waste in the kidnap case, Cubby. You never could be sure when the gang will get frightened or annoyed and kill their victim. Now, you find the same kind of newspaper here, you say? I sure did, Nick. The same size, same watermark, and as near as I can tell from what's left in the kidnap note, the same printing at the top. Good. But what now, Nick? How does knowing the paper came from here help you any? If the paper came from here, it's quite possible that whoever wrote the kidnap note was staying here in the hotel at the time. Yeah. And if he was, the hotel register may give us a further clue. Oh, but the handwriting on the note was disguised, Nick. Oh, quite so, Scubby. But it's impossible to completely disguise any writing so that it may not be identified. Even when the writing's apparently completely changed, there will always be some peculiar characteristic left that'll give it away. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, clerk. Yes? Do you mind if we look at your register a moment? Not at all, sir. Here you are. Well, let's see... Young Ascot disappeared on Tuesday afternoon, and it's possible that the signature we want might be under Sunday or Monday's date. Well, do you know what to look for? Yes or no, Skippy. I've memorized the looks of the writing in the kidnapped note, and I expect to recognize any similar peculiarities in the signature here. Mm, no, nothing here under Sunday's date. Uh -huh. Let's try Monday. Okay, right over here. And Decker. And... Here, here. Look at this one. James Scannett. I never heard of him. Of course you haven't. Neither have I. But look at that S. Yeah. And the J. Uh -huh. Note how oddly they're made? This signature, like sure. the kidnap note, is half written and half printed, too. Evidently the work of a man who learned to write late in life. And a man who never writes easily. Oh, I see what you mean, Nick. No yeah. question, Scubby. This is our man. Clerk. Yes, sir. Is this James Scannett in the hotel? <laughs> James Scannett? Uh, no, sir. He checked out this morning. Mm, I was afraid of that. Do you recall what he looked like? Oh, medium height, sandy-haired, little mustache. He had a crooked little finger on his right hand. I remember him because he asked a lot of questions last night. Mm, thanks, Bert. Well, do you know him, Nick? Why, yes, Scubby. But I sent that man up the river three years ago for a five-year stretch. Oh. Well, maybe he's out. Yeah, maybe. I know a man who can tell me. I'll give him a ring and see. Come on. Well, whom did the description fit, Nick? Sounds like Jack Vincent, Scabby. Yeah? Forger and a con man. An old-timer at the business. I can't see for the world how... Oh, pardon me for a minute. Oh, sure, Nick. I'll wait here. It should turn out to be Jack Vincent. This case may prove to be quite interesting for both. Oh, hello, Bill. How are you? This is Nick Carter. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Say, Bill, is Jack Vincent still up at state prison? Oh, two weeks ago, huh? No, nothing special yet. Well, thanks, Bill. Good luck. Goodbye. Well, what'd he say, Nick? Vincent was pardoned two weeks ago. Uh, He's our man, all right. You know, it's a funny thing, Nick, but while you were in there phoning... A couple of men went by me, and I heard one of them say to the other, I saw Vincent Grady's bar last night. Well, maybe that's where he hangs out. You say you just heard that now, Scubby? Yeah, just now. That's queer. Well, how do you mean, Nick? Scubby, things are going a bit too easily. The note paper that can be traced, the name in the register, the description, and now the conversation you say you overheard. You mean you think it's some kind of a frame-up? Might be, Scubby. Might be. Well, gee, if it is, Nick, you if better... If it is, take... I'm going ahead just as I was before. 
Just be a little bit more careful, that's all. Well, if they want me to go to Grady's bar, that's where I'm going. See you at the office later, Scubby. And he fell for it, Jack. Hook, line, and sinker, just like you said. I got to hand it to you. And you told him where he could find me? I said it real loud, right beside that stooge of his. I said I'd seen you in Grady's place here. He's coming here now? Yeah. I beat it on ahead to let you know he was coming. Good. We'll take care of him when he gets here. Gee, you're awful smart, Jack. Ain't no wonder I kind of go for you. Yeah, but don't forget, I owe him one, too. He sent my pop to the chair for bumping off that old rat of a watchman last winter. I ain't forgot that, you betcha. Okay, Gertie, cut the gab. Huh? Looks like Carter's coming in now. Ah, uh, he can't see us where we're sitting. Yeah, that's him. Hey, do I look okay in this apron I borrowed from Pete? Sure, you look like a regular waiter, Ben. Hey, got a tray? Yeah, yeah, right here. You sure he don't know you, Ben? Nah, he broke up my racket last year, but he never seen me. Gee, we all got it in for him, ain't we? You bet we have. And here's where I pays off. Watch me. <laughs> Waiter. Yes, sir. Bring me a large ginger ale and coke, will you? Coming right up. Well, Nick, lots of familiar faces here, but nobody I really know. I wonder if Vincent might have moved out of town after he had the snatch. And that conversation Scubby overheard, if he did over here, it sounds to me like... Yeah, yeah, sir. Oh, thanks. Here, give the change. Thank you, sir. <sighs> well, at least this ginger ale's cold, doesn't taste that bad. Yeah, it's an odd flavor to it, though. There must be a new brand of Cokes they mix with it. Can't yeah, say that I enjoy it. Why, oh, yeah, that's queer. It isn't hot enough in here to make me dizzy like this. You seem to be... Nick, you fool. You've been doped. You've been... You've been... Do- He's out cold. Gee, Ben, you must have made it strong. You bet I did. I ain't taking no chances. I put three of them in. Now go on, Gertie, and get the car and make it fast. I don't want none of Carter's friends to come looking for him before we can get him out of here. Okay. This is the day I've been waiting for for three years. Well, he don't look much like a great detective, does he? All tied up and gagged like that. I'll say he don't. <laughs> he looks more like a trussed up chicken. Or a dead duck. <laughs> and that's what he's going to be as soon as he wakes up. A dead duck. You mean you ain't going to kill him now? No. Nah, there's no fun in killing him when he don't know who's doing it. I want him to look me in the eye when I send a bullet into his brain. Oh, gee, Jack, I thought you'd let me kill him. Nothing doing. This is my party. Private and exclusive. Did you get his guns? Yeah, both of them. Hey, should we leave him here in the back room for now, Jack? Yeah, he won't come to for another couple of hours. He'll be safe here. Now, you and Gertie stay here and watch him. I got some stuff I want to take care of. I'll be back by the time he wakes up. Okay. Here you go, Mr. Master Detective. (coughs) And there you stay till we're ready for you. Have a nice sleep. And keep your eye on Gertie, Ben. She might forget and bump him off all by herself. Nicholas Carter's office. Well, this is Mr. Alcott speaking. Is Mr. Carter there? Why, no, he isn't. Has something else come up? Yes. Yes, I've got another note from the kidnappers. They want a hundred thousand dollars immediately. Good heavens, a hundred thousand dollars. Oh, what shall I do? Mr. Carter said to do nothing until I heard from him. Well, I've no idea where he is. He should have been back here long ago. You better just do nothing, as he said, until we hear from him. He's bound to call me pretty soon. Unless... Unless something's happened to him. Oh, what a headache that stuff leaves behind. Well, it served me right for being such an idiot. I knew what I was walking into, and I walked right into it. Gosh, but it's dark in here. I wish I could see... Wait a minute. What's that? 
Miss Clyde, you sent my pop to the chair, did you? And you'll never send nobody else there. Because you ain't going to live no longer. I'm going to fix you right now. I'm going <gasps> to... What the... Sorry to have to be so rough with you, lady. But it's my life or yours. You're only stunned. Now, I can reach that knife she dropped before she gets her senses back. I can cut these ropes. <coughs> and get free from... <coughs> Just a little more. <coughs> if I could only see behind my back. Oh, where is that knife? <coughs> I want to be able to reach it now. Just uh... I'll be forced to kill you. You? How did you... I heard you coming in, so I sat up, stuck my legs out, and tripped you. You dropped your knife. and knocked your head on the floor, and I stunned you. Then I found the knife, cut my ropes. Now I'm getting out of here. Oh, no, 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 you can't. Jack will kill me. He'll murder me. You should have thought of that before. Now, don't try anything. Your friends overlooked this little pistol I carry in my shoulder holster. It's very small, but effective, I assure you. What are you going to do? Why'd you dope and bring me here? To kill me? Oh, Jack and Ben were scared you'd try to break up their plans for the kidnap yes, job. I knew it. Now, listen carefully. Who else is in this house now? Only Ben. He's in the next room. Good. And when I tell you to, call Ben. Tell him you're afraid I'm waking up. Ask him to come in here, but don't you warn him. You want me to, 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 to ask him to come in here? Yes, but no funny business. Now, call him. All right. Ben? Ben? What do you want? I think Nick Carter's waking up. You better come have a look at him. So quick. Yeah. Okay, don't touch him. You wait till Jack gets back and then... Look out, uh, man! Up with your hands! I warned you. Now stand aside. I'm leaving here and don't try to stop me. I'll be seeing you both later under different circumstances. How do you do, Miss Boone? Nick, where in the world have you been? We've been waiting for you for hours. Sorry, Patsy. Anything special been going on? Anything special? I should say so. Mrs. Ascord has called five times. She got a note from the kidnappers telling her it would cost her $100,000 to get her son back. And she's going crazy waiting for you to tell her what to do. Hey, Patsy, have you heard anything from... From me, Scubby? Well, Nick, what happened to you? Jack Vincent laid a trap for me and I walked into it. Did you learn anything? No, Scubby, I didn't. Except that it all has to do with the kidnap case we're working on. Well, did you have any trouble, Nick? Well, depends on what you call trouble, Scubby. More of that later. Now, what about Mrs. Ascot? Well, she wants you to call her as soon as you come in. I'll get her for you. All right, Patsy. We've got to move fast. Maybe too late even now. My being there and getting away doesn't help any. Mrs. Ascot, just a minute, please. Here she is, Nick. All right. Hello, Mrs. Ascot. Sorry I've been uh, held up where you couldn't get hold of me. What's up? Oh, Mr. Carter, I received a note from my son. It says that I'll have to pay his kidnappers $100,000 if I want to get him back. The note also says that that I've got to take you off the case or he will be killed. He says that, that, that so far they've not mistreated him, but he begs me to pay the money and get him free. Is the note in your son's handwriting? Oh, yes, yes, I'm sure of that. What shall I do, Mr. Carter? Well, does the note give you any way of getting in touch with him? Yes. Yes, it, it says to put an ad in the personal column of the clarion, address to safety, and let them know what I decide. Good. Put the ad in the clarion. Tell them you're willing to pay the money and ask them how they want it paid. All right, Mr. Carter, but but how about, well, what they have to say about getting rid of you? You know what I... I understand, Mrs. Ascord. Tell them in the air that you'll guarantee that I'll have nothing further to do with the case. Oh, but that... that would be a lie, wouldn't it? Yes, of course it would. But would you prefer that the kidnappers kill your son? Oh, oh no, of course not, Mr. Carter. All right, then. Put the ad in just as I said. And let me know the minute you get an answer. Then we'll plan our next step. Mr. Carter, I'm so glad you've come. An answer to the ad that I put in the paper just came in the morning mail. Here it is. Thank you. On Route 77B, five and two-tenths miles north of Route 31, is a large single oak tree right beside the road. It's the only tree around. Make up a bundle of ten, twenty, and fifty-dollar bills, one hundred thousand dollars in all. Throw the bundle out at the foot of the tree this afternoon at five o'clock sharp. 
Drive by at not less than 25 miles an hour. And do not stop. Your son will be sent back to you tomorrow morning. He'll be alive if you follow directions. He'll be dead if you don't. Gosh. Mm-hmm. Pessy. Hmm? Where's that map I asked you to bring along? Well, here it is, Nick. Well, I still don't know how you could tell what section of the state we're going to need a map of. Well, Patsy, when I went back to the gang's hideout yesterday afternoon, it was deserted. The only things I could find that interested me were a rough draft of the original kidnap note made in the back of an envelope addressed to Jack Vincent. Mm -hmm. And also a timetable showing trains running to a certain part of the state. What part was that, Nick? The part I asked you to bring the map up. Very simple. Very simple. To you. Well, where is it? Here. Hmm. Now, let's see. Route 77B is here. Route 316 crosses it right here. Mm Mm-hmm. It's about 45 miles out of the city, in a very thinly settled section. What shall we do about it, Mr. Carter? We'll do just exactly as the note says. Have your bankers make up the bundle of $100,000 in 10s, 20s, and 50s. Yes. Take Patsy with you, and have your chauffeur drive you up to the spot designated in this note. Throw the bundle out, and then leave the rest to me. I'm sure glad it's clear today. Otherwise, we'd be out of luck. You see anything, Scubby? No, not yet. Hey, Nick, do you suppose anything has gone wrong? No, I doubt it. I have entire faith in Patsy's ability to follow instructions. Gee, sure is sort of deserted around here, isn't it? Yes. Only a few scattered houses and very little traffic. Oh, here, Scubby. Suppose you take over the controls of the plane for a while while I take the glasses and have a look around. Oh, sure, Nick. Here you are. Thanks. Got the stick? Yeah. All set. These glasses are really high-powered, aren't they? Hey. I think I could... Yes, yes, there they are. And right on time. Are you sure this is the right road, James? Yes, Miss Asgore, this is the right road. Oh, I'd feel so much safer if Mr. Carter were here. Why, if any little thing were to go wrong, it... It might mean my boy's life. That's why I'm here, Mrs. Ascourt. Just to see that nothing does go wrong. The place you want is about a half a mile ahead, Mrs. Ascourt. Oh, dear, so soon? Oh, I... Oh, I'm all of a jitter, Miss Bowen. You have to throw the package out. I, I just can't do it. Now, don't you worry, Mrs. Ascourt. I'll take care of everything. Uh, uh, slow down just a little, will you please, James? Yes, miss. Well, I wish I knew how Nick is planning to get the money back. The gang could go anywhere from here, and we'd never know where it was. Oh, I hope Mr. Carter won't do anything to, to interfere with my getting my boy back. He's worth all the money I have. You can trust Nick to do the right thing. There's the tree, just ahead. Oh. Now, help me up with the package. All right. That's it. Careful now. I'm going to let it go out the window. Here it goes. Well, that's that. Oh, you're wonderful, Miss Bowen. Did you see anybody? No. No, nobody. Not a soul around here anywhere. I still can't see anybody. The bundle is still right by the side of the road where it fell. Oh, heck, this curve cuts off the view entirely. Well, at least we've done our part. Yes, we've done our part. The rest is up to Nick. Yep, those are Nick's orders, Sheriff. Drive as close to the house as you can and then park your car in the bushes just off the road. Okay. Uh, where's Carter now? Oh, well, he went on ahead to get the layout of the place. He wants to get his plan set by the time we get there. I don't understand how you know them fellas are hiding out there. You say neither you nor Carter have ever been near the house. Well, I'll tell you, Sheriff, it's really very simple. When Mrs. Lascourt dropped the bundle of money out of her car this afternoon, Nick and I were overhead in Nick's plane watching everything through his extra high-powered field glasses. Huh, yeah. Right. We saw the crooks come and pick up the money, and then we watched them beat it back to the farmhouse. <laughs> they took every back road and cow pad they could find to keep from being followed, but we could see them, no matter where they went. Yeah. Where, All the time, the one man that they were really afraid of was up there over their heads watching it. <laughs> hey, that's quite a stunt. I've heard tell this Nick Carter's quite a feller. <laughs> and darn if I don't believe it now. Well, darn if you don't head better. <laughs> well, we better stop here, huh? Don't dare go no closer to the house with the car. I'll just run her off into the bushes here. <sighs> huh. 
Well, I wonder where Nick is. He ought to be here any minute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So far, so good. They haven't seen me yet. Yeah. Yeah, this is the window where the boy should be, if I'm right. Too dark to see what's inside the room. I'm going to have to take a chance and climb through the window and see for myself. Locked. Uh, I ought to be able to slip the latch on an old window like this. This knife will do it, I think. There. Hope my luck holds it all my longer. I guess it's safe to use my flashlight here. Yeah, there he is. Oh, Harold. Harold. Oh. Quiet, quiet. Not a sound. Keep absolutely quiet. You all right? Yeah. Quite a pretty bad cold yesterday, though. But who are you? You're not one of the gang. No, 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 no. I'm not one of the gang. I'm, I'm Nick Carter. Nick Carter? Yes. Gee, I've heard of you. You're going to save me, huh? That's just what I'm going to do. And I'll get these ropes off your arms and legs first. Yeah. <laughs> there we are. Yeah, I feel better? Gosh, yes. Now see if you can stand up. Well, it's not very easy yet. But I'll be all right. Good boy. We got to get you out of here pronto before one of the gang comes up to have a look at you. All right. How do we get out? Out of the window, same as I came in. All right, come on now. Quiet. Okay. Whatever you say, Mr. Carter. Climb out the window under the roof. Easy now. Easy. That's the boy. Gee, it's dark out here. Can't see anything, hardly. Just follow me. There's a post in the corner of the porch we can slide down. I came up it. Careful now. There it is. Here we are. Okay. I'll come right behind you. You go ahead, Mr. Carter. Not Mr. Carter, Harold. Just call me Nick. Gosh, Nick. Am I going to have something to tell the fellas when I get back home? All right. Here we come. That's the boy. Gee, that was easy, wasn't it? All right, son? Sure. Let's get going away from here. All right. My friend Scubby and the sheriff want to be over there on the edge of the brush. Hey, is that you, Nick? Yes, Scubby. And I have the boy, too. Suffer and catfish, Mr. Carter. How in heaven's name do you get him out of there without getting caught? It was easy. Nick's a good detective. I bet he can do anything. Well, thanks for the plug, Harold. Now, here's my idea. Are the three of them still in the living room where they were a few minutes ago? Yeah, I just took a look and they're still there. What's your idea, Carter? Well, this is it. They think Harold is still tied up nice and snug in his attic room. Now, if they should happen to hear him out here in front of the house, they'd probably come rushing out to see what's up, wouldn't they? Sure. Well, go on, Nick. Well, I don't want any shooting. If I can help it, somebody might get hurt. So you and I will stand one on each side of the front door, Scubby, while the sheriff goes around to the back door, ready to come up from behind them. Yeah, Harold. Then Harold will stand out here in front of the house and shout good and loud. They'll come out to see what's what, and we'll poke our guns on their backs. No shooting, no trouble. All nice and simple. Gee, that's swell. What'll I yell, Nick? Oh, whatever comes into your head. Anything at all. Okay, Sheriff? Yep. Sounds nice and simple, if it works. Well, here goes the rear guard. Come on, Scubby, and get your guns ready. Okay. And, Harold, if anything goes wrong, you run for the woods. They'll never find you out there at a back night like this. Okay, Nick. When do I yell? Count five slowly. That'll give Scubby and me time to get into position beside the door. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. Rainfield in the mountain! Yippee! Whoa! What the devil is the kid doing out here? Get your hands up and fast. Don't try reaching for your guns. We've got you surrounded. Nick Carter, how did you... Just keep those hands in the air, Vincent. Okay. All right, Scubby, get the guns. Okay, Nick. Here, Ah, only one on Ben. And two on our friend Jack. All right, just crawl along here. Now, stop it. Find this gal trying to skip out the back way, so I brought her along. She belongs to this outfit? Well, I'll see she does. She was the one who watched me while the men went out for the money. Well... Looks like we got everything, don't it? Yeah, it certainly does, Sheriff. Everything but the ransom money, which must be here in the house somewhere. Nick, hmm? can I hold a gun on one of them? Why, sure, son. Yeah, take Jack's gun and keep it pointed right at him all the time. Hey, Carter, don't let that kid have that gun. He don't know nothing about guns. It might go off and somebody get hurt. You're quite right, Vincent. But would it interest you to know that I wouldn't care if it did? As far as I'm concerned, kidnappers are pretty filthy things. The lowest of the low.
Oh, Mr. Carter, how can I ever repay you for what you've done for me and my boy? Well, I'm very happy that we were able to get the boy back for you, Mrs. Ascott. And the money, too. Oh, please tell me how much I owe you, Mr. Carter. I want to send you a check at once, a, a big one. You owe me nothing, Mrs. Ascott. Oh, but Mr. Carter... If you really I... want to repay me, I suggest that you put at least an extra $10,000 into war bonds in this fourth war loan drive. And give the bonds to the Associated Boys Clubs of the city. I can think of no better way to spend money right now. Buying the bonds helps the boys who are fighting for us today. And giving the bonds to the boys' clubs helps the boys of tomorrow. It's a wonderful combination. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly at the same time by WOR Mutual. What can you tell us about next week's story, Nick? Well, all I'm going to tell you about it is this. There's such a weird and unusual case that for the only time in my life I was almost compelled to believe that vampires really do exist. I call it Death After Dark, or the mystery of the vampire killings. So long. So long, Nick. See you next week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate, Scubby by John Kane. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was written and directed by Jock McGregor. Next week at the same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... Death After Dark. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Vampire Killings. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is broadcast in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every week. This is Mutual. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. When the rumor gets around that summer has begun, Broadway is beside itself with glee. Somebody notices the sunlight and tells somebody else, and the word gets around. It drifts cross town, and a man reaches into his closet for a hand organ, puts the funny hat on his monkey, and takes a walk up to Broadway, just to grind out background music for the big grin. It's the time for the dachshund, and the silken ankle, and the flowered print dress. The orange juice is sweeter, the knish is lighter. The guy runs down the street screaming, I'm in love. It's June. And it was June under the Translux, too. A rare day. And the Times Square crowd had gathered there to consider it and take the story of it home to the little woman, dad and mom. There was a man lying in the circle of their feet. He was expensively dressed. He's dead, Danny. What happened, Muggerman? Ah, come on, come on, you people. Break it up. Come on, get going. What is it with them, Danny? What happened? How can you tell what happened? People milling around, crossing streets, going to lunch, looking at the one ads over there in the Times building. Suddenly a guy's face down on the pavement. Somebody laughs, drunk, and somebody sees blood. So we got him on the pavement and them watching. Uh, stabbed. Yeah. Know who he is? Uh-huh. Here, wallet. Loads of identification. Yeah. Earl Lawson, Park Avenue. Earl Lawson. Earl Lawson stocks some barns. He's got a name. Wizard or something. Makes money by the buckets. Anybody see it happen? A million people on Times Square. High noon, nobody saw anything. Nobody. 
Now look, you people, why don't you move along? Go home, get out of here. The safest place in the world to kill somebody, Mugman, in a crowd. Walk up to him, stab him in the back, keep walking. Well, it started off to be a pretty day. Yeah, real sunny. Just across the street, the file of crowd waiting for the movie that was better than life held on close to its place in line. Held on close against the insinuating whisper of the violent dead. It was a trick, kid. A trick to make you lose your place. To cheat you out of a front row seat where love and beauty and other high-class things are handed you on an air-conditioned platter. But a few were sold by the whisper and were drawn by it. And joined the cluster attending the dead man. A woman pushed her way close and turned away. She opened her purse, smeared a lipstick nervously across her lips, studied their reflection in a window, and then carefully carefully retraced them with the perfumed scarlet and death had raised its banner on Broadway the home of the murdered man was a place whose sounds had been geared down to the soft purr of wealth the swish of the ankle deep carpets the flute like trills of the parakeets taking the noonday sun in exclusive cages the butler who murmurs you into the library and asks you to wait quietly You don't dare open a book because turning a page would release a clap of thunder. And finally, when you'll wait no longer, the soft voice at your shoulder. I'm glad you made yourself at home, Mr. Clover. This is a difficult house to do that in. It's quiet. You can say that for it. You're... Harlan Lawson. Dr. Harlan Lawson. Oh, then the book's on this shelf. My one literary effort. All 20 copies. 20 copies of the same dribble. New Freedom, Pennsylvania, the utopia that failed. Nice binding, though, wouldn't you say? Quite. Expensive. That's my brother. He's everything you say. He gave me those when I got my Ph.D. Made a grand gesture of binding my doctor's thesis and burying it 20 times over on the shelf. Every time he fingers the gold lettering, I tell him how grateful I am. You don't get along, you and your brother? We suffer each other. Let's put it that way. He has his world. I have mine. And uh, your world would be... The back alleys of poverty. You see, I'm in the nature of a failure, Mr. Clover. I'm a social worker. Doesn't pay very much. But I take in tears and give in exchange baskets of fruit. My brother's castaway clothing. And the gestures of sympathy they taught me in post-grad humanities. But you keep on living here with your brother, with uh, Earl Lawson. I exist here. Is this why you came, Mr. Clover? To run your hands over my brother's library? To probe into me? Or is it... (laughs) No, no. Don't say to me Earl has somehow run afoul of the law. Don't say it, because I wouldn't believe it for Earl. He's dead. He was murdered. Your manner of saying it. You leave me nothing but to believe you. He was stabbed, left lying on the street in Times Square. He must have shuddered that it found him in a place like that. I'd swear he shuddered. Your brother dies and that's how it hits you? To each his own way, Mr. Clover. You're implying that it was I who killed him? Let's play it that way for a while. I've dreamed the wish sometimes, but I couldn't have killed Earl. I slept the morning through. Earl's butler will testify to that. He was serving me brunch when you came in. Expensive brunch with wine. Who else would want your brother dead? Besides me. That would be your thesis, wouldn't it, Mr. Clover? I suggest the scholars approach... Yeah, thanks. I'll try. Then back to headquarters and to the desk... Get on the phone, make inquiries, send out to the newspapers for files, read them, digest them, extract them. Start a file of your own, label it Earl Lawson Homicide. Fill out the form, date of birth, hour of death. Murder by sharp instrument to be filled out in detail by the coroner. And on the lines on the bottom of the page, the incidental information. Jot down the phrases. A self-made man, shrewd financial mind. Known enemies, probably many due to financial manipulations. Send out for coffee and the sandwich because it's suddenly nighttime. And read some more. Then your door opens and Sergeant Tataglia is all business. Lady to see you, Danny. What does she want? She knows who killed our Lawson. What? She says she Bring her knows. in. 
This way to see Danny Clover, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Peggy Drake, Lieutenant. Please sit down. Close the door, Tataglia. All right, all right, you can stay. Miss Drake, the sergeant said you know... Not exactly. Danny, she told me she knew all about it. She said... What's on your mind, Miss Drake? I have the murderer's picture. Here. Here it is. Yeah. How'd you happen to take this picture? Well, I'm here on vacation. This afternoon was a good day to take pictures. I was at Times Square. I took a lot of pictures. And, well, this is one of them. You can see for yourself. Yeah. I found a store with six-hour developing service, and I got them developed. I was looking through them, and I saw this one. That's why... Yeah. Come here, Tataglio. Look at this. Ray Brewer. That's right. Ray Brewer sticking a knife into Earl Lawson on Times Square. Call records, Dino. Get the last known address on Ray Brewer. And anything else they've got interesting. Guess I did help with that. I don't know how much. Records. This man here with a knife. His name is Ray Brewer. A known hoodlum. A record of every misdemeanor on the books. Yeah, yeah, I can so. Wait till my society back back home hears about this. I belong to the literary society. We have open forums. I suppose this will be in the papers, well, I mean, won't it? Front page, probably. What else is what else? Yeah, what's happened to him lately? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. How are you making out, Gino? In a minute, Danny. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got all that. We appreciate it, and thank you. Yeah, very interesting, if I may comment on the material gathered from records. What's interesting? Up until a week ago, Ray Brewer was confined to the county hospital for incurables. Yeah, I remember. He was a pretty sick man. Incurable? His heart. Docs gave him a month to live. But last week, he was discharged from the hospital. How come? To die in the bosom of his family, as the records guy phrased it. Where is this family? 1212 West 16th, the man says. Where you going, then? See that Miss Drake gets home, Gino. I'm going to pick up a killer. Open up, Brewer, or I come in anyway. Brewer? Where are you, Brewer? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Out here, Danny. Taking my ease on the fire escape, watching you. Watching you spill out your strength. Throw away the gun, Ray. They tell me you've got a month. If you throw the gun away, maybe you can live a part of it out. All of it. It's arranged. I live all of it. Thirty days, Hathray Brewer. <laughs> if I come out after you, Ray, it'll cut your time down to a half minute. You make me shake with fright. Stay where you are, Danny. I'll bring it to you. The gun, Ray. Now, don't drool, you know You'll get it. Funny... When you rang the doorbell, I thought it was a boy from Milford's, but no, it was you. How come you find me so lightning quick, Danny? A girl, a visitor, got your picture sticking a knife into Lawson. <laughs> I never could learn to be camera shy. Poke a camera in my nose and smile for all birdies. Turn your back to me, Danny. I feel a new smile coming out. Listen to me. You, you don't turn your back, you bleed in the face. Turn... You did that, you brought sunshine into my short life. <laughs> One for the road. <laughs> it splintered through me, puncturing, ripping into the dark cells where pain lay waiting for it. Being released, scurry darted through me, opening endless doors on endless hurt. And these new ones took over, finally. Gave up, because they'd overdone it. I couldn't feel it anymore. And then the hall wind cold on the sweat that had drenched me. And looking for Brewer, knowing he wasn't there. And calling to headquarters and tell them to put out an all-points bulletin on Ray Brewer. And then to Park Avenue to ask a question. Why had Brewer wanted Lawson dead? What had Lawson been to a hoodlum like Brewer? Help me. In my bag. It's in my what? bag. What? 
Help! I... I... <laughs> you... Didn't... You... Didn't... Help... Down the long hall I could see the parakeets preening, pecking into their clipped wings. The new stillness of the man lying there with a knife in his back. Dr. Harlan Lawson. Dead. The nap of the thick rug furrowed where his hands had tried to tear life out of it. And suddenly the, the flute song of the parakeet started again. And it wasn't still anymore. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The sensational young tenor Mario Lanza will take the place of Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen on CBS while the famous pair are on summer vacation. Mario Lanza starts his new series tomorrow, and you'll be heard each Sunday this summer on most of these same stations. And while Jack Benny is off for Korea, Guy Lombardo and his orchestra will be on hand to entertain you in CBS familiar Jack Benny time. Last year's bride mannequins are dusted off, brought out of Broadway's basements, propped up on a rod and arranged tenderly at the side of last year's groom mannequins. And Broadway knows June is passing through. It presses its nose against the shop window, sighs at the cascade of white satin flowing slowly over the wax figure, sheds a tear at the coronet of cloth lilies of the valley, and blows its nose for the sweetness of it all. It's the time of youth, the two-week romp in the Catskills, the burial in the sand at Far Rockaway, and the breathless ecstasy on the heights of the roller coaster at Coney, for the stay-at-homes, other sweets, other delights, the subway ball games, the band concerts in the mall, the moon-burned girls in the dark grass, and the my-hand-in-your-hand talk about two brothers dead of knife wounds. Summertime talk. At headquarters the next morning, it was difficult to talk about anything because Sergeant Tataglia had his mouth full of tacks and his fist full of hammer. Building something, Gino? Oh, it's you, Danny. Yeah, you might say I'm building... I'm building a site for sore eyes. Oh? You mind if I look? Well, my pleasure. Pardon me for obstructing your view. Oh, nice. I think so also. A pin-up picture of Mrs. T hammered to the door of my closet. This I consider a worthy hobby. Mrs. T? I call Mrs. Tartaglia that whenever I'm in a hurry. Mm. <laughs> Consider her, Danny, in her Catalina swimsuit, Jones Beach underneath her, the Tartaglia progeny forming a garland of angels at her feet. Ah, nice family picture, Gino. Uh, do you mind taking the tax out of your mouth now? So as I can tell you about Ray Brewer, huh? So as you can do that. Well, naturally. Uh, permit me to close the closet door on Mrs. T first. I don't want every Tom, Dick, and... <clears throat> well... Nothing on Brewer, Danny. The hoodlum killer is still at large. All points bulletins have been Nothing, sent. Nothing, huh? Bread and butter, there is something. I forgot. The Milfords, of which the hood spoke to you, is Milford's haberdashery on Madison Avenue. But Roman Curcio traced it down after thousands other Milfords. It seems... I'll check it. Well, don't go away, Danny. I got something else. Another pin-up? Well, you might say that. Remember that Peggy Drake came in here with the snapshot of Brewer killing Lawson? What about her? Precinct 12 picked her up last night running down East 60th Street in her, you should excuse the expression, negligee. What? Was someone running after her? The precinct boys asked her the same question. She said no. She said she dared herself to do it, then she took the dare. So the boys decided on a small fine and let her go. A lonely girl in the big city. Sometimes it hits them that way. All right if I leave now? You always leave me, Danny. I'm used to it. Go, Danny. <laughs> Sir, is someone helping you? I'm looking for Mr. Milford. Mr. Milford is dead. What? Twelve years ago. Like that. Zut. He was discussing plans with a buyer and... I know. Zut. Who are you? Uh, Mr. Milford, Jr. 
May I be of some service? I'm from the police. I want some information. Oh, uh, what is it you want? The police department called you a while ago. You said you had some dealing with a man named Ray Brewer. Oh, uh, yes, I did. I did indeed. You want to tell me about it? I don't see why not. Then tell me. Uh, surely. Last week, Mr. Brewer entered Milford's and was fitted for a complete outfit, from linens to warachas. Warachas? Uh, Bootery a la Mexico. Uh, Mr. Brewer was going to Mexico. Uh, note that I said was. Uh, note that. Mr. Brewer changed his mind, huh? Well, that's a man's right. Mr. Brewer decided to stay around the city. Thus, he cancelled the Mexican clothes and ordered town wear. Uh, Gabardines. And he paid you? I only ask because it's been bandied about that Mr. Brewer is not a wealthy man. His uh, friend paid me. The friend who was with him when first he ordered. Uh, this friend? Here, this man's picture in the newspaper? The very one. Dreadful clothes. Not ours. Is he from here in town? Uh, what's his name? It says right here, Harlan Lawson. Hmm. Ph.D. It says this chap was murdered. That's right. Do you have any idea why Mr. Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico? None. He was so delighted, too, the, the first time he was in here. Showed me a travel brochure put out by the airplane people. Uh, Central American lines, I think. I, I've been to Mexico, you know, uh, ridden on a donkey. Thanks, I... Junior. Thanks a lot. May I be of service to you, senor? I think so. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Oh, my privilege. Uh, you wish to tour Central America to observe our police methods? Mm. It can be easily arranged. I will speak to the Latin consul. I, I uh, just want to know about Ray Brewer. Uh, about Brewer? Uh, Brewer? Ah, the name has a familiarity. Uh, si, si, senor Brewer. The man who wished to live out his days in Mexico, the land of tradition and romance. He's a murderer. Do you think he'll make it? <laughs> What a dying man sets his heart to do is difficult to restrain him from, senor. Uh, this from my father, I learned. But senor Brewer will not make Mexico by way of Central American lines, senor. Of this, I am certain. Tell me why. Because only yesterday he canceled the ticket. It took me so long to prepare. He canceled the tour I had mapped for him. Acapulco, Zapateca, the floating garden. When Brewer so came in here to arrange his trip, was he alone? Uh, with another gentleman who subsidized the excursion. This one? In the newspaper picture? Mm, see, see, this one. Uh, Dr. Lawson, a gentleman of refinement. Now dead, I perceive. Yeah. Brewer didn't give you an address by any chance. Oh, no, no, no. He simply took the cancellation money, told me he preferred your city. As who would not? You peddle tickets to romantic places and you like it better here, huh? <laughs> who would not? Why pay extra fare, senor? Romance is where you find it. <laughs> Oh, come in, Margolin. Sit down. <laughs> Got anything? Nothing. Guy Brewer's hiding someplace. Where, I can't even begin to guess. Nobody knows anything. Stool pigeons, old friends of Brewer's, not a thing. Uh, if he gets out of the city, it's going to be tough. Yeah. How do you figure it, Danny? Figure what? Well, this, the case, the killing of the Lawson brothers. You know what I mean. You piece it all together, it comes out easy. Show me. Sure. Harlan Lawson wanted to get rid of his brother. For he... money? Maybe. But more than that, I think. Earl Lawson was a man who beat up the world. Harlan just stood there and cried for it. Well, Harlan was a social worker, Danny. He probably did a lot of good where it counts. Sure he did. But I met Harlan. It's the way he impressed me, Muggerman. He felt sorry for himself. Uh -huh. So he finds a little hood like Brewer hires him to kill Earl. Like you said. Harlan was a social worker. Brewer was in a charity hospital. That's where they met. Harlan found out Brewer only had a month to live, promised him a fling that month in Mexico for killing Brother Earl. Well, then why did Brewer turn around and kill the hand that fed him, if we go on the assumption that he killed Harlan, too? Well, Brewer killed twice, all right. The knife in Harlan matches the stab wound in Earl. He killed both brothers. But why? I don't know why he killed Harlan. 
Another thing I don't know is why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. If he found that out... Then all I can say is, thank goodness. Well, say it and sit down in the corner. Mugovan and I were discussing... It's it. about Peggy Drake. Peggy Drake? Say, isn't she the girl? Yeah, the girl who took the snapshot. She should have taken the snapshot and left the city. What? Just a few minutes ago, at five on to midnight, to be specific, she had a to-do with a cab driver. Tried to force him to take a wardrobe trunk in his back seat. Broke a window while so forcing. Quite a scene. The police suggested the moving company. And... And, and what? Oh, give me a breathing spell, Danny. And Officer Padunik suggested his father-in-law and stood guard over the trunk until his father-in-law, the Murphy Movers, hauled it away. Thank Jeep as this girl leaves for her hometown of New Freedom, PA, in the morning. Where? New Freedom, Danny. The trunk has already left by Murphy Trucking Company, and the girl Peggy Drake leaves tomorrow, for which leaving the police only again wave the finger under her nose. Highway Patrol, Mugman, pick up that van. Escort it back to Peggy Drake's place. Right there. What do you know? So that's why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. Then I waited. It was a little less than an hour when the phone call came. The Highway Patrol had picked up the van at the entrance to the Delaware Bridge. There was plenty of time. Time to grab a bullet chili and walk over to the 60s into the rooming house where Peggy Drake was staying. Inside, the banisters of the staircase had been worn smooth by a thousand respectable hands, and the color had just begun to drain from the flowers and the wallpaper. On the third floor landing was a trunk. Beside it, Detective Mugovan. She's in there, Danny. She know we're here? We talked loud. She knows. Stay with the trunk, Mugovan. Okay. you, Mr. Clover. Glad you're here. Come in. Please, come in. What goes on in your town? I don't understand you people. Something wrong, Peggy? It was all that noise a little while ago. I opened my door a bit. I saw my trunk. Explain it to me, Mr. Clover. You were sending it back to New Freedom, huh? Of course, where I live, where I came from. That's where you met Harlan, wasn't it? What's he got to do with I need some sleep, Mr. Clover. My bus leaves early tomorrow. You're not leaving. You want to bring your trunk back in here and unpack? I'm not leaving. Wait a minute. Margovan, bring that trunk in here. What are you doing? I don't have to unpack. It's pretty heavy, Danny. I'll need some help. Okay. I'll give you a hand. Yeah. You better grab the handle on the other side. Okay, Danny? Uh-huh. Wait outside. Yeah. I wish you'd tell me what this is all about. How long did you plan to stay in New York, Peggy? Four days. And you needed a trunk that big for a four-day trip? It's a brand new trunk, Peggy. Yes, I just bought it. It's for things I want to take home. Books, lamps. Books, huh? I like books. Let's see what you bought. Don't open that. Don't. Why not, Peggy? Leave me alone. What's the girl have to do? I come here for a good time. I'd say you had quite a busy trip. Running down the street at night in a negligee. <laughs> I had something to drink. I didn't know what I was doing. Then creating a stir with this trunk with a cab driver? It wasn't my fault. People here aren't helpful. But... Peggy, we're looking for a man, Ray Brewer. We want him for two murders. Brewer? You know him, Peggy. You took his picture, brought it to me. Oh, that's, yeah, that's right. I remember his name. I'm sure you do. Let's open the trunk, Peggy. No. Don't. Get it out of here. Take it away. Later. You took the picture, Peggy, because you knew the murder was going to be committed. The murder you planned so well with Harlan. Get it out of here. Just get it out of here. Gave us a picture of the murderer. You figured by the time we found who he was, traced him, he'd be roaming around Mexico. By the time we got to him, he'd be dead. Because Ray Brewer only had a month to live. I didn't do anything. I didn't kill anybody. It was Harlan. One thing is bothering me, Peggy. Why Brewer changed his mind about going to Mexico. He saw me taking his picture. We didn't tell him we were going to do that. You double-crossed him, huh? That's why he killed Harlan. That's why he was going to kill you. I ran from him. It's like a nightmare. Somebody grabbed me by the shoulders and choked me. And I was in the middle of the street. Dressed. Dressed. When you finally got back here, Ray Brewer was dead. He didn't live his month. His heart gave out. Let's open the trunk, baby. There he is, Ray Brewer. I won't look. I'm not going to look at him again. All the while I was putting him in there, staring at me, 
staring. And I couldn't get the trunk closed. His hand. I was alone. All alone. His face. Staring at me. <laughs> Dawn touches Broadway now. The remnants of the night are driven back into the earth. You walk the streets, and from behind a doorway, you hear the old sound, the, the sound of weeping. You know the nighttime will never leave. It's found its refuge. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Peggy Weber was heard as Peggy Drake, Ted Osborne as Harlan Lawson, Anthony Barrett as Ray Brewer, and Don Diamond as Milford. For a full hour of outstanding musical entertainment, plus one of radio's biggest cash awards, play Sing It Again every week over most of these same CBS stations. Laugh along, win along with Jan Murray as he picks up his coast-to-coast -coast telephone and invites you to sing it again and land a big batch of loot. It's exciting, it's outstanding radio entertainment. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where you meet adventure with Charlie Wilde, Sundays on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing. Delicious. <laughs> In July, the night slips down over Broadway like a black silk stocking. And you drift to it, because the other promises you made to yourself never happen. The part of your life that never counted is left behind. You stand on a street corner, beating down the scream in your throat. The shadows start at 7 o'clock and deepen into night. You hug it close, because it's your chance that something will happen to you outside of the movies. And the tap on the shoulder starts it, or the laughter that floats down to your end of the bar, or a smile, or the man who runs down the hall after you. Danny! Hey, Danny. What's the matter, Sergeant? Glad I nabbed you before you took off for the day. Phone call, Danny, from a hysterical woman. You know, I had a hard time Come piecing on. it all. Uh, 1647 East 56, Danny. Fourth floor apartment. That's where her fiancé lives. The guy's threatening to blow his brains out. Hey, here, the names and such I jotted on this paper. Squad car, Gino. Waiting for you downstairs. Muggerman's with it. Uh, 
That's it, Danny, 1647. Uh, who'd you say was doing all this threatening? A man by the name of Blaine. The first thing is, let's see, David. Try the buzzer, Muggerman. Yeah. He did it. Miss Carroll said he was going to do it, and he did. We're from the police. It happened up there on the fourth floor. Mr. Blaine, it happened just now, not more than... Who's that crying? That's her, Miss Carroll. See her? See her? Hugging the banister up on the third floor landing. And that's Mr. Fallon at the rail on the second floor. Let's go, Muggerman. Dead. The gun's here, Danny, by his chair. It looks brand new. Looks like Mr. Blaine had his choice. Uh-huh. It's quite a gun collection from Derringer's on up. Complete equipment for a young arsenal. Margarin. Yeah? Those people we passed on the landing, that boy on the second floor, Mr. Fallon, and Miss Carroll on the third, I'll want to talk to them. Yeah, Miss Carroll's still crying, Danny. You hear her? Poor woman. <laughs> And stand for a moment and consider the virulence of death. How it is not content with its own, must reach out to slash the livid scar into the heart of those crowding its edge. The woman crying softly. The other tenants whispering, moving restlessly in the lower corridors, and then hugging the wall because the attendants on violence must pass. The photographers, the interns, the technicians. And the moment is gone. It's routine now, official. The first entry in the file of night. <laughs> The next morning, gather it into a neat stack on your desk and sit down to it and be surprised at the opening door and the quick presence of the woman you had marked for later interrogation. The, the man who was with you last night, he said you wanted to talk to me. It could have waited, Miss Carroll, until you felt better and until you... It'll not be forgotten that easily, Mr. Clover, if that's what you mean. If you have something to ask, ask. Only don't prolong it. Don't make me wait and wonder. Sorrow's enough by itself, don't you think? Yes, yes it is. And you, try to understand us, Miss Carroll. A man I loved, who loved me, is dead. By his own hand, by his own will. He could have lifted his burden onto me, whatever it was. But he didn't. And now he's dead. You want more than that? Maybe. Because this is my job. Because I can't rule out the possibility that David Blaine was murdered. Awful. How ugly of you to think a thing like that. But anyone could have wanted my David dead. What if it's ugly? Tell me about him. He loved me. He was going to marry me. He was polite and gentle. Sometimes he'd forget himself. Then he'd beg my forgiveness. Wept sometimes. Showered me with gifts, so I'd be quicker to forgive. This watch, he called it an engagement present, but it was really an atonement for... Look at it. See how he loved me? It's a beautiful watch, Miss Carroll. See? Listen to it. And it ticks, ticks, ticks away my life with David. Softly, gently. Listen to me, Miss Carroll. Why would David kill himself? You were in love, you were going to be married... Why? He had a secret. That's it. He had a secret. He didn't want to stain me with it. Isn't that it, Mr. Clover? Isn't that why a man kills himself for the girl he loves? Oh, I'm sorry, Danny. I thought... But it's important... It's all right, Dr. Sinsky. You can come in. Well, that'll be all for now, Miss Carroll. Thank you. All? You helped a great deal. Thank you. You have nothing more? Nothing. Not now. Then I'll go. If you should want to talk to me again, I promise I'll be... Goodbye. Uh, it's not easy, huh, Danny? To pry into grief, to scavenge... You've me. got something, Doctor. Just tell me. Oh, forgive me, Danny. Sometimes my mouth gets the better of me. I studied it, Danny. I put it on your desk for you to study. Read it sideways, upside down, still comes out suicide. Then it's done. Finished, huh? Nothing to bother our brains about. 
Like you say, Dan, he finished. Except when a man who dies as Blaine did in shock spasm, arms rigid at right angles to his body, fingers clenched, how is it the gun was not found in his hand but on the floor? It's just a small question, Danny, to gnaw at the brain of a medical man. Sometimes it happens so, but... Yeah. Go practice medicine, Doctor. Maybe I can bring you back an answer. Maybe where a man died, someone has an answer. I'm busy right now. Your name, Richard Fallon? I'm from the police. I guess that gives you a right. Come on in. You want to sit? Over there. Move those papers off the couch. Just put them on the floor. You a writer, Fallon? You interested or curious? What do you write about? About your city? About how it's not like my part of the country? About your many-faceted city? About your stinking city? Your people? Your small people, your hurry-up people, your no-place-to-go people. The no-tears city, the rat-hole city. That's what I write about. Any material up on the fourth floor? I figured that'd be your gambit. Uh Uh-uh, nothing. Your city caught up with a man and he shot himself before it drowned him. I'll think about the man and smile and wish him well. Know anything about him? His name was David Blaine. He walked arm-in-arm with a third-floor woman, Miss Carroll. Last night I heard a shot. I ran out into the hall. Mrs. Galvin downstairs ran out into the hall. Miss Carroll upstairs ran out into the hall. We looked up the stairwell to the fourth floor from where the shot came. David Blaine was dead. I know that about him. What else? Uh Uh-uh. Nothing. Sit there if you want, but don't stare at the back of my neck when I write. Makes me self-conscious. My gratitude for permitting me my ten minutes at the water cooler, Danny. Feel better, Gino? Goes without saying. And now to the toils of the day. It comes to that part of the rundown in which I proffer you your daily piece of resistance. In two parts. To wit, <clears throat> gun found that side of deceased David Blaine is indeed gun with which deceased did do himself in. Now, uh, Gino, that hasn't been... Patience, a... Danny. Part two will settle the question itching in your brain of suicide versus murder. Scratch it for me, Gino. Delighted. Part two of report from technical states. Impossible for any tenant to have shot said deceased, make an escape down the fire escape, arrived in the hallways in time to look up and yell, man dead on the fourth floor, in your presence. Add to this the double whammy I have held out on you. Give it to me, Tartaglio. Peek you, and any? The lakeman assigned to such duty I've come up with that David Blaine did indeed lose upwards to 50 grand by sour bets in the stock market. This in the period of the last month. 50 grand in 30 days. For this, guys kill themselves, Danny. For a lot less yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Gino, close the file on Blaine. There's nothing more to... Danny Clover speaking. They switched me to you. You the man on that Blaine thing? Yes. What about it? Who are you? Blanche Hemby, mister. 1834 East 59. Room 11. You said Blaine. What have you got? Uh... What have I got? I got he was murdered, mister. And go there, and walk the hallway mottled with shadows and scuffings. The short corridor that ends in the door with the tin numbers and the pull-down bed and the basin in the corner. Knock on door 11. Get no answer. And go in, because there was urgency in the voice that said, Come here. And the bed was pulled down. The rug was frayed, and the splotch of blood trailed off it onto the floor. The girl was behind the couch, huddled, her knees drawn to her chest. And only the fat summer fly pinging against the window made sound. That and the lonely room silences that intruded upon the dead girl. The murdered girl. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. 
The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the glittering midsummer's day, Broadway takes time out to shimmer. The chrome is polished high, the better to reflect the passage of women who lean for a moment against the summer's heat and then walk slowly on. The mouthpieces of the payphones glisten with the moist whispers of an empty summer afternoon. A money clip glints through the dark of an alley, and you know that someone has gotten odds on a piece of the day. There's the drone of the neon and the tired wind nudging a headline in a shining trash bin. Cop finds murdered girl in tenement room and the wet shirt pulled from your back. Like other summers, other days. Where I was in the corridor between my office and the show-up room, that had happened before, too. Only the names of the dead were different. Blanche Hemby. I got the rundown on her you wanted, Danny. Well, what'd you get, Muggerman? Oh, I'll have to slice it off fast, Danny. I'm due at the show-up. A woman there, Mrs. Westfall, real eager to identify a prowler she dreamed last night. I'll walk you down. Now, this girl, Blanche Hemby, frequent visitor. Hmm? Got her name on her guest book uh, maybe five times. For what? Oh, nothing sensational. Brawl over a hairdo with another dame in a bar. Phonograph screaming. Her screaming, disturbing the neighbors. Beat a guy's head open with a bottle because he called her a gimme-gimme girl. Things like that. Any tie-up with David Blaine? I know it's around the bars where she had the trouble. The tenement where she lived, the place she was working at two weeks ago. They fired her? Uh-uh. No, she gave notice, Danny, two weeks ago. Said she was sick and tired working for nickel tips behind the hamburger counter. She had better, she told him, a lot better. Bit a hole in her time card, threw it on the griddle, walked out. Work anywhere else? See anyone else? Mm-mm. No, I checked that, too. Blanche slept away the days in her room. Three times a day, she got up to phone for beer, once a day for sandwiches. Uh, here I am. I'll check with you later, Danny. Yeah. How do I know where I got it? Why don't you leave me alone? Muggerman. Stop making a show. That kid up there. What about him, Danny? Some punk probably. That's the boy who was the tenant on the second floor where Blaine was murdered. Get him, Muggerman. Bring him up to my office. Sure, Danny. Right away. Here he is, Danny. He's not anxious. Get your hands off me, your scum, all of you. Take it easy, kid. What happened? The city trying to drown you the way you said it does to people? I hate it. I get drunk at night because I hate it. That way I see it for what it is. And you can't stand that when someone like me sees you for what you are. You hate me. And you kick me, you throw me in jail because I'm better. Even drunk, I'm better. He's right, Danny. He's a lot better than us. He goes around with a pocket full of watch. Like this, because he's so much better. That's it. Where'd you get this watch, Richard? <laughs> I held out my hand and I begged, and a kindly person dropped it right into my begging hand. Where'd you get it? I told you. I walked the streets and it fell into my hand because I was crying and lonely. And sick for home. Miss Carroll, your neighbor has a watch like this. You steal it from her? You steal it, Richard? Lock him up, Mother. A watch exactly like the one Regina Carroll owned Her engagement present from the man now dead Presumed a suicide, suspected murdered If it were Miss Carroll's watch, what was Richard Fallon doing with it? It was a simple question, and Richard couldn't answer it So call Miss Carroll, get no answer So open the plush box that held the watch Levante, jewelers for over a century That's what the satin ribbon said, glued against the inside top Stolen from Levante? Jewelers for over a century? Go there. Ask Mr. Levante. Oh, no. Not stolen. Purchased. By whom? A policeman you said you were? Let me see, please. Sure. Here. Yes. This watch was purchased. You've already said that. Apologies. I'm temporizing, you see. I'm trying to gather my forces together. Now, as to who purchased this watch... Perhaps to a Miss Carroll, my old friend, Miss Regina Carroll. 
Of course, it's impossible to tell. What are you trying to tell me, Mr. Levant? You see, this is quite an unusual watch. We rarely sell more than one a year. Our own design with a foreign mechanism. However, we sold two in the last few months. Remarkable? Who did you sell them to? Even more remarkable. A few days ago, Miss Carroll purchased such a watch. A few months ago, a fiancé. Now dead, I've heard, a few months ago. This gentleman also purchased such a watch as an engagement gift for Miss Carroll. That makes two watches for Miss Carroll, both the same kind. Is there an explanation for it, Mr. Levante? Well, Miss Carroll said she lost her engagement watch. Thus, she purchased another one. She cautioned me not to mention it to her fiancé, or to anyone for that matter. But now, you, a policeman, Mr. Blaine, dead? Well, you don't think I'm going back on my word to an old friend, do you? Miss Carroll is your old friend? Her dad and I were close. I toddled, Regina. Poor woman. You mean about her fiancé? About all of them. What do you mean? There were four of them, you know. Two at college, one when she was a sophomore, one when she was a senior. Then about ten years ago, a young man, since quite successful in groceries, has a nice store for select customers on medicine. Chap named Mason, I think. Miss Carroll was engaged four times, huh? Well, she's 37, you know. She doesn't look it, does she? Still a beauty. A bygone day kind of beauty, if you know what I mean. Victorian? Would that be it? Oh, I often wondered why she never married any of her young men. Why they backed out on their marriage. I wonder why, too. You need some help, sir? Uh, I'm looking for a Mr. Mason. All right, I'm Mason. I'm Danny Clover. Police. The first name's Pete, Danny. You got a couple of minutes? Any time for you, fellas. I need a couple of minutes to recuperate anyhow. Mrs. Smythe just had me on the floor. Oh? She comes in here with her French poodles, three on a leash. Maid and chauffeur trailing in back. Orders a dozen... Well, did you ever hear anybody say bagel with a broad A? She wants a dozen boggles. <laughs> I don't understand her. Finally, she tells me what she wants is receptacles for a delicacy known as locks. How did she say locks? Locks, the chauffeur said. What can I do for you, Danny? You were once engaged to a Regina Carroll, weren't you? It was an experience. I'm not sorry for it. Who broke the engagement? You've got to ask that because it's important for the police to know, right, Danny? I broke it. Why? Why? That's a question I often ask myself. Sometimes my wife asks me, and I'll tell you what I answer. Go ahead. Regina was a girl just like the girl that married dear old dad. Close to the wedding, I discovered this is not the type of girl I wanted. Personally, the girl that married my dear old dad, my mom, nagged my father to an early grave. Mom and Regina, two peas from the same pot. Go on. I'll tell you about Regina. I figure she has a picture in her head of a husband in a smoking jacket with satin lapels and a curved pipe in a fireplace. I don't fit the requirements. Personally, I like polka better than cribbage. Uh-huh. What else? Well, Regina... How she dressed. Pretty, you understand. But she made her own fashions, which she never changed. Ribbons, dresses choked against the throat, and always a little too long. She slipped on the ice once, and I told her she had pretty legs. She slapped me. That's what about Regina Carroll, Danny. That enough? Plenty. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Gordon? Oh, uh, Danny Clover. <clears throat> I couldn't be more charmed if I tried. A quiet evening in technical, huh, Gordon? It was. Now the place screeches at me. Did you do that, Danny, just by walking in here? You mix yourself bitter pills in those test tubes? I don't have to. I have company. <laughs> no offense. The gun that killed David Blaine. Get it out and go over it again. Well, I've already examined it thoroughly. My report was placed on your desk. Get it out. Well, I can recall it to you if memory fails you. Thirty-two caliber Smith & Wesson. Fired once. Get it. Examine it. All right. All right, Danny. See? I'm examining. 
It's still as it was when Blaine held it close to it. The barrel. Put it on a slide. Hold it up to the light, whatever you have to do. If you ask, Danny, I'll do better. Perhaps this will amuse you. The spectral micrograph enlarges 45 times. Uh, and there. Have a look, Danny. You look. All right, Danny. All right. Hmm. What? Wow. Wow. What? These infinitesimal scratch marks on the barrel. Fascinating. And a new quirk. It didn't register on me before. I checked the rifling in the barrel against the slug, which we call standard operating procedure. I didn't think of looking at the outside of the barrel. Why should I with a suicide? I guess I should have, huh? And what would you have found out, Gordon? That the man killed himself with a silencer on his weapon. Now, <laughs> that's what I call taking quiet pleas a shade too far, huh, Danny? <laughs> Oh, Mr. Clover, I knew you'd come back. Knew there'd be more things you'd want to know about David. Did you come in? Thanks. You may sit down in that chair. No, thanks. What makes you think I wanted to find out any more about David? I assumed it. Suicide. Files to complete. I realize it's my duty to be cooperative. Miss Carroll... I can tell you so much about him. He was generous. He was a gentleman. Rare thing to find out. He was murdered. You suggested that before, Mr. Clover. I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now. Murdered. He was dead minutes before we got to him. That's stupid. Listen to me, Miss Carroll. Stupid, because I heard the shot. We all heard it. We all ran out into the hall. Do you have a gun, Miss Carroll? Yes, I have a gun. David gave it to me. Woman alone. Did he show you how to fire it? Of course he did. He loved guns. I interested myself in them. Shall I get the gun? It isn't necessary for now. You don't have to get the silencer either. What are you talking about? The gun you shot David with, his own gun, was equipped with a silencer. Mr. Clover, I don't understand you at all. I'm a lonely woman. And I admit it, I, I'm a helpless one. How could I have killed anyone? Someone I loved. Hmm. Nice view from this window, Miss Carroll. You could stand here, see Detective Mugovan and me coming, fire a blank cartridge from your gun, run out into the hall. Look up, and everyone thinks the shot came from the floor above, from David Blaine's apartment. Mr. Do you admit it, Miss Carroll? No. No. I want to show you something. Here. Look at it, Miss Carroll. A watch, just like the one you're wearing. I didn't kill him. David Blaine broke his engagement to you, didn't he? I didn't kill him. The kind of woman you are, proper and proud. You gave him back the watch. But what to tell your friends? Tell them that someone else walked out on you the way three other men did? A proud woman like you? So you bought another watch, just like it. The one you're wearing. Please, please. Because I have the one you gave back to David. The watch you had that boy, that writer, Richard Fallon, steal from David's apartment. So the police wouldn't find it there and ask questions. You told him to get rid of the watch. He got drunk instead, got picked up. Look, look. David jilted me. But I didn't kill him. You did. You couldn't live with the thought of another man's walking out on you, like the other three. That's why you bought the watch, so your friends would think you were still engaged. Mr. Clover. So your friends would think David died because of the money he lost. And Blanche Hemby, the reason why David walked she out on you. Filth. The woman David loved. Filth! Beat her to death. Beat her, beat her! Let's go, Mr. Like David, there is filth! Instead of me, a woman like that! Miss Carroll. <laughs> True what you said. Those men didn't turn me down. I turned them down. College boys. Grosser. Not good enough. It isn't true. It isn't true. They did walk out. Why? Take me away. Put me someplace. I don't want to look at anyone. I can't look at anyone.
Broadway's deserted now. Maybe it's the heat. Maybe it's just that people get tired and want to go home because Broadway threw sand in their eyes. Maybe you found what you were looking for and couldn't stare it in the face. Because it's a street that'll give you anything you want. Any way you want it. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment any time, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for chewing any time, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint Gum. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Prussian as Mugovan. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Bob broadcasting from Topeka, Kansas, Hope, and thanking the sponsor of your regularly scheduled program for this two-minute interruption. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last ten years, I've visited many dramatic spots in this world, But just a few minutes ago, I returned from a tour of what was once North Topeka, Kansas. I've just seen block after block of total destruction. Streets caved in, buildings undermined and flattened. Entire new housing developments a shambles, with the houses jammed together like battered boxes. As we toured this sickening area, I thought of the heroics that must have accompanied this disaster as it happened. The emergency operations of the Red Cross, Salvation Army, Air Force, Coast Guard... Veterans organizations and the thousands of civilian volunteers, all striving to hold this hungry Call River within its banks. Then the complete frustration when it crashed into the streets. But the excitement of that time has passed. Today, it's a dismal task of dirty drudgery. Imagine the heartbreak of returning to what was once your home and finding three feet of dried mud on the front porch. After scraping and digging for hours, you finally get the door open only to find dried, drifted mud banked throughout the house with everything in it destroyed beyond repair. Countless of the heartbreaking stories of human despair this great flood of 1951 has written. But you and I, neighbors of these Call Valley folks of Kansas, can help. And I mean help with dimes and dollars. The Red Cross and other agencies have done a magnificent job taking emergency care of 10 to 15,000 refugees, and they're still doing great work in helping the needy with rehabilitation. But that's a far cry from the tremendous job that lies ahead. In Topeka alone, the loss is $100 That amounts to $1,000 for each and every person in this city. I'm appealing to that great heart that has made America. It's never failed before. Won't you send your contribution, large or small, to Flood, Topeka, Kansas? That's all the address you need. Flood, Topeka, Kansas. And join me, Bob Hope, in bringing new hope to thousands of unfortunate American folks. Thank you. The William Wrigley Company has donated the time for this message from Bob Hope. Now, after a short pause, we switch to Hollywood for your regular program, Broadway is My Beat. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment... Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the exciting drama of mystery and murder and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover.
For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment any time, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing, delicious. When the summer becomes August, Broadway pauses for a while, considers. What happened to the springtime dreams to be fulfilled in the middle of July at the very latest? And what of the blonde on last month's snapshots, the one with sunny legs, the one you tried with poetry and she touched your cheek, the fawn of Camp Never Care, jewel of the Catskills? She's back in the Bronx shoe store, kid, and the last time you walked by, she didn't look so good. And walk the streets furious with people and heat, and feel your throat tighten when it suddenly comes to you. Another summer's rushing away. Maybe next year, kid. Maybe. And uptown, east of Broadway, where I was, in the outdoor swimming pool, catering also to the seekers after something or other, the crowd was divided into swimmers, non-swimmers, sand sitters, ukulele players, and miscellaneous. And the man in the swimming trunks, lying on the concrete walk. The man who had drowned... And the police emergency crew working over him with a respirator. And the man from headquarters who had gotten there before me. They've been working on him for quite a while, Danny. Why'd you call me to come down, Muggerman? I asked the same question of Patrolman Kenny. It's like this, Danny. Kenny was flagged off his beat when this man was dragged out of the pool. Took off the man's locker check, went to the locker. You know, for identification. The locker was empty. Forced? Uh-uh. No, those locks answered with dime store skeleton key. Robbery gets a dozen calls a day from these pools. So you figure that man's drowning and his locker's being robbed had something in Maybe a coincidence, Danny. Maybe something else. I don't know. I wanted you to be here in case. Yeah, let's take a look. One of you men called the morgue. A lifeguard who pulled him out is that one, Danny. You want to talk to him? Uh-huh. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Uh, Russ Gavey. What happened here? Well, I was on my stand. Him, he started to yell. I went in after him. How'd you get those scratches on your shoulder? He fought me. I had to take him under to break his hold. And when he stopped struggling, I got him out. By that time, he needed artificial respiration. I gave it to him. But did your men came. All right. Did Detective Muggerman here tell you this man's clothes are gone, that it's going to be pretty difficult to identify him now? Yeah, he told me. Any ideas about it? Nope. Okay, Russ. Back to the office at headquarters and sit with it. A man had been drowned in a public pool. From a policeman's point of view, worth only a quarter-page form in triplicate. However, the fact of his lockers being robbed may be something else again. Probably not. More forms. Then a couple of hours later, when the office gathers up its private shadows, a door opens. A man walks in. Uh, Danny, you busy? Come in, Dr. Sinsky. Sit down. Thank you. I just came from the autopsy room, Danny. And? Uh, has that man brought in from the swimming pool the drowned one? Has he been identified, Danny? Not yet. What's on your mind? He was murdered. Murdered? How? Whoever administered artificial respiration to that man killed him as surely as if he had driven a knife into his heart. Dr. Sinsky... Gently, did... Danny, gently. I'll explain. Inside of the chest, Danny, is a delicate system of balances. Balances which cannot be upset... Else a man's heart will be affected in his lungs. What's that got to do with murder? Simply that the autopsy I just performed on the drowned man revealed small internal hemorrhages. Bruises of the muscles and bones of the chest from too active a manipulation. You mean that lifeguard didn't do... I mean he did a very bad job of artificial respiration. And that's why you call it murder? Not premeditated, of course, Doctor. This is not the question in your mind. You wanted to ask if it was premeditated. Didn't you, Danny? And let the question take over the room. Add the weight of its violence to the oppressive night heat. The stifling remembrance of other such questions posed in the same room, quietly, fearfully. Because a policeman, too, reacts to the touch of death. It fills the room, and against its pressure, you lift the phone, make the call to the Department of Public Works, have them check personnel files, come up with an address for Russ Gavey, lifeguard. Go there, to the hall bedroom furnished in the style of brownstone, East Twenties. 
find it empty of Russ Gaby. Be told on the way out by the woman spread wide on the stoop you should have asked before. Russ was across the street in the park, on that bench, fighting for his share of the night air. Walk up to Russ. Let him chew the last fiber of a matchstick. Yeah, I'm taking my well-earned rest. You want to help, Mr. Clover? Sure. Mind if I sit down, Russ? Yes, sit down. You were almost a hero today, Russ. You're kidding. That's how I make my daily summer bread, 50 bucks a week. Ogle a girl, save a life. How long have you been a lifeguard, Russ? Oh, six, maybe seven summers. Time out for a frolic on Anzio Beach. Then you've uh, had a lot of experience saving people from drowning. Am I a lot of share? The medical examiner down at headquarters says that man you try to save... Yeah, I remember. Our medical examiner says he was murdered. Oh? Huh? How come? Our man says it was murdered because artificial respiration wasn't applied properly. Well, your man is a smart man. But a four-bit-a-week lifeguard does the best he can. He studies in classes, he follows the first aid manual. <laughs> you call him a murderer because he didn't make out with one poor slob. You tell me, Russ. You murder the man? Well, considering the percentage of lives that are saved and not saved by such as we, that's a question you may never be able to answer. I'll come. I'll keep trying, Russ. You won't mind, huh? Danny, why don't you never turn on a light? You sit like this in the dark by yourself. It's... I got one of the Tartaglia kids at home does the same thing. You both make me feel the same way. And you've got your problems, haven't you, Gina? Yeah, I could do without them. You in the mood, Danny? Sure, for whatever. What have you got? Nothing. No progress on identification of the drowned man. No progress on a connection between him and that lifeguard, Russ Gaby. Reports on Gaby State, he is looked up to at the pool by girls and ladies-sized swimmers. Occasionally, he buys for one or the other a beer at the concession stand. Occasionally, escorts one or the other type to her home, deposits it, goes to the newsstand, buys super-type magazines, goes to his room. Healthy, normal muscle boy. Maybe a murderer, Gino. Oh, pardon me, Danny, but I must take a... Sergeant Artaglia speaking. Yes? Yeah, I got it. Hanson's Pawn Shop, East 34th. I told you I got it. <sighs> they bother us with such... Such what, you know? A man with a pawn shop got the nudges in the midst of a nice conversation because somebody who works in a pool hocked a suit of clothes. <laughs> Valuables. Look to this Mr. Hanson like stolen goods. On East 34th? Yeah. Then why bother yourself with it, Danny? Because maybe it'll give me the name of a murdered man. You might ask me why I called the police, Mr. Clover, after so many months of abstemiously staying away from you, fellas. All right, Mr. Hanson, why? Because there was something fishy about it this time. Mm -hmm. uh, this suit, this watch, ring, money clip was brought me by a boy who's an attendant at a public pool. Pool on Upper Broadway? Inevitably, that pool where that unidentified man was drowned, his things stolen. You read about it, of course. Who brought these to you? A boy. Know him well. I've had dealings with him intermittently. Who's the boy? Bobby Kent. He's got a room in one of those crates on East 37th, uh, uh, 1654, East 37th. Just ask for Bobby. We all know him. And you think these things belong to the drowned man? The man was robbed where Bobby works, died where Bobby works. Bobby pawns things that obviously don't belong to him. What is there left for a decent man to think, Mr. Clover? Then the three walk to the languid summer night, the city-bound and the dream-bound people on the sandstone steps who find their delights in a pop bottle, or by taking possession of a star in the sky, or by cooling themselves with a fan, courtesy of Swanson's chicken frequency. Past them and mind the kiddies at their nighttime play, the patter of little feet up an alley, and arrive at the address on 37th Street. And over one of the bells, see a name, Bobby Kent, apartment three. The sound you hear is the far-off thunder made of heat and air currents and stratosphere. And the lightning through the window at the end of the corridor lights up the number three on a door. Briefly. Then again.
Bobby? Bobby Kent? This is the police, Bobby. Open up. I'm coming in, Bobby. Bobby was in. His shirt was ripped, his face bloody, hands tied behind his back, belt around his neck, and the belt was strung over a pipe near the ceiling. I brought over a chair to stand on. There was lightning again, and the whole room was stark white for an instant. It took a while to get Bobby down, but it didn't matter. Bobby had been dead when I got there. Bobby had been murdered. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Broadway leans against a doorway, flips a coin, and makes odds on the 31 days of August. This month, kid, it'll come in. The filly in the third, the dreamboat. The oil on that little piece of property you leased in the Texas Badlands. Gotta come in. Otherwise, what have you been building, kid? Gotta come in. So you can indulge the whim of the hour. Enjoy it. Own it. All that neon. Yours to turn on or off. That music of the dance calling to you from basement dance lands. Yours to play soft or loud. Or cut off like that. Dance in dark and in stillness if you want. The traffic signals pushing back the people. Yours to make say stop, go... You're a king man with headlines at your feet. Boy murdered, hung by belt in tenement room. Unknown man drowned in public pool. All yours, kid. Clean shuffle, a minute of luck, and it's all yours. And the next morning at headquarters, consider your share of it. Yours and Detective Muggivans. You still stick with that, Danny, that the man in the pool was murdered? Yeah. You don't like it? Oh, it's not that, Danny. It's only so many people drowned, so many can't be saved. You're going to go back and call everyone that wasn't the murder victim? Russ Gavey is a trained lifeguard. He told me the man fought him, had to be pushed under. Happens that way sometimes, Danny. Could have been the other way around. Could have been Russ wanted the man dead. It could have been he fought the man, drowned him, finished him with his own brand of artificial respiration. Could have been. But where's the string that knots it, Danny? What connection that is That kid there? that was hung, Bobby Kent, the attendant at the pool. That could be a connection. Because you stole a man's clothes out of a crummy locker? We're not even sure they belong to the drowned man. What do we know about them, Muggerman? Well, from the cleaner's marks, they belong to a man named Howard Crawford. Married. I checked his wife. Should be at the morgue to identify in a half hour. Would have come sooner, wanted to go out and buy a dress first. I let her. I'll go down and meet her. You get whatever you can on Bobby Kent. Friends, people he stole from, whoever wanted him I'm dead. working on it. I put a tail on Gavey. Every breath he breathes, I want to report. Got it. Anything else, Danny? Yeah. Why does a woman need a new dress to look at a dead man? Well, I don't know. Ask her when you see her. Are you ready, Mrs. Crawford? Waiting for you. All right. Just look at this man and tell me if he's... Uh... Okay, okay. Put him back. He's mine. Can we get out of this place now? Of course. i through this door. You want to sit down on this bench for a minute? Or else, huh? Sure, I'll sit. What do you think of my husband, Mr. Clover? Can you imagine it? Howard getting himself a piece of marble in a police morgue. When did you see him last? I got out of a warm bed yesterday morning on account of the phone ringing. It was for Howard. He pinched my cheek, said, Goodbye, honey, I'm going out of town. This happen often, his going out of town? 
in his line, salesman. And you didn't see him after that? Look, boyfriend, I was in the middle of a beauty exercise, bendovers for the figure. I was grabbing my ankle, so I looked back. There he was, going out of the house. Doesn't it seem strange to you that he didn't go out of town, that he was fine? It's strange to me he's dead. But I'm going to get used to it. Who do you know had a reason for murdering him? Murder? Thought you said he drowned. Do you like to swim, Mrs. Croft? You see this sunburn? You think I got it standing under a hot iron? Look at it, see? How you like it? Did you get it at that swimming pool uptown? Coney. I know a part of Coney where they carry a pretty good crowd. That's where this burn came from. There's a lifeguard at that pool. I they... go to Coney where they carry a million on a weekend. I don't confine me to public pools uptown. Did you have anything to do with your husband's death, Mrs. Crawford? Now, I'm a girl who's going to tell you the truth, boyfriend. Every time I've thought of it, I've wished Howard dead every hour on the hour. I'd have wished him dead on a half hour or two, but that's when the race results come over the radio. Howard, things have come true. I've wished for him. That's all, Mrs. Crawford. You can get out of here now. Watch her reapply the lipstick and readjust her clothes. Walk away from her dead to a summer rhythm that no longer held any part of him. A woman starting the new day fresh. The memory she had submitted to now happily dead on a marble slab. And at the end of the corridor, the street sunlight touching her face for an instant, darting away, leaving only pallor and the smear of scarlet on her lips. Back in the office, order a shadow for Mrs. Crawford. Then a telephone report from Mugovan. He had found a girl who was the girlfriend of Bobby Kent, a box office girl at an all-day, all-night movie on East 125th. Lucille Lang, on duty for the rest of the day and night. How many? Police, Miss Lang. Take back your badge. It don't buy you nothing. You were a friend of Bobby Kent's. Look, you, you want to lose me my job? All we want, Miss Lang. All is... you want is to mark me lousy with the management. A sweaty cop snooping around where I live. I know, my girlfriend called me. Told me he had his nose in my affairs, asked questions. She had to tell him I was cozy with Bobby. All we want is something that'll give us Bobby's killer. Search me up and down, you won't find Bobby's killer. Then maybe someone who wanted him dead. All the kid ever did was steal a buck here and there. So he could make an impression on me. On my girlfriend. Boy has to die for that. He was a thief. Ain't everybody kiddo one way or another. To sweep out the locker room in a public pool. To empty the foot bath, scrub them out. You think that's the end of the rainbow for a kid? Did you know about the clothes he stole from the pool? The watch, the ring, the money clip? Sure, I know. He told me. I even know about the 500 bucks that was in the suit. 500? We were going to take it and go off to faraway places. Do you know something, kiddo? What? Bobby's dead from hanging, and I'm cooped up in a cage. So I ain't gonna make it, am I? Danny? Well, come on in, Margaret. What do you want? An opinion. About what? About how soon we should pick up Russ Gavey for the murder of Crawford and that pool attendant? If we pick him up, how long do you think we can hold him? A killer, Danny, he's... How are you going to prove premeditated murder by artificial respiration? Now, maybe we shouldn't start from there, Danny. Maybe we should start from the attendant. Now, he killed Bobby Kent because Bobby stole the clothes. Because Bobby would learn that the clothes belonged to Howard Crawford. Bobby was a sneak thief. From there to blackmail him, one easy lesson. So we get back to Howard Crawford. You know what we need, Mugovan. Yeah, motive. We gotta find out why. Danny! We got something, Gino? Officer Ratchie just called from a gas station on Queens Highway. Mrs. Crawford just rest registered at the Ritz Lodge Motel, about ten miles out of the city. Thanks, Gino. Mugovan. Yeah, Danny. That shadow you got on Russ gave you, get him off. I don't want him followed. All right. Where are you going? To find out why a widow wanders far from home. <laughs> Where do you see? 
Bought some new clothes. You'll like them. Oh. You'll like them too, lover. You like them? Is that your going away dress, Mrs. Crawford? It could be for that, too. You've got a home in Manhattan, Mrs. Crawford. What are you doing here? Where is your home, boyfriend, and what are you doing here? I wanted to talk to you. Well, me and my sunburn made an impression, huh? So you got a flunky to follow me. You could have done it yourself. No uproar would have happened. Well, here we are. You still haven't answered my question. What are you doing here? Girl likes to get away sometimes. You'd be surprised how many phone calls I've gotten since Howard drank all that water. Here's a dime. Throw it in the radio. No? Then I'll throw it a dime. Yep. Phone calls all day long. Now, it's your turn. Just to talk. Kill some time. Ah, oh, that Kenton. Yeah, oh, what'd you say, lover? Nothing. I didn't say anything. Look, be a doll. Will you go away? Come back another day. I'll be here. Let's pick a Tuesday. Make a definite, huh? Why don't you go right now? Out the back way, through a window? Just get up. Hi, Russ. Got a little trouble. Come in, Russ. Close the door. I'll bet the lady told you to get out of here, Mr. Clover. Uh-huh. You two know each other pretty well, don't you? Yeah, a swimming pool romance. I saw him in those California feet flippers and it twisted my heart. You two planning on going away together? I only ask because the back of Russ's car is loaded with suitcases. We're going to get married in Maryland. Is there a law? Yes, there is. There's a whole section in the penal code about murder. Yeah, back to that, huh? I could have picked you up before, Russ, but I needed a motive. I had to find out why you murdered Howard Crawford. There she is. How did I kill him? By drowning him. You made sure the resuscitator squad wouldn't revive him. You crushed out whatever life there was in him. Listen to him, Edith. Yeah, listen. You killed Bobby Kent. He was a petty thief. He took the clothes you'd stolen from Crawford. Sooner or later, he'd put two and two together. Probably would have blackmailed you. You couldn't afford to let that happen. You ready, Edith? I'm ready. Only one thing, Russ. What? I'm a happy girl, Russ. I like to live happy. From just now on, you're going to be a burden. As long as lover here's got you, I don't want you. Both of you. You're an accessory, Mrs. Crawford. Well, that changes things right away. Russ. Yeah. Don't be a fool. Okay, your way, Russ. You'll never be the same. You ready to go back to town, Mrs. Crawford? It's the time on Broadway when the crowd gives up, goes home. Then it's the street of the dim moonlight and the dark whispers. The wind of the night. The wind that scatters everything. Yesterday's headlines. Yesterday's dreams. Yesterday's people. It's Broadway. The gaudiest. The most violent. The lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum.
The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at the same time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. Program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. In tonight's cast, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Edith Crawford, High Averback as Russ Gaby, Stan Waxman as Mr. Hanson, and Michael Ann Barrett as Lucille Lang. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. It is now 45 seconds past 8 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. But remember, next week, Sunday afternoon at 5 o'clock, it will be... Time for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Man They All Loved. The Egyptian desert isn't the best place in the world for a man who likes to hunt. But once in a while, the fleet-footed gazelle makes things interesting. So a couple of friends and I decided to take the day off, drive up the Nile near Helwan, and try our luck. It was quite a way, so I was up about four in the morning. I was still half asleep as I went down the stairs from my quarters to the half-lighted cafe. The tambourine still reeked with oriental tobacco smoke from a few hours before. As I walked along the bar past the empty tables... I never felt so glad to get away from a place in my life. I was wondering what a little fresh air would smell like as I cut off the light by the front switch and threw open the latch on the door. When I opened up, I got some fresh air and a lot more. He plopped in with the door spread eagle, like a sack of overripe potatoes, and he didn't move. I bent over and got a quick look. First thing that struck me was his unusual dress. Frock coat, headdress, heavy shoes, all in black. Just then, another figure moved from the shadows outside. A little beggar named Samak I'd seen a few times wandering the native quarter. Hey, All right, nothing here for you, Samak. But what is it? Imshi, move along. A man drunk with a liquor. Nobody's rolling him, Samak. On your way. But why not, offend? Anyhow, you're wrong. This guy isn't drunk. He's dead. Hail white. He's true by the knife. So now it does not matter. I said cut it, Samak. Get out of this pocket. But offend Yeah, give me that watch. I was first to find it, not you. Let go. Give me that... Uh, Fenty, look, 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 there's the name in their wallet. Sure, it's an identification. Please let me see. All right, keep your hands off. <laughs> what about it? Hey, come back here! Samak was gone just that quick. I caught the look in his eyes, and it was fright that sent him scampering off into the dark. Something about the wallet. So I took a closer look. And the name meant everything. It was the name of a man I'd heard a lot about, but had never seen before. Jonathan Mello. Jonathan Mello. A man of unknown nationality, he'd become a missionary for the Coptic faith, an ancient branch of Christianity centered in old Cairo. Several years before, he had journeyed to the African interior to bring information to the native tribes. Since then, few outsiders had seen him. But ever so often, a word had come as good works and personal sacrifices. And his name had become almost a legend throughout the Middle East. Yes, Jonathan Mello was a man greatly loved and respected by everyone. And here he lay murdered at the door to my cafe. His name had meant something to Samak, too. And I figured the little beggar would soon be spreading the word around. So I got the body inside, latched the door. 
had another look at the wallet. It was empty except for a receipt from the Pyramid House in Cairo dated the day before. And I put in a hurry-up call to Captain Sam Sabaya at his home. Fifteen minutes later, Sam was in my terrain looking down at the lifeless form. So, this is the fabulous Jonathan Mellow. Yeah, it's what the identification says. Mm. That in his clothing leaves small doubt that he is the missionary. Do you know he was back in Cairo, Sam? It had not come to my attention, Jordan. He surely must have returned very recently. Looks like he should have stayed in the Sudan. Yes, it would have been better for all of us. Finding an enemy of such a man as this poses a very strange problem. Uh, you haven't much to go on. No. Jonathan Mellow was known to lead a most exemplary life. Maybe there's some things we don't know. True, Jordan. For example, why he should be found dead at your cafe. Oh, now, look, Sam. No, no, you... no, 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 Jordan. You have many accomplishments, but the skilled use of the knife such as this is not one of them. A lot of Coptics might not agree with you, Sam. It is not necessary that they learn of your connection with this, Jordan. No, oh, they'll find out. Leave that to Samak. Sure. Samak? A little beggar who came up a couple of seconds after I found Mello's body here. And the beggar knows who this man is? That's right. He got away fast when he found out. I see. You see where that puts me, Sam? Yes, I do, Jordan. Jonathan Mello's death will be a profound shock to his people. They will demand immediate justice. Yeah, after Samak gets the word around. I bet it doesn't take him long. Jordan, you say you were going hunting up the Nile. That's the way it started out. Let me suggest that you continue with your plans. Stay out of Cairo for a while. You're suggesting I run away? Only until this matter is cleared up. Well, supposing it isn't cleared up, Sam. If I leave Cairo now, I'll never get back. Do you not realize that it is for your own safety? Sure, but you don't know me better than that. Jordan, for once in your life, you must listen to me. It is my duty to protect you when it is possible, but I, I can offer no guarantees. No good, Sam. I'm staying right here. <sighs> Very well. But you have been warned. Sure, sure. Thanks. We will cut the body away secretly and trust that Samag does not spread the news. Well, Sam took the body, and along about ten o'clock, I opened up for business. That's when I knew Samak had been real busy. Not a single person came in that morning. And the tambourine was just as empty at two in the afternoon. Even the Muslims crossed to the other side as they passed which meant they sensed trouble and didn't want to be around. I got out of the streets and felt the unrest growing. When a knife sailed out from somewhere and almost parted my hair, I decided it was time to get busy. I remembered the receipt in Mello's wallet from the Pyramid House. It hadn't meant much, but it might put some light on Mello's activities since he'd returned to Cairo. So I made for the place over on Sharia Rangoon. The sign on the window puzzled me, but I went on in. I can help you, mister. Uh... Yeah, with some information. Sorry, I don't sell that. Did you ever see this receipt? Sure, Mike. I wrote it myself for a customer yesterday. Hey, wait a minute. Where did you get it? Uh, that's not important. Uh, what did he buy? Liquor. What else? It... Maybe I don't tell you. You sold that man liquor? What do you think I sell here? Elevator shoes? What kind of liquor? Champagne, scotch, bourbon, arak, gin. The very best. Fifty cases. What did the man look like? All in black. Headdress, frock coat, heavy shoes. Wait a minute. You don't tell me where you got that receipt, I don't tell you. Yeah, maybe you mixed up anyhow. You think I forget him? When I'm going to make him a special price for a big sale, but he pays me like that, all in cash for quick delivery? Delivery? Where to? His boat, the Delta Queen. Qu uh, War 4 it was. Don't you ask me. All uh, right, thanks, I won't. Yeah, sure. I claim up for guys like you, mister. I don't going to tell you nothing. <laughs> Uh, it didn't make a lick of sense, but there it was. Fifty cases of expensive liquor purchased by the circumspect Jonathan Mello. Well, that little receipt had set up a chain reaction that couldn't stop here, so I went on to the next link, located at Wharf 4 on the Nile. And the Delta Queen was some job. A sumptuous yacht that could have played stand-in for the Queen Mary. Brand new, with lots of shiny brass from stem to stern. Looked like our lowly missionary had been spending potatoes on a lot of things. There was nobody on deck, so I wandered down below. A passageway led to a big lounge, complete with a big bar. There were some cigarettes on a side table, American brand, so I took one. I reached for a match, but I didn't need it. And I saw her walking toward me, the flame of the cigarette lighter glowing on her face, green eyes, tawny blonde hair, and round shoulders. The perfect piece of equipment to make a layout like this complete. I accepted the light. Thanks. 
Not at all. Was I expecting you? No, uh, I'm an intruder. Suppose I start screaming. Uh, suit yourself, lady. I'm a little out of practice. Well, how do you like it? Mm. Everything's real ship shape. The boat? Yeah, it's nice, too. All the comforts of life, huh? Almost. But I like to keep looking around, meet new people. Yeah. yeah your deal here looks good to me. Uh, who comes with it? Bourbon? Sure. The expensive kind. Our tastes are alike, aren't they? Maybe we have a lot in common. Oh, yeah, money, boats. I like Americans, too. I've been trying to remember. They throw them like you in St. Louis or Chicago. Yeah, you're right the first time. My name's Rocky. I'm Kareem. Here you are, Rocky. Thanks again, Kareem. Why don't we sit down? Over here. Uh, maybe I ought to check the passenger list first. We're alone, Rocky. For a while. Okay. Now, uh, why don't you ask me why I came here? Is that important? Oh, makes good conversation. Wouldn't you rather just... Yeah. You get on the sail fast, don't you? We like boats, remember? So does your boyfriend. Do we have to talk about him? Yeah. Tell me about Jonathan Mello. Don't you know about him? Only that he's passed up just about everything most men want for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all this is quite a switch. He's been a good man. He's helped a lot of people. Now he deserves the good things in life. Yeah, he hasn't missed a trick. Where does it go from here? We're getting out of Africa. From now on, we're going where the bright lights are. See the world. Why don't you come along? Just the uh, three of us? There'll be lots of people around. It would be easy. How about it, Rocky? Corrine, you know where Jonathan Mello is right now? He's settling some business. What kind of business? Oh, I don't know. It's with a Prescott exporting company, Jared Prescott. Jonathan says as soon as that's settled, we're leaving. Well, happy sailing, Corrine. Rocky, you could wait for him here. No, thanks. Why? Because I don't like things that don't make sense. And none of this does. The liquor, the yacht, you, and especially... What, Rocky? That's something you got to find out for yourself, Corrine. I don't want to be around when you do. There was no place to go now but to the Prescott Exporting Company. It had a big layout of offices just off one of the Moose Keeper's R's. I liked the taboo the girl at the desk was wearing, but I didn't like cool my heels. So the next time she went out for a drink, I opened Prescott's door and went on in. He was on the phone. He was a big guy with a crew haircut and smoked a fat cigar. The ashes falling in his white vest as he talked. Surely a man like Jonathan Mello can be found in Cairo. You'll find him, that's all. Maybe I can help you, Prescott. Who are you? My name's Jordan. Jordan? Jordan. Let's see here. I don't recall an appointment with you. You can get one now, if you don't mind. But I do mind. What do you mean, barging in here like this, Jordan? It came about the big deal. What deal? Get to the point. With Mello. Jonathan Mello. I understand he wants it consummated in a hurry. Why isn't he here? I had an appointment with him three hours ago. Have you seen him? Yeah. Saw him early this morning. It's not doing me any good. Mr. Prescott... Has it occurred to you that Jonathan Mello won't be here at all? That's ridiculous. Look, Jordan, I don't know what he's trying to pull on me, but you tell him ivory or no ivory. If he doesn't show up here before hey, the... Wait a minute. Ivory, did you say? Certainly I did. That's not beat around the bush, Jordan. And, by the way, what have you got to do with it? Maybe there isn't any ivory. Look, I'm nobody's fool. Why do you think I sent a safari to the interior myself to check on it? My mistake. Jonathan Mello discovered the hoard of ivory himself. He has a right to sell, and I'm ready to buy. For how much? Fifty, hundred thousand dollars? We deal in Egyptian pounds here, Jordan. Besides, nobody's going to top the price. Mello knows that. Just how much do you know about Mello, Mr. Prescott? That's beside the point. Everyone knows about him. Yeah, I thought I did, too. A lowly missionary with a lot of high ideals. And get the picture now. Expensive liquor, a yacht, and a slick girlfriend to go with it. How he spends the money is none of my affair. But his own people will be interested. You know anything about the Coptics? I'm a businessman, Jordan. I'm not interested in Coptics or anything else except a perfectly legitimate deal. Okay, we'll leave it that way. Jordan, I don't know who you are or what you want, but you tell Mr. Mello I won't wait much longer. Either he shows up today or the whole deal is off. Sure, I'll tell him. Next time I see him. <laughs> Oh, 
I had everything from Prescott but the answer to the jackpot question. Who killed Jonathan Mello and why? Well, I figured the ivory hoard he had uncovered somewhere in Africa had something to do with it. That's why I was scouting for a payphone to bring Sam Sabai up to date. I avoided the bazaar and had walked maybe a couple of blocks when I spotted a character hugging the shadows not so far back and staying on my tail. I stepped it up, figuring to double back in him, when all at once he was in the center of the street and yelling. It was Samak, the little beggar who found me with Mello's body that morning. That's when I climbed with a sprint record. I left a lot of natives far behind, but Samak had his robe up around his knees and kept coming. Samak was lagging too by then. I slowed to catch my breath when I saw another native running from the other direction right at me. Right then I picked an alley. It was the wrong one. Not more than 30 paces ahead, it came to a dead end with nothing but high walls between me and the man running in. He had a knife like nothing I'd ever seen. A great curb-bladed scimitar, a yard long. I waited with my back to the wall as he came in for the kill. You are listening to The Man They All Loved, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Here is a special announcement for all you Rocky Jordan fans. Starting next Sunday, Rocky Jordan will come to you at a new time, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Make a note of it so you can remember to tune us in next Sunday. The new time for Rocky Jordan is 5 Pacific Standard Time. Now we return you to Cairo and Rocky Jordan for tonight's adventure, The Man They All Loved. Imagine a man with his back to the wall at the end of a dirty blind alley in Cairo, facing a character with blood-red eyes coming at him waving a huge curb-bladed scimitar. Well, that's me. Not the one with the knife, but the one backed against the wall. And the guy kept coming with Samak the beggar somewhere behind. Oh, help, Jordan, by the scimitar, you die! In a split second it took him to reach me, I thought of a million moves, but none of them worked. I knew one swing of that blade and I was finished. My eyes were on the raised scimitar, so I didn't see a third figure into the alley. But all at once he was there. A tall, dark-skinned man who had my assailant by both arms from behind, and the knife never came down. I had the feeling he could have crumpled the guy in his powerful hands, but he only slammed him back and rolling. Little Samak was already gone, and his chum got up running. Another time, Jordan, we'll make a day! And I was alone with the man who had saved my life. His intelligent eyes watched me as I got my breath. Well, we... Maybe we better shake hands. I'm most honored, Mr. Jordan. Oh, Abyssinian, aren't you? Yes. I am Jethro, an Abyssinian and a Coptic. Then maybe you don't know why they're after me? The beggar Samak tells everyone that he found you early this morning by the body of Jonathan Mello. Well, I, I still don't get it, but thanks. I've helped you, Mr. Jordan. Now you help me. You think I can help you? We both share certain interests in this affair, do we not? Yeah. Maybe you've been finding out some things about your missionary you didn't know before. Maybe he's not such a big man. Mr. Jordan, no one grieves more for the death of Jonathan Mello than do I. How well did you know him, Jethro? He was my greatest friend. To him I owe everything. He taught me kindness and understanding. It was he who provided the funds for all my education. Yeah, I used to hear things like that about him. It was his wish that with my training and education I would go back to the tribes and bring enlightenment to my people. Do you mind if I ask you something, Jethro? Not at all, Mr. Jordan. When did you see him last? Not for a long time. When he first brought me and my family to Cairo. Were you expecting him back? Yes. Let me explain that my father and I have a small construction business here. About a month ago, we received a letter from Jonathan Mello, who was then in the Sudan. It stated that he would soon be in possession of a great deal of money with which he wanted my father and I to construct schools and other installations for the tribes of Sudan. He was to arrive here a few days ago. But you never saw him? The next I heard was the news of his death. I wish to know why he died and why he did not contact us upon his arrival. Well, I can't answer the first one, but you'll find the second answer down on the Nile. 
I do not understand. It's all his. Brand new. And loaded with all the provisions for a big joyride around the world. Looks like all that money turned his head a little. Mr. Jordan, have you said that you will help me? Of course, anything. I wish to see Jonathan Mello's remains, if you can arrange it. Right away, Jethro. Let's go. A handsome young Abyssinian stayed with me, and I finally got to a phone and talked to Sam Sabaya. I briefed him real quick and then asked him about viewing the missionary's body. He said to come on down, and in another 20 minutes, Sam was leading Jethro and me down some steps at headquarters that led to the morgue. This way, gentlemen. Uh, right behind you, Sam. I had the remains moved to a room off the main hall. You will understand why. Oh, sure. Every precaution was taken to conceal his identity, Jordan. However, many people already know of Jonathan Mello's death. Yeah, I found that out. You would still do well to take my advice and hide out for a time. No, not interested, Sam. In here. Is this the one? It is. Yeah. Three stab wounds. Any one would have brought instant death. Somebody sure wanted him out of the way. Indeed. Will that be all, Jethro? Jethro only nodded his head, moved silently out. He had nothing to say to Sam, so he left headquarters. We were soon walking away down the Sharia Nagoon. The desert twilight had given way to sudden dark, and a dim street lamp every four or five blocks didn't help much. In spite of my being with him, he seemed alone and lost. It was hard to know what to say. Uh, tough, was it, Jim? Yes, but not a surprise, Mr. Jordan. How do you mean? That was not Jonathan Mello. But... Say that again. The man lying in the morgue is not Jonathan Mello. Are you sure? I knew him too well to be mistaken. And if it's not Mello, who is it? I can tell you that too, Mr. Jordan. His name is Matson, a hunter whom I saw often before coming to Cairo. A man who would not hesitate to kill. Did he know Jonathan Mello? He did. Their paths crossed often in the Sudan. Why would he want to switch identity with your missionary? That is quite obvious, is it not, Mr. Jordan? And now I can be certain that the real Jonathan Mello is dead. At the moment, that is all that matters. Look, Jethro, uh, how about coming back to the tambourine with me? No. No, Mr. Jordan. I wish to think on this alone. We parted there, and I headed back for the tambourine. It occurred to me that I hadn't eaten since four that morning, but something else interested me more. There wasn't much question why the disappearance of Jonathan Mello... But that didn't explain the killing of his imposter, the Hunter Matson. Well, I got back to the cafe and good old Chris, my bartender, was real busy swatting flies. The tambourine had just one customer. Rocky. Well, you got better liquor on your yacht, Corrine. Rocky, I've got to talk to you alone. Okay, I'll go into my office. Yeah? Rocky, where is he? Where's Jonathan? You asking or telling me? I don't know. He was to come back. I've got to see him. You'll never see Jonathan Mello, Corrine. Fact of it is, I don't think you ever did. I don't understand you. Then sit down and get it once through. Tell me, Rocky, what are you driving at? Jonathan Mello was never anything but a good missionary. But in his travels, he happened onto a fabulous hoard of ivory. Worth enough to build a lot of schools and hospitals. I know that. Ah, wait a minute. Before he could do anything about it, a hunter named Matson found out the whereabouts of the ivory. He killed the missionary, assumed his identity, and came to Cairo to sell the ivory and use the money in his own way. Oh, that's impossible. Oh, no, it isn't. Mello had been gone a long time. Few people would recognize him. You, for instance. His name made no difference to me. No, no. Only the money. What about Matson? He's dead. How do you know? Because I found him that way at the door of my cafe. Me and Samak. Who's he? I'm beginning to wonder. Maybe it wasn't a coincidence Samak showing up when he did. I figure he was working for someone. He made quick work of spreading word that I'd done the killing. Then you're in trouble, Ricky. A lot of Coptics don't like me. Rocky, listen, the yacht, it's ready to go. We can get away if we hurry. You make a quick switch, don't you, lady? You know how I feel about you, Rocky. I think you feel the same way. It'd be wonderful, you and I. We've been all over that. Look at me, Rocky. Hurry, get back. Ah, the English, you drive me still afraid. He knows his time is short. He cannot escape the Coptic revenge. The brave Mr. Jordan. 
the beggar Samak was back in the job. I forgot all about Corrine right then and went through the broken window. Samak was already scrambling away and running hard. He kept to the alleys, always a few steps ahead of me. As he entered a dark passageway with buildings on either side that almost touched at the top, I realized he knew where he was going. I had to catch him quick. I was almost on him when suddenly there was another shadow and a flash of the scimitar. I ducked back in time as I did my feet to on My hands made a grab. I came up with a piece of iron pipe. That was all. Against the biggest knife I ever saw. This time, Samak's buddy was at it for keeps. He swung the huge blade with both hands. I parried the first one. Then the next one. Third time I was lucky, and now he was swinging wild. I followed the blade, ducked it, and came around with the iron pipe flat against his face. The scimitar landed 20 feet away. He piled up at my feet. I looked around for Samak, but he was gone. You're not through yet, George. The light from the room inside hit me as the door opened. He took one step into the alley, a cigar in one hand and a gun in the other. You're right on time, Jordan. I didn't have an appointment, Prescott. Yes, you did. Drop what you have there. Samak led me to the right place, did he? He carried out his assignment very well. Only his pal with the scimitar bungled the job again. As a businessman, I should have known. When I want something done right... I have to do it myself. Yeah. Now, who gets all the ivory? Just you? That is my plan. You put on a great act for me back in your office. You knew Jonathan Mello and Matson were dead all the time. But I'm wondering how you know about the ivory hoard. When a man has ivory to sell, who else should he write to but a reputable dealer like myself? Sure. When you got Mello's letter, you had Matson out to locate the stuff, got rid of Mello, and came back in his place. All I had to do was get rid of Matson, and the road was clear. Except for you. I'm next. Sometime tomorrow morning, they'll find you here. The victim of the Coptic's attrition. Come closer, Jordan. You see, I'm a very thorough man. I don't intend to miss. The shots echoed back and forth from the sandstone walls, and I wondered why I heard. Prescott hadn't moved. Then I saw the two spots in his white vest. The gun suddenly dropped from his hand. He pivoted slowly and fell back down into the dirt of the alley. You all right, Mr. Jordan? Yes. Thanks to you, Jethro. Well, this is the second time today. It will not be necessary again. No. Samark's still loose, but nobody to work for. The police will find him soon enough. You know, I'm wondering something, Jethro. Yes? Why did you do this? Just to get Prescott or to save me? How can I say, Mr. Jordan? I only know that now the way is clear for the great work Jonathan Mello wanted done. I'm happy for that. You can be happy for a lot of things. No. You see, he taught me the ways of peace, not violence. Tonight I've killed a man. I think Mello would understand. Yes, he would understand. That is why we all loved him so much. It's CBS at a new time next week, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles in the title role, is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Remember the new time next week for Rocky Jordan, 5 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. 
The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. The ideal private detective, and of course we mean Mike Shane, is a fearful and wonderful combination. He has the courage of a movie hero, the all-knowing knowledge of a radio commentator, and the persistence of a bill collector. Right now, Mike and his lovely associate, Phyllis Knight, are developing another quality, the bedside manner of a doctor. The object of their attention is a very indignant young lady seated in Mike's office. And I want this man investigated, Mr. Shane. I want him prosecuted. Well... He can't call me a thief and get away with yes, it. Yes, yes, Miss Agnew, but you see... If anyone's a thief, he is. He's unscrupulous, he's domineering, he's... Well, all that may be, Miss Agnew, but don't you think that no you actually... No one can work for the man. He's suspicious. He's a bully. He's a crook. And besides, he's crazy. Yes, sure, but Miss Agnew, I don't think you'll need a detective. Now, perhaps if you went to see some attorney, he... <sighs> Excuse me, please. Hello? Long distance, I have a person-to-person call from Claremont for Mr. Michael Shane. This is Mr. Shane speaking. Thank you. Here's your party, sir. Please signal when you're through talking. Hello? Hello, Mr. Shane? Yes? Who's this? My name is Pringle, Mr. Shane. William J. Pringle. Yes? I'm calling you because I want a private detective to shadow me for the next few days. A detective to shadow you? Say, what is this, a gag? I'm afraid of a certain man that's going to be murdered, that I'm going to be blamed for it. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've just had a fight with this man. His name is G.W. Highland. Yes? I said I'd kill him myself if somebody else didn't beat me to it. He's got a half a dozen people who'd be glad to murder him. In fact, I heard another man threatened him today. And you want me to shadow you so I can prove your whereabouts in case this man is killed? That's right. I'm at my home in Claremont now, but I'll be glad to come across the bay. All right, sir. Look, can you make it at, uh, say, 2 o'clock? I'll be there. Goodbye, Mr. Shane. What were you talking about, Mike, in case the man gets killed? I'll tell you later, Angel. Huh? Now, now to get back to your problem, Miss Agnew, you say you work in an experimental laboratory and that your employer accuses you of stealing a chemical formula. Yes. He says I smuggled it to a competitor, an inventor named Burton Gordon Feldman. I'm positive it's the other way around. Mr. Feldman came storming into the office this morning and said Highland had stolen uh, the formula from him. He said uh, that he... Just a minute, please. What was your employer's name again? Highland. G.W. Highland? Yes. Phil, huh? that's what the phone call was about. A man named Pringle told me he just threatened Mr. Highland's life. Well, of all... Are you sure it's the same G.W. Highland? Of course it is. I was in the middle of the whole fight. Pringle was arguing with Highland about one matter. Feldman was accusing Highland of thievery, and Highland was calling me a spy and tool for Feldman. Mm. Do you think Mr. Pringle and Mr. Feldman were justified? Certainly. All of us were. Feldman said that he'd bash Highland's head in if he used that formula. And I told Highland I was going to sue him. I was going to hire Mr. Shane to clear me of the whole nasty mess. Well, I'm not sure how much I can do about it, Miss Agnew. Uh, what's, uh, what's this man Highland's telephone number? Dawson 87421. His uh, plant is down by the Bay Bridge Terminal. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'd like to talk to him. If he's conducting business, as you say he is, uh, he'll have half of San Francisco gunning for him. Hmm. Hello? Hello, Mr. Highland? No, I'm afraid you can't talk to Mr. Highland. Well, this is very important. Tell him Mr. Shane is calling. I'm afraid I can't, sir. I'm afraid Mr. Highland is dead. In fact, he's been murdered. Hello, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight. Hi, Sergeant. Well, looks like the inspector beat you here this time. Now, wait a minute. Don't go Chamber of Commerce on us, Sergeant. After all, we sort of telephoned for the inspector. I know, I know. He's inside the plant. I'll open the door for you. All right, please. Good night, an iron door. What is this, the state armory or a prison? That's the way it was run. Like a prison. 
iron doors, barred windows, burglar alarms in every room to guard Highland's precious secrets. <laughs> Listen to those 4011 different sounds, Mike. What does yeah. this plant manufacture? Oh, mostly experimental stuff. Plastic chemistry, metabolic research, new dye formulas. Oh. Angel, there's the inspector looking out that doorway. Inspector! Well, kids, I guess there's no doubt about this case. It's murder in capital letters. Oh, Inspector. Where's the body? In the next room, Phil. And the young lady with you? Jane Agnew. I was Mr. Highland's assistant. Yes, she came to see me about her boss, Inspector. I'll tell you about it later. Okay, Mike. Now, you want to see the body? Yes, of course. He was killed in this next office, if that's what you'd call the place. It's crammed with gadgets and gauges and stuff. Uh-huh. I see. Fell face downward. Yeah, the bullet hit him in the heart. It fell through his body and punctured that metal tank up on the wall. Yeah, uh-huh. Drilled a hole right through the tank. What's that? That dark blue liquid dripping all over the floor? That's Highland's secret dye formula. The formula he accused me of stealing for Mr. Feldman. I've made a brief examination of the body. Highland carried a revolver and a shoulder holster. Gun was still in it. Well, that means the murderer took him by surprise. Yeah, I figured that, Mike. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Mr. Waters, will you come in here, please? Yes. This is the man who found the body. Oh, oh Mr. Waters, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight. How do you do? I guess you know Miss Agnew. Oh, yes. You're the Mr. Shane who phoned Mr. Highland right after I discovered his body. Yeah, that's right. Uh, did you, uh, did you hear the shooting? No. I was out in the blending room where we control our dye manufacturer. You see that feeder pipe running from the formula tank on the wall? Hmm? Yes. Yes? Well, it runs out to the blending room. I was watching my time and pressure graph on the feeder pipe. Suddenly, the pressure began to drop. I came back here to the office to see what was wrong with the tank. Uh-huh. And uh, how long was that before I telephoned? Oh, I would say less than a minute. Of course, I don't know how long before that Mr. Highland died. Well, as I recall, it was about ten minutes past noon when I tried to telephone him. But that doesn't tell us the time of death either. Mike? Yeah? Mike, I think you better get hold of your client over in Claremont. Huh? Mr. Pringle? Mm-hmm. I just found this slip of paper on the floor by the wastebasket. It looks like Highland's dying message. It says, Pringle killed me. And it's signed, Highland. <laughs> The inventor and manufacturer, G.W. Highland, lies dead on the floor of his laboratory, surrounded by his own strange inventions and machinery. In the same laboratory, Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector have discovered a scrawled message that points directly to the murderer. Pringle, kill me. Signed, Highland. Hmm. I'd like to hear Mr. Pringle's explanation of this note. Well, maybe we'll have it in a few minutes. I phoned Claremont. Pringle said he'd come right over. You didn't tell him why we wanted to see him, did you, Mike? Oh, no, no. I wish Miss Agnew and Mr. Waters could decide if the note is in Highland's handwriting. Well, I can't tell, Miss Knight. It's written in such a scrawl. Mm -hmm. Mr. Waters, have you ever seen him write like that? No, but Highland never wrote in death agony either. Well, maybe we can get somewhere by comparing it with samples of Highland's normal writing. There should be some letters in his desk. Inspector? Yeah? You say you found a gun on Highland? Yeah, and a shoulder holster. Then what's this doing in the desk drawer? What? Another gun. A forty-five. Apparently hasn't been fired. Everything clean and proper. Well, that must be another one of his guns. Highland insisted that everybody in the plant carry a revolver with him, whether man or woman. Oh, oh, I see. I was wondering why Mr. Waters had a revolver strapped to his waist. Do you have a list of all the guns issued to the employees? Oh, yes. As I remember, Highland kept it in the desk. Yes, I've just found it. Uh, Inspector. Yeah. What's the serial number on that gun? Let's see. 207 39 724. 207 39 724. That's odd. It's not here on the list. I think it'd be a good idea to check all the guns in the plant. Mr. Waters, may I see your revolver, please? Oh, of course. The last time I fired it was at target practice two weeks ago. Uh -huh. Oh, Highland wanted you all to be handy with guns, huh? Uh huh. Fully loaded and clean. Now, your gun, Miss Agnew. Well, I'll have to get it from my desk. Highland asked me to carry my gun with me, but I never did. 
What? Why, it's gone. Huh? My gun's gone. You sure? When did you see it last? Well, I... I don't know. A, a couple of days ago, maybe. You have no idea where it is? No, none. Somebody must have taken it. Miss Agnew, you gave Miss Knight and me a sketchy account of the quarrel with Mr. Hyland this morning. Would you mind repeating it for the inspector? Well, I don't know everything that took place. I... I was upstairs getting some data on the new process. When I got back to the office, I heard Mr. Pringle's voice. He was shouting that he would kill Hyland if he didn't do something. If he didn't do what? I never found out. Mr. Feldman was waiting outside to see Hyland. He walked in right behind me and started calling Hyland a thief. That he'd stolen Feldman's own secret dye formula. Hyland said it was a lie. He said the truth was that Feldman had stolen the formula from him. And that Jane was Feldman's go-between. You heard all this, Mr. Waters? That part of it. Mr. Feldman was pounding the desk and shouting that he would batter Hyland's head in. What is Mr. Feldman's full name? Burton Gordon Feldman. Thank you. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Get hold of Mr. Feldman and ask him to come down here at once. Yes, sir. I will. Miss Agnew, why did Mr. Hyland accuse you of stealing the formula for Mr. Feldman? Well, he was in a spot. He was passing the buck. He was accusing me because Mr. Feldman had accused him. Excuse me, Mr. Shane. Yes? Is so Mr. Pringle here to see you? Oh, yes, yes. We'll be right out. On second thought, Mike, let's not tell Pringle about Highland's note. Okay, Inspector. Mr. Pringle? I'm Mr. Shane. Oh, yes. Mr. Shane, something strange has happened. Right after I phoned your office, I discovered my revolver was missing from my desk. Huh? I got to worrying that... Your revolver was... missing? Do you uh, have its serial number? Yes. Yes, I wrote it down on this paper here. I want to report it to the police and... Look at to... this serial number, Inspector. Mm. 207-39-724. It's the same number. Mr. Pringle, your gun is in Highland's desk. What? Yes, Mr. Pringle. Step inside and we'll uh, show you something else. Highland. Good heavens. Why, this is terrible. And I threatened to kill him not two hours ago. Mr. Pringle, what was your car quarrel with Highland about? Well, you, you, you see, I'm a contracting engineer. I asked Highland to build me a new experimental turbine. He promised it in 90 days. Mm -hmm. On that promise, I signed a contract with a big customer of mine. And Mr. Highland didn't live up to your contract? No. And it means that I lose $50,000. You blame me for wanting to kill him? Mr. Pringle, we've been wondering why both you and Miss Agnew happened to choose the same private detective for your problems. Well, Miss Agnew and Highland were having a terrific fight. I heard her say that she was going to hire Mr. Shane and put Mr. Highland behind bars. I thought it would be a good idea to have the same detective. Mr. Pringle, about what time did you leave Highland's office? Well, uh, I went directly from here to the Bay Bridge Terminal and there caught the 1120 train for Claremont. I must have left here about uh, 11.15. And you phoned me from your home in Claremont a few minutes past noon. Was Highland alone when you left, Mr. Pringle? No. Miss Agnew and Mr. Waters were with him and a Mr. Feldman. Uh-huh. When did you leave, Miss Agnew? Well, I would say about 11.40. I went right up to see Mr. Shane and you. And when did Mr. Feldman leave? Just a few minutes later. I was the last one to leave the office. I would say about 12 noon. In other words, Highland was alive at 12 noon and dead at 10 minutes past noon when I tried to telephone him here at the office. Inspector? Yes, Sergeant? I just talked to Mr. Feldman on the phone. Good. Is he on his way down? No, sir. He's at his home. He said he couldn't be bothered. And that if Highland was murdered, it was a darn good thing. And if you want to talk to him, you can come out to his house. Couldn't be bothered. Stubborn, eh? Okay, Sergeant, take a couple of the boys and bring him down here. Uh, look, I got a better idea, Inspector. Yeah? If he's stubborn, we'll get more information by going to him. In fact, that, that uh, may really bother him. You're right, Mike. Sergeant, take over here. The car will be along any minute. Meanwhile, we're going to bother Mr. Feldman at his home. <laughs> That's correct, sir. I told your police sergeant that I would not budge out of my house for Mr. G.W. Highland, alive or dead. I see. Well, we won't comment on the attitude you take, Mr. Feldman. 
But it's that sort of non-cooperation which forces us to question some witnesses at police headquarters. I thought you weren't going to comment. Mr. Feldman, we understand you had a conversation, uh, a quarrel with Mr. Hyland this morning. I did. Otherwise, you would not be here playing cat and mouse with me. Uh, we came, Mr. Feldman, because we learned that you had threatened to kill Mr. Hyland. If you wish my exact words, madam, I said I would bash his head in. I gave Highland 24 hours to return my special dye formula and to stop its production. Are you certain that Mr. Highland pirated the formula from you? Positive. The man is a direct descendant of Captain Kidd. Besides, I verified the fact by a little theft of my own. Would you mind explaining? As I was leaving his plant, I stole a test tube of the formula. I've just analyzed it. It's identical to my own product, which I'm about to place on the market. Mm -hmm. Do you know how and when Highland stole it from you? No, no, I've been trying to find out. Highland accused his own assistant of being my go-between. I'm sure he got that idea when he saw Miss Agnew and myself eating dinner together last week. Oh, you knew uh, Miss Agnew socially? She is a very capable research woman, a Ph.D. I was and I am trying to persuade her to join my own staff. And that was the purpose of your dinner? The only purpose, Inspector. Mr. Feldman, do you remember about what time you left Highland's office? Yes, it was about uh, 11.45. When I reached my apartment here, the chimes of Grace Cathedral were ringing the noon hour. 11.45. That's right. Uh One final question, Mr. Feldman. Do you own a revolver? No. And if I did, I certainly would not use my own gun to kill Highland. Bullets can be traced. You're right, Mr. Feldman. Bullets can be traced. And that's exactly what we hope to do. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. I suggest we go to headquarters right now and see what ballistics have found out. I've got the report, kids. Ballistics say the bullet that went through Highland's heart and punctured the chemical tank was a forty-five caliber. Oh, fine, fine. The list of guns issued to Highland's employees were all forty-fives, And Mr. Pringle's, too? Yes, and even if we find the right gun, we won't know who fired it. Inspector? Yeah? Coroner just phoned about the Highland case. Says the man died between 11.50 and 12.05. I see. Okay, thanks. Well, that doesn't help us too much. You know, kids, I've got an idea how we can tell when Highland died. You have? How? You remember Fred Waters said that he discovered the body after he noticed something was wrong with the the flow from that uh, tank in Highland's office? Yeah, sure, but I don't see what that... Well, Waters said that he saw the change recorded on the time and pressure gauge out in the blending room. Don't you get it? Yes. Yes, Phyllis, my angel. (laughs) Ha-ha! You're not only beautiful, you're downright brilliant, Doc. Oh, gee, thanks. Inspector, <laughs> Inspector, let's yeah. head back to the plant and perform a little experiment. A very important experiment. I'll be glad to do it, Mr. Shane. But the minute we fill this tank up with the dye formula will drip right out through the bullet hole. That's precisely the point, Mr. Waters. Yes, uh, start pouring the buckets into the tank, please. Uh, Let's see. The graph in the blending room shows how much fluid was in the tank at 11.30. Uh We know the time when the tank drained dry. Now, all we have to do is fill it up to that level, then clock how long it takes to drain through the bullet hole and the feeder pipe. Yeah, and then we can compute the exact minute that the bullet punctured the tank. And the exact minute that Highland was killed. The tank's ready, Mr. Shane. laboratory of the murdered inventor, a secret formula slowly drips from the bullet hole in a metal tank 
Watching tensely are Mike, Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector. Well, I guess that's it. The tank is completely drained. Mm -hmm. According to my watch, it took 11 minutes. Mr. Waters, what was the exact time that the flow stopped out in the blending room? Well, the time and pressure graph on the feeder pipe read 17 minutes past noon. 12.17. The tank drained through the bullet hole in 11 minutes. 11 subtracted from 12.17 makes 12.06. Then at 12.06, the bullet punctured the tank. At 12.06, the same bullet went through Highland's heart. Inspector? Yes, Sergeant. I have Mr. Feldman here. I told you, people, I wouldn't be bothered about Highland. This policeman came to my house. Yes, I sent him, Mr. Feldman. I wanted you here. I'm sorry if it's inconvenient, but we are trying to solve a murder. Mr. Feldman, what time did you say you left uh, Highland's office? I told you very clearly and distinctly, about 11.45. And what time did you leave, Mr. Pringle? Around 11.15. I took the 11.20 train for Claremont. And you, Miss Agnew? About 11.40. Mr. Waters? Around 11.50. No, that isn't what you told us before, Mr. Waters. You said you left this office at noon. That was just my guess. Since then, I checked my production chart in the blending room. I find I wrote an entry in it at 11.55. And apparently all of you were out of the office long before 12.06, when Highland was murdered. Yes, absolutely. Of course. Of course we were. The sergeant has checked on everybody else in the plant. He's examined all their guns. You know, there's one last possibility, Inspector. Somebody yeah. might have stood outside in the alley and fired a gun through that open window. I'm not sure it could be done, Phil. Okay, let's find out. Let's go outside of the alley. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose somebody could fire a gun through this window. If he was standing on a step ladder or somebody's shoulders. The window is at least ten feet from the ground. From down here in the alley, all a man could fire at would be the office ceiling. Oh, it's got me stumped, kids. We have four suspects. We find a note. We kids! Ca- what? Oh, kids, I've been the prize dope. A complete blue ribbon dope. What are you talking about? Inspector, you couldn't solve this case. Phil, you couldn't solve it. The police couldn't solve it. I'm the only person who had the answer, and I didn't even know. Well, for Pete's sake, give it to us. I will, Inspector. I will, just as soon as we get back inside that laboratory. Mr. Shane, if you've got the solution to this murder, I wish you'd tell us. I'd like to go home. Just stands there at the window looking out into thin air. I'm waiting for something, gentlemen. Oh, by the way, Mr. Feldman... You say you were home at your apartment at uh, 12.06. I believe I told you that, sir. And, Miss Agnew, you were in our office talking to Miss Knight and myself. Certainly, you know I was. And I was in the blending room checking my gauges and masters. And Mr. Pringle was at his home in Claremont. That's right. Uh, where about in Claremont do you live, Mr. Pringle? Why, on the hill above the hotel. Oh? Do the key system trains ever keep you awake at night? Key system trains? Yes. There isn't even a streetcar line within ten blocks of my house. Inspector, do you yeah. see what's coming down the ramp from the Bay Bridge right now? Sure, one of the key system trains is going into the terminal. Listen to it. Well, what about it? We've heard at least 20 trains on the bridge today. Yeah. Yes, Angel, but the first time I heard a key system train was on the telephone. When Mr. Pringle called me at the office... What are you talking about? You did not telephone me from Claremont, Mr. Pringle. You telephoned me from this laboratory or somewhere within the sound of the train. You called me at uh, 12.08, about two minutes after you had killed Highland. Mr. Shane, I telephoned you long distance. Yes, that's what I thought. I thought the... I heard the operator say it was a person-to-person call from Claremont. Of course. Ah, yes, there's probably an explanation. The fact remains that I did hear behind your phone conversation the distinct sound of a train coming off the Bay Bridge. I didn't recognize the sound until five minutes ago. Then Highland did write that note. With his last dying effort, he named the murderer. Then that note was a fake, a frame-up. Why, it was clear across the bay. Shane admits he heard the telephone operator. Yes, but I... Hello? Who? Oh, just a minute. For you, Mike. Long distance from New York. New York? Who could be calling me from New York? Hello? Mr. Shane, this is New York calling. I have a person-to-person call for you. Go ahead, please. Hello? Who is this? Hi, Mike. How do you like my long-distance voice? Phil, where are you? In the next room. I thought I'd let you know how to fake a long-distance call. (laughs) Angel, remind me to kiss you. 
Well, there's your answer, Inspector. That was Phyllis in the next room. Pringle either got some girl to pretend to be the phone operator or he used a falsetto voice himself. That's it, Mr. Shane. I remember. Pringle called up here several times and impersonated a woman. He did it for a gag. No, no, I... You... You don't understand. We understand perfectly, Mr. Pringle. It was a very convincing gag. So convincing you thought you could get away with murder. Well, Inspector, I guess that winds up the case. <laughs> Sorry I kept you waiting so long, kids. Pringle insisted on giving us a speech along with his confession. Mm, I'll bet. I'll bet it was all about Highland, what a no-good character he was. Yeah. Seems about ten years ago, Highland pulled another chip, stole a chemical invention from Pringle and wrecked Pringle's whole business. He never forgot it. Then the motive was revenge. Mm. Why on earth did Pringle leave his gun right in Highland's desk? He was using psychology on us. Oh. He figured if he left a clue so obviously pointing at himself, the police just wouldn't believe it. Oh, it almost worked. Yeah. You know, I was really suspicious of Jane Agnew. It's darn funny she couldn't find her gun. I, uh, I found it, Angel. You did? When? After we were all done. It was in the bottom drawer of her desk with a heavy file on top of it. Say, Mike, do you think she was holding out on us? Uh-uh. No, Inspector. Jane hated Highland, and I think she realized how dangerous her mood was. So she hid her gun to prevent herself from killing him, and then forgot where she hid it. You know, that's an idea. Place an obstacle in front of yourself whenever you get any wild ideas. Mm. I must remember that with you, Mike. Well, Angel, what are you talking about? You don't hate me. Oh, no, no, just the opposite. But, uh, well, that can be a dangerous mood, too. What? Why, Angel! <laughs> Tune in again next week for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. We delay the start of our scheduled program to bring you a bulletin from CBS News. Washington. The State Department has issued a statement in response to the proposal by Jacob Malik, the Soviet delegate to the United Nations, for a ceasefire in Korea. The State Department said that if Malik's proposal is more than propaganda, adequate means for discussion and end to the conflict are available. The State Department said we are ready to play our part. This bulletin has come to you from CBS News. We now resume our regular program. <laughs> Broadway's my beat. From Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's my beat with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The nighttime starts at the river before it closes over Broadway. A wind drifts in with the moistened shadows, flings them into the street, flattens them against the gutter, picks a man waiting for a bus and wraps darkness around him. And a light comes on, and another. And down the street there where the crowd is gathered against the traffic signal, high above them a neon sputters, flames. The spectaculars dance. Somebody runs into the street and yells, Come on! And everybody does. Night has come to Broadway. Where 
high was there was a wind. The built-in wind, a thing composed of poor ventilation, tears, shed and unshed, and bottled chemicals. It was the basic ingredient of the city morgue, though not to be found on blueprints or bills of specifications. It was something new to the man walking beside me. This place? This place? Just take it easy, Mr. Larson. I'll tell you something. I guess it'll sound funny. I've read about places like this, and I've closed my mind to what I read. I guess I never wanted to visualize anything. Right here, Mr. Larson. What was your daughter wearing? Mrs. Larson wrote it down for me. Hmm. You see, I wasn't home when our daughter, when Ruth went to the movies, so Mrs. Larson... Ruth was wearing a skirt and blouse, pink bobby socks and saddle shoes. I guess you want to know this, too. She was five feet one. She was 14 in May. She had brown hair and brown eyes. And I want you to know, Mr. Clover, I, I guess all fathers feel the same way. My Ruth was... Well, our friend said she was a remarkable child. She's going... We're going to send it to... Under that sheet. This girl was found in a vacant lot between your home and the theater your wife mentioned when she called. How... I mean... Look, you, you know what Beaten, I... Beaten. Fractured skull. I have to look, don't I? Yes. If it's your daughter. Ruth's a nice girl. She started to go to parties with boys and she always gets home by 11 o'clock. She, she's going to be a dancer. When people come to the house, she dances for them. Mr. Larson. You see, as I, as I told you before... Ruth... Ruthie? Oh, Ruthie. Who did it? What monster? Who did it to you? Who? Who? And the fury took over. The man trembling with it, shivering with it, scurried from wall to wall, enraged at the wound the death of his child had clawed across his heart, torn inside his throat... The helpless, futile rage of the animal whose small range of understanding has been kicked, beaten, thrown against the barbed wall of violence. <laughs> not once, not once more did he look at his child. Now try only to wipe out the memory, try to strangle the long-ago laughter and sobs that the child had let echo through him. And finally, the collapse, the heap on the concrete floor. You call quietly to the officer on duty to help you lift the man, carry him to a place where he can sleep away the fury of his dead. Then back to your office and close the door on it. Stand at the window, watching the squalls of the nighttime wash against it, beat against it, and then stare at the walls, then hear the door open for it to let it all in again. Danny? Danny? What do you want? Well, Dr. Sinsky's report. He was busy on another. He asked me to bring it to you, so... Leave it on my desk. All right. You're not going to look at it, Danny? Why? I know what's in it. Well, I thought I did, too, till I glanced it over on the way to your office. You better take a look at You're it. You're so eager, I don't want to spoil it for you. Tell me about it, Muggerman. Danny. You tell me, I'm Muggerman. We've had other kids who... And this one's no different. That all, Muggerman? That's what I've been trying to tell you. This one is different. Just what you saw when you first found her. That's what's in the report. Beaten, skull fractured with the butt of a gun. Nothing else. Then give me a motive. Give me another motive why a 14-year-old child should... Glover speaking. Sergeant Tartaglia at this end. Homicide, Danny. Woman in backyard of house at 1845 West 11. People named Murray. Upstairs wants you on it. Shall I tell him you're agreeable, Danny? Tell him I'm... Bring me a motive, Muggerman. Upstairs wants me to run an errand. She's over here, Mr. Clover. Right here. Dead. Beaten. I'd say her skull had been fractured, Mr. Murray. Oh, I don't understand it. I just don't understand it. Tell me what happened. We were sitting in the library. A knock came on the back door. 
I wanted to answer it, but Beatrice said I looked so comfortable. She... There was just you two in the library. You and your wife. And sis. Sis? My sister, Claudia. She can't hear anything. She's deaf. She never goes out of the house. I take care of her. Well, who's in the house with her now? Who's playing that organ? Oh, uh, sis plays. I see. Go ahead. Well, there was this knock on the door, and Beatrice went to the door, and I, I, I heard her talking to someone. At least I think I did. I want you to know I'm not sure about that. I kept reading, that's all. Sis was practicing. Didn't your wife scream? Didn't you hear anything? No, 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 I didn't. I I happened to look up in my book a little later, after she went to the back door. How much later? Well, I don't know. I looked up, and she still wasn't there. She... she hadn't come back yet from answering that knock on the door. That's right. So I went out back. The back door was still open, but there wasn't anybody there. I called to her. And then I, I started toward the alley, and I I stumbled. I, I stumbled over Beatrice, lying... Then what did you do? Well, I, I called the police, and then I told Sis what had happened. You speak sign language? Yes, I, I learned it when I was very young, so that I could speak with Sis. She's been with me all the time. Yeah. How long have you been married? Fourteen years. Why, what's that got to do? Happily? Of course, happily. Do you have any children? No. No, that's something Beatrice and I agreed on. Sis needs taking care of, and Beatrice is always so busy. Busy? Busy doing what? Clubs and auxiliaries, you know. She was well-liked, got things done. She was admired and well-liked. Then who would want to kill her? Nobody would want to kill Beatrice. Nobody. Mr. Murray. She was a middle-aged woman, Mr. Clover. Everybody she knew was her friend. She did charity work. People came with troubles. Anybody, she'd help them. Why would anybody want to kill her? What motive would he have? What motive, Mr. Clover? It was there again. What motive? A 14-year-old girl, the loved child of a quiet, nameless family, until a killer had taken the butt end of a gun, beaten their name and their dead child's name into the newspapers that choked the trash bins supplied for the purpose by the Department of Sanitation. What motive for that? And for Mrs. Beatrice Murray, admired, liked, charitable, a woman to whom the trouble came, a childless woman who sat in the evening and sewed together the patchwork of her day while her husband read and his sister released the music she couldn't hear. What motive for that brutal death? And because you find no answer, share it with Dr. Sinsky. Ask the question of him. Burden the gentle doctor with it. You put me a question, Danny, that is not strictly in my department or in my education. Mind if I bum another cigarette? Oh, well, here. Help yourself. Thanks. You've been with us a long time, Doctor. Some of it must have rubbed off. Danny, I deal only in known quantities. You boys bring me the wounds you find, I wash them, bandage them. You bring me the dead, I perform autopsies. Known quantities, Danny. Like I know, like I know my name, your name, that this Mrs. Murray was murdered by the butt of the same gun that hammered away the life of the child, Ruth. Why? Tell me why. And I'll go out and buy my own pack of cigarettes. If I had gold, you could have it, Danny. No strings to it. No. For the question you ask, go consult a specialist. A man who puts the microscope of his training to the emotions. The department psychiatrist? Yes, to him. Perhaps he will agree with me. And I'm only an amateur, a dabbler, mind you, Danny, that this violence, this ugly bestial violence, has been committed by what is called a paranoid. Uh, I've read about them. Had them screaming in my office. They dream up hates against themselves. That... For this they kill. An animal, a child, a woman. Excuse me, Danny. Come in, please. Uh, looking for me, Gino? Yeah, Danny. Fresh homicide. Alley on West 10th. Buckman's got a squad call. Let me finish my cigarette, huh, Tartaglio? Well, sure, Danny. Well, sure, if you want. <sighs> it's finished. A woman, Danny. Yeah. Put your flash on her. Yeah, hold it. Hold it right there. Where's that music coming from? An apartment upstairs. Man. Danny? The back of her head, it's... Uh-huh. Keep your flash still. We've seen it two times already. In a short space. This makes three. 
It made three. The woman staring into the beam of the flashlight Mugman held close to her face, staring in the final disbelief that this had happened to her in this place, in this time. She lay in awkwardness, her dress disarranged, her hand where it had frozen, trying to straighten the wisp of blood-clotted hair under her black straw hat. The alley wind found the white lace at her throat, riffled it, and the murdered woman made three. Listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The Peggy Lee Show bowed in over most of these same CBS stations last Sunday night. Folks who heard it will be back tomorrow for more of Peggy's charm, Peggy's vocals, Peggy's previews of coming popular musical events. Enjoy the Peggy Lee Show for lighthearted summer listening at the Star's Address. <laughs> The night music of summer spills into Broadway from the scarred throats of the loudspeakers hanging over the record shops. And this summer's kids, in the -the off-the-shoulder cottons and the transparent California sports shirts, squeeze each other into the doorways and lap it up. And then someone shrills a new diversion in a new shop window on a new corner, and Broadway's youth rebops on down to it. It's an old ceremony on Broadway, this dancing in the streets, and the sweating barker with a fistful of passes to happy upstairs lands... Just the price of the amusement tax, kid. That's old, too. The girl in the swimsuit lying on the billboard beach, never aging, but old. And the touch of summer's night on your eyelids, that's familiar, too. It's all happened to you before. And where I was, where Mugovan was, it had happened before, too. To a 14-year-old girl named Ruth. To Mrs. Beatrice Murray... And now to the woman lying dead in an alley, not feeling the touch of the man who at first timidly and then, with effort, twisted the purse out of her hand. She was holding on to it so tight, Danny. Open it. So tight. Yeah. Killed the same way as the other two, wouldn't you say, Danny? Uh Uh-huh. Maybe our fair city's being honored with a mad killer, huh? Maybe. Sick man with a grudge against women, even if they're a kid. Looks like it. How long does it take to go through the purse, Mugovan? Just sorting the unnecessary stuff, Danny. Tissues, compact, change purse, bobby pins. There's a cell slip for... Let's see. Hold a flash a minute, Danny. Yeah. Uh, For China wear. Tortoise shell comb with silver edging. That's all? No identification? Well, I haven't tried this inside flap yet, Danny. Yeah, here it is. Uh, new social security card made out to, uh... Hold it again. Mm. Alma Russell, 4212 6th Avenue. That's around 8th Street, Danny. Well, maybe she was on her way home, took this alley. It cuts through the 6th. Uh-huh. Killer knew she took it sometimes, waited for her here, slugged her, made sure she was dead. Got a confession, Danny. It puzzles me. You alone in the world? The three of them dead. That girl, that woman with her husband and the sister who plays the organ... No, this one. I can understand it if... If what? There wasn't a mark on it, Danny, other than the beating from the gun, but not a mark. And this girl's young. About 25, I'd say. Pretty, neat, clean. I bet she was attractive, sweet. What are you building, Mugman? Well, we've had them before, Danny. The guys who wait in alleys go to moving picture houses, talk to little girls, and the vacant lot. This kind we've had before. And in a way, I could understand it. But the killer who... You said he was sick. Dr. Sinsky called him a paranoid. Whatever they call him, it scares me sick. I got a niece who lives three blocks from me with my brother. She's... Funny. You're trying to talk about her like the girl's father did when... Go call them, Morton McGovern. Danny, the thought that it could happen... Go call them. I'll wait for you. In a little while, the young woman who had hugged death in an alley was attended to by gentle people, which is the miracle of violent death in a great city. The intern, the stranger in the white jacket, knelt beside her, shook his head, and thought a thought that included both of them. And an ambulance driver looked at her and bit his lip when he put her on the stretcher. Then the alley was no longer remarkable. 
it resolved back unto itself. A play of refuse, mewings, and the shortcut home. It was the end of something or another. For me, it was the end of the day, home now in bed. Adjust the mind not to dream. This can be done by a policeman assigned to homicide. Sleep the night through and wake and have the coffee and read the paper and get to work. Go now to the address on 10th Street because a girl named Alma Russell once lived there. Ring the bell. Adjust your mind again to the fact that you're going to talk about the murder of a young woman at 8.30 in the morning. You from the police? Yes, I am. Well, come in. In here. The kitchen. Sit down. Thanks. What's your name? Danny Clover. Mine's Perdon. Ethel Perdon. I'm mine host to the borders. Had your coffee yet, Danny? Uh Uh-huh. Me too. You won't mind if I try making up this face of mine, do you? I say making up because that's the phrase that's used. How is it that you're expecting the police, Mrs. Perdon? Well, I read the morning papers, don't I? Alma got killed, didn't she? She lived here, didn't she? So... Who should I expect? Humphrey Bogart? Yeah. How does the lipstick look, Danny? Kissable? Or otherwise? Uh, otherwise, huh? Look, Mrs. Perdon, I want you to tell me everything you can about Alma Russell. Sure, sure. Uh, can you reach that mascara, Danny? Hmm? Yeah, right there on the shelf, see? Thanks. About Alma? A maid. Clean, sweeps, dusts. A buck an hour. Who'd she work for? Well, she never said. Quit a job a couple of weeks ago. I think she got another one just the other day. Well, I guess that's the best I can do with my facial equipment. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Ah. What else about her? Well, I don't know what else. She paid board, kept to herself, was no trouble. Didn't talk, except a how do you do and a very well thank you. Nice table manners. Broke her bread and never left much crumbs. Nice girl. What about boyfriends? None here in my establishment. All ladies. What happens in the street, I wouldn't know. Uh, help me with my coat, will you, Danny? You going someplace? Well, sure I am. I want to look at Alma's room. First landing, door on your right. You want to talk to me soon again, Danny? Maybe. After I look at Alma's room. I'll be easy to find. Your place. Your morgue. I'm going down and cry for Alma Russell. Somebody's got to cry for her. <laughs> Watch her leave for a session of weeping through mascara and eyelashes. The pastime, the protest against her being bitter and lonely and unwanted. And enter the dead woman's room, search it, note its primness, handle the modest belongings of a girl who would wash, dust it, arrange the belongings of other women in other, richer rooms. The pile of old magazines carefully saved on the closet shelf. And on the bedstand, the new ones. The fan magazines, the romances, truer than her own because they were printed on slick paper. The dresser, lined with a thin layer of inexpensive underclothes. The wardrobe of the bargain flowered prints. The starched maid's uniform, the cloth coat, and the moth-proof bag. And that was it. The sum of Alma Russell's life. And then back to headquarters and the concern of Sergeant Gino Tartaglia for your tiredness, for your paleness. Well, Danny, not that it is mine to meddle, but... Well, you should exhibit yourself to the sunshine more. Lao on Far Rockaway on your day off. Gino. Bring cheeks of tan to your cheeks. Bare your pale feet to the vitamin-filled rays My of... pale feet bother you? Nothing whatsoever about your personality bothers me, Danny. It's only that I... I know, Gino. You'd feel better if I got sunburned. Well, it is the fashion of the season. There's a rumor murder is the fashion. Yeah, this also. Three... To members of the opposite sex. It would be so simple. If only somewhere I could find where their lives had been touched by one man, by one killer. Danny, don't whip yourself. I put the boys working on it like yes. They can't find it either. All they come up with is a reading on a sales slip. Huh? The sales slip you found in the purse of the deceased Alma Russell. It seems the girl bought a teapot from a place called Ivers, paid $200 for it. And this makes a mishmash, upsets your colleagues in the department. 200 for a teapot bought by a girl who makes a buck an hour. Doesn't it upset you? (laughs) 
Something we can do for you, sir? Yes, there is. I'm from the police. Good. Are we interested in some chinaware today? Yes, we are. I want you to take a look at this. Uh, this is a sales slip. Uh, what is it? It's for a teapot, one that costs $200. I don't understand why we're lifting our eyebrows, sir. Of course it did. A Stratfordshire teapot on the current market is worth at least that. This sales slip was found on a young lady, a young lady that's been murdered. I see. The young lady happened to have purchased this teapot here. I see. Her name was Alma Russell. I see. How does a dollar an hour made buy a $200 piece of china? Uh, by paying $200 for it. <laughs> uh, Miss Russell paid exactly that much. Then you remember Miss Russell? Oh, indeed, yes. We sold it to her ourselves about uh, three weeks ago. I remember the transaction well. She'd called the day before to price the teapot. The next day she came in with the money about uh, midday on a Thursday. Unless it was her day off, she was in uniform. Didn't it seem strange that a housemaid... Yes, it did. Uh, I, I might as well tell you. Tell me what. Uh, the sales slip says $200. She didn't pay that for it. Uh, she paid 190 for it, tax included. We paid the difference out of our own pocket. In the trade, we are known as a sucker for hard luck stories about teapots, and Miss Russell had one. You want to tell me about it now or later? Miss Russell was dusting the china at the home of her employer, broke a Stratfordshire teapot, hid the debris, bought another one before the accident was discovered as a replacement. Just one more thing. Did she say who this employer was? Uh, she did not. However, however, there are some regular clients of ours who <laughs> eat off the stuff. Like who? Uh, the Llewellyns, for example, the Crandalls, the second and third, mm -hmm. uh, the Murrays, the West... Which Falls, Murrays? Uh, on West 11th, uh, the Paul Murrays. Are we being helpful? We'll never know how much. Oh, it's you, Mr. Clover. Please come in. Thanks. Mr. Murray... You uh... want to talk to me, don't you? Uh, uh, this way, down the hall. Oh, Claudia, uh, that is, Sis is practicing. Uh, we don't want to disturb her. Through this door. In here, the library. Now, do you know the man who killed my wife? We know the kind of man who killed your wife. Yes? A paranoid. A paranoid? A person who's quick to find a reason to kill, and he doesn't need much of a reason. Just cross a him. A crazy and... man? You could say that. Well, they tell me a lot of crazies are clever, but why why come to tell me about it? You should be out looking for the man. I just thought I'd stop by and let you know how we were progressing. I, I'm busy. Oh? Uh, my hobby. Model trains. I was assembling this engine. It's a diesel. Oh. Careful work. Must take a lot of patience. Uh, please, put it down. It's fragile. I don't allow anyone to touch it. All right. I said I stopped by to let you know how we were progressing. Come back when you can tell me the killer's name. And from what I've been reading, you'd better hurry up. Three killings. Indiscriminately. By the same man. By the same man. The way we figured, Mr. Murray, is that the killer was really only interested in killing one person. He killed the other two to make it look like what you said, indiscriminate killings. I, uh, I don't understand. To make it look like murder without a motive, without plan. But there was motive. Well, what motive for killing a 14-year-old girl? None. Part of the plan. And, and, uh, that housemate? None. But that was the killer's mistake. If he'd killed someone else, I wouldn't be here now. What? Well, you... You don't know what you're talking about. Aren't you going to ask me why anyone should kill your wife? There was no motive, uh, like the others. The killer had one. He had a wife. A wife who didn't want the burden of an afflicted sister-in-law. That's only a guess. Did your wife ever complain about your sister? Get out of here. You said your wife was a warm and open-hearted woman. She wanted children, didn't she? You're presumptuous. You're crude. Get out of here. But you already had a child in your house, sis, your sister. You never let her be anything but a child. I don't have to take these insults. And put that down. Put that train down. You're crazy. Crazy, you broke it deliberately. All that work and you... I'll kill you. I'll kill you. You're a broken toy train. I'll kill you. That's how you're going to convince I'll me you're a madman. I'll kill you. Cop an insanity plea. You're going to try harder than that. 
That's right. Settle down. You broke my train. Cut it out, Murray. You're no more crazy than I am. Paranoid would have had reason to kill that maid, that 14-year-old girl. You killed to cover up your wife's murder. She'll find out what happened. We'll let her know. Oh, sis. Oh, Lord God. Broadway leaps against the night. The sound it makes is the crash of life deep inside the earth and the hiss of neon, the laugh that screams. They melt together. The sound you get is shock. There's another sound, the teardrop. But no one listens. No one hears. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway... My beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tortaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Joseph Kearns was heard as Paul Murray. Featured in the cast were Charles Davis, Martha Wentworth, and Harry Bartell. Two styles of music, both tops in popularity, are heard every Sunday over most of these same CBS stations. Guy Lombardo's sweetest music this side of heaven is one. The other is the singing style of Mario Lanza, new vocal sensation of the airwaves. Enjoy Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians and the Mario Lanza show tomorrow night. Stay tuned now for Sing It Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where you meet adventure with Charlie Wilde on Sundays on the Columbia Broadcasting System. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Hello, hello, hello. Sam? At this hour on this network, you were expecting maybe Mary Margaret McBride? I've been expecting anything, Sam. <laughs> After all, to have you drop out of sight like that, leaving not a, a ripple on the surface for four whole days. Mr. Livingstone is frantic. Who? Mr. Livingstone, the man you rented the car from, he's, he, he's ready to send out a search party. Aha! Uh -huh. Sammy and Livingstone with a reverse twist. It's no joke, Sam. Nothing, huh? You, you have no right to worry me like this. It's not fair. Where are you? To the only spot on Earth as yet unvisited by the National Geographic Society, sweetheart, the Vale of Takaloma. And don't try to find it on a map because it isn't. Set yourself for my saga of a crook's tour of the hinterlands with just a touch of mysticism, which is why I call it the Rowdy Dowser Caper. All right, Murgatroyd, these will do. Sam, where are you calling from? A tailor shop. I had to leave without my pants. For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all, starring Stephen Dunn in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Dum da da dum dum dum. When you and I were young, Effie. Sam? Who else? Are you decent? Decent? Well, you said you'd lost your pants, so. Oh! Yeah, how do they look? Well? Isn't it a little early for Halloween? Ooh, you made a joke. You ready, woman? As always, Sam. They fill it in to Constable Ollie Shuttle, North Takaloma, California. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Rowdy Dowser Caper. Dear Ollie. 
On Wednesday, it was when I returned to my office of a fine spring morning to find a note lying on my desk like a big, juicy piece of cheese in a mousetrap. Quote, Mr. Spade, call North Taka... Taka Loma? Three. Unquote. Hmm, North Taka Loma. Where have I... Long distance. North Taka Loma, three. Yes, sir. One moment. Uh... Would you repeat the number, please? North Takaloma, three. North Takaloma, three. Nice diction. That is North Takaloma? I'm not kidding. Look it up, girl. Look it up. Yes, sir. North Takaloma, three. Well, she must have found it in the book because soon we had encouraging buzzes and clicks. Six operators later, we had punched our way north to the farm at Slattery Flat. Then we knocked off for lunch while Slim Slattery repaired the windmill that made the juice for the last lap. At 2.07 p.m., victory was in sight. Yeah? Sam, this is operator nine for the tenth time. Oh, fine. Uh, How we doing, Millie? Sam, boy, I am actually ringing at North Tacoloma 3. Oh, good girl. Hello? Hello, this is Sam Spade. I have a note here to oh, call... Oh, yes, North... yes, Mr. Spade. You were out of town when I came. Perhaps you remember me? Uh... Wendell Wisby of Oak Tree Lane, yeah. North Tacoloma, California. Wendell? I employed you a year ago to find a girl who vanished. The magician! You made the girl disappear and couldn't bring her back. Uh, correct. Yeah. You may well ask, Mr. Spade, how anything could be worse than that. Well, this... This is... <laughs> oh, there, Wendell. There, boy. Take it easy. I, I can't talk. I, I just can't talk about it. Fine, fine. Then write me a nice, long letter. Uh, well, you know, I'd this rather... is a long-distance call, and I... No, no, I... no, no, no. I... I am sorry, Mr. Spade, but this has affected me very deeply. Look, you promised you'd lay off the magic, Wendell. Well, How'd you I... do? Misplace half a woman this time? No, I have given up magic, Mr. Spade. I am currently employed as third vice president of the Second National Bank of North Tacoloma. All that? Yes, sir. Oh, my star was rising. My future seemed assured, but... Now a shadow has fallen over my good name. Boot it along, will you, Wendell? This is costing me money. I cannot tell you more on the phone, Mr. Spade. You must come at once. It is extremely urgent. I see. Well, frankly, Wendell, I have a feeling I'll be tied up. But I left your retainer under your desk, Well, the chances are I'll... What was that? I just said there's a hundred dollars under your desk blotter for a retainer. I left it when I came with a note. But if if you have a collection to make, suppose Uh, Oh, Wendell, that is the collection. And so it befell that shortly before lunch on the following day, I guided my rented hack across the ford at Clobber Creek, up the high road through Possum Notch, and down into the Vale of Tacoloma, where I muscled my way through a flock of geese in the main street and tied up before the imposing stone facade of the Second National Bank. Inside, sitting in front of the door marked Urban Root President, sat a secretary whose facade looked colder and even more imposing than the bank's. She was shriveling one of the customers, a meek little milk toast in a salt and pepper soup. But as I informed you, my good man, President Root is extremely tied up at the moment. Oh, I'm quite aware of that, miss. I wouldn't bother him for the world, but you see, uh, I... No, w- I don't see. I... And since you refuse to state the nature of your business... Did I, I refuse? Mean, you most certainly did. Oh, dear me, I didn't mean to refuse anything. It's just that... Well, it's sort of personal, and uh, may I go in? You may sit down until I tell you to go in. Is that clear? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, I don't... I, I understand. I don't mind waiting. Don't mind at all. <clears throat> uh, and now you, sir. What do you want? I have an appointment with Wendell Wisby. Uh, Mr. Wisby is in conference with the President Root. Thanks. Sir. If you'll sit down, I'll... Uh, just a minute, sir. Uh, just a minute. And you must understand, President Root, this is a matter of family honor. Yes. I shall... De- oh, hi, Wendell. Oh, Mr. Spade. Now, sorry I couldn't get here sooner, but it's a long haul. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Spade is a friend of mine, President Root, from my solid days as a magician. A very competent detective, I might add. Well, thank you, Wendell. Hey, I see. We, uh, we are indeed fortunate to have him with us in this matter. Good, good. Uh, please sit down, Mr. Spade. Thanks. Uh, you are aware, Mr. Spade, this matter is to be held in strictest confidence. Word must be kept from the depositors at all cost until... But remember, uh, President Root, eh? remember the code of the Wisbys. Should worse come to worst, I shall make good. 
I shall make good if it takes I me... I understand, Weasby. I understand. Well, mind if I admit I don't? What is it, Wendell? Snatcher. Snatch whom? Uncle Purse. Our former cashier, Mr. Speed. Purse Snatcher. Weasby's uncle. Purse Snatcher. What about him? Everything. He has disappeared. Absconded. That is a harsh word, President Root. I would prefer to say he disappeared until we have further proof. The money's gone, isn't it? How much money? $53,000. From Uncle Purse's accounts. Yeah. It may be he has absconded, President Root, but we must remember that despite the snatcher surname, Uncle Purse is a Wisby. And a Wisby never lived who got away with $53,000. All right, Wisby. He disappeared. Yes, may I ask when he disappeared? Last Friday night, about nine o'clock. Anyone see him go? Almost everyone. His car stalled at Main and Persimmon. Several people saw him trying to start it. He was acting very strangely. Oh, how was that, Wendell? Well, uh, Clem Clobber and Charity Fid and and several others spoke to him from the curb, but he wouldn't answer them. He didn't say a word to anyone, which is not at all like Uncle Purse Snatcher. Wisby, man to man. Would you feel sociable with a satchel full of stolen money on the seat beside you? Well, there you have a point, President Root. I can't blame you for the way you feel, President Root. But I must continue to believe the best of Uncle Purse until Mr. Spade discovers the worst. Oh. <laughs> and in that dismal eventuality, please know I intend to pay off the $53,000 plus interest on the installment plan. $5.37 per week for 48 years. Oh. You have my word on it, sir. The word of a Wisby. With which solemn pronouncement, Wendell marched out, closely followed by me. Salt and pepper suit milk toast was still fingering his hat frame, looking hopefully at Miss Icewater for the sign. At Wendell's suggestion, I hustled out to the Snatcher homestead for a word with Purse's wife, a timid little woman with her heart in her eyes, known from one end of the valley to the other as Aunt Wistful. I can hardly think straight these days, Mr. Spade. So full of puzzlement, this thing has left me. Of course, Aunt Wistful. (laughs) Have another dipper of cider, Mr. Spade. Get down, not you. No, thanks, Aunt Wistful. First wasn't himself since the well run dry. We had a passel of dry winters here in the valley, you know, but never for this has the well run dry. First didn't know which way to turn. The pipe ends two miles down the road. Couldn't afford to bring it in here. I see. He took to muttering to himself, saying strange things. Coming home from his work at the bank with a frown on his face. Stayed there all evening. What do you mean, strange things? Oh, I don't recollect very well. He brought a law book home one night, though, and out of a clear sky, he says to me, Wistful, honey, do you know the punishment for embezzlement is five to ten years in prison? I asked what he meant by that, and he said he thought it might be a good thing for a banker to know. Well, he had something there. It was the night after that. He come home all cheerful. He said he thought he'd figured a way out. Found a fellow to help him. Get down. I had no idea what Purse was thinking. Uh, what fellow? Urban Root, I suppose. Oh. It's Urban's bank he was fixing to steal from. Mm-hmm. But then I got word from my sister ailing over to Fogarty Grove, so Thursday I left, and when I got back Saturday, he'd gone. Now, did he take his things? Mostly. Funny. He did one strange thing for this time of year. He left his corn teeth behind. Corn teeth, huh? Uh, a spare pair of store teeth for corn on the cob. Oh. The person will miss him now with summer coming on. Yes, yes Bless him. You know, ever since spring, I've been after Purse to spade up my flower bed by the window. Mm. He, he did it before he left. Now that there's no water to grow things with. I loved him so much, Mr. Spade. In this awful way for marriage to him. Get down! (laughs) 
Well, I started at Main and Persimmon Streets and worked south, farm by farm. Everyone seemed to have been sitting on his front stoop Friday night because all remembered Purse Snatcher driving out on the south road in his 1919 Winton 6. Up to a point, that is. Somewhere between North Tacoloma and Fogarty Grove, I ran out of witnesses. And in Piney Crotch, of all places, the town beyond, they could guarantee Purse didn't pass through because the main drag was roped off all Friday night for a square dance. And thus, matters stood on the third day when I limped back to the bank. For some reason, a crowd had gathered in the alleyway next door. Writing it off as a floating crap game, I walked inside, bowed formally to Miss Icewater, then plunked myself down at Wendell's desk. Oh, Shaw, I just found I miscalculated on the interest. At $5.37 per week... I won't have this paid off until I'm 134. And who knows? By then, you may even have a wife and children to support. Look, don't you think you were a little impetuous with that retainer? What retainer? Mine, the hundred dollars. Hundred dollars? Wendell, the hundred dollars you stuck under my desk blotter when you hired me. I hired you? You came to my office while I was out of town, Wendell. You left a note for me to call you. I talked to you on the telephone. Well, didn't I? Mr. Spade, something is very wrong. I did not talk to you on the telephone at all. What? I I thought you were employed by President Root. Well, where is President Root? I don't know. He stepped out some time ago, and there's someone waiting for him in his office. Oh? Do, 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 do. Hi, Miss Icewater. Oh, tell me, pretty mean. Are there any more at home like you? Well, (laughs) no toast. But with a difference, the salt and pepper suit had gone. Beret, bow tie, plaid sport jacket with a racing form sticking out of the pocket. Maroon plus fours and wool socks with tassels. He took one of President Root's cigars out of his pocket, bit off the end, and lit it. Then smiled, or rather leered, at Miss Ice Water. Well, honey. I'm sorry, oh, sir. Oh, 23 skidoo, sweet stuff. President Root will be back shortly if you... Oh, don't be a back number, beautiful. But, sir, I... Ah, 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 mama. Well, I don't know what to say. <laughs> You'll learn. <laughs> Tell Cookie I'll be back, huh? Uh, yes, sir. Anything you say. Live a little, baby. Live a little. <laughs> Toodaloo. <laughs> Golly. Golly, indeed. Uh, Miss Icewater. Hey. Oh. What? Was that? Uh, I don't know his name. A friend of Peasant Roots. Uh, he, uh, he's rather attractive, don't you think? <laughs> Only now, as I went outside in his wake, did I see what had caused the crowd in the alleyway. The first sport model convertible in Colocoma Valley since Wally Reed came through on location. And the first pink one I'd ever seen. Pondering the new milk post, I walked into the drugstore, found a phone book, and checked all 25 names. North Tacoloma 3 belonged to the Atomic Auto Courts and Restaurant. Charity Fid, proprietress. She was riding herd on a griddle full of lamb chops when I pulled up at the counter. How's that again, Sonny? Short, you say? Short. And scalped on top with a fringe of hair like so? Yeah, and a wicked leer in his eye. That's my man. Well, he wasn't wearing no barret, hat, nor plaid coat when I seen him. Salt and pepper suit it was. Yeah, I know. Who is he? Well, he didn't register, but they say he's Dowser. Dowser? Mm. Uh, don't know his first name, do you? Nope. Now, where he come from? Stayed in room six till two days ago. Ain't seen him around since. When did he come here? Uh, let me see now. Uh, codfish balls. Beg pardon? Oh, that'll be Friday night, late. Oh. And the funny thing now, think of it, he'd come afoot. Not by the road from Fogarty Grove, mind you, but by the trail over the ridge. Oh, where does it go to, Aunt Charity? Winds up the old clobber place. Bandon now. Oh, thanks. I'll be back. You'll I... be nothing. You just sit right down where you are and you wrap yourself around this. Ain't no growing boy going hiking over the ridge without supper. Clean it up now, every scrap. Yes, Ma. <laughs> It had been dark about two hours when carrying one of Aunt Charity's best coal oil lanterns, I topped the ridge and looked down on Clem Clobber's abandoned barn, nestling in a grove of ancient oaks at the very foot of the hill. The moon was bright enough to show up the pair of grassy ruts leading from the rear of it down the gully toward the road to Fogarty Grove, a couple of miles away. On general principles, I blew out the lantern, then scrambled down the side hill and up to the barn door. 
I couldn't make out anything inside at first, and then finally something took shape. A dark hulk in the middle of the floor. Stupid me, I lit a match. It was an automobile. To be exact, it was Purse Snatcher's 1919 Winton 6. His hat and the tweed overcoat everyone saw him wearing Friday night were lying across the front seat. I held the match higher and bent over for a closer look. Whereupon Spade and the match went out together. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun for you Sunday with two of your favorite families, the Blandings and the Harrises. Mr. and Mrs. Blanding stars Cary Grant and Betsy Drake in the title roles as the proud but somewhat bewildered owners of the famous Dream House. The Phil Harris Alice Faye Show stars Phil and Alice, of course, plus ever-helpful Frankie Remley, Brother William, and Delivery Boy Julius. Yes, there are laughs this Sunday and every Sunday with the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show and Mr. and Mrs. Blandings. <laughs> Now, back to the rowdy dowser caper, tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I must apologize, Constable, for succumbing once again to the traditional nemesis of the private eye. But the bald facts are simply that I bent over for a closer look at the Wenton Six and was struck a dastardly blow on the rear of the head. How long I remained incommunicado, I know not, but I awoke presently and with good reason. My pants were on fire. As a matter of fact, the entire barn was on fire, and I was lying in the tonneau of the Winton Six wearing purse snatcher's overcoat. The door I'd come in was a wall of flame, likewise the stalls on both sides. But at the rear were a few square feet of rotten siding that hadn't caught yet. Now, ordinarily, I'd have thought twice, but when your pants are afire, you only think once. So I ran right through it and took a flying header into the creek behind the barn. It was just as well I only thought once, since at this moment the flames reached the Winton's gas tank. Hi. Good laws almighty, what have you been up to, boy? Smoking corn silk behind Clobber's barn. Match got away from me. Well, stay right there till I find my goose screen. No, 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 no. Later, Aunt Charity. How about the key to six? The dowser fella? Yeah. Won't need no key, son. No door open? If he left it open, he's in there now. Barrett hat, plaid coat, and a 25 cent cigar. Help yourself. <laughs> Well. What? What? Hey, Mr. Spade, isn't it? Right, and you're Dowser. Mm. Dowser? Business? Do- uh, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Dowser. Hey, you can call me Alonzo. Sit down. No, no, I'll stand. Oh? You're uh, lucky you caught me. I was just... Just leaving, so I see. I was detained, as you probably know, over at Clobber's barn. Detained? Okay, Dowser. We'll let that do for the preliminaries. Now, why'd you just try to kill me? Uh, kill you? Well, good heavens, man, I... I did not get careless at a weenie bake dowser. I just woke up in the middle of a three-alarm fire, and I don't like it. As a matter of fact, I'm a little burnt up, to use the phrase loosely, and I just might kick your teeth in. Now, now, believe me, I haven't been near Clobber's barn since Friday. I had nothing to do with... with whatever happened. Sure, and you had nothing to do with a hundred-buck retainer in the phone call from Wendell Wisby. Well, as a matter of fact, You figured with a curious city fellow like me on the premises, urban route might shake down easier. Bigger apples from the same old tree, right? Yeah. All I did was negotiate a personal loan. Drop it, will you? Root had his hand on the till at the bank. A big hand. Fifty-three thousand dollars worth. And Snatcher found out about it. What about you? How'd you get into the act? Uh, the loan. The shakedown. Where's Uncle Purse, Alonzo? Well, uh, out of town somewhere, I suppose. He... Uh, look, I can't tell you, Mr. Spade. Purse got as far as the road to Clem Clubber's barn last Friday night. Or did he? Uh, no. No, he didn't get that far. You know... I'd begun to suspect as much. How far did he get? I'm sorry, I can't tell you anymore. Root killed him, didn't he? No, no. You no, saw let him. Me go. How come? I don't know anymore. Please, come I... on, let's have a dozer. What did he do with the body? But... Root wore the coat and drove Purse's car out of town so everyone would see him. Now where's the body? Let me go. Let me go. Dowser! Dowser! <laughs> Dowser! 
He squirted out of my hands like a watermelon seed, leaving me with a plaid coat and took off down the line of atomic cabins toward the atomic restaurant. A nice high knee action for a little guy. And what with my burns and contusions, I'm forced to admit he was widening the gap between us when he rounded the corner of the atomic restaurant, making possibly the gravest error of his career. Aunt Charity was rounding the same corner, coming the other way with an armload of wood. You don't reckon he got himself a brain conclusion, do you, son? I don't know, but he's a weak witness, Aunt Charity, a weak witness. What you got there? Oh, shoebox for $1,500. A <whistles> few odds and ends, and this. Well. Yeah, it looks like an oversized slingshot fork. Slingshot? What do you mean, slingshot? Well, who cares? So he whittles. Where'd you get the idea his name was Dowser? Huh? Driver's license in his wallet. Alonzo P. Scoggins. Who said his name was Dowser? You did. I never said his name was Dowser. I said he was a Dowser. Oh, oh. And uh, what's a Dowser, Aunt Charity? A guy who finds water for people, that's what. Well, that's nice. If you could... Finds water? Yeah. How? Well, I'm no expert, Sonny, but as near as I can recollect, you take this here slingshot fork so, and then... Mr. Spade, I, I can't go through with it. Get hold of yourself, Wendell. Remember the code of the Wisby. But this sinister revelation has virtually prostrated me, Mr. Spade. And you must remember it is now over a year since my salad days as a magician. Tut, tut, Wendell. Stout fella, stiff upper. And further, even at the peak of my career, I was only sketchily acquainted with the field of dowsery. Hold it. Hmm? There they are. Aunt Wistful is sitting on the back porch with President Root. Mr. Spade, I... The I, code of the Wisbees, Wendell? <sighs> yes, sir. Let's go. Brendan Ruth, I just can't tell you how full up of gratefulness I am. Now, now, Aunt Wistful, don't take on so. It's nothing at all. It's... Uh, 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 you remember Mr. Spade, President Root? Wait, wait, wait. Of course. Of I... course. Hardly seems any time at all since we met President Root. Oh, Mr. Spade, President Root's going to buy the farm. Isn't that wonderful? Touching. And he's allowing me 10000 on it oh. against the money per stove. Well, that's a generous offer. Yeah, I thought so. Considering there's no water on the farm. Oh, Pierce said many times it wouldn't be worth $40 an acre for that water. Well? Um... Uh, did you say something, Wendell? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Aunt Wistful, I have great news for you. It may not be necessary to sell the farm. What do you mean, Wendell? We've made a deal here. Uh, maybe the signals are off for now, President Rude. You recall, Uncle Purse, that he'd found a man to solve his problem, Aunt Wistful? I am now ready to step forward and bring it into the open. I am that man. You! What do you mean, Wendell? Since entering the banking field, I divorced myself from magic and the allied dark arts, Aunt Wistful... So I wish to keep my other talent sub rosa. What are you talking about, Wisby? President Root, I am a part-time dowser. And he just happens to have his dowsing rod along, right, Wendell? Right. I have reason to believe there is water here, if I can just douse it out. Wendell, you're out shut of your... Shut up. Shut up. Douse away, Wendell. Douse away. Very well. Now, I hold the dowsing fork before me. Thus. Then I turn thus. Where does it point, Wendell? Let me see. Toward Aunt Wistful's flower bed. But this, this is ridiculous. Shut up. Proceed, Wendell. Proceed with the dowsery. One step, two, three, four. Well, the rod's five, pointing down. Well, I'm never right in the middle of my seven, flower bed. Hey, listen, Aunt Wistful. I'll make that 20000 $20,000 for the farm. Cash, see? Not credit. Cash. Twenty? Hold out. Uh, uh, Twenty-five. Uh, Thirty. Right here is where we did. Uh, Thirty-five. Thirty-five thousand. Well, this has already been dug up. Looks as if Uncle Purse had dug a hole and then filled it back up. Last Friday night, just before nine o'clock, right, President Root? <laughs> no, no. You came no, down no. for a showdown on those shortages he turned up. Found him digging the well here and got a better idea. <laughs> Please, no. I've talked to the guy who saw you do it, Root. <laughs> All right. All right. I killed him. He's, he's right here. Yes, he's right here. 
which is where you came in, Constable, and since you can take it from here, I shall close, as always, with... Period. End of report. Right. Another triumph, Sam. Another new sphere of effort. No field is safe from my talent, sweetheart. You will please preserve it for posterity during the following 15-second announcement. Scoot. Scoot. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, the glamorous and unpredictable Tallulah brings you another hour-and-a-half broadcast of The Big Show, starring Fred Allen, Judy Holliday, Joan Davis, Frank Warren, and many more. And this Sunday's Theater Guild on the Air production is the Broadway comedy, The First Year. Starring in this Theater Guild presentation are Richard Widmark and Catherine Grayson. Here it is, Sam. Ah, efficient girl. Yeah? Yeah, Millie, this is Sam, boy. What's up? Oh? Oh. Thanks, Millie. Well, what is it, Sam? They just relayed a message from Fogarty Grove. F. Wendell is being installed as second vice president tomorrow night at the Moose Hall. Oh? He wants me to come. Oh! And bring a girl. Are you game, little one? Well, that's one way to get the report to Constable Ollie Shuttle. <laughs> I'll do it, Sam. Good girl. Pack up an emergency ration of sorghum and hominy grits. I'll pull up at your doorstep in the morning at 8 o'clock. Well, I'll, I'll wear my sunbonnet and Mother Hubbard. <laughs> oh, good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade was played by Stephen Dunn, Lorene Tuttle as Effie. Also in the cast were Peggy Weber, Verna Felton, Sidney Miller, Alice Wellman, Charles Smith, and Nestor Piva. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another Adventure with Sam Spade. Tomorrow, your hit parade plays the hit tunes on NBC. Tonic and Cremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Tonight, owing to Mr. Conway's illness, the part of Sherlock Holmes will be played by Mr. Ben Wright. And now for our weekly visit with Sherlock Holmes' famous colleague, your friend and mine, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. I'm glad to see you. Make yourself at home. Thank you, Dr. Watson. You know, I've been waiting eagerly all week to hear about the singular affair of the ancient Egyptian curse. And the most singular affair it was, to be sure. It had its beginnings in the august halls of the British Museum. I've been looking over my old records to refresh my memory, and even after all these years, it sends what in Scotland they call a cow grew down my spine. <laughs> I can hardly wait, Dr. Watson. Recently, in a poll conducted throughout the country, women picked the ten best groomed men in America. These men were all men at the top. Statesmen, governors, motion picture stars, producers, and millionaires. And men, I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing how a recent survey showed that Kreml hair tonic is preferred among America's top flight executives and most successful men. But then why shouldn't it be? Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. This is why Kreml gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look. Such a handsome, clean-cut appearance. Kreml also keeps the hair neatly in place longer, with a healthy-looking luster. Yet it never leaves your hair looking or feeling greasy. After you apply Kreml, you can rub your hand over your hair, and your hair always feels so delightfully clean. Notice, too, how no greasy film comes off on your hand, or on your hat band. Just use a little Kreml on your hair in the morning... And at night, your hair looks as neatly groomed as when you first combed it in the morning. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. 
Now, Dr. Watson, what about the singular affair which began in the sacrosanct confines of the British Museum? Well, I must admit that I was not a frequent visitor to those gloomy halls, but on this particular morning, Holmes had been insistent. I say, Watson, look here. This notation definitely proves the use of stringed instruments as well as flutes as early as 3000 B.C. Hmm? Very interesting, Holmes. Very interesting indeed. If you please, sir. The smoking is absolutely forbidden. Huh? Oh, all right, all right, all right. Uh, hello, Holmes. Oh, Watson, I don't think you know Professor Halliday of the British Museum. Professor, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Dr. Watson? Not the eminent Dr. Eustace Watson, the well-known archaeologist of Edinburgh. I'm honored. No, sir. Dr. John H. Watson of Baker Street. Oh, sorry. <laughs> this is Dr. Watson's first visit to all your magnificent new acquisitions, Professor Halliday. It's a veritable treasure house, gentlemen. The late Lord Cranwood's excavations at the site of ancient Abydos have given the museum a priceless mine of information. And yet the price in human lives has not been inconsiderable. First Lord Cranwood himself, only a few days after the shrine of Harshafit was opened. A man of almost 80, Mr. Holmes. The strain and excitement of the discovery were too much for him. No doubt. And then a month later, Dr. Duma, disappearing mysteriously from camp, only to be found hopelessly insane and babbling madly before he died. And young Wilson vanished into thin air and assumed to have been lost overboard from the ship that was bringing the expedition back to England. Oh, it was a calm, moonlit night. Don't tell me that you, of all people, believe this newspaper talk of Hashafit's curse, Mr. Holmes. I believe nothing that is not susceptible of proof, Professor. Evidently, the new Lord Cranwood is quite undisturbed by any threats of a curse upon his family. I've seen him working here every day this week. Oh, is that Lord Cranwood? Yes, the uh, heavy-set middle-aged man over there. Just beyond that fifth sarcophagus. Fifth which? The chap with the rather florid face. Just packing those notes into his briefcase. Oh, looks fit enough, I must say. Judging from his appearance, I should think the curse of a watcher's name wouldn't have much luck with him. You'll excuse me, gentlemen. I want a word with Lord Cranwood before he leaves. Oh, Sir Holmes, supposing I run along, I'll meet you at the club for lunch and... Uh... Oh, Lord Cranwood, what's the matter? Why, well, he's collapsed. Quick, Watson. I, I don't understand. He just seemed to keel over. Uh, let me take a look at him. You were standing right beside him, Professor. Just what happened? Well, I was speaking to him. He clutched his throat, tried to say something, and collapsed. Holmes. Yes, Watson? The man's dead. Impossible. Cause of death, Watson? Well, I should have said heart, but... But uh, the I... curious rigidity of the muscles of his hands and throat aren't consistent with that diagnosis. Is that it, Watson? Quite correct, Holmes. You would better notify Scotland Yard at once, Professor Halliday. Scotland Yard? Mr. Holmes, are you suggesting... I suggest nothing, Professor Halliday. But Lord Cranwood has died extremely suddenly. In view of the three previous deaths which have occurred among the members of the expedition, I feel that this is definitely a matter for the police. I'll send for them at once. I'm certain, Watson, that a second look at Lord Cranwood's body will suggest to your mind a cause of death with which you cannot be unfamiliar. After your army career in India... The congested eyeballs. The rigid neck muscles. You mean snake bite? Precisely. The bite of some venomous and highly poisonous snake is the only cause consistent with these appearances. But there are no snakes here in the British Museum? That, Watson, is why I sent for Scotland Yard. Pacing up and down now for two solid days, Holmes. Would it be too much to ask you to be seated for at least five minutes? I'm sorry, Watson. The lack of any satisfactory solution to the problem of Lord Cranwood's death has driven me almost out of my mind. You find the problem insoluble, then? <sighs> so far. Come in. Ah, Inspector Lestrade. I've been expecting a call from you. Yeah, this thing's fair got me beat, Mr. Holmes. Oh, sit down, Inspector. Can I get you a drink? Thank you, Doctor. I'll be glad of one. <laughs> well, we've got the coroner's verdict, Mr. Holmes, and much good it does us. Death by misadventure from unknown causes. Well, you could hardly expect a coroner's jury to say more. Did the Home Office pathologist confirm my opinion? Uh, here you are, Mr. Holmes. Well, thank you, Doctor. Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. All the appearances of death were consistent with the bite of some deadly snake. But did we find any snakes running around? Were there any snake bites on the deceased body? No. 
Why, you yourself, within a few yards of the man, Mr. Holmes, and you know as well as I do that if a man gets bitten by a snake, he's going to let out a yell. I know exactly how you feel, Lestrade. Yeah, and have you seen the papers? <laughs> Scotland Yard baffled by 5,000-year-old curse. Death strikes again from Egyptian tomb. You can't blame the journalist, Lestrade. It's a newspaper editor's dream. And Scotland Yard's nightmare. <laughs> well, I must be off. The commissioner wants to see me this afternoon. You can be thankful this isn't one of your cases, Mr. Holmes. I think this one would be too much even for you. Phew. I've never seen a steward quite so worked up before. And I can't say that I blame him, Watson. Well, come along. Since the late Lord Cranwood's funeral is to take place at two o'clock, we might well stroll over to Hanover Square. Perhaps a brisk walk may serve to blow the cobwebs from our brains. <laughs> First time I've known you stand about outside a church at a funeral home, peering at the relatives of a dead man. I'm anxious to see the new Lord Granwood, as well as his relatives. He was a nephew of the late Lords, you know, and the family's interest in Egyptology has been inherited by him, along with the title. Here they come. And there's them, the new Lord Granwood. I wouldn't want to be in his boots with a curse hanging over me head. There's Lord Cranwood, Watson. Husky-looking young chap. It looks as though it'd take more than a family curse to get him down. Who's that coming after him, the pale young fellow in the wheelchair? His cousin, a Mr. Neville Robertson, I believe. Been hopelessly paralyzed ever since boyhood. Horse rolled on him while hunting. Yes, the lines of pain and suffering are very evident in the poor fellow's face. That must be Robertson's older brother, Mr. Oliver Robertson. That rather heavy-set young man just coming out. I assume that's his wife with him, though. The girl with the black veil. Well, it's rather rough on them, all these curious people staring. Come along, Holmes. Let's be off. Very well, Watson. I've seen all that I... I beg your pardon, sir, but aren't you Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes. Oh, my name's Oliver Robertson. <laughs> Fortunate coincidence, my seeing you here. I'd intended sending you a message this evening. A message? Yes, I... I wanted you to... Well, this is hardly the place to discuss such matters. Look, I'm staying at my cousin, Lord Cranwood's house. I wonder if you'd be good enough to come there this evening. Would nine o'clock be satisfactory? Excellent, Mr. Holmes. Good day, sir. Good day, Mr. Roberts. Oh, come in, gentlemen, come in. I don't think you know my wife. Dear, may I introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes? How do you do? And this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I'm very happy to see you here, Mr. Holmes. And you too, Dr. Watson. Mr. Holmes, my wife and I, well, to put it frankly, have asked you to come here because we're afraid. And not for ourselves, but for my cousin, the new Lord Cranwood. Mr. Holmes, neither Oliver nor myself is of a, a nervous temperament. But if you've read the accounts of the Cranwood expedition, you must appreciate my feeling that we're contending against more than... Mere ill fate. Four members of the same small group, dying mysteriously or by violence within a few weeks of each other. Well, sir, you don't put any stock in all this talk about an ancient Egyptian curse? No, I don't really know. Uh, tell me, Mr. Robertson, does the new Lord Cranwood share your fears? I regret to say he does not. He laughed when I told him I'd asked you here. Am I interrupting a council of war, or may I be permitted to be present? Oh, come in by all means, Neville. Here, let me give you a hand with your wheelchair. I can manage, I can manage. My brother Neville, gentlemen, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do, you do? I assume that the presence of the celebrated sleuth of Baker Street is not unconnected with the curse of the Cranwood. Please, Neville, don't make fun of us for being frightened. Oh. After all, it's Derek we're worrying about, not ourselves. I'm enough for you to worry, Oliver, when the curse catches up with Derek. Then you'll be Lord Cranwood yourself, and it'll be my turn to start worrying. I gather, Mr. Robertson, that you are somewhat skeptical regarding the efficacy of Ha Shafit's 5,000-year-old curse. My granduncle died of heart failure after the excitement of discovering the tomb. Dr. Dumas' death was certainly not the first case of sunstroke that's ever been heard of in Egypt. And Wilson, who fell overboard from the ship, was notoriously fond of the bottle. Does that answer your question? Ingenious, Mr. Robertson, but it leaves out of account your uncle's death in the British Museum the other day. I could offer you a dozen theories to account for that, but I doubt if they'd be sensational enough to please you. Mr. Holmes, regardless of what my cousin may say, and I know he'll agree with my brother, 
I wish to engage you to prevent any repetition of the tragedies which have already struck this family. Do say you will, Mr. Holmes. I will do my best, Mr. Robertson, to keep Lord Cranwood safe from harm, but without his cooperation, I greatly fear that I... Stimson said he wanted to see me, Oliver. Oh, I beg your pardon. I didn't know you had guests. I very much want to see you, Derek. This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. My cousin, Lord Cranwood, gentlemen. How do you do? do? I'm sorry, gentlemen. I have no sympathy with my brother's fears, nor do I see any necessity for dragging detectives into this matter. I trust you'll excuse me. Good night. Well, you see, Mr. Holmes, it's just as I told you. But I do hope you'll do your best anyway, Mr. Holmes. I promise you I shall. Your task won't be made any easier, Mr. Holmes, by my cousin's stubborn determination to continue working at the museum. He's arranged with Professor Halliday to work there at night in the future, uh, beginning tomorrow. He wishes to avoid the stairs of the curious. Hmm, interesting. Great Scott, my watch must have stopped. 9.30 and I haven't as yet fed my snakes. Snakes? Uh, did you say snakes? Why, yes, Doctor. Since my affliction debars me from digging in Egyptian tombs and similar active pastimes, I amuse myself with a small herpetarium. Would you care to see my collection? Good heavens, no. Or some other time, perhaps, Mr. Robertson. Dr. Watson and I must be off. Good. Snakes. <laughs> I must say, Holmes, that I find that sinister cripple Neville and his nasty collection of poisonous reptiles highly suspicious. Well, there's no doubt that Neville's personality has been warped by his affliction. And the availability of snake venom is, of course, significant. And look at his motive, Holmes. Look at his motive. The Cranwood title and the Cranwood fortune. But there's one thing you've forgotten, Watson. Even if the new Lord Cranwood were to die, it would be Neville's older brother who would inherit Oliver and his wife would become Lord and Lady Cranwood. Are you trying to tell me that a murderer who'd killed two men would boggle at a third? If Cranwood dies and Oliver gets the title, he'd be the last barrier in Neville's way. I don't like to say it, Holmes, but for once you seem to be singly obtuse about the facts of this case. Possibly, Watson. At any rate, I intend that you and I shall be present, although concealed, when Lord Cranwood visits the Egyptian galleries tomorrow night. You mean that you anticipate an attempt upon his life? As I have told you on previous occasions, Watson, it's a great mistake to theorize ahead of one's data. Mr. Holmes, you, you, don't, uh, you don't really put any faith in all this talk about the supernatural curse. Do you, Watson? I, I... Uh, oh, dash it, no, no, of course not. Good. Well, then I trust that tomorrow night you will arm yourself with your service revolver. Oh, really? Yes, Watson. I should like to be in readiness for anything we may encounter at the British Museum. Supernatural or otherwise. Empty place at night, isn't it? Carved humanity? Yes. What do you mean? Merely that the relics of the past are all about us. Oh, yes, 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 of course, sir. Oh, oh, and this way, through the northern vestibule. I say, Holmes, what's that thing? Looks like a coffin. That's what it is. Oh, good, good. Ah, here we are. Ah, he'll no doubt work at that long table. It has the only decent light in the room. And you take that side of the table, Watson. I'll take this. And make certain there's no one and nothing concealed. You're, you're, you're not expecting to find a, a snake anywhere, are you, Holmes? I don't expect to find anything. I merely wish to make certain that there is nothing to find. Now, oh, careful, Watson. Don't knock over that little figure. What the devil is it? And the Egyptians call those little statues the answerers. They were buried in the cedar coffins within the sarcophagi to accompany the dead and to obey their orders. Oh, pleasant idea, I must say. Well, there's nothing hidden on this side of the table. No, I hear now, now, there's an excellent spot to conceal ourselves. Over here, Watson. Great. God, what a horrible sight. What sort of a nightmare is that? And appropriately enough, it's a statue of Hashafit, a ram-headed god. Oh, excellent, Watson. Now, this will do perfectly. We can see everything in the room from behind uh, here. Just what uh, are you expecting, Holmes? I don't know. Quiet. There's someone coming. Lord Cranford. 
Yes, he's taking his papers out of his briefcase. Oh, now that he's turned the lamp up, I can see the fellow. He's all right so far. He's, he's sitting down to work. What? Something's wrong. Quick. He must have fainted. Here's the antitoxin. Give him the injection. Hurry. It's too late, Holmes. He's dead. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson as they endeavor to solve the mystery of the ancient Egyptian curse. Men, if you want to be a success in life, remember that well-groomed hair adds a great deal to a man's appearance. And one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So start at once and take better care of the hair you've got. And if you're smart, you'll use Cremel hair tonic. No other hair tonic keeps the hair more neatly in place without looking or feeling greasy. But men, Cremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Cremel's light oils have a grand lubricating effect on a dry scalp. At the same time, Cremel removes itchy, loose dandruff. Notice how alive and tingling your scalp feels. And you like to massage Cremel on your scalp because it's such a clean product. It never feels greasy or sticky. And if your hair, like so many men's, is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Cremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So men, for handsome groomed hair and a more hygienic scalp, use Cremel daily. Buy a bottle of Cremel at any drugstore. Ask for an application at your barber's. K-R-E-M-L, Cremel hair tonic. That famous modern hair tonic which has become such a nationwide favorite. And now back to Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and our story. I say, Holmes, if you won't have any lunch, you at least take a cup of tea. No, thank you, Watson. I'm not hungry. You've been saying that ever since that poor fellow Derek was killed the night before last. You simply must eat, Holmes. My appetite will return when I have a solution for this case, Watson, and not before. Well, I've, I've hesitated to say it, Holmes, but uh, if that man had died by any natural means in front of our very eyes, I'm perfectly certain that you would have solved the riddle. Well, if your hypothesis is correct, Watson, this case is not a matter of the mortal's minds. And that I refuse to admit. Well, we saw him come in, we saw him open his briefcase, he turned up the lamp, sat down... Thank and... you, Watson. Thank me for what? You've just given me some remarkably interesting food for thought. Oh, really? Come in. Why, Mrs. Robertson? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. It's Lady Cranwood now, isn't it? Makes me unhappy to say that it is, Dr. Watson. Won't you sit down, Lady Cranwood? I've already expressed to your husband my deep feeling over the tragedy I failed to prevent. Let me assure you, Mr. Holmes, that neither my husband nor I feel that you were in any way to blame. I appreciate your kindness, Lady Cranwood, but I still blame myself for having failed to reach a solution. And that is why I've come to see you this morning, Mr. Holmes. I... I hardly know how to say it. My suspicion is such a horrible one. Oh, there, 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 my dear. I'm convinced that Oliver is in deadly peril. And... And from his own brother. Do you, you hear that, Holmes? You felt it too, Dr. Watson. Oh, I've been fighting down a horrible thought, denying it even to myself. But I felt I had to tell you, Mr. Holmes. Well, have you any proof, Lady Cranwell? Anything definite on which to base such an accusation? Only Neville sneers and his jealousy of my husband. And those horrible snakes of his. Perhaps you may be able to assist me in confirming or disproving your suspicions of Neville. Lady Cranwood. Anything I can do, Mr. Holmes. Anything. I imagine that the entire family, and the servants as well, will all be attending the funeral this afternoon. Yes, of course. Then, if you will be good enough to leave me your key to the house, I shall take advantage of everyone's absence to go there and investigate one or two possibilities that have occurred to me. Of course, Mr. Holmes. Head us the key. Thank you. And one other thing. I should appreciate it if you would ask your husband to meet Watson and myself at the museum tonight. About nine o'clock. At the museum? Yes. I feel that a reenactment of the late Lord Cranwood's death may bring us to a solution. If you think it's necessary, Mr. Holmes. I think it is vitally necessary. Very well. I will ask my husband to meet you at the museum at nine. I must go now. 
Goodbye. Goodbye, Dr. Watts. Uh, goodbye. Poor woman, no wonder she's overwrought. Come, Watson. Your hat and stick. We have work to do. Cranwood's house, you mean? Well, I shall go there this afternoon. But meanwhile, I want you to take a note to Lestrade at Scotland Yard and personally see to it that he gets it. And then? Meet me at nine o'clock tonight at the British Museum. Well, I must say, Holmes, that as long as we had to come back to this chamber of horrors, I'm glad that you insisted on a decent amount of illumination. Since we won't be concealing ourselves this evening, Watson, I asked Professor Halliday to leave the Egyptian gallery fully lighted. Now, you sit here, Watson. Well, as long as none of the professors are about, Holmes, I don't suppose the museum will be shaken to its foundations if, if I smoke the pipe. Ah. Huh, that's better. Good evening, Lord Cranwood. Good evening. Lady Cranwood? Uh, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson. Good evening. Well, I fail to see what purpose will be served by a reenactment of my cousin's tragic death, but well, I'm willing to do anything within my power that will offer any hope. I insist on coming with Oliver, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid every moment I'm away from him. And now, Lord Cranwood, let us try in every way to duplicate your cousin's actions of two nights ago. I have here his briefcase, and I'd like you to enter through those doors, carrying the briefcase in your left hand and humming a tune. All right. Ready? All right, go ahead. <clears throat> now, uh, put the briefcase down on this table. Take off your hat and coat and put them on the table. Any particular place you want them? Well, I just place them on the table, as your cousin did. Now, open the briefcase. Oh, I thought I... What were you about to say? Uh, nothing. You were about to say, Lord Cranwood, that you thought the ingenious adaptation of the Borgia's poison needle had been removed from its mount in the briefcase lock. What on earth are you talking about? I found that fiendishly clever mechanism in your study this afternoon. Mr. Holmes, what do you mean? I mean that this briefcase was fitted with a poison needle, which was removed after Derek's death. Oh, no! And which I replaced when I found it at your house this afternoon. How horrible! How utterly vile! I also found some of the poison, Lord Cranwood. And I greatly fear that when I remounted the needle in the briefcase after my experiments, some of the venom may have remained on it. It was, Neville. Bluff, Holmes. It's sheer bluff. You wouldn't dare. If you think I'm bluffing, Lord Cranwood, why is your face going so pale? You're clutching your arm with your other hand. Why? Uh, Fiend, it was poison. Oh, no. My arm's swelling. It's going numb. There's no feeling left in my hand. No, no, no. Mr. Holmes must be mad. Must do, Holmes. You've killed me. All right, I did it. I killed the others, but... You'll never hang me! Oh. All right, Lestrade, oh. there's your confession. It's a confession, all right, oh. Dr. Holmes, but all you've given us is the corpse of a murderer. He's dead! You killed him! Not a bit of it. He's only collapsed from fear. Holmes, the pain in his arm, the symptoms. Merely a harmless, though painful solution which I placed on the poison needle. Oh! Catch her, Watson, she's fainting. And Oliver's a fiend, Holmes, an absolute fiend. Oh, unquestionably. But you must admit that his hiring us was an ingenious attempt at a novel method of removing all possible suspicion from himself. And now he'll pay the penalty for murdering at least two men. A good thing, too, although I'm sure I don't know how you ever found out about the briefcase. Why, you gave me the clue, Watson. You yourself. I did? Back in Baker Street when you were talking about the second death. You mentioned that we had seen Lord Cranwood enter the room. Open his briefcase. Well, we did. Exactly. But until you mentioned it, the significant fact had escaped me that the only object common to both deaths and handled by both men was the briefcase. Good gracious me. Well, that solves the mystery of the ancient Egyptian curse. Does it, Watson? Have you forgotten the three who died previously under such strange circumstances after they had opened Harshafit's temple? You, uh... You don't mean that you really believe in that stupid curse? Those three deaths have still not been explained, and I doubt that they ever will be. There are powers, Watson, higher powers, of which we poor humans still know nothing. <laughs> Ladies.
Louise, the poet who said a woman's hair was her crowning glory certainly knew what he was talking about. That's why you ladies should take the very best care of your hair, especially in shampooing. I'm glad you brought that point up, Mr. Bell, because many popular shampoos have a tendency to dry the hair. Well, here's one shampoo that will never dry the hair, never under any circumstances. And it's Cremel Shampoo. Yes, Cremel Shampoo is simply wonderful. It actually glamabays each tiny strand of hair so that it fairly radiates natural, dazzling highlights. It leaves the hair simply gleaming with natural, glossy luster. And what's more, your hair stays this way for days. Cremel Shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. Cremel Shampoo never hurts the texture of your hair. You can use it as often as you wish over a long period of time, and it'll never dry your hair. In fact, it has a beneficial built-in oil base, which actually helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Remember, ladies, that beautiful Powers models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. They claim no other shampoo leaves their hair more shining bright, yet never dries the hair. Why not try it? K-R-E-M-L, Cremel Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, next week, I think I'll tell you a story about the strange and ferocious behavior of Professor Presby's dog. An even stranger behavior of the professor himself. I call it The Adventure of the Creeping Man. Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Study in Scarlet. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tonight, the part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Mr. Ben Wright. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Cremel Hair Tonic and Cremel Shampoo, and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the creeping man. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The summer evening flows gently over Broadway, and the carousel sounds of the street's carnival begin. The brazen trumpet screams, calling the believers to the basement sanctuaries at a dime a prayer. The barkers of the night shout their spiels into passing ears, and the rustle of perfumed silk rides the June wind. You're shoved and pushed and mauled, and there's no bitterness because the taste of night melts in your mouth. You ride the rides, walk the midway, toss the hoop to win the cupid. You try not to notice the plucking at your sleeve. But finally you turn. Your palm is crossed with violence. You hold on to it until the man in the tweed jacket and the gray flannel slacks takes it away from you. Gives death back to the other man, its owner. Sprawled across the silk sheets of his bed, the blood from his bullet wound draining the sleep out of him. And because blood like that can stain the reputation of an exclusive apartment hotel, the man in tweed makes a suggestion. I offer it in all modesty, Mr. Clover, a mere suggestion. This can be... can be... What, Mr. Tracy? What can it be? Handled discreetly, of course. You can do that. You have the power, the know-how. Keep it out of the papers. Treat the frightful mess with velvet gloves. Anything else? I... nothing more I can think of at the moment. Not that I can bring to mind at the snap of your fingers. That's good. Now you can do something for me. Understand me, Mr. Clover. Managing this place is all-consuming. I spent years at school, here and abroad, learning the quirks, the ins and outs of the profession, the very... All that education. Maybe you can spell out for me the murdered man's name. Did I forget to introduce you? Pity. The fellow over there on our bed was once Frank Dunn, a bartender, of all things. 
A rather crude chap, I thought. But genteel enough to pay the tab in this slick joint of yours. They do bartenders like Dunn well at the trade winds, I hear. The club on West 52nd? I wouldn't know where the place was. Do you mind? Tell me more about Dunn. Well, he appealed to the female of the species, shall we say. They called on him constantly, at all hours. Tonight? Difficult to say. But do you not detect the faint odor of a lingering perfume? The aura a woman leaves? Pardon, I'll rid us of that. Never mind, I'll get it. Hello? Hello? Frank? Would you put Frank on the line, please? Uh, Frank just stepped out. Could I give him a message? Who are you? Why do you answer for Frank? I know he's there. Does he not wish to speak with me? Who is this? Who shall I say is calling? No. No, there is something. This is not the way Frank would have it with me. Hello? Hello? Yes, please? This is the police, operator. Trace that call. And the call was traced. Drugstore on 43rd and Broadway. A phone booth there. The third one from the left as you pass the Chiron reducing display. Only who knows who's been using the phone, the clerk in the white coat asked me. You don't have to have friends in Washington to use the phone, mister. You need a dime, that's all. Anyway, what was she, a spy or something? So if that's all, he had work to do. He left. So did I. It was a short walk up to 52nd Street in the nightclub that's known as the Trade Winds. Outside, a beach boy in a custom-made loincloth said aloha and pointed inside. And inside, a beach girl said aloha and offered her nose to be rubbed, which came with a cover charge, the price of admission to tropical paradise. And it was, even to the tropical birds playing tropical games and singing their sad songs in huge cages of gilded bamboo. And sitting in a fan-shaped wicker chair in the corner was trader Milt Barker, wearing yellowed linen, his eyes bleary with the grandeur of it all. Until he saw me. Hey, Danny. Grab yourself a wicker and take a load off. Yeah. What a place you have here, Mel. Wait till you see the floor show, Danny. Got a dame here that does a routine on a bed of hot coals. Mel, I... Do you uh, try the authentic cuisine yet? You like fish? I got cold huma huma nuka nuka apawa. That would set you crazy. Yeah. You sit still. I'll slice you some from the middle. Sit down, Milt. Huh? All right. So I'm sitting. I'm sitting, so... About a bartender here, Frank Dunn. Frank Lee ain't showed up yet tonight. He commit something? He's been murdered. Kismet. Pure kismet. Fate, Danny. The way the department figures, it took a murderer to do it. Yeah, I guess. How'd he go out? Shot. Like I say, kismet. What are you talking about? A guy like Frank, it figures. It just don't make me surprised. Come on, Mill, talk to me. What's on your mind? Well, he said smiles with the tall, cool ones. When Frank wiped the bar in front of a female patronesses, it had a meaning all its own. Personality. Keep talking. Well, Danny, a guy like him. Well, uh, Dane would be embarrassed leaving less than a fin or a phone number for a tip. Did he cause any trouble here? Frank? No. An operator with a head on him. Wait until the male escort was occupied elsewhere, then. <laughs> well, Frank would drop a small onion in a cocktail glass in such a way that patronesses would leave teeth marks on the bar. Uh, like, for instance... Well, well for instance, uh, who? Uh, Louise Hathaway is current, Danny. You know, the dame who is Mrs. to Edward Hathaway, the guy who manufactures hardware. You know Hathaway's hardware, nails, home. Yeah, yeah. tell me more about Mrs. Hathaway. She's current. That's all I know, honest. Come on, Danny. Eat some of my cuisine. I'll make you a regular lava lava. And so, as the surprise pink spotlight dimmed slowly over Trader Milt's paradise, I heaved a sigh for the regular lava lava that would never touch my lips and bid a fond farewell to the land of the Huma Huma Kuka Nuka Apawa.
at the Park Avenue apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Edward Hathaway. A maid in gray silk and high spiked heels told me they were out for the evening. She tightened a black shoulder strap to inform me that the Hathaways never informed a person in what glamorous places they were boozing it up. That this usually took till dawn. I said I'd come back in the morning. She said sometimes a person didn't know what side his evening was buttered on and kicked the door shut with her heel. <laughs> I guess I didn't wait the polite and proper interval after dawn because the girl who opened the door to me this time was still yawning. <sighs> Another thing, the long night had left no scar on her kind of beauty. But can it wait? Whatever you want, can it wait? You're Louise Hathaway? Uh-huh. Sleepy Louise. Tired Louise. If you weren't a stranger, you could rock me back to sleep. I need it so. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. Oh, you're the one Celeste told me about. Celeste the maid. What do you think of her? She thought much of you. <laughs> Come on in. Tell me about it. Celeste's in bed. I let her stay because we dragged her out of it when we came in. Couldn't find the keys. You know how it is. But I'll drag her out again to whip up some eggs for us, if you like. No, thanks. Big night last night, huh? Ah, the biggest. You build a lovely city here, officer. Lovely and fair. And at night, it glistens. Frank Dunn, was he a part of the night? You just played the only sad note there is, officer. Frank wasn't in it. Not anywhere. Why do you play a sad note like that to me? Because he's dead. Murdered. I don't think I'd ever let you rock me to sleep. You're cruel. And Frank, what about him? I wouldn't know about him, wise man. Once it got bad and I tried to... Frank winked, grinned, splashed whiskey on my dress. That's all, huh? Just a clumsy bartender. So much more you'll never know. Once I was at the trade winds having dinner with hubby mine, and there was a phone call for me, and I took it, and it was Frank calling me from the bar. And hubby mine didn't know why I suddenly turned happy. He had sense enough not to ask. Your husband knows how you felt about Frank? I don't know. I don't care. I always made him tip Frank a lot of money take him with us after he was through work. <laughs> well, it's going to be cheaper for a hubby mine with Frank gone. And for me? For me? Such a high price, I don't mind telling you. Will you wake your husband, Mrs. Hathaway? I want to talk to him. <laughs> He's awake. You can talk to him at his factory. Hathaway's Hardware Incorporated. Always the first man there. Sleeps an hour after I've kept him up tonight, and off to the factory. Off to make a bed of nails for me. Off Just to... stay here in case we want you, Mrs. Hathaway. So you can talk more to me about Frank? It'll be a pleasure. Deep and fair. A pleasure. Any time. It'll be all, Miss Garvey. All right, sir. Who are you? I gave my name at the gate, Danny Clover. From the police, aren't you? That's right. What's on your mind? I just came from your house, Mr. Hathaway. My house? What's the big idea? What did you want there? I had a chat with your wife. My wife? You don't go to my house, policeman. No more. You understand that? You don't bother Louise. You want something? You got a ticket to sell? You got something that gives you worry? You come to me. Louise, don't get bothered by police. She gets bothered, Hathaway. Any time the department feels the need. Yeah, you think so, huh? You get bothered, too, mister. Go ahead. Call your lawyer. Say murder to him, because that's what you and your wife are involved in. Murder? Call your lawyer, Hathaway. Look, now. The death of Frank Dunn, bartender, at the hands of person or persons unknown. Your hands, your wife's hands, both. At... I thought you were kidding. I'm not kidding. Louise is a kid. I got a young wife, Clover. Wild sometimes. Country kid come to the city wild. And not excusing her, understand? I like to watch it. She knew Frank Dunn. So she knew Frank Dunn. So I know Frank Dunn. A thousand people know Frank Dunn. She didn't kill him. Why should she kill him? What could he do for her? Give her a double martini? A couple of those go a long way. Look, Frank Dunn was a joke passed over the bar to Louise. Louise is married, so that settles that. All right. Who killed Frank Dunn? I'll tell you this. If he would have put a finger on Louise, I'd have killed him. One finger on Louise. I've told her that time and time again. 
And she and Lily think Who? it's... Lily. They think it's smart. They got to have cocktails at five. They go in by themselves. Who's Lily? Lily. Lily Prokosh, a dopey dame who writes poetry, wears glasses that goes like this. Lily Prokosh. Prokosh? Foreign? Yeah, talks accent talk. Where do I find her? Lily. Sometimes I pick up Louise at Lily's place in the village hotel. Yeah, I know where it is. Good. Maybe you're on to something, Clover, huh? Couch. A dream. Lily? It was painful. I opened my eyes and the knife was in me. Here. You say open your eyes, Lily. It is still the dream. I can't feel my body. I can't move. Lie here. Look at the Operator, get me in the house, body. doctor, quick. Help me. Help me. Wait a minute, operator. Never mind, operator. You're listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. This combination is your open sesame to Sunday night musical delight. CBS Guy Lombardo Time, featuring the sweetest music this side of heaven. And the Mario Lanza Show. Enjoy Guy Lombardo's music. Enjoy vocals, old and new, by Mario Lanza. Mario, singing sensation, called both the new Caruso and the hottest singer in a decade, may be heard Sunday nights on most of these same CBS stations. The nice thing about Broadway, the good thing, the reason why you run the rest of the way until you get there, is that Broadway never lets you down. It's all things to everybody. For the gourmet, the foot-long wiener with a seated roll. For the musically inclined, the rosette of loudspeakers over the slightly used record shop. For the art lover, the windy corner. And for those who just like to walk and be amazed, there are people who will be amazed right back at you. Walk it or wait it out. The day's 24 hours long, kid. Take that dream along. It'll happen to you. One way or another. But where I was going, there was no dream. Only the reality of a girl lying there frail against the decor of plump upholstery. The expensive drapes, the built-in silences. The lifeless girl, the stabbed-to-death girl. And talk to a man about it. The practice talk over the telephone. Because a policeman speaks of death by formula. Apartment 612, huh? Yeah, I got it, Danny. The door to the suite was open when I got here. The girl's name is Lily Prokosh. Okay. The one who called Frank Dunn when I was in Frank's apartment. I'm pretty sure of that, Gino. Anyhow, coroner, lab boys, the works. I'll talk to you later, Gino. Lily? Lily, it's me. Lily. Oh. Oh, I, I, I didn't... Come on in. Oh, that's all right. I, I can come back later. I'm from the police. Come on in. Come on, come on. Who are you? Police? Why, I... Lily! What? What happened to you, Lily? What did they do to you? Are you somebody to her husband or brother? I, I live across the hall. I... It's the first time I've ever seen her this close. The first time I've ever knocked on her door. I had a little speech. I was going to tell her what my name is. What do you know about her? I listen for her every day. Yesterday, when she came in, I What time was that? that? About 6 p.m. Did she go out again? No. I, I know because I spent all that time making up my mind to knock on the door and tell her I was a neighbor and what my name was. And that's all you can tell me about her? Yes. Lily? Lily, listen to me. My name is Harry. Harry Lynn. The 
Tartaglia. Tartaglia. Huh? Oh, oh, it's you, Danny. And the way I was standing here in the corner daydreaming, I'm not surprised I did not hear you come in. Dreaming? Uh, huh? Because of the talent I discovered only last night in our little six-year-old girl, Aida. Oh, tell me about the talent. Oh, Danny, the way my little Aida plays the piano... Mm. Mm, plays good, huh? Well, not only good, Danny, but she plays the piano underhand. What? And by ear. By ear. Gino. Yeah, Danny. Did you run down that stuff I asked for on the phone? Goes without saying. What'd you Danny, get? Danny, uh, this is the only comment? It's not important. What did you get, Gino? <clears throat> yeah. Well, Lily Prokash, a writer of things that rhyme, gathered material nightly for her rhymes in the trade winds at the bar stool facing the station of the also deceased bartender, Frank Dunn. Hmm. In the daytime, escorted said Frank Dunn to literary teas. Last night, came home at six, an hour after the established time of Frank Dunn's murder. Nothing else? Only that the knife handle was wiped clean. I kept after the boys, Danny, but that's all they could dig up. Yeah. Underhand, huh? Yeah, Danny. Ah, you should see little Aida. I'd like to. I really would. Be sure to invite me sometime, huh, Gino? I see the wicker chair is still open, Milt. Danny. Danny, sit in it, kid. Two nights, I see you each time. To what is due this sudden harvest of Danny Clover? Not that the trade wind ain't humored, but to what is due? You know a girl named uh, Lily Prokosh? Eh, names don't register with me, Danny. I'll ask for a reason. Is there a reason? A tall girl, blonde, harlequin glasses. Spoke with a little bit of an accent. The one who wrote lousy sonnets on my napkin? Yeah, she was a poet. The one who always comes in here with Mrs. Hathaway? That one, Danny. Well, what about her? You tell me. Lily Prokosh and Frank Dunn. Hey. Yeah. Yeah, what? The other day. What are you talking about? The other day. Uh, yesterday. The day Frank met his kismet. She was in here with Mrs. Hathaway about 5.30. I asked for Frank. I told her he wasn't to work yet. I started to tell her where Frank lived, but she said, never mind. She already knew. Left. And then what? Then what? Is she left. Left Mrs. Hathaway with a martini at half mast. The poet walked out. To see Frank? Yeah, yeah. She bumped Frank, huh? A doll like her. What do you know? And then start all over again. Back to the room where I'd first seen Frank Dunn with his blood on the monogrammed sheets. Back to the room where this particular set of violence had begun to shape itself and touch once more the things that had belonged to a man who had been well-loved. The gold money clip with his initials written in chipped emerald, the gold cigarette case, the gold keychain, the silk robe that hung in the scented closet. And on none of these things, the mark of an identity, the whisper of a killer's name. And all of it with the man in tweed at your elbow, commenting, snickering, fingering the imagined price tag. Hmm. This little trinket must have cost one of them a good deal of her rainy day savings. Put it down. Dead, don't touch. Is that it, Mr. Clover? Exactly that. There's an etiquette about these things, hmm? Yeah. I've been wondering, Mr. Clover. My brow is furrowed with wonder. I noticed. Hardly touches me, though. Sorry, Tracy. I've been wondering why you asked me to partake with you of this, what shall I say, this chamber of horrors. Because you're a liar, Mr. Tracy. And I indulge myself on the proper occasion. What was the occasion of my doing it to you? Yesterday, when you showed me Frank Dunn. Oh, oh, that. You mean when I didn't reveal to you who had been visiting the bartender at his siesta before death? Now's a good time for revealing. Sorry, but it's slipped my mind. There's nothing the police can do about a mind like mine. Is there, Mr. Clover? Correction, there is. Who was here, Tracy? Who was here? Else you'll beat me? You hardly make it worthwhile defending a dead woman's honor. Who? That foreign thing, with the wind in her hair and the mist on her eyeglasses. Lily Prokosh? I've heard her announce herself that strange way on the house phone. She stayed long enough with the bartender to read him her newest poem. But they had an interruption. You can reveal that, too. It'll cost me a dear little savings plan I had in mind. 
The interruption. Who was it? Lovely, frolicsome thing. Never been here before. Knocked on the bartender's door, was waved away, it seems. Tapped on my office door. Asked if I had a deck of cards. Wanted to play away love's bitterness. Sympathized? Played against her? One forty cents. Would have won more, only... Only what? In the midst of a deal, I had a call from the bartender ordering me to whisk the Prokash thing away by freight elevator. I did. When I got back, my card-playing lady was gone. You won 40 cents from her? That ought to make a girl like that unforgettable. Ever seen Louise Hathaway, Mr. Clover? I have, in society columns. And that evening, she played cards with me. She's precisely what you say. Unforgettable. And walk the night streets and try to figure why did Louise Hathaway call on Frank Dunn and not being able to see him content herself with playing cards with a hotel manager? Why had she gone to see Frank? She knew her friend Lily Prokosh was there. A lot of whys. And keep on walking east from Broadway to Park and up to the 70s and stop in front of the canopy apartment house. Pause, smoke a cigarette, then go in. And on the second floor, ring a bell. What do you want? Hello, Mr. Hathaway. I told you before... Let's go inside. You can tell me all over again. Thanks. Who is it, Edward? That cop. Yeah, me. Oh, Hi. See, Mr. Clover, I stayed as put as put can be. I'm glad you did. That'll make it easier. What are you two talking about? Oh, uh, we've got secrets, Edward. Yeah. About Frank Dunn. Oh, Danny, Edward knows all about that. Look, Louise and I were playing chess. Chess, huh? You know a lot of games, don't you, Louise? All the ones that are fun. Did you have fun losing 40 cents yesterday to that hotel manager? What's he talking about? What am I talking about, Miss Hathaway? <laughs> Louise. Stop it. <laughs> Darling, listen to me. Let me handle this. Take your hands off me, Edward. Louise. You knew Lily was with Frank Dunn. Why did you go there, Mrs. Hathaway? Why? That's right. Lily was my friend. I didn't want to see her get in any trouble. I told you to let me handle it, Louise. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> you see, like I told you, Mr. Clover, she's wild. Louise, you're in a little trouble now. Let me handle Take it. Take your hands off me. Can't you understand? Take your hands off me. Oh, I'm sorry I lost my temper. I didn't mean to slap you. Hardware man, fat man, bald man, nothing man. Jump. Jump, Edward. Louise, don't make me lose my temper again. Why don't you jump for the man, Edward? You do everything else I want you to do. Tell the man what you did for me, Edward. Oh, crazy. What are you talking about? About murder. About murder, Edward. You once told me something, Mr. Hathaway. You said you'd kill anybody who laid a finger on your wife. Yes, he told me, too, over and over again. That's why you always followed me, Edward. That's why you followed me to Frank Dunn's apartment house that night. Shut up, shut up! <laughs> and Frank wouldn't even look at me. He sent me away, Edward. And you killed him all because I spent an hour playing cards with a hotel manager. I was never with Frank, Edward. Never. But you killed him for me. <laughs> Go ahead. Jump for the man. I followed you. I always follow you. I couldn't stand that you're going to see that man. Take the hardware man away, Mr. Clover. You too. What? For killing Lily. You couldn't have Frank. Lily was luckier. So you killed Lily. Oh, no, Edward did that for me, too. Didn't you, Edward? Didn't you, Edward? No, I didn't. I followed you to Lily. Her door was open, wasn't it? I saw Lily after what you did to her. Oh, you don't know what you're saying, Edward. Listen to me. You love me, Edward. I'm going to have to sign a confession, Louise. What I just said about following you to Lily's, I don't have to admit that. Sign my name to it. I could deny I ever said it. I don't know whether I will or not. I'll have to think about it. I love you. Honestly. Truly, Edward, I love you. Jump, Louise. Jump. 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 
Broadway's quiet now. It's the four o'clock in the morning hour, the hour without color. But in a while, dawn will dip down, and there'll be fury again, and roar again, and crowd. The restless wandering, the puppet dance, the running after nothing at all. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Mary Jane Croft was heard as Louise, Herb Butterfield as Edward, Joe Granby as Milt Barker, Edgar Barrier as Neil Tracy, and Gladys Holland as Lily Prokosh. Just once around the clock aboard the second hand for Singing Again, an hour of comedy, music, and cash for the CBS listener who can identify the phantom voice. Jan Murray is your host, Judy Lynn, Allendale, the Riddlers, and Ray Block supply the music. Stay tuned now for Singing Again, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. It was Gilbert and Sullivan who said, quote, a policeman's lot is not a happy one, end quote. But tonight, just on the stroke of eight, Mike Shane, San Francisco's favorite ferreter of felonies, is seated in his apartment. He looks down on the bay at the masthead lights rising and falling with the swell, as Phyllis, his easy-on-the-eyes associate, does things with eggs in the tiny kitchen. A kitchen which hangs like an eyebrow on the forehead of Telegraph Hill. Uh, yes, Angel? How's the shoulder? It's fine. Uh, that is... Uh, oh, it's pretty good. Why? Ah, uh, because I think you're using it as an excuse to get me over here every night to fix your dinner. Well, Angel, some fellows have etchings. I use scrambled eggs. Uh-huh. Well, from tonight on, if I come over to your apartment, it's to be as a guest. You're going to do the cooking. Oh, Angel. I mean it. I'm through being a detective by day and a cook at night. All right, come and get it. Oh, boy. Um, hello. Hi, Mike. Oh, hello, Inspector. What are you doing? Well, I was just going to sit down to a plate of scrambled eggs. Why? I got a body. <laughs> you sound like something out of a horror film instead of Inspector of Homicide. What kind of a body? It's been in the water a week or so. It looks like an accident. Autopsy surgeon seems to think it was an accident. Sergeant here says it was an accident, but... Uh... You think it's murder? Could be, Mike. Where are you? You know where Olium is? Right on San Pablo Bay? Yes. I'll have the police boat pick you up at the jetty. Oh, swell. The sergeant will pick you up as fast as he can get there. Well, uh, give me two more seconds. Two more seconds? Yes, Inspector. One second for each egg. There she is. Pull alongside. Are we going aboard that yacht? Yeah, the inspection board. Ah, it's a trim-looking craft. Yeah, about 200,000 bucks worth. Hi there. Can you make it up the ladder? Do you want a bosun's chair? Oh, half an hour aboard ship and he talks like an admiral. <laughs> we'll use the ladder, Inspector. Hmm. Oh, what's the matter, Angel? Can't cook his own dinner because of a bullet wound in the shoulder, but he can climb a ship's ladder. Well, I... Okay, okay, you go first, Mike. Okay. 
Well, kids, you made good time. Mm Mm-hmm. Sergeant brought us up the bay as if he knew every wave. He does. Born and raised at San Rafael. Well, (laughs) where's the body? On the engine room hatch. Mm Mm-hmm. Any uh, wounds? One blow on the head, which could have been made if he had fallen off the rocks. Water in the lungs? Yeah, Phil. Oh, so he was alive when he hit the water. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Dressed in sailor pants, a reefer jacket, scarf. Shoes don't look like a sailor's. Uh, what besides the shoes make you suspect murder, Inspector? A dead man's hands, Mike. No calluses. And the nails have been manicured. Mm. Sailors don't have soft hands and manicured nails. Oh, good work, Inspector. Good work. But uh, how come uh, you're aboard this ship? Is the owner aboard? No, Mike. But we've sent for him. We came aboard because the Bay Patrol found the body near the ship. And because of this. We found this note in the dead man's pocket. The North Star. Owner Nelson Carter. And this is the North Star? Yeah, Phil. Autopsy surgeon said the body has been the water about ten days. Oh, it's pretty hard to identify him now. Any missing persons reported? I don't know. The sergeant checked with the missing persons bureau when he went back to pick you up. Yes, sir. Nobody reported missing, Inspector. Say, uh, who's aboard? I noticed the anchor light is trim and clear. No smudge on the glass. Must have been lighted tonight. That's right, Mike. Captain is aboard, also the quartermaster. Oh, I don't see any cabin light. No, Phil. The portholes are covered with heavy green curtains. Uh, did you uh, question the captain and the quartermaster? Yeah, Mike. Very non-committal gents. Said they didn't know the dead man. Never seen him before. Didn't know anything about him, and then they both retired to their cabins. Well, that's a little suspicious, don't you think? Uh, Not particularly. Well, most people are inquisitive, Inspector. Especially about anything that smells of murder. Inspector, did you search the ship? Yeah, they're doing quite a bit of repair work. Huh? Placing all the paneling in the stateroom and so on. Oh, uh, Inspector, did you take a look at the uh, ship's log? No. After all, Mike, we really haven't anything definite to go on. Not even a legitimate reason to suspect murder. I think we have. Well, so do I. Otherwise, I wouldn't have sent for you. But to try and tie the murder up with the captain or... With the ship, even. But I do tie it up with the ship, in a way. What do you mean, Mike? Point number one. We're agreed that this dead man isn't a sailor because of his hands. Uh Agreed. Point number two. We think that these sailors' clothes aren't his clothes, all except the shoes. Oh, yes, Mike, but I still don't see how you... Dead men can't change clothes, Angel. Uh So that suggests uh, violence. Now, take a look at the inside of that right trouser leg. Mm -hmm. You see that uh, smear of orangey red? Uh Yeah, Mike. So what? Well, that was made by red lead. The stuff they use to keep iron and steel from rusting. Go on, Mike. Now, take a look at these stanchions on the port side. Freshly painted with red lead. I didn't notice that before. Well, neither did I until right now. But you'll notice, Inspector, that there's no trace of red lead on the inside of either of the dead man's shoes. I see what you mean. To get that smear on the pants legs, whoever was wearing those pants would be sure to get some on their shoes. Right, Inspector, if he were wearing them voluntarily. Now, that smear suggests that he was carried. So I give you a suggestion. The murdered man was stripped of his own clothes, then these sailors' clothes were slipped on him and he was dumped into the bay. And these sailors' clothes came from this ship? Yes, Inspector, yes, these clothes are from this ship. And for that reason, I think we should question our four suspects. Four suspects? I... I don't get you, Mike. Four suspects? Yes, yes. The captain, the quartermaster, the owner. Yeah. And the fourth? The fourth is the ship's carpenter. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the news you've all been waiting for. Post-war gasoline is here. Right now, as we speak these words, Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries are shifting to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, you'll be able to buy a new 76 gasoline that will knock your hat off. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are hurrying it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil Minuteman hasn't received his first shipment of this powerful new gasoline yet, he will within the next two weeks. And just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up. And then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline. 
Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are still aboard the yacht North Star. The dead man's body still lies on the engine room hatch as Mike knocks on the captain's cabin door. What do you want? This is the inspector of homicide. We'd like to talk to you again. Well, I won't say glad to see you because I'm not. I won't say sit down because I'm hoping you won't stay long. We've uh, sent for the owner and I thought we could save time by asking you a few questions. Who are you? I'm Mike Shane, private detective. I don't know that I got to answer any of your questions. Oh, you don't, of course, but I'd like to ask one question anyway. Well? Where's your master's certificate? Why, you went... And don't tell us it's in the chart house, because uh, we looked there. Now, Captain, you may not like to answer Mike's questions, but I think you'd better answer mine. Where is that certificate? Here in that drawer. I haven't had time to put it up yet. I only took over this ship yesterday. Oh, only yesterday, eh? Yes. I answered an ad in the paper. The man wanted a navigator to be captain of his private yacht. I got the job. What about the crew? Well, they need three. I'll pick them up in San Francisco tomorrow. What about your quartermaster? Is he a new man, too? Yes, I hired him yesterday. Ahoy there, North Star! Throw us a line! Here you are, Sergeant! Who have you got there, Sergeant? The ship's captain named Wilkinson. What about the owner, Carter? Couldn't you find him? No, he's down in South America. Been there for three months. What's that? I said the owner of the North Star's been in South America for the past three months. But that's impossible. I spoke to him a couple of days ago when he hired me. Uh, that's what Carter's secretary says, and he ought to know. I brought him along in case you wanted to ask any questions. Mm-hmm. Who else is that in the police launch? Well, the woman is Mrs. Carter. Oh. Has she heard from her husband lately? No, not for three weeks. Mike. Yes, Angel. You and I have the same idea. I'm beginning to have the same feeling, kids. Well, let's have the secretary up first and have him look at the body. What's his name? Jackson. Mr. Jackson, will you come up the ladder, please? I wonder... Yeah, Mike? I wonder if the ship's carpenter is one of the old crew or a new man. Did you know he's he one of the old crew? I didn't hire him. You want to me, Sergeant? Uh, yes. This is Inspector Homicide. How do you do? Mike Shane. Hello. Miss Knight. How do you do? I wonder if you'd come over this way, Mr. Jackson, to the engine room hatch. Okay, Sergeant. Oh, why, why that's... That's... Mr. Carter? Yes, that's Mr. Carter. Hmm. Inspector. Yes, Mike. I'd like to make a suggestion. Shoot. I think we should take the body back to San Francisco. Yes? Then we should take everybody, and I mean everybody, to police headquarters. Sit down, Mr. Wright. You're carpenter on the North Star. Yes, sir. Tell me, how long since you were aboard? Well, nigh three months, sir. Not since Mr. Carter left. Is that right? That's right, miss. Mm-hmm. Now, take a look at this reefer jacket. Hey. Hey, that's mine, sir. I left it in me bunk. And these pants? Mine, too. But there wasn't no red lead on them when I laid them on the bunk. Mm-hmm. Did Mr. Carter say anything to you about redecorating or repairing the paneling in the staterooms? No, miss, not to me, he didn't. Mm-hmm. And uh, you think he would have, if that's what he wanted done? Oh, I think so. But uh, Mr. Carter was always one to be full of surprises. He could have done it without saying anything to me. You don't know of any reason why anyone should want to kill him? Not me, sir. I didn't know anything about his private life. Only as the owner of the North Star. Did he and his wife use the North Star much? Oh, yes, quite a bit. Sailed a couple of times to a wire with her. Lots of trips to Vancouver, B.C. He was in the shipping business, you know. Yeah. Well, Mike, unless you have any more questions... Uh, yes, just one. Where was the North Star anchored the last time you were aboard? She was tied up at her own jetty. Three miles northeast of Olium. Oh. So she's been moved in the past three months. Yes, miss. Out into the middle of the bay and about uh, three miles south. Uh-huh, I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Wright. The sergeant will show you out. And bring in Mrs. Carter, sergeant. Yes, sir. Mrs. 
Sit down, Mrs. Carter. I know this has been quite an ordeal. You identified your husband? Yes. We suspect murder, Mrs. Carter. Have you any reason to suspect anyone? No, my husband hasn't... Hadn't an enemy in the world that I know of. You thought he was still in South America? Well, yes, although I haven't had a letter for a month. I, I used to hear from him regularly every week. I suppose you inherit your husband's property, Mrs. Carter? I suppose I do. Half of it is mine anyway. I inherited it from my mother. Did, um, did your husband say anything about repairing or redecorating the paneling in the salons? No. But that reminds me of something. Yes, Mrs. Carter? Well, I heard Mr. Jackson talking to someone on the phone the other day about paneling. I didn't know what he was talking about, but then I paid very little attention to my husband's business. I see. And you can't help us anymore? I'm sorry, but I, I'm afraid not. I, if I think of anything, I'll call you, Inspector. Thank you. The sergeant will show you out. Bring in the captain, sergeant. Yes, sir. Uh, we may be out to call on you, Mrs. Carter. It might be necessary to search your husband's papers. Certainly, Mr. Shane. Sit down, Captain. Thanks. I take it that if you only took over command of the ship yesterday, you haven't given any orders? No, I spent yesterday and today checking supplies, looking over the ship's gear. You knew nothing about uh, the replacing of the salon paneling? Oh, yes, yes. The man I thought was the owner told me he was having it replaced and the workman already knew what to do. And this man that you thought was the owner, what did he look like? I don't know. I never saw him. But you said you spoke to him when he hired you. I spoke to him on the phone. Aha. Now we get somewhere. What was his phone number? I don't know. He called me. I wrote him an answer to his advertisement and put my phone number in my letter. He called me on the phone and told me to report aboard yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's all you know? That's all I know. I saw the ad, answered it, and he told me the berth was mine. I came aboard and that's that. Well, thanks a lot, Captain. I guess you'd better get back aboard ship. I'll wait for the quartermaster. I'm sure he doesn't know any more than I do. As you wish, Captain. You're quite certain that the quartermaster doesn't know anything. How can he? I picked him up on the waterfront this afternoon. He's only been aboard a few hours. I see. All right, Sergeant. We'll see Mr. Jackson next. Uh, just a second, Inspector. Yes, Mike. I think maybe we ought to take a trip out to Mr. Carter's home before we talk to Jackson. All right, Mike. Keep Jackson and the quartermaster till we get back, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Get out into the cargo and see if the captain and Jackson or the quartermaster get to talking. Right, Inspector. Atta boy, Inspector. Uh, are you serious about going out to Carter's place? Well, yes, honey, why? Well, I've been following your advice, Mike. Yes, Angel? I've been listening to the tone of these voices. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think the captain is lying. Or at least not telling the whole truth. Why, Phil? Well, he said he hadn't given any orders since he went aboard. That's right. Yeah. He said he'd been checking stores and looking over the ship's gear, but... Well, then why who do you... painted the stanchions with red lead? The captain? Those stanchions were still damp. Well, it takes red lead quite a time to dry, but Angel... Angel, I think you have something there. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know quite what it is, but you have something. <laughs> Thanks, Mrs. Carter, for waiting up for us. Oh, not at all. Naturally, I'm anxious to do anything I can to help find my husband's murderer. Hmm? I'm afraid I, I hardly realize he's dead. Yes, there isn't much we can say, Mrs. Carter, except that we'll get his murderer if anybody can. This is... this was my husband's office, his home office. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jackson always worked here when my husband was out of town. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd better check the desk first. Bill, you take the straw, Inspector. I, I don't know anybody should be scared. Well, Say, Mike. Phil, yeah? hmm? what is it? Here's the North Star's clearance to leave her jetty on the... an anchor in the bay. Dated the 26th of last month. Well, it might mean something. We'll, uh, we'll remember that. Hey, what have you got there, Mike? Well, something not quite on the up and up, I think. In the fireplace there? Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Burned envelopes and letters. Here, Inspector. Yeah. Here, if that isn't part of a Panama stamp... Panama? I don't... That's where my husband was when I last heard from him. Well, this was mailed the 21st. Airmail. 
The last I received was the 18th. Mail the 21st, and the North Star changed her moorings on the 26th. Yes, Angel, yes. Just time to receive this letter and change the ship's moorings. Does that mean something? It uh, depends, Mrs. Carter. It depends. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. I think we should pay a visit to the North Star's jetty, three miles northeast of Oleum, as I remember it. We'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those who may have tuned in late, we are repeating the announcement made earlier in the program. Post-war gasoline is here. Union Oil Company's huge new 100-octane refineries have been shifted to civilian production after long months of exclusive military service. That means that within a very few days, depending on your locality, you'll be able to buy a powerful new 76 gasoline that beats all pre-war performance. As fast as this new super gasoline can be blended, our trucks are delivering it to your Minuteman stations. Some have it already. If your Union Oil man hasn't received his first shipment of this sensational new 76 gasoline, he will within the next two weeks. Just as soon as he does, he'll post signs announcing its arrival in his station. Watch for these signs to go up, and then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of the new post-war 76 gasoline. Soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector are facing one of their most baffling mysteries. A murder with apparently no motive and no clues. We pick them up at the jetty where the North Star is usually tied up. Well, there's not a thing that I can see. Bear jetty. Odds and ends of rope, freshly painted staunch. Yes. Everything connected with the North Star seems to lead to staunch. What, what is it, Mike? Look. Look. A piece of red glass. Looks like part of a ship's lantern. Port lantern. A natural deduction, Inspector, since we're on the jetty. But look again. Then look at the railing here. Hmm? A long scratch with paint rubbed into it? Yeah. A scratch made by an automobile bumper and rear fender. Yes. When the car was backed up to turn around, whoever was driving scuffed along the rail and broke this tail lamp glass. Sergeant. Oh, uh, yeah, Mike. Check with Mrs. Carter's car, Jackson's car, and uh, the captain's if he has one. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, Mike. But uh, first get hold of Chips. Chips? Uh, the ship's carpenter, Mr. Wright. Oh. Get hold of him and tell him to meet us aboard the North Star as quickly as possible. Yeah. And then? And then... Then bring everybody back out to the ship, but not before you've checked all the automobiles. Yeah, Mike. And what's our move, Mike? Back aboard the North Star and lay a trap for a murderer. Oh, that constant creaking of the ship gets me. I think we're in luck. I don't believe the captain or the quartermaster are back on a boat. No, my captain said he was going to wait for the quartermaster, so they're both back at headquarters. Yeah, you're right. I forgot. What are you looking for, Mike? I don't know. But I'm giving these port stanchions the once over. Say. What? You see that dark stain on the deck? Yeah. Sure. What about it? You know what made that? No. Do you? No, but I'll make a good guess. Fresh water. Fresh water? Yes. Deck should always be washed down with salt water. It leaves them white and sparkling. Fresh water makes them dark. Yeah, but even so much. Shh, shh, shh. I hope this is Chips, our ship's carpenter. Oh, there! Yeah. Oh, Scar! Yeah? Here's the line! Try up and come aboard! All right! Go All right, mate. Well, what can I do for you? Hey, tell me, what will dissolve red lead? Red lead? Why, oil will if it ain't too old. And you've got to scrape it. Uh, take a look at the stanchion. I'll wipe that off in no time. You've got oil aboard? Sure thing. Okay, let's get going. All right, sir. Now, now for a quick look at the salon. You know, this was a pretty cleverly conceived murder. If that body hadn't been found for a week or two, there would have been no trace of this murder at all. There isn't much trace even now, Mike. Well, not enough for your district attorney or grand jury, but enough for me. And I think we can trap the murderer without too much difficulty. Well, this is the salon in here. <gasps> oh, what a beautiful place. Yes. Doesn't seem to me that the paneling needs redecorating. Uh-uh. But I tell you what it does look like, Mike. Yeah? 
Looks as if the paneling had been torn out in the search for something. The ship's safe, perhaps? Mm. Could be, or something hidden behind the paddling. There goes Chips. Uh. Why do you call him Chips? His name is Rice. All ship's carpenters are called Chips. At least in the books I read. Well, here we are. I found these rags in the captain's cabin. Good. Look like they've been used for the same job before. Let me see those. Hmm. Blood? I think so. Here, use this one. All right, sir. This is going to make a mess of the deck. Uh, That's all right. All right. Do, do I hear a boat coming? Yeah, I hear it too, Phil. Hurry, Chips, hurry. Get some more of that red lead off. All right, sir. I'm going like the roaring 40s, I am. Ah, that's the stuff. You've got it down to the old paint there in spots. He was right off when it's still soft this way. Ahoy, the star! Hi, up and come aboard, Sergeant. Bring everybody aboard with you. I think this ought to do it. Well, now I want to. Let us see. Here, I Hey, 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 what's going on there? You'll ruin that deck. I think this deck's already been ruined, Captain. But let that go for a moment. The uh, inspector had you all brought out here to see what we were doing. Yeah, what are you doing? We're taking off the last few layers of red lead that somebody put on this stanchion. Now, would you know who did it? You did it, Captain? You've been aboard two days and this red lead was still soft and wet? Could it have been put on without your knowing about it? Red lead often takes a week to dry. That stanchion hasn't been painted since I came aboard. That stanchion is the clue to this killing. What do you mean? Mr. Carter was killed aboard his own ship. Oh, Mr. He was probably hit on the head with a marlin spike, but that's beside the point. The main point is that while his killers were changing his clothes, putting the ship's carpenter's clothes on him, he bled quite a bit. Some blood was spattered on the deck. The killers tried to clean that with fresh water. Yeah. Then they were afraid that some of his blood was on the freshly painted stanchion. So after they'd thrown his body overboard, they repainted the stanchion. But not before they got a smear of red lead on the pants leg as they heaved him overboard. But who would do such a thing? My husband... The captain, for one, Mrs. Carter, and I think the sergeant has the answer to the other. Right, sergeant? Yes, sir. Uh, Mike, we found the car. The car? What car? Yes, Captain, the car which was used to take Mr. Carter out to the jetty while the North Star was still tied up there. That car has a broken taillight and a badly scraped fender. And it is where, Sergeant? In Mr. Jackson's garage. Jackson, you fool, I told you... Shut up, you idiot. Cut out the arguing. You'll need all the arguments you can scrape together when you face the jury. Okay, Sergeant, you can handle them. Tastes good. Nearly six in the morning and I'm hungry. You know, I was afraid that the inspector wasn't going to get a confession from those two, the captain and Jackson. They were tough monkeys. Oh, not so tough, really. They had just spent so much time plotting and carrying out this murder that they they couldn't realize they were trapped. Oh, such a senseless murder, too, Mike. All murders are senseless, honey. But I don't think they started out with the idea of murder in mind. As I see it, the secretary of Jackson had uh, made several trips on the North Star. He knew that wherever they went, Mr. Carter always had plenty of ready cash. Mm. He just got the idea in the back of his head that the money was hidden somewhere on board. He didn't know where, but uh, when Carter went to Central and South America, he determined to make a haul. Mm. So when the crew was on vacation, he got together with this man who called himself the captain. They started taking the salon apart, huh? Right, Angel, right. Jackson needed someone who knew something about ships. And then when he saw from the mail that Carter was coming home, he, he got panicky and destroyed the letters to Mrs. Carter? Mm-hmm. He met the unsuspecting Carter when he arrived, took him out to the jetty where the North Star was birthed, set out into the middle of the bay and killed him. Ah, oh, dressing him in the carpenter's clothes so if he were found, nobody could identify him. Mm-hmm. I see. Have some more coffee, Mike? Sure thing, Angel. How's the shoulder after the night's excitement? Oh, pretty good, but... I still think you'll have to come over for a few nights and fix dinner for me. I will not. You can eat out if you're too lazy to fix your own dinner. You know, I've been thinking, Mike. Yes, Angel? Wouldn't it be nice to have a yacht like the North Star and go any place, any time you wanted to? Oh, I don't know. Look what happened to Mrs. Carter. She lost her husband on account of the North Star. <laughs> of course, darling. I don't have a husband. Well, don't give up hope, Angel. Now, if you were to fix my dinners for the next few weeks... Mike Shane, I believe that's all you think about in a wife, a good cook. Oh, no, Angel, not quite. But uh, being a good cook is a good recommendation. <laughs> Before we sign off, I'd like to repeat the special announcement made earlier in the program. 
post-war gasoline is here. As fast as Union Oil Company's trucks can haul it, a powerful new 76 gasoline is being delivered to your Minuteman stations. Watch for the signs to go up at all Union Oil stations announcing the first shipment of the new 76 gasoline. Then drive in for a real thrill. Your first tank full of powerful post-war gasoline, soon on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Watch for it. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Written and produced by David Taylor, tonight's story was based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Charles Dan. This is John Lang saying good night for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. There may be many drawbacks to the life of a private detective, but boredom is not among them. At least not for Mike Shane. This evening is no exception. At this moment, Mike and his fetching associate, Phyllis Knight, are hurrying through the entrance hall of one of the luxurious homes of San Francisco's Marina District. And the reason for their haste? A hurry-up call from the inspector of homicide himself. Mike? Well, you've sure got here on the double. Oh, you asked us to, Inspector. And just why you ask us is still a mystery. Because, Mike, I wanted to learn what you know about John N. Crowder. John N. Crowder? I never heard of him. You didn't? How about you, Phil? Mm-mm, mm-mm. The only Crowder I know is the kid who sat behind me in seventh grade, and his name was Wilbur. Okay, I want to show you kids something. The body is in that room there. But we'll get to that later. Whose body? What body? John N. Crowder's body. This is his home. He's been murdered. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Well, people all dressed up as if it were a party. It huh? was a party, Phil. Mike, you see this telephone stand here and that scratch pad beside the phone? Oh, oh I see what's bothering you. Yeah, and that scratch pad is your phone number. I can't explain it, Inspector. Crowder didn't phone me. All my calls the past couple of days have been from people I know. That doesn't look like a man's handwriting to me. Did Mr. Crowder have a wife? He was a bachelor, Phil. Just a minute. Miss Whitcomb? Yes? Miss Whitcomb, this is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight. Janet Whitcomb is Mr. Crowder's ward. How do you do? Oh, I'm glad to know you, Miss Whitcomb. Uh, do you happen to know how this phone number, my phone number, got on this scratch pad? Why, yes. Uncle John, that's what I called Mr. Crowder, was looking through the classified directory this afternoon. He asked me to jot down that number. Did he tell you why he wanted it? Why he wanted to call a private detective? A private detective? Uh-huh. No, no, he didn't. Well, what about the murder itself? Anybody know what happened? As I've gotten the story, Mike, they were having a party tonight. At 8 o'clock, before most of the guests arrived, Mr. Crowder excused himself and went into the library to listen to the radio. Uncle John always lis- insisted on listening to this one broadcast, the days of 49. So when we heard several gunshots, we just thought they were part of the radio show. Several gunshots? Yeah, Mike, but one of them was the real thing. Who found the body? Miss Whitcomb here. Oh. I... Well, when the program was over, he didn't come out of the library. I went to call him. I... I opened the door. Oh, why? Why, how could anybody... Please, you mustn't. You've been so brave through all of this. This is Lee Strayhorn, her fiancé. Uh-huh. And the other gentleman? Richard Russell, madam. Where are the other guests? There aren't any. 
I told the sergeant to turn the others away at the front door. Was this radio program Mr. Crowder listened to a 15-minute or half-hour show? 15 minutes. And after Mr. Crowder went into the library to listen to it, where were you three people? Well, I hadn't gotten here yet, Mr. Shane. When I walked in, I found Janet in hysterics, and Charlie Lung, the houseboy, was trying to quiet her. Mm -hmm. Janet is a high-strung girl, and well, at first I thought she was upset about something she'd spilled on her dress. Then I saw Mr. Crowder, and I took one look and telephoned the police. As for me, gentlemen, I was here in the living room talking to Oliver. Oliver left, and then in a few minutes, I heard Janet shriek. Who is Oliver? Another servant? No. Mr. Oliver is one of Mr. Crowder's clients. Mr. Crowder was an investment counselor, and he handled Mr. Oliver's stocks and bonds for him. Nobody told me about Oliver before. I didn't know anybody had left the house. I guess you'd better round him up, Inspector. And now, how about you, Miss Whitcomb? Where were you while Mr. Crowder was listening to the radio? I was upstairs. I'd spilled something on my dress and was cleaning it. When I came downstairs, the program was over. What about the servants? I checked, Phil. They were all in the kitchen or the butler's pantry or the dining room. Oh. Did Mr. Crowder have any known enemies? Oh, oh no. I got it. Inspector, I'm sure I never talked to a John N. Crowder. So how about letting me have a look at the bottom? I was just going to suggest it, Mike. Okay. A couple of chairs overturned, the drapery pulled down. There must have been quite a fight. Which makes me doubt these people when they say that they heard nothing unusual. Oh, the body's on the other side of the desk, Mike. Oh, man about 50. No, Inspector, no, I've never seen this man before. Shot through the heart. Well, the gun was fired at close range, Mike, if those powder burns on his shirt mean anything. I've found one interesting clue. Huh? I've kept my mouth shut about it so far. Take a look at this blood on the rug. Mm-hmm. Right in the middle of the blood, a spot of clean rug. Mm hmm In the shape of a dollar mark. Hmm. I know what that is. Yeah? It was made by one of those, uh, money clips. You know, Mike, you carry one in your pocket for dollar bills. Yeah, the killer dropped it and then picked it up in order not to leave a clue. Or so he thought. Well, I'm still wondering, why did Crowder have my phone number? Why did he want to call me? And when he had the number, why didn't he call you? They said Crowder had no enemies, yet somebody must have had a motive to kill him. Just a minute, Inspector. Maybe maybe I can give you a hint. Yeah, Mike? What? Look around the room very carefully. Well, what about it? Oh, you mean those two overturned chairs? The walls, Inspector. The paintings on the walls. A painting of Carmel by the Sea in particular. You're right, Mike. The painting is crooked. Not only crooked, but it stands out from the wall. Yes, and I'll bet behind the painting there's a wall safe. Hmm. Well, I'll... Push the painting to one side. So, and there we are. Mm. It's unlocked. Now, let's see what's inside the safe, if anything. Kids, huh. this desk lamp is the only light in the room, isn't it? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, why? Because I'm going to turn it out. Somebody is about to come in through that French window. <laughs> We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. If you like to feel your car surge ahead with quick power when you press down on the accelerator, try using the new 76 gasoline. You'll find that with a tank full of the new 76, your car will respond instantly to the throttle. Take hills with the easy lift of a soaring bird. That's because the new 76 is power-packed with components of 100-octane gasoline, the fighting fuel Union Oil Company refineries produce for the Air Forces. Furthermore, the new post-war 76 has been blended under scientific control to produce a fuel which will give you the full horsepower of your engine regardless of make. It's no wonder motorists are saying that old cars perform like new with 76. So try a tank full of this powerful post-war gasoline and then watch the way your car surges ahead with new life and power. You can get the powerful new 76 gasoline at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. And while you're in, ask the Minuteman for your Union Oil credit card application. <laughs> On the library floor lies the murdered body of John Crowder. And on the sun porch outside, Phyllis has seen a prowler. Mike and the inspector step to the French window. And then suddenly... All right, mister. Hands in the air. What in place? Come here. Come inside. That's what I've been trying to do. The police at the front door wouldn't let me in. Okay, turn on the light, Phil. All right, now. Who are you and why the peeping tom act? I was not peeping. 
I came around the side of the house to see if someone would let me in. That flat foot at the front door said Crowder had been murdered. There's the evidence on the floor. Shot through the heart. Blood on the carpet. Who did it? That's what we're trying to find out. And also your name. Oliver, see? Bert Oliver. Oh, you're the man who was here earlier. Why'd you leave the house? Why not? No murder had been committed then. I walked across the street to my house. Well, Mr. Oliver, why did you go home? Because I forgot my present for Janet. And uh, when did you last see Mr. Crowder alive? He came into the library to listen to a radio program. I was talking to that, well, that social butterfly, Richard Russell. I stepped into the library here for a moment, finished some business with Crowder, and then left. What kind of business? Investment business, stocks, bonds. Do I have to draw a diagram for you? When you were talking with Mr. Crowder, was the radio on? Full blast. And when you came back, the sergeant wouldn't let you in the house, so you came around onto the porch. Yes, 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 I already said that. Why were you so anxious to get inside, Mr. Oliver? People generally give a murder a wide berth. Oh, for Pete's sake, I'm a good friend of Crowder and Janet. I wanted to help her. Why should Janet need your help? Because she won't get any from that fiancé of hers. That's reason enough. Crowder should have stuck by his guns. We should have forbidden the marriage. Inspector, I think we should ask Mr. Oliver to relax in the other room for a while and let us talk to Janet. Right. If you please, Mr. Oliver. Miss Whitcomb, would you step in here a moment, please? Oh, Mr. Oliver. Don't let them frighten you, Janet. You wanted something? Uh, Just a small point, Miss Whitcomb. Now, Mr. Crowder was to be your guardian, I believe, until you are 21? Yes. I suppose that means you have some money? From my parents. Was it very much? Several hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. And you were having some trouble with Mr. Crowder? About your money? Oh, no, not that. He was a fine man. He was perfectly honest. He had money of his own. Then you didn't get Mr. Shane's telephone number from the directory yourself. Oh, no, no. But you were having trouble with Mr. Crowder. There's no need to be frightened, Miss Whitcomb. I... Uncle John didn't understand. He... He wouldn't understand. (laughs) Now, please, Miss Whit. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, fellas. You told Oliver to go in the other room and relax. I suppose you sit down and relax a while. I'll talk to Janet. He's dead. What does it matter now? We're just trying to help you, Janet. The more we know about Mr. Crowder, the easier it may be for us to find his murderer. Now, you can see that, can't you? Yes. Of course you can. Now, you were having some difficulty with your guardian. You can tell me what it was. He... Uncle Johnny didn't want me to marry Lee. He said Lee was no good. I told him he was wrong, wrong. I told him I wouldn't let him run my life any longer. I'd leave home. I love Lee and he loves me. I'm going to marry him. Nobody can stop me now. Nobody. How long have you been engaged to Lee? Two weeks. Uncle Johnny was mad about it, but he never said another word about Lee. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's all the trouble you ever had with Mr. Crowder? Yes. Can I go now? I guess so, Miss Whitcomb. Thank you. Well, what do you think, kids? I don't know, Phil. girl is so dramatic about everything. If Crowder didn't make an objection to the marriage for the past two weeks, I don't see why she's so excited. Uh Uh-huh. Well, before we have another interruption, I want to examine that wall safe. Hmm. Safe is hardly as big as the inside of a hat box. Mm. One small tin box, empty. One packet of currency marked $2,500. Mm. Oh, that's odd. If it was burglary, why did the killer leave the money? Well, he might have been scared off before he saw it or even overlooked it in this hurry. Yeah, but we don't know what was in the safe originally, Mike. We can't tell what was stolen. If Crowder was a good businessman, he must have kept an inventory of its contents. And if he was a cautious businessman, he would not keep the inventory right inside the safe. No. How about this desk here? Mm. Uh, Inspector. Eh? Oh. What is it, Mr. Russell? I noticed that Janet is very upset. I thought maybe I ought to tell you that she used to quarrel with Crowder all the time. Uh, He didn't want her to get married. Yes, Janet told us all about it, Mr. Russell. Oh, well, I just thought you'd like to know. Uh, Find anything in the desk? Mr. Russell, we're very busy, so if you don't mind... Oh, all right. I just thought you'd like to know. Oh, a nosy character. Oh, here we are, Inspector. The inventory to the safe. Swell, Mike. Let's see now. Cash, $2,500. Well, that checks. Then one package, Charlie Lung. The houseboy. Yeah, but no findy package. Next, $21,000 bonds. 
P.M. and O.R.R. Abbreviation for railroad bonds, probably. Yeah, and said bonds are also missing. Now, the last person known to have been in this library with Crowder was Mr. Oliver. Mm. Yes, Oliver said he had some business with Crowder about stocks and bonds. After which Oliver walked across the street to his house. If, uh, if he paid Crowder for those bonds, I didn't find the check in the safe. And I searched Crowder's body. He had just a small amount of money in his wallet. Mike, you know what we're going to do? Yes, Inspector, we're going across the street and search Mr. Oliver's house for those bonds. <laughs> Mike. Yes, Inspector. I've looked all through Oliver's desk. You find anything? No. No, no luck. I searched the whole living room. I thought there might be another wall safe. And I checked upstairs. If Mr. Oliver's servants were home tonight, we might get them to tell us where he keeps his valuables. Mike, you think Oliver would still be carrying those bonds on him? Oh, that'd be pretty risky. Uh Uh-oh. Hey, do we dare answer it? I'll take a gamble. Hello? Hello, Oliver speaking. Is this the inspector, Mr. Shane? <clears throat> well, it's Shane, Mr. Oliver. How did you know we were uh, here? Russell saw you. You're looking for those bonds. Well, we were just checking. If uh... you haven't found the bonds yet, I tucked them in Webster's Unabridged Dictionary. It's on the table, right behind the phone. The dictionary on the table. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Oliver, those bonds belong to Mr. Crowder. How did you I have... bought them tonight. I told you I had business with Crowder. You didn't give him a check in payment? Of course I didn't give him a check. Crowder always sends me a monthly statement. My credit is A1. When you leave the house, please turn off the lights. Oh, how do you like that? Russell saw us come in here. Oliver hid the bonds inside the dictionary? Yeah, Phil, here they are. Oliver was so straightforward about it all. Yet he might be trying to beat us to the punch. Yeah. Now what? I'll talk to him this time, Mike. The inspector speaking. Inspector, this is the sergeant. They told me I could reach you at this number. Yeah? What is it, sergeant? Uh, that Chinese houseboy, sir. Uh-huh. I saw him sneak out of the house. I trailed him clear down to a shop in Chinatown. He's up to something. Oh, where are you now? In the chop suey place on Grand Avenue. I can watch the shop from here. Okay, Sergeant, keep your eye on it. We'll meet you there in ten minutes. <laughs> I followed him into this building, Inspector, and up those stairs to the second floor. And then where? He went in the first door at the top of the stairs. Please, Angel, watch those heels. You sound like a dray horse going up a ladder. Don't be personal, Mr. Shane. Oh, there, no. there. That's the door right ahead, sir. The transom's open. Never Listen. Talking Chinese. I think, I think we better knock my door. Oh, oh. Uh, Will you come in, gentlemen, and uh, miss? <laughs> Listening through closed door is like cotton in one's ear. Well, you see, we were just... Uh, yeah. I am Yin Hao, dealer in Oriental Imports. I believe you already know my friend, Mr. Charlie Lung. Yes, yes, we wanted to talk to him. Obviously. That is why you followed him from Mr. Crowder's. As inspector of homicide, I gave orders that no one was to leave that house. Yet Charlie Lung sneaks off. Why did you run away, Charlie? Please, Charlie. My friend, Charlie Lung, came to me with a problem of ethics, a delicate matter of conflicting loyalties. So? Mr. Lung is in possession of an object. You of the police would call it a clue. I see. His problem is whether to produce the clue or to hide it. He'd better produce it or I'll have to arrest him. Even the honest man casts a crooked shadow. Unhappily... Mr. Lung tells me the object belongs to Miss Whitcomb. You can, of course, appreciate his distress. If Miss Whitcomb is innocent, I promise no harm will come to her. Why, yes, this clue may solve the whole murder. Oh, uh, my friend Mr. Lung say that upon the basis of your promise that no harm will come to Miss Whitcomb, I may give you the object. It is this. A silver money clip. The dollar mark. Charlie, where did you find it? Oh, after Missy Clyde, I find it on a floor 
In the blood. I, I take it. Now, now, what you do? We're going back to the house and talk to Miss Whitcomb. And you, Mr. Lung, are coming with us. <laughs> I'm sorry, Inspector, but I just had to lie down for a while. Uh-huh. I I don't feel at all well. She really is sick. I've been sitting here in the bedroom talking to her. Lee, would you mind stepping outside? We have something we'd like to show Janet in private. Well, yes, of course. Janet, do you own a silver money clip? The sort you carry in your purse to hold dollar bills, Janet. Yes. Is this it? Why, I must have dropped it. Janet... Charlie Lung, the houseboy, found it beside Mr. Crowder's body in a pool of blood. Oh, no. No, it now, can't now, be. Now, now, Janet. I didn't have my purse with me. What are you trying to do to me? Inspector. Yeah? Mr. Shane. Yes? Could you come in here a moment? Why, certainly. Phil, you stay here with Janet. All right. No, 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 no. You're, you're making a mistake. It's, it's your mind. It's your mind. It's Charlie Lung. What's wrong, Sergeant? I caught this houseboy... Hiding a bundle under his mattress, sir. This bundle of money. $17,000. Holy Harry. It belonged to me. It's your mind. Where would you get $17,000? Oh, Charlie Long, very rich man. I'm making say with 15 years. I say we go back by and by China to die. Mr. Clowder, he keep money in his safe for me. Then it was you who went into his safe tonight. No, sir. Huh? Me, I ask you, Mr. Clowder... For my money tonight. Mr. Cloud will go to save it, take out the money, and he give it to, to me. Oh, in just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. If you have to drive in traffic very much nowadays, you've probably noticed the extra congestion on the road. Now, we don't say that driving with the new 76 gasoline will eliminate traffic problems, but we do say it'll make your driving a lot more pleasant by putting new power under your foot. Even the oldest cars step up with renewed energy when you put in the new 76. That's because the new 76 is power-packed with components of wartime aviation gasoline, the fighting fuel Union Oil Company refineries produce for their air forces. Furthermore, the new post-war 76 has been blended under scientific control to produce a fuel which will give you the full horsepower of your engine, regardless of make. It's no wonder motorists are talking about the way their cars perform with the new 76. Try a tank full of this powerful new gasoline and then watch the way your car surges ahead with new life. You can get the new Super 76 gasoline at any Union Oil Minuteman station. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. In answer to Janet's piercing scream and Phillips, Phyllis's call for help, Mike Shane and the inspector dash into Janet's bedroom. <laughs> Phil, Phil, Janet, what's the matter? What happened? The window. I saw two arms reach through the window. He wanted to kill me. Oh, who wanted to kill you? I don't know. I couldn't see. Phil, did you see it? No. I was in Janet's dressing room. Let's check what's outside the window. Uh-huh. Balcony. Runs the full length of the house. Janet! Janet, was that you screaming? Oh, Lee, Lee. Who made it? You? You, you all right? What in blaze is going on in this house? Somebody was being murdered. Quiet, quiet, please. Quickly now. We want to know where all of you people were during the past three minutes. Lee? I was in the dining room. Mr. Oliver? In the hall below. I was starting up the stairs when I heard the commotion. Mr. Russell? In the living room. Seems I'm always in the living room when something happened. And Charlie Lung was outside the door with the inspector and me. Don't... Janet, you're certain that you saw somebody? Oh, yes, yes. I almost died of fear. Phil, were you out of the room? Naturally. Janet told me she was certain that the clip found in the library was not hers. That her clip was in her purse, so I was looking for her purse. And did you find it? Yes, it's in the dressing Let's room. Let's go take a look at it. Here, this is the clip. Uh-huh. And comparing it with the one Charles Lung found? Well, it looks just the same, only a trifle smaller. Phil. Yeah? Do you think Janet really saw somebody 
Or was she faking it? I've been wondering myself. I don't know, Mike. If I'd been in the room with her, Back it wouldn't here. have been... Mr. Shane. Yes, Mr. Russell. Oliver says he was below in the hall when the screams came. Well, I was in the living room looking out into the hall, and I didn't see him. Perhaps not, but I did. I saw him starting up the staircase. Oh. You may be more helpful, Mr. Russell, if you'll return to the bedroom with us. Gentlemen... Do any of you own a silver money clip in the design of a dollar mark? No, I've never, never owned one. one. I'm sorry to contradict you, but one of you did own such a clip. A brand new one. How can you make a statement like that, sir? Because the clip which I'm holding in my hand is of highly polished silver. It has not been in contact with the loose chains in a man's pocket because it bears no scratches. It is brand new. Janet, uh, Miss Whitcomb. What? Would you mind turning around, please? Oh, a little more into the light. You mean like this? That's it. Have you worn that same dress all evening? Why, yes. I cleaned the spot just before... before I discovered Uncle John. Mm-hmm. Inspector? Yeah? Angel, will you step out into the hall with me, please? All right, all right, Smarty. What's all the mystery? You heard Janet earlier this evening. She said she had cleaned that dress just before finding Crowder's body. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure, Mike, but what about it? What about it? Come with me. Where? Downstairs and outdoors. I think we'd better search one of those cars in the driveway. Not just any car, but a car. <laughs> Right, Mike, here it is. It was hidden under the seat. Colt, 38 revolver. One chamber fired. Huh? That does it. All right, Inspector, I think we're ready for our murderer. That's what I said. This gun I hold in my hand killed Mr. Crowder. Inspector, I've never owned a gun in my life. The same goes for me. The last time I used a gun was skeet shooting. Very well. No one has come forward to claim his gun, so we'll give him another chance. Janet, when we were first talking to you tonight, do you remember somebody else mentioned that you had a spot on your dress? I don't remember. Perhaps not, but I do very distinctly. Maybe I can refresh your memory by telling you what happened. The murderer parked his car down the street a couple of blocks. He walked here to the house, then sneaked around in back and watched the living room window. He saw Janet spill something on her dress, and then Mr. Crowder excuse himself and go into the library to listen to his favorite radio program. The killer knew the program would last 15 minutes. While Crowder was at the radio, the man opened the French window and sneaked up on Crowder. At the last second, Crowder discovered him. They struggled. And in the struggle, the man's silver money clip dropped to the floor. The man fired and Crowder fell. The killer stepped outside the French window and closed it. He ran back to his car, got in, and drove up to the house. Then, very casually, walked in the front door just after Janet had discovered the body. But, but that's when Lee came in. Yes, Janet, your fiancé. And he tried to kill you a few moments ago when he thought you were beginning to suspect him. Don't believe him, Janet. It's, It's crazy. You told us that when you walked into the house, you didn't know Mr. Crowder was dead. You said you thought Janet was upset because of the spot on her dress. But Janet had already been upstairs and cleaned her dress. The spot was gone. You saw the spot on her dress when you looked through the library window. Why, that isn't what I said. Oh, yes, it is, Strayhorn. We found this gun in your car with one chamber fired. All right, arrest me. You won't get anywhere. No jury will convict me on evidence like that. The murderer planted the gun in my car. Lee, have you ever heard of the paraffin test? No. No. Well, the police coat a man's fingers with paraffin. If he has recently fired a gun, the paraffin will show the powder marks. Are you willing to take that test? All right, Inspector, I think the look on Lee's face is proof enough. Kids, I'm sorry my wife is down country again. She'd love to fix these eggs herself. Well, we're sorry too, Inspector. You know, your house seems empty without it. Yes, it certainly does. Not to change the subject, Inspector, but Mm -hmm. I've been wondering. Lee Strayhorn seemed awfully cocksure that a jury wouldn't convict him. Do you think he has a chance? Not a chance, Phil. Tomorrow we'll check every jewelry store in town and find which one sold Lee that silver money clip. That'll cinch it. And we can prove his motive. 
Mr. Crowder knew Lee was a uh, thorough no good. Oh, Crowder allowed Janet to become engaged to Lee, but he was going to sidetrack a marriage. Mm, I suppose that's why Crowder had your phone number. He was going to ask you to look up Lee's background. And Lee guessed what was in the wind. He wasn't going to let anything stop him from marrying Janet's money. Not even murder. Say, Angel. Hmm? Why the dreamy expression? Mm, I was just looking out at the lights in the Golden Gate Bridge and wondering. Oh, but what? Wondering why Janet didn't see through Lee. Her eyes must have been blind. Mm-hmm. When your heart's on fire, smoke gets in your eyes. That has a special point for you, Phil. For me? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. The way you're looking at Mike right now, I'd say clang, clang, three alarm fire. Oh, why, why Inspector? <laughs> <laughs> Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. The Chinese characters were portrayed by Charlie Lung. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for Union Oil Company and reminding you once again to get your application for your Union Oil credit card this week. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Jordan. Not far from the Musk Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Man from Damascus. Damascus, capital of Syria, population 300,000 or so. They say it's the oldest city in the world that people still live in. Uh, I wouldn't know. But I do know there's a street in Damascus named the street called Straight. And I also know I once met a man from Damascus. And he was as twisted as they come. Go back to a hot Wednesday afternoon. Chris was at the bar serving up some arak. And I was standing at the front of the cafe looking out into the Cairo streets. That's when an old man, dressed in a boy's postal uniform and riding a bicycle, stopped in front of the tambourine. When he came in, he was carrying a wet envelope in his hand. I have for the Mr. Jordan one special delivery letter. Would the Mr. Jordan sign his name on this line? The Mr. Jordan would? I thank the Mr. Jordan. Yeah, uh, here you are, Pop. Buy yourself an ice cube. Muta Shakir. Muta Shakir, then. It was a white envelope with some dirty finger smudges and a Cairo postmark. There was no return address. I looked at it for a moment, then tore it open. The first thing I saw, flat and crisp, was a pack of Egyptian pound notes. And I did a quick tabulation. One thousand Egyptian pounds, five thousand American dollars. And clipped to the money was a short note. Partial payment for services to be rendered, one thousand pounds. I'm waiting for you at 16 Sharia El Nazar. Seven o'clock this evening will be fine. And it was signed... The man from Damascus. Well, I don't take easily to somebody's bidding. If someone wants to see me, he comes to me. So I put the money in the safe, but figured that wasn't the end of the man from Damascus. Exactly seven o'clock that evening, I knew I had figured right. Rocky. Hmm? What is it, Chris? Fell out to see you. Where? In your office. I tried to stop him, but he... Oh, that's right all right. I'm sort of expecting him. Uh, Mean-looking guy. 
Want me to come with you? No, no, I'll handle it. Yeah, take over the till, will you? Sure, I... Hello, Jordan. Well, make yourself at home. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. <coughs> Pretty good booze. Too rich for your taste, buddy. Put it down. Yeah, uh, all right. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Figured you differently. Everybody in town says you're a right guy. Well, maybe you've been talking to the wrong people. What do you want? <laughs> you. You have been talking to the wrong people. I'm not for sale. The thousand pounds is just a start, pal. There's more where that come from. And there always is. Ah, come on, big shot. Button up your shirt. It's seven o'clock. You got a point, man. I can't make it. Ah, that's a big mistake. Your money's in the safe. You can have it back. Ah, that is not my instructions. Oh, so you're just a leg man. Ah, something like that. You and me, we're working for the same man. All right, buddy, you're through talking. There's the door. Get away from the door, Jordan, or I'll pin you to the wall. <laughs> Seven-inch blade, Jordan. Damascus steel. Got it? I got it. All right, put the knife away. You'll cut your hand. I'll, uh, I'll come with you if your boss wants to see me that badly. I wasn't going to argue with a seven-inch double-edged blade, especially the way that monkey was waving it in the air. Well, we left the tambourine, climbed into his car, and drove through the Cairo streets, out one of the city gates... We ended up in front of a place called the House of Sand. Should have been called the Pile of Scrap, because that's what it looked like. But the knife man said it was a hotel. Two minutes later, my pal knocked on the door of room 12. Who is there? Jordan. He's come for the rest of the dough. You're taking a lot for granted, Buster. Quiet, you. All right, you may let him come in. Go on in, Jordan, and meet your new boss. I walked inside. My pal with the knife shut the door behind me and stayed outside. Then I saw him, the man from Damascus. He was tall and big, but I couldn't tell what he looked like. His whole face was wrapped in bandages, and he reminded me of those pictures I once saw of the invisible man. Hello, Mr. Jordan. Nice of you to come. Sit down. Uh, I'll take it standing. Well, it's good to meet again. Is it not, Mr. Jordan? Again? You do not remember? But you should. Damascus, 1939... Well, maybe it's my new appearance. I had a face then. What do you got now? Let's talk about Damascus. All right. You wish a drink? No, I just gave it up. Mr. Jordan, you wronged me in Damascus. I did? Yes, you wronged me most severely. So severely that I've never forgotten. And I said to myself that someday I would come for you. Well, I am here. Welcome to Cairo. Jordan, I'm not just talking for pleasure. You sure you got the right guy? And do not try to tell me you do not remember. You are the right man and you know it. But you are fortunate, Mr. Jordan. Yeah, how's that figure? I'm going to give you a chance to erase our difference. And make a little money besides. You see, there's someone in Cairo that I want even more than you. So how do I figure? You are going to bring him to me. His name is Alex Zarko. Zarko? It's a pretty big order. I know, but I think you can do it. The police have had a dragnet out for two weeks trying to track him down. And I want to get to him before they do. I think you can bring him to me. You know Cairo better than any man I know of. You know where men like Zarko would hide and how to get to him. Ah, oh, sorry, friend. You've got the wrong guy. Jordan, listen to me. I would find him myself if I could. I just do not know Cairo. And I cannot go wandering around like this. I'm giving you a chance to square a dirty deal and make a little money on the side. I will double that thousand pounds and call off our little difference. Uh, what have you got against Zarko? He took something from me. What? My face. Oh. I want to find him, Jordan. I must. You do not know what it is to feel that you can never walk the streets again without a covering and the thing you once called a face. Well... What about it, Mr. Jordan? No, no deal. You got a private vendetta with Zarko. Keep it that way. Yeah, there's your thousand pounds back. Buy yourself another boy. I walked out of the house of sand, and the knife man was gone. I found a taxi and headed back for the tambourine. Alec Zarko. Yeah, an all-around no-good guy. The Egyptian police wanted him on an attempted assassination, espionage work, with an assorted killing or two thrown in. 
The police had all roads covered, the trains and the flights out of the city. They figured they had him bottled up pretty well, and it was just a matter of time before they bundled him. Well, back at the tambourine, I drew myself a beer, found a back table, and did some thinking about the man and the bandages in the city of Damascus. What's up, Rock? Hmm? Oh, nothing, Chris, just thinking. Say, uh, did you ever hear me talk about Damascus? Damascus? Yeah, spent nine months there once working for an oil company. No, I don't remember you saying anything about it. Why? Oh, nothing. Just trying to bring back a little memory. Drop it, it doesn't matter. Sure, Rock. I'll get back to... Excuse me, gentlemen. You are Mr. Jordan... That's right. May I talk with you, please? It will take but a moment. Uh, all right, Chris. I'll talk to you later. Sure, Rocky. Sit down. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Jordan. I did not wish to trouble you, but I found that I had no other course. My name is Sandra Marr, and I'm from Damascus in Syria. Uh-huh. You're traveling in Cairo's on the Grand Tour. This is not a trip for pleasure. I'm looking for someone. Uh, if his name is Alex Zarko, you got lots of company. No, his name is not Alex Zarko. It is Paul Marr. And he is my husband. Paul Marr. I don't know anyone by that name. You may not know him by his name, Mr. Jordan, but I'm positive that you have met him. And how do you figure that? Paul said he had some business in Cairo. He left Damascus four days ago with a man whose name I do not know. But he was the same man who left the tambourine with you earlier tonight. It is my belief that he took you to see Paul. Oh, I get it. I tried, but I was not able to follow you through the streets of Cairo, so I've waited outside your cafe till you returned. I must see Paul. Would you take me to him? No. Nope. Would you tell me, then, where he is? Mr. Jordan, Paul's business, as he calls it, it is, it is trouble. Some terrible sort of trouble, I know. Oh, you're right there. He's a fine man, Mr. Jordan. A wonderful man, but... Things have not gone well since his face. He's in trouble, and I've got to help him. He's got a revenge on, lady, with a guy named Zarko and me. There's nothing fine about that. Revenge? Paul? Oh, no, it, it must be something else. He's not that kind of man. Well, then you don't know him very well. It is true. We have not been married for long. Uh-huh. Look, why don't you just go back to Damascus and forget it? You're in for trouble here. Something's going to happen. Where is Paul, Mr. Jordan? A place called the House of Sand. Out of the city, through the gate of the Bar El Nasser. Taxi will take you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Jordan. I shall not forget the help you've given me. She walked out of the tambourine, and I hoped that that would be the last I'd see of her and the man from Damascus and Alex Zargo. How vain can your hopes be sometimes? Well, we rolled the last on-the-cuff customer out of the TAM about 1.15 in the morning. Chris threw the lock on the front door, and I doused the lights. I'll just scoot out the back way, Rock. Oh, all right, Chris. Good night. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Rocky, look out! Find the guard against quick. Vengeance, Jordan! Vengeance! Rocky. Do you hear me, Jordan? Quiet, Chris. Well, if you do and you are not dead... Then I will come for you again! You are listening to The Man from Damascus, an adventure with Rocky Jordan. Remember that 5 o'clock Sunday afternoon is the new time for Rocky Jordan, so join us each Sunday at 5. And plan to tune in 30 minutes earlier to hear Call the Police at 4.30. So you will have a full hour of excitement and action. And now we take you back to Cairo for another adventure with Rocky Jordan, the man from Damascus. After the man from Damascus threw those slugs at me, I took out after him, chasing him through the darkened streets. But it's easy to lose someone in the winding Cairo streets, and that's just what I did. I got back to the cafe tambourine about 45 minutes later, and Chris wasn't there alone. Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo police, was there, too, waiting for me. Well, Jordan, so you've returned. Oh, hiya, Sam. It brings you here this time of night. I phoned him, Rock. I told him. I thought you'd be better. Uh, all right, Chris. Uh, see you tomorrow. Sure. Uh, good night, Captain. Uh, good night. Well, Jordan, I'm waiting. 
Waiting? For what, sir? For you to tell me what this is all about. We have nothing to say. Jordan, the man who shot at you from the alley called out vengeance. This much Chris told me. Therefore, I can assume that this man is after you for some hurt he believes you have inflicted upon him. Yeah, it's close. What is it that you have done to him, Jordan? Beats me, Sam. Jordan, how can you expect me to I believe... Tell you, Sam, I don't know. Then I shall let that pass. Jordan, who is this man who shot at you? I'm afraid that's my business. I'll just handle it my own way. Jordan, oh, I... stop worrying about it. You got your hands full with Alex Zarko. Oh, fear not. We will capture Alex Zarko. Tell me, has Zarko something to do with this shooting? If you mean, did he throw those slugs at me? No. I meant exactly what I said. Does Zarko have anything to do with the shooting? Maybe. Oh, Jordan, you... You are most exasperating. Oh, just a little trick I picked up in my travels. Very well, very well. I cannot force you to speak. However, I wish to warn you that if someone else is injured, some innocent party drawn into this private conflict of yours, I shall hold you responsible. Oh, thanks, Sam. That's swell of him. No one will get hurt, will it? Except maybe that friend of mine. For your sake, I hope you are right. I would not wish to use my office, Jordan, to have you expelled from Cairo. <laughs> I started out bright and early the next morning to see if I could find the man from Damascus. Stop number one was the house of sand, room 12. I pounded on the door, no answer. I rattled the doorknob and the door came open. I went in. I could see why no one had bothered to throw the lock. The room was empty. Paul Marr, the man from Damascus, had done a quick checkout. I moved down to the front desk to see if I could get a forwarding address. Sitting in a rocking chair, rolling back and forth, was a wrinkled relic left over from the days of the pharaohs. A chortling sound was coming from her throat, and then I saw why. She was reading a U.S. comic book called The Phantom Menace. A lady... A lady, you got a customer. Oh, young man, you are observing an old lady being devoured by pleasure. Well, I'm certainly glad you're having fun, but could you give me a minute? Oh, the Phantom Menace has captured Brick Braun, thrust him in wire, and is dipping him head first into a barrel of pickle brine 100 times. Very I am being consumed with joy. Well, if you can grab to yourself for a minute, you can earn a pound note. Hey, my laughter has suddenly left me. Oh, fine. Look, I'm trying to get a forwarding address on number 12. Hey, that would be a short, fat man with a bald spot. A seller of flypaper. That would be a big man with bandages on his face. A seller of death. Death comes higher than flypaper. Could you make it two pounds? I would. Uh, alas, now that I find a fortune at my fingertips, I cannot claim it. What does that mean? I do not know where your friend has gone. And indeed, you are not the only one who is seeking him. A young lady came this morning. She said she was his wife. Uh, where'd she go? I gave her room ten. She said she would wait to see if her husband returned. And if you wish to see her, I can call no, her. No, no, no. What time did number twelve leave? Six this morning. How? By taxi. I called one. Do you know the driver? Do I know him? A kelp, a no good evil dog. Well, has he got a name? Hali Amar. Residence 303 Sharia Shaman. It is worth two pounds just to mention his name. Ah, uh, yeah. Keep it. And thanks. Oh. Go on back to your reading. <laughs> I shall, I shall once again pay the next see. And she did. I left her sitting there, wetting the pages, and looked up Holly Amar. It cost me two more pounds to open him up, and all he could say was that he left Mar off at an all-night dive called the Harem. So that was my next stop. A couple of hundred pounds of fat was pushing a wet rag over the counter in slow motion. A red-headed Englishman, deep in his cups, was throwing darts at a picture of a dame short of clothes. But what I was looking at was a guy at the end of the bar tilling a bottle of beer. It was the knife man who had first taken me to see Paul Marr. I moved his way, but he saw me and lit out for the back door. I took out after him fast, like the super chief on a downgrade. He took me through the backyard, over a fence, across an empty lot. But I put a stop to the marathon with a flying tackle, and we rolled into a mud hole. He reached for his knife, but I need him, and the fight started to go out of him. All right, where is he? Who? You know who that Damascus friend of yours, Paul Marr. How did you know his name? That doesn't matter. What I want now is his address. Do not worry, Jordan. He will come to you. Well, I can't wait. I'll give it. My, my throne, your knee, 
the address? I, I cannot tell. You'll try a face full of mud. <laughs> All right. All right, I tell. 1042 Sharia Fakar. The small hotel by the name of Little Nile. Uh, okay. I'm going to put you on ice at the tambourine. Chris will take care of you till I have a chance to talk to your boss alone. <laughs> The Little Nile was a termite trap on Sharia Fakar, and Mar was holed up second floor back. I stood in front of his door a few minutes later, listening, trying to catch any sounds from inside. I didn't hear a thing. I tried the doorknob easily. The door was locked. So I took a deep breath, kicked at it, and all the rotten wood gave way. The first thing I saw in the darkened room was the figure sitting in a chair across the room facing the door. The second thing I saw were the bandages around his face, so I knew it was Paul Mar. And the third thing I saw was the Italian-made gun in his hand, pointing toward me. What has kept you so long, Jordan? All right. Sorry, I didn't know you were waiting. I would not advance toward me any more steps, Jordan. That is wise. Well, you have come. I had assumed that if I did not kill you last night, you would come to me. It saved me parading my conspicuous appearance through the Cairo streets. So you have found me. But unfortunately, I have the gun. You're not going to kill me here, Mar. Sabaya knows you're after me. You'll never get out of the city with those bandages. You may be right, Jordan. Perhaps I will not kill you. My original proposition still holds. Bring Alex Zarko to me and our little difference shall be forgotten. I've forgotten it already. Jordan, I want Zarko. I want him more than I want you or anything else. Bring Ma. him to... Sandra's in town. Sandra. Your wife. She's in Cairo looking for you. She's at the House of Sand right now, waiting for you to come back. No. I saw her. She came to me to ask about you. You know, she thinks a lot of you. She doesn't believe you're the kind of a guy to have a vendetta on. She doesn't believe you could kill me or Zarko, regardless of what he did to your face. Stop it, Jordan. Do not unnerve me. And do not attempt to change the subject. I want Zarko even more than you. I will let you go if you help me. Here. I shall show you my good faith by throwing my gun into the corner. That was a mistake, Mar. You know I can't help you. I told you once already, and that still goes. I'm not butting into a private feud. But I am, Jordan. Sa well, you get around, don't you? I know you well enough, Jordan, to realize that you would not allow someone to shoot at you and then forget it. So when you would not tell me who had done it, I knew, too, that if I followed you long enough, you would lead me to him. You always do. Look, Sam, this is a private thing between Mar and I myself. have told you once, Jordan, violence is not a private matter. I will not allow killing if I can help it. And I will not allow you, Jordan, or Mr. Mar to interfere with the police capture of Alex Zarko. Then you haven't got him yet, eh? No, but I shall have him in time. Mr. Mar shall not. Mr. Mar, you will please remove the bandages from your face. What? I said that you will please remove your bandages. Better do it. Sam's not kidding. Very well. Very well, then I shall remove my bandages. I shall step into the light, gentlemen, so that you may see all, so that you may see what was once a face. I watched Paul Marr unwind the bandages, uncovering first what once was a chin, then the battered skin around the cheeks, the nose over the forehead. Then I noticed his stare, a peculiar, hard kind of stare. Then I saw where it came from. A left eye that couldn't blink. There. There you have it. Now you can see why I feel as I do about Alex Zarko. I am most sorry I had to subject you to this, Mr. Marr. But I still cannot allow a personal revenge to interfere with my execution of the law. It is customary in Cairo in affairs of this nature to use the following procedure. There is a train leaving Cairo for Alexandria in one hour and five minutes. You will please be on the train. Sam. And you, Jordan, shall remain in my custody until Mr. Marr has left the city. And what about Alex Zarko? He is and shall remain my problem. You have then one hour, Mr. Marr. I will meet you at the Cairo station to make certain you have boarded the train. Now you may put the bandages back on your face. Well, 
Well, Sam and I left Paul Marr at the hotel and headed for police headquarters. We didn't talk much about Paul. There wasn't anything to say. I was still trying to figure out in my mind what I could possibly have done to him in Damascus, but nothing came. And seeing him, or what was left of him, stirred no memory. At headquarters, Sam had a few things to do. So did I. I put in a call to the house of Sand and asked for Sandra Marr. Yes, this is Sandra Marr. Uh, Miss Marr, this is Rocky Jordan. Who? Oh, uh, how did you know I was here? Oh, uh, never mind that. There's something I want to tell you. How about Paul? Uh, sort of. Throw your clothes in a suitcase and go back to Damascus. Oh, I thought you had some good news for me. I thought you understood. I will go no place without Paul. Well, you're not going to find him in Cairo. The police are moving him out. The police? What have the police to do with Paul? Paul will tell you if he wants to. Now, go on. you got a better chance of seeing him again in Damascus. But, Mr. Jordan... And see if he can keep him out of trouble, huh? Good luck. Well, that was that. All that remained was to see Paul Marr climb on the train for Alexandria and hope he could straighten himself out. And hope, too, that he and his wife, Sandra, would get together. Well, a little while later, I drove to the train station with Sam, still in police custody. There weren't many people there in the hot of the afternoon, but standing near the end of the platform, next to a large sign of the flying red horse that accented his white bandages, was the man we were looking for, Paul Moore. Sam and I walked up to him, and he glared at us through the slits in his wrappings. Well, Mr. Moore, you will be leaving Cairo in a few moments. Uh, if after a year has passed you wish to return to our city, write me a letter explaining your reasons, and I shall see what can be done to make Cairo available to you once more. Mar nodded and climbed on the train, and it headed out of the city. Sam and I turned and started back to his car. That's when it hit me, and I took off in double time. Jordan, where are you going? For a train ride. I think you better come along. I chased down the platform and caught the train. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see Sam climb onto the train farther down the line. Then I started through the cars, going from one to another, looking for the man in bandages. I traveled through four cars before I finally spotted him. When he saw me, I guess he figured what I had on my mind, because he took off fast, going the other way, but I kept right after him. The train had picked up speed, lurching us from side to side. Then going around a bend, the momentum pinned him momentarily against a seat, and I was on it. His fist started working, and so did mine. We had ourselves a fine little fight there, rolling around the floor of the moving train, till Sam Sabaya caught up with us and pulled the gun. That put a quick stop to the fight. Jordan! You will please explain what the meaning of this is. Sure. Glad to, Sam. Have him take off his bandages. But, George, and I... I do Have not him understand. take off the bandages, and I think you will. Very well. You will please remove the bandages, Mr. Ma. Ah, oh, take them off, buddy, or I'll take them off for you. Yeah. That's his stuff. Now, just a little more. Let Sam see who you really are. Well, there you are, Sam. Not Paul Marr at all, but the guy you've been looking for for weeks. The guy who's been trying to escape your dragnet and get out of the city. Meet Alex Zarko. Well, the thing came apart at the seams. It was all an elaborate plan of Zarko's. The police had him trapped in the city and needed a way out. So he got his knife man to dig up Paul Marr in Damascus and bring him to town. Then he had Marr, all wrapped up in bandages, create a fuss, like his revenge against me, which was strictly a phony. Nothing too serious, just enough to get himself run out of Cairo. Then Zarko takes his place, wraps himself in the bandages, and starts to leave, almost with a police escort. It would have worked fine, except for one thing. Marr's disfigured face, and his left eye that couldn't blink. Zarko couldn't control his, and standing on the platform of the train station, he blinked his eye once. And that was once too often. Well, all that remained was Paul Marr, his face, and Sandra. And later, in Sabaya's office, we got to talking about that. Jordan, where do you suppose Paul Marr is now? In the House of Sand. I told him Sandra was there waiting for him. Mm. You realize, of course, that I must send some men to apprehend him. Yeah. Uh, why do you suppose he allowed himself to aid Alex Zarko? Well, put yourself in his place. A face like his and a lot of desperation. He was working a business deal, getting money any way he could, figuring he'd use the dough in a plastic surgery job. It'd make him look like a, a human being again. Yes, quite so. You understand Ma will have a jail sentence to serve for aiding a criminal. Mm -hmm. And it may be possible for me to confiscate the money Zarko gave him. Sure, if you worked on it, you could possibly take the dough from him. That is, if you'd 
don't forget that he's gone. Are you suggesting, Georgian, that I deliberately allow myself to forget that a financial arrangement uh, existed between Mao and Zarko? That's right, Sam. Georgian, I have always suspected you are an unscrupulous man. <laughs> sure I am. Remember the time I tried to sell that Monte Carlo swindler a half interest in the tombs of Memlux? <laughs> Remember? No, no, I, I guess I've forgotten. Yeah. Perhaps I am getting old. My memory is not what it used to be. Thanks, Sam. See you soon. <laughs> It's CBS again at the same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Rocky Jordan, starring Jack Moyles in the title role, is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Tonight's story by Adrian Jando and Larry Roman. Life with Luigi will be heard tonight at 8 over most of these stations. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Yes, it's another case for that most famous of all manhunters, the detective whose ability at solving crime is unequaled in the case of detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. Tonight's curious adventure... The Corpse in the Cab. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Murder in the Park. Taxi? Taxi? Uh, Mr. Ramsey, you are very kind indeed to take such an interest in this uh, problem. My dear fellow, I consider it my civic duty. Uh, taxi! Ah, here's a cab now. Yes. Okay, gents, make it snappy. We're blocking traffic. All right. You get in first. My party, you know, my party. Thank you. Where to, gents? I guess the quickest way to get there is through the park. Yes, drive through the park. I'll tell you where to turn. Okay. I believe it is on West 54th Street. And there's a flag out there. Uh, excuse me, uh, uh, driver. Yeah? Uh, do you mind if I shut this glass partition between us? Go right ahead, boss. You're paying the fare. Here, yeah, let me do it for you. Ah, well, that's better. Nice winter evening. Stars twinkling. Ought to pick us up for the grim business ahead. Ah, lucky thing I ran into you. Lucky thing. <laughs> yes, indeed, Mr. Ramsey. It seems fate destined me to make your acquaintance this afternoon. Yes, lucky thing. Mr. <laughs> Ramsey... Just my little way of keeping air out of the windpipe. Uh. Oh. There you are, my dear fellow. <sighs> Mighty lucky thing I ran into you tonight. You gotta help me, Nick. You gotta. They'll slap me in stir. Now, take it easy, Shorty. Take it easy. Now, tell me again exactly what happened. Like I said, two guys hail my cab. One of them says to drive through the park. He'll tell me where to turn out. And when you get out of the park? The one guy opens the petition again and says to pull up. He's getting out. He tells me to drive the other guy to the precinct police station. And, Nick, if I hadn't looked around when I came to the intersection and seen what I seen... I'd have driven right up to the bullhouse with a dead body in my cab. Me, Shorty Bentano. 
You don't remember what the man looked like, Shorty. In the dark? I ain't got cat's eyes, Nick. <laughs> Gee, what's that? You are jumpy. And just Patsy buzzing me in the talkback. Oh. Nick, in the inimitable words of Mr. Winchell, my stomach and my backbone are now a twosome. When do we eat? You'll have to order yourself a sandwich, Patsy. We've got work to do. Work? Tonight? Mm-hmm. And Patsy, get me a police headquarters. Lieutenant Riley. Okay, Nick. You're going to turn me in, Nick? I thought you'd help me. I am going to help you, Shorty. But the sooner the police know about the murdered man outside in your cab, the better it is for you. You're crazy, Nick. I done time. I ain't got a chance. If the cops find that stiff in my buggy, it's curtains for me. I'm getting out of here. Shorty, sit down there. Nick, they'll give me the hot seat for something I never done. No, they won't, Shorty. Not while my name's Nick Carter. <laughs> Nobody gets through here. I'll beat Halnick. Not one bit of identification on this body. No bullet trace, no knife, no nothing. Well, what did you want the murderer to do, Riley? Leave his calling card? Uh, I'm always getting stuck with one of these dud cases. It takes months to solve them. We don't even know who this tiff is. Now, Riley, flash your light inside here again. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. You see something? I'm just looking. You see, these pockets are turned inside out. Uh, the motive was robbery, all right. No, Riley, I don't think so. Huh? Doesn't look prosperous enough to rob. Ah, uh, Nick, you're always looking for what's not there. That might mean something, too. Huh? Now, Riley, evidently the murderer didn't care to have his victim's identity uncovered too soon. Say, what are you looking at his hands for, Nick? Riley, have your laboratory analyze this white powder under the nail of his right index finger. Well, say, that there is something under his fingernail. Yes. I have an idea. You'll find it's chalk. Chalk? But sure, you're a smart one, Nick. Yeah, with these lily white hands, it... hey, this guy was a pool player, a professional, maybe, huh? Maybe. But don't bank on it. Now, Riley, about Shorty. I'm holding him, Nick. Never fear about that. Now, look, Riley, he's a favor to me. Don't pull him in yet. Oh, great jumping banshees, Nick. I've got to. Listen, Riley, he had nothing to do with his murder. If he were a party to it, he'd have dumped the body out somewhere, wouldn't he? Well... well certainly he would. Shorty's been on the right side of the fence ever since he got out of the big house. And he's given me a hand on cases from time to time. Yeah, I know. You owe him a favor, and I owe you a barrel of them. Well, that's about it. Well, okay. I'll shut my eyes for 24 hours. No longer, though, mind you. Thanks, Riley. Uh, Nick, well, where are you going? To find a murderer. <laughs> Boy, this is some buggy you got here, Nick. Four speeds ahead, a siren, two searchlights. Anytime you need a chauffeur regular, I'll hire on. Like driving my car. Huh? It's like handling a baby carriage. Uh oh, we're turning into 54th Street now, Nick. All right, Shorty. Slow down a little. Now, what was it you heard your passenger say? One says the quickest way to get there is through the park. I'll tell you where to turn off. And then the other guy says it's on West 54th Street and there's a flag up. And then the other guy shuts the partition and I don't hear no more. Well, 54th Street doesn't run very far here on this side. I don't see nothing on this block. Flags, flags. Usually in public buildings, aren't they? You think maybe this is going to be a clue, Nick? Shorty, everything's a clue when you don't have much to go on. Nick, look. Flagpole. Yeah, very handsome flagpole. Yeah, but it's a police station. A police station? Good. What's good about it? Let's get out of here. You're safe until tomorrow night, Riley. Riley keeps his word. You want I should uh, keep going slow? Nope. I got the first link in our chain. You can put the speed on again. Where to now? To pick up Patsy. I sent her to the Bureau of Missing Persons on 30th Street. Ah, oh, Nick. Another cop house. I don't like them places. George Day, 2345 Elmhurst Drive, occupation truck driver. When last seen, was wearing gray coveralls. No, he's not the one. Gee, Nick, the guy ain't been missing long enough for anybody to get excited about it. 
He's only been dead a few hours. I'm playing a hunch, Shorty. Oh. You want me to read the rest of the names on the list, Nick? Wait a minute, Patsy. Hmm? Do you have a school teacher on the list? Yes. How did you know? Never mind. What did it look like? Well, uh, let me see. Um, here. Ivan Johnson, number two, St. Anne's Drive. Occupation, professor of ancient history. Good. When last seen, was wearing dark blue overcoat, gray hat, white shirt, blue tie, and always wears... Wears pince-nez glasses. Yes. So did our corpse. The glasses were missing at the time, but the bridge of his nose bore prints of them. Boy, I'm glad I'm going straight. Even the dead wake up and talk when Nick Carter gets on the case. Nick, how in the world did you know it would be a school teacher? Well, I didn't for sure. But nose glasses, plus chalk under the nail of the index finger, plus a sensitive face and the general appearance added up to teacher for me when I looked at the corpse. Next, I figured if he were a school teacher, he'd be expected home by five o'clock. His wife or family would be unduly worried if he hadn't showed up by eight or so and would call the missing persons bureau. But who'd want to murder a poor school teacher? One step at a time, Lizzie. And we know this much already. Our Mr. Johnson intended going to the 54th Street police station when he and his murderer hailed Shorty's cab. Oh, I see, Nick. Then you think that Professor Johnson was killed because of something he intended to tell the authorities. Mm -hmm. Simple the way he tells it, ain't it? One, two, three. Yes, you're very clever, Mr. Carter. But don't you think maybe his wife could tell us what it was he was going to tell the cops? Perhaps he told her first. Yes, Patsy, that's just what I do think. Uh, what was his address? Mm, just a minute. Oh, yes, here it is. Number two, St. Anne's Drive. Right. Okay, Shorty. Take us to number two, St. Anne's Drive. And hurry. Mrs. Johnson, I'm Nick Carter. And this is my assistant, Patsy Bowen. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Johnson? Did the police send you, Mr. Carter? Did they find him? Did they find my husband? I'm only here to ask you a few questions concerning your husband. Oh, then they haven't found him. I, uh, I really can't say. Now, tell me, did your husband mention whom he was going to see after school hours today? Ivan always comes right home after his classes. I thought that he might have had some special appointment today. Oh, no, no. Mr. Johnson, how was your husband feeling when he left for school this morning? Oh, he, he was in such a mood this morning... Talked about right and justice until my, my head fairly whirled. You know, he doesn't like to see people cheated, Mr. Carter. Ivan's a very honest person. What do you mean, cheated, Mrs. Johnson? He said he wasn't going to stand by and see the students in his school tricked out of their dimes and quarters. He was going to see right and justice done. The kids are being cheated. Uh, uh, what school is this? The Central High School. Ivan is the ancient history professor. He's taught there for 12 years. And where's his office there? Why, he's at the same office all that time. Number 12 on the first floor. I've always been happy about that. It's such a sunny little room. Well, Mrs. Johnson, you've been very helpful. Do you think they'll find him tonight? Do you think something terrible has happened? Why, the police will keep you informed. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Johnson. Try to get some sleep. Oh. Thank you, but I, I, I couldn't. Not till Ivan's home. Safe. But Nick, I thought you were going to the school where Professor Johnson taught. That's not over here in the West Side Business District. Glad to see you on your toes, Patsy, and working in all four cylinders. Nose to the grindstone, shoulder to the wheel, and all that. I'm proud of you. All right, all right. But what are we doing over here? In just a moment, you'll see for yourself. This is the place, Nick. Right, Shorty. All right, come on, Patsy. Want me to go with you, Nick? No, you stay here and keep your eyes open. Okay, and good luck. Come on, Patsy. We still got a lot to do if we want to keep Shorty out of Lieutenant Riley's foul clutches. I'm glad they didn't lock the front door in this office building tonight. Hey, that's funny. There's no night watchman here. There usually is. Well, Patsy, never look a gift horse in the teeth. No watchman, no trouble. Hey, it's spooky in here. There's one little light in this whole foyer. Wish we'd brought Shorty in with us. He'll do us more good, keeping watch outside. You really think this is where Ivan Johnson was this afternoon? Well, we know Shorty picked him up in front of this building. And this is the only office building in this block. All the rest are warehouses. It's pretty deserted, if you ask me. Mm-hmm. 
And the elevators, of course, have stopped for the night. And this is a ten-story building. Well, Nick, maybe if we look at the directory board, we'll be able to figure out what office Professor Johnson might have visited. Well, that's what I'm hoping. Now, let's see. Ah, hmm. uh, doesn't seem to be a name on this directory that helps us out at all. There isn't, is there? Oh, Nick, what'll we do? Doesn't take much brain work to figure that one. Maybe we can tell if we have a look at the doors of the offices in this building. So, we'll just have to go from office to office. Now, come on, let's start climbing. <laughs> Well, there's nobody on this floor. All doctors and dentist offices. Don't think Johnson's business was with any of them today. Come on, up we go. See anything on this floor, Nick? No, nobody or nothing to interest a school teacher. <laughs> Nick, I don't think I can make another floor. You've got to, Patsy. We must cover every floor. Well, this is the top. Yeah, and we don't know any more than we did before. Nick, this place is as empty as a number two ration book. We might as well... Shh. What is it? I thought I heard something. Nick... There's someone in that office. Yeah. And yet the lights are out. The name on the door says Gerald Ramsey, promotion counselor. Let's pay him a visit. Stay behind me now. To the left of my flash. All right. <laughs> and who is flashing that pretty light in my office at this time of night? Mr. Ramsey. That's my name. And yours? Nick Carter. Surely you don't mean that you're Nick Carter, the great detective. That's who he is, Mr. Ramsey. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Ramsey, but my assistant and I were just having a look around this building. Oh, well, too bad the fuse is blown out of my office here. Or you could have a good look. <laughs> who are you after? You don't happen to know of any business in this building that might have dealings with a schoolteacher, do you? A schoolteacher? Mm-hmm. Let me see. A schoolteacher? Why, no, uh, no, if there is, I never heard of it. But then there's such a lot I never heard of. Uh-oh. Oh, you... You knocked over that whole stack of packages. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Ramsey. I, I dropped my handkerchief and I was leaning over to pick it up. Uh, anything breakable in them? Oh, no, 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 it's quite all right. Uh, oh, thank goodness for that. Yes, uh, just some things a friend of mine left here until he came back. Just leave them there, I'll take care of them. No, at least let me pick them up. No, 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 uh, never mind, <laughs> Just leave them there. They, uh, they won't mind staying where they are for a while, I'm sure. Well, all right, if you say so. Yes, I do. So you can just run along and continue your search for whatever it was you were looking for. Good evening. Good evening. Now, well, Patsy, if you're okay, we better be on our way. Sorry we disturbed your, uh, reverie, Mr. Ramsey. Reverie? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> really? He was an odd specimen. You think he knows anything, Nick? Well, if he does, he isn't talking. Come on. Oh, gosh, Nick, all that climbing up and downstairs just for nothing. I'm worn out. Maybe it wasn't all for nothing, Patsy. You mean you found a clue somewhere here? I don't mean anything, yet. Oh, but Nick... I hope you could still walk well enough to get down the ten flights of stairs ahead of us, Patsy. I don't feel quite like carrying you just now. I guess I can make it under my own power. Where to now? Central High School. Times are wasting, and we still haven't uncovered a clue to the murder of the man in Shorty's cab. Gosh, Nick, what do you expect to find in a schoolhouse at this time of night? Clues to Johnson's murder, I hope. It's no use, Nick. The janitor's not here. I'll have one more try. That racket should wake up the ghost of Hamlet. Hmm. No answer. So? So Nick Carter's trusty pick lock will do the trick. Mm-hmm. Hmm. 
Oh, it's black as pitch in there. Stay right beside me. Mm, seems to me I heard that one before tonight. And look, Nick. Hmm? I barked my shins in the dark in that, that character's office. And so if you don't mind, this time I'd like to see where I'm going. Okay, Betsy. I'll use my flash and keep it down low. Shin height. No, well, that's better. Now, come on. Better hurry or our friend Shorty's going to be sitting in the clink with a murder rap pinned on him. Okay. And she said his office was on the first floor, didn't she? Mm, yes, number 12. All bright and sunny. Here we are, Nick, number 12. I wish it were bright and sunny in here now. This time we'll just dispense with the formalities of announcing ourselves. Well, the door's open, Nick. Yes, so it is. Come on. Snap on the light, Betsy. Switch is right behind you. Okay. Hey. Well, looks like somebody else has given Mr. Johnson's room a going over. I'm afraid we got here too late. Papers all over the floor, window wide open. What do you suppose they were looking for? Same thing we are, Patsy. Clues. Except for a different reason. You think it was the murderer? Could be. Well. What are you reading, Nick? There's a poster on the wall here. Oh. A dollar buys a destroyer, high school students. Subscribe just one dollar to the high school victory league and help buy a destroyer. That's the second time tonight I've seen something like that. A dot. Do- do- <laughs> Oh, where's my hanky? Need any help? No, I've got one right here in my pocket. There. Hey, wait a minute. Mm. Why'd you get this? What? The sticker that came out of your pocket with a handkerchief. Well, I don't know, Nick. Why? Why? It's got the same legend stamped on it that that poster has. Victory League. Well, so it has. Did you buy this sticker? No, I buy my destroyers by buying war bonds. Well, think, Patsy. Why did you get it? It was in your pocket with your handkerchief. Well, I don't know, Nick. I, I never put anything in this little pocket except my handkerchief. I can swear this stick away. Wait, but... See anybody? No. No. Nobody here now. Are you okay, Patsy? Well, I guess so. What happened? I just happened to look up in time to see a man poking a gun through the open window. So that's why you pushed me out of the way so fast. Yes, there was no time to be polite. Oh, thanks, Nick. Did you recognize the man at the window? No. Too bad. But he got away. Gee, Nick, you certainly shot that light out fast. Well, if he can't see us, he can't shoot us. A very logical deduction, Mr. Carter. Hey, Patsy. Hmm? Give me that sticker you picked up tonight. Do you think it means something to this case? You bet I do. I've just remembered where I've seen one like it. Oh, where, Nick? Never mind now. Well, Patsy, this case is beginning to add up. I'm not mistaken, the sticker splits it wide open. Come on. I've got a job for you to do on your own, and right now. That means you've got a job that you're going to do on your own. Right. Now, this is the plan. And if it works, we'll nail our murderer red-handed. Boss, you in here? My dear fellow, you know I'm in here. Did you get the fuse fixed? Yeah, and while I was fixing it, I got something else, too. Come on in, you. Hey, snap on the light and see what I picked up snooping around down the basement of this building. See? Nick Carter. Well, well, well. Mr. Carter, back again. Still looking for the same thing? No, I found what I was looking for. Oh, good. Good. It's very fine. I already lifted his rod, boss. What'll I do with him now? You've had your chance, my dear fellow. Now it's mine. You know, I have a general impression you men don't like me very well. Oh, sure, Mr. Carter. We love you. But we'll love you a lot better when you don't talk no more. Put very bluntly, Mr. Carter, but that is the idea. Now, Mr. Ramsey, just what do you think I could say that would harm you? Now, don't let him fool you, boss. When I was hiding in the bushes outside the window back there at the schoolhouse, I heard him tell the dame the case was wide open. Shut up, Lefty. Oh, so it was you who took those shots at us through the window. Yeah, and you ain't going to do nothing about it. You was pretty smart, though, figuring out it was Mr. Ramsey what rubbed out the school teacher. You are a complete idiot. Stop that fool tongue of yours. Ah, what's a dip, boss? He ain't going to live to tell it. Mm. True. That's true. Yeah, since you know so much already, we have only one recourse, Mr. Carter. Give me the gun, Lefty. Yeah, he are, boss. This one's on me. Just a minute, Ramsey. As long as I'm not going to live to tell it, maybe you'll confirm a deduction I made. Certainly, my dear fellow. 
A condemned man is always granted one last request. Speak up. This high school victory league's a phony, isn't it? You're playing on the patriotism of school kids to get them to donate their money to build destroyers and planes. But the money never gets any further than your own pocket. Isn't that it? Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. Since you put it bluntly that way, I am forced to admit that you're entirely correct. But may I ask what it was that led you to believe that I was behind the league? Yes. When I was at Professor Johnson's office, I saw a poster on the wall advertising your dirty league. Oh, please, Mr. Carter. I mean just that. Swindling high school students out of their few dollars in the name of a patriotism that you never knew the meaning of is about the lowest form of stealing that I know of. Boy, just let me take a poke at <laughs> him, will you? No, no, no. We can afford to be good-natured. Mr. Carter hasn't much time left, you know. Do go on, Mr. Carter. As I said, I saw the poster on the wall advertising your dirty racket. And then Patsy found one of your stickers in her handkerchief where she'd picked it up off your floor. I recall then seeing that each of the packages she knocked over in here had a sample sticker pasted on it. It was easy enough then to put two and two together and get the required four. It's too bad that your undoubted excellence in mathematics can't save you. And all because one little school teacher suspected his kids were being cheated. Poor Professor Johnson. It is too bad for him that I found him wandering around this building, looking for the offices of the high school victory league. He told me he suspected it was a phony outfit, and he was going to see right and justice done. <laughs> I offered to take him right to the police station, and I did, <laughs> although I wasn't with him when he got there. <laughs> Very funny. Yes. Hurry up, boss. We got way to do. Yes. Well, Mr. Carter, this is it. <laughs> Blast and banshees, Nick. Don't do this to me again. I tell you, my nerves won't stand it. Oh, what's the matter, Riley? You got your men. They're lying on the ground here, howling like stuck pigs. Yeah, sure, but, but what if I hadn't hit him when he aimed at you, Nick? What if I'd missed? Oh, Nick, your plan worked beautifully. The whole thing. Getting yourself found by Ramsey's henchman and my getting Riley up here to hear the confession and everything. Yeah, Patsy, but, but she, uh, don't run such a split-second chance of life and death again, Nick. My heart won't stand it. Well, that was worth it. Just to see Ramsey walk into the trap like a bear looking for honey. Hey, Nick. Oh, Shorty, come on in. Take a look at our handiwork. Gee, so that's the bum who tried to frame me to the hot seat. He'll be getting it himself before long, thanks to Nick Carter. Early, I want to tell you something. Of all the criminals I've tracked down, catching Ramsey gave me the most pleasure. A fellow like that trading on the patriotism of school kids is about the lowest rat in the world. Why, bad as the Nazis are, a guy like this is worse. You're right, Nick. You said it, Nick. Well, Riley, you've got all the evidence you need. Mm -hmm. The package of posters in the next room, the package of stickers here, and the confession. Right, Nick. We can take over from here. Thanks. Okay, Riley. So long. So long, Nick. So long, Patsy. So long, Lieutenant. Well, Patsy, come on. Chin up. Carry on and all that sort of thing. It's not my chin that's worrying me, Nick. It's having to walk down those ten flights of stairs again. That'll be the fourth trip tonight. Why, Patsy. And at your age, too. Look, Nick, can't we just sit here on the top step for the next six hours? You think you'd be rested enough then to walk down the ten flights? I think that by then the elevators will be running again. And what a wonderful invention the elevator is. This has been another of the strange adventures of Nick Carter, Master Detective, which are brought to you regularly each week at this same time by WOR Mutual. Now, tell us a little about next week's story, Nick. Well, next week's story includes rather more adventure than actual detecting. But if Nick hadn't been able to make the first few deductions that really started him off on the right track, there would have been no adventure. And there was adventure and plenty of it. I came nearer to meeting my match when I met Dr. Donaldson than at any other time in my career. This Dr. Donaldson was a specialist in secret and dangerous poisons, and he tried one of them out on Nick. But in the end, I managed to get the better of him and solve a mystery that had the police completely stopped. We call it the empty coffin because it was an empty coffin that gave us the first clue. And it was two different doctors making out two separate death certificates for the same death that led to that first clue. Well, that's enough for now. Join us next week for the story of the empty coffin. So long. So long, folks. And so long to you, Nick and Patsy. Until next week. In the strange adventure you have just heard, Nick Carter was impersonated by Lon Clark, Patsy by Helen Choate. The story was written for Nick Carter by Barth Conry. Original music was played by Lou White. The entire production was under the direction of Jock McGregor. <laughs>
Next week at this same time, listen to another curious experience of Nick Carter entitled... The Empty Coffin. Or Nick Carter and the Mystery of the Doctor's Poison. This story is a copyrighted feature of Street and Smith Publications, Incorporated. The return of Nick Carter is produced in the studios of WOR and is broadcast over most of these stations every Saturday evening at 7 o'clock Eastern Wartime. And don't forget that the adventures of Nick's adopted son, Chick Carter, are broadcast over most of these stations Mondays through Fridays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. This is Mutual. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, the thrilling drama of murder and mystery and the people who walk the great white way with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. The delicious, long-lasting, real mint flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The good, smooth chewing helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So, indoors, outdoors, at work or play, enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Wrigley's Spearmint. Refreshing, delicious. When it's July and the heat puffs up from the river, Broadway's a place of regret. The winter dreams made for the summer are blurred. The golden girls fan themselves with newspapers. It's the time of the salt tablet, the fly paper, and the sullen sleep on the fire escape. The mornings are filled with a thousand hours and the bleary talk and dead cigarettes in the bottom of paper cups. It's summer, the poet's time, the lover's time. And if you can afford an ocean voyage, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Which is equally true for a policeman if he's retired, if he's come into a fat inheritance from Uncle Ned, ex-wonder boy of the oil fields. Not me, nor Detective Mugovan. We were still working to pay off the bills. Current job, stakeout in front of an apartment house in the West 80s. Stakeout for an armed robber who had shot a bystander to death, ran across roofs, down alleys, finally trapped. Let's hold up on the second floor, Danny. Empty apartment. Ready? Let's go. All the other tenants cleared out? Uh-huh. Had a little trouble with the people in 2B. How come? People named Morgan. Their grandmother died. A funeral. We got all the mourners out. The apartment right next to the one our killer's in, 2A. You sure he's in there? Probably him, Danny. Description fits. Let's find out. Open up. Open up. This is the police. Mugovan? Yeah. Hey, those windows over there, Danny, open. The screen's been kicked out. Come on. The killer left this apartment in a hurry. Uh huh. Hey, these windows lead to a fire escape. He could have gone out this window onto the fire escape into the next apartment, Danny. Let's find out. <laughs> yeah. Must have done it this way. The screens on this apartment have been knocked out, too. Let's go see them. Huh? Hey, this is the Morgan apartment, Danny, where the Morgan grandmother. Want me to look around? For appearances, Mugovan. I'm guessing our man walked out with the mourners and got lost. Must have made him happy.
Hey, greetings, Danny. Well, looks like we made the boo-boo. It amuses you, Sergeant? Well, Danny, it is only that I am trying to tickle your funny bone with what otherwise could blossom into a severe headache. You got out the all points on the killer? Goes without saying. The bulletin is out, but the puzzle lingers on. Oh, that Mugovan and I were on him and he got away from us? No puzzle, Gino. We lost it, that's all. Ah, be friendly with yourself, Danny. Such things happen. The puzzle to me is that a burglar in his chosen line of duty should so overstep himself as to enter the ranks of the killers. <laughs> Overambitious type, huh? Try to beat his way into Mrs. Conlon's apartment on West 76 with a gun. It bothered a neighbor. The neighbor tried to stop him, tried to beat him off. The neighbor got killed. You got any other troubles, Gino? Oh, nobody's got troubles compared to the way Mrs. Conlon's got troubles. A man with a gun tried to get to her. He didn't make it. If I were Mrs. Conlon, it... What'd you say? About Mrs. Conlon? Oh, when your call came in, Danny, the name Conlon registered on my gray matter. So I nudged it up a notch by referring to a file and flash. It came to me that like a year ago, a Mr. Hugh Conlon was found shot dead at the side of an unidentified woman, also shot dead. Verdict? Murder with suicide. This Conlon was the husband of the said... Hey, yo, yo! To see Danny Clover, permission must be obtained and granted. Don't try to stop me. Don't anyone. Who are you? Now, don't try to bypass me, sir. You have spoiled the plans of Lucian Cobb, funeral director. After we'd rehearsed and rehearsed. This is a new type show business, Danny? Sit down, Mr. Cobb. Tell me what I've done to you. I'll not sit, sir. While bearding a criminal, you this morning did destroy the careful staging of a month. We rehearsed the old woman, Grandmother Morgan. How the little old lady would lie in her coffin, her pose, her attitude. And when death took her, we were ready for it. And now... You're saying our trying to take a killer ruined your carefully planned funeral. How? Twenty minutes ago, the granddaughter of the deceased phoned me, told me tearfully she'd opened a clothes hamper, and there was her grandmother folded in with last week's wash. I'm sorry, Mr. Cobb. Death has a dignity, Mr. Clover. You... I'm aware of it, Mr. Cobb. Gino? Yeah, Danny? That's how the killer got away. Climbed into the coffin himself. Get on the phone. Find out what happened to that funeral. Tartaglia did very well. He lifted a receiver and dialed and asked a question. He got an answer and replaced the receiver. Hey, Danny, the hearse took off for parts unknown. Deserted the rest of the funeral. I make some more calls to traffic and to highway patrol and wait. And finally a call comes back, one hearse located on a side road off Queens Highway. Driver recovering from pistol whipping, but still bewildered by the strangeness of it all. Go there and talk to him. Look, mister. The first thing I want you to understand is I'm not lying to Just you. Just tell me what happened. We were cruising along through the streets, uptown toward the cemetery. It happened at 180th Street. What did? There's a glass panel between my driver's seat and the, you know, the coffin, the flowers. That's where the tapping came from. Tapping? Yeah, with the butt end of a gun. The coffin was open and this guy was kneeling there with the gun. Then he busted through the glass, pointed the gun at my ear. Says, take a right here. I took a right. Wouldn't you? Go ahead. I took a right. I took off from the rest of the funeral. A long nose, a head full of red hair, and a big gun. When we got to where we are now, he tells me to stop this hearse, to get out. I get out. He slugs me. Is that all? Is that all? You think this happens every day? And phone it in and check out for the night. And go home. Find the heat piled high in your room waiting for you. And take the blanket and the pillow to the roof and step carefully past the sleepless child, his eyes wide with reflection of nighttime, and hear the whispered, tired scolding of the man at his side and the rustle of the woman's cotton robe as she pulls it tight to her throat. And find an empty place and consider there the pattern a killer has scarred across the summer's day. Consider it. Then make your way back downstairs to the hall phone. Ask Mrs. Conlon to meet you at your office in the morning and go back for the sleep you left on a brownstone's roof. In the morning, she was already waiting for me, and with her, a young woman who took a cigarette from a plastic case and waited for me to light it for her. 
Thank you. You're sweet. Uh, my daughter, Mr. Clover. Uh, Myra. Hi and hello. Uh, well, Myra insisted on coming with me. She said she didn't want me to be alone with you. Don't lie, Catherine. Myra. The reason I came, Mr. Clover, it was a chance to meet a new man. I told Catherine that. The poor thing's trying to cover up. <laughs> she doesn't mean that, Mr. Clover. Myra's a child. All the excitement, that man trying to break in, your call last night, a, a child's mind. It, it can be too much for... You through, Catherine? Because if you aren't, Mr. Clover will never have the chance to tell us why we're here. The man who tried to break in, Mrs. Conlon, had you ever seen him before? Uh, why, no, I never... Uh... I told you that yesterday. Why do you ask again? Maybe the attractive man doesn't believe you, Catherine. Myra, what are you trying to do to me? You come in here, make a show of yourself before this man, talk fresh... Mrs. Conan, had you ever seen the man before? No, I told you no. Yesterday was the first time he beat at my door. When I wouldn't let him in, he threatened me with a gun. And then that nice neighbor from across the hall... He's helped Myra and me so many times, and now... Mrs. He's... Conan, try to understand why I'm going to remind you of... Of what? Remind me of what? Of your husband's death, of What's how... he got to do with it? What's my husband dying a year ago with that nameless woman got to do with it? Patience, Catherine. Let the man tell you. It's only that the killer we're after might have had something to do with this other thing that happened to you. It's the only way I can figure it. Why should he beat on your door openly with a gun? Why should... He's a thief. He wanted to rob me. A thief who stands in a hall and knocks and asks permission to... What are you trying to do to me? Hasn't it been enough? Haven't I had enough? Oh, Myra, tell him... Pardon. Danny Clover speaking. There's a man sleeping in my boarding house. Answers the killer's description you got in the papers. You want him? I give him to you. Where? Boarding house. 1756 West 61. You come from right away, huh? So I can put my room to let sign. Back in the window. Quick, turn over. You can go home, Mrs. Conlon. I'll ask the killer my questions. I'm telling you, mister, when I give this man a room, I thought there was something funny. Why didn't you call the police then? Just because she was breathing hard, like he'd been running? Well, that ain't no reason. The reason was this morning. Oh, when you saw his description in the paper. Yeah, yeah. The bright red hair, you know, and the nose. He registered last night, and he hasn't gone out since. Is that right? He had a caller late last night, late. Who? Oh, I don't know who. I don't peep. He made a phone call from the hall phone, went back to his room, and later I heard someone go into his room. How long did the caller stay? I went to sleep. I don't know. Where's his room? Uh, uh, down on the right. I'll take you. Here it is, this one. Give me the key and step back. Hey, he's that dangerous? You got to use a gun? Don't worry about it. Ooh. All right, you. Wake up. On your feet. On... Deep sleep already. He really sleeps, huh? <gasps> What's the matter with him? What's the matter? He should have peeped at his collar. You would have seen what a murderer looks like. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth feels dry, when you're warm or tired, Wrigley's Spearmint is really refreshing. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you feel your best and do your best. So for chewing enjoyment plus pleasant refreshment, chew delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. We now continue with Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. The July twilight bleeds the color out of Broadway's neon, and the street is a summer's sigh done in pastel. The delicate cottons cling to the visitors' shoulders, and their husbands shoo them away from Broadway's kindly folk. And Broadway's forced to other summer delights. The boat ride to Coney. Try that, kid. The quick shipboard romance. 
And at the end of it, the guided tour through the Hall of Mirrors. Or the rendezvous at the coffee pump in the automat. Or just stand on the corner and sniff the cool air from the Catskill sent in the open envelope from the wife and kids. And compare its message with the one in the headlines. Fugitive killer found murdered in boarding house. And decide, it's better here, kid. Happiness is where the heart is. It's better here. And at headquarters, feel the twilight slip from your fingers as the door opens. And the night time is brought to you in the capable hands of capable Sergeant Gino Tartaglia. I come to sound the hour, Danny. At the sound of the bong, it will be late. And even now, the aroma of the cacciatore that awaits at Tartaglia's house is being wafted from uptown down Center Street to tickle the nostrils. Bong. Give me what you got, Gino, and then you can go home. Thank you, Danny. You are indeed a kindly, generous employer. Did the ballistics check the gun that killed Joe Gruber? No, it is the same with which this Joe Gruber murdered an innocent neighbor in the to-do in front of Mrs. Conlon's apartment, which proves to all concerned that this Joe Gruber was indeed the murderer of the innocent neighbor. Uh, anything else? What is else is that Detective Mugovan has compiled for you the criminal record of the aforesaid Joe Gruber, which I will brief. It seems that in his this past, Joe stopped. Gruber Danny, was... I got the record on Gruber. Detective Mogovan, I'm surprised at you. What's the matter with you, Gino? Well, I was about to parlay the information you have gathered. Efficiently, I grant. But I was about to parlay this info into the ear of Lieutenant Clover with my own mouth. When you were so rude... Oh, you did good anyway, Gino. You can go home now. Mrs. Tartaglia will be waiting for you. She'll... She at least appreciates the endeavor I make to... <clears throat> good night, Lieutenant Clover. Detective Mogovan. Good night to all. Good night, Gino. Tell Mrs. Tartaglia you were fine today. Tell her I... What's eating him? Call him up in a little while. Tell him you're sorry. Well, what for? What'd I do to him? Well, just do it, Mugovan. Okay. What have you got on Gruber? Oh, Technical's got the knife that killed him. Trying to trace the make, manufacturer, distributor, retail outlets, etc. You, uh, you said you had a record on him. Yeah, 20 years long. Gave it to us when an officer booked him up for disturbing the Pell-Mell Rotisserie and Bar in 3rd. Got in a beef with some woman, mauled her. She yelled police. Happened five days ago. Well, who was the woman? No, we don't know. She didn't show up to make complaints, so we released Gruber. You want the rest to run down on him? If it means anything. Well, that's up to you. Uh, Gruber began 20 years ago in San Francisco. Car heist, filling station holdups. They finally got him good on a negligent manslaughter charge. Fifteen years in San Quentin. Released six weeks ago. Next heard of it, the Pell-Mell Bar. Then released to murder Mrs. Conlon's neighbor. Then dead on arrival. That all of it? Yeah. Anything, Danny? Not much, huh? It wasn't much, but it was all I had. Joe Gruber had been mixed up in a disturbance at the Pell-Mell Rotisserie and Bar, which was on 3rd Avenue, which took up 40 front feet of sidewalk, and whoever was thirsty enough to dare what was inside. The inside was all bar and three fellas deep. The rotisserie part of it being a cheap hot plate burner that melted things upon occasion. It took a few minutes to get close, but I finally made it. Now, yeah, what's yours? Talk. I'm from the police. Here, badge. Was well, something wrong? No, I'll just talk. Oh, sure. Hey, Ed, come here, take over. Well, you got to talk to a guy. Yeah, scooch down to the end of the bar, mister, so we won't get our talk mixed up with people. Ah, better, huh? Hey, uh, can I give you something from the shelf, some Johnny Walker? About a week ago, there was a little trouble in here. At least I keep the trouble inside, off the sidewalk. Uh, take a look at this picture. Yeah. You ever see this man before? Well, who is he? Name's Joe Gruber. His eyes are closed because you took a while he was on the slab, huh? That's right. Yeah, I seen him. Like you said about a week ago, trouble with a dame. What dame? I don't know. I didn't see much what happened. I got told. Had you ever seen Joe before? The uh, first time. He was in here, picked up one of my customers. You know, throw the arm around the shoulder, I'll buy you a drink pickup. Friendly, buy drinks. I ask him to pay. He says, sure, sure, my sister will be in a minute and pay. He looks serious, so I fed him drinks. Later, I was back in the storeroom, I hear yelling. I get back in time to see a cop off the beat, hauls this guy away. Leaves Mal standing there. Drinks unpaid. Mal? Mal who? The arm around the shoulder pickup. Mal! Hey, Mal! Mal, come here! Yeah? Well, what do you want? Yeah, my friend here's a cop. A very nice You're cop. Out of my way. Hey, come back here. Let me through. Let me through. Let go of me. Let go. If I'm going to have to take it down on the floor to talk to you, that's where you're going. 
How'd you get here so fast? It ain't been five minutes I opened up that pay phone. But it was only because the operator got snippy. A man's got a right. Let's go. Look, I'm booked, ain't I? So give me my shower and a cell like always. What, am I different or something? I want you to look at a picture, Mal. Here. You know that man? Must have been a lot of long-distance calls from that pay booth you tumbled, Mal. That change could add up to grand larceny. It was that much, huh? I guess I was just born lucky. It's going to be a hot summer in that jail yard, Mal. Sit down, Mal. Cigarette? Your friend's got a cigar in his pocket. Mugman. Yeah. You want a light? Here. My feet are killing me. Put them up on my desk. <sighs> Comfortable? Well, what's your trouble, fellas? What about the picture? You guy's name is Joe. Bought me drinks. Nice fella. Very nice. My cigar went out. Now let's let's hear all about it. He buys me a lot of drinks, tells me the story of his life. Now how he did a lot of time on the coast, you know. Mm. A lot about his sister Mildred. He liked his sister Mildred a lot. Go on. You know, he says his sister Mildred ran away to New York, got herself married. Uh, this is about 20 years ago when she was a youngster. And by the time sister Mildred got back to Frisco with her hubby, Joe was in stir. His sister Mildred come to visit once, then he lost track. Ain't seen her since. Well, how'd he fi- happen to find her in New York? Phone book. Looked up her married name on the off chance, and there it was. He called her. Did he tell you what her married name was? Might have. Uh, slipped the old mind if he did. He called her, said he'd wear a red posy so she'd recognize him. Well, the dame shows. <laughs> Guess what happened? Danny. Leave him alone. She walks over to Joe and asks, is he Joe who called? Joe says, I am he, only you ain't my sister Mildred. My sister Mildred had red hair like me, he says, so they walk over in the corner, they start to talk. Then the lady raises a roof about something, starts to hurry up. Joe runs after her right into the arms of the law. What did this lady look like? Frankly, Joe fed me too many drinks to remember clear. <laughs> That's about it, boys. Uh, light my cigar again, huh? <laughs> Muggerman picked the nickel thief up by the frayed collar and carried him off to the showers, which left me alone to sift the pleasant time we'd had together and come up with a name. Mildred, Mildred Gruber, the sister who had run off to New York 20 years ago to marry and wonder why it wasn't Mildred who showed up when Brother Joe phoned her and wonder why it wasn't possible to go and ask her herself. But for that, you needed her married name, the name only Joe Gruber could tell you, the dead Joe Gruber. And remember that the city has a hall of records and that girls' names are entered there for births and deaths and marriages. Go to the hall of records. You hand it over to a man named Franey. Wait for Mr. Franey to come back from the long voyage into the files. Finally, he does, waving his find under your nose. I found it, Lieutenant. Found it. Thanks. Let me... Uh, I'm afraid you couldn't read my scroll. I'll translate for you. On May 12, 1931, one Mildred Gruber applied for a marriage license. Age 19, height... Who'd she apply with? Uh, Got that, too. Uh, Mr. Hughes Conlon. Age 27, height... Conlon, eh? Look up what you have on Conlon. Please, Mr. Franey, do that. Wait again. And know somehow Mr. Franey would look just like that when he came back. And you got something this time, Lieutenant. Conlon was married again, just three years after the first time. And I looked and looked, and there's no record of a divorce. The penalty for false statements is clearly stated on the bottom. Sure it is. Thank you again, Mr. Franey. Oh, hi and hello, Mr. Clover. Come on in. In here, the living room. Say, I've been trying to make Alexander's for years. Can I try one on you? How old are you, Myra? Seventeen. And I won't breathe a word of it. Is your mother home? Let's chip in and send her to the movies. Get her. Are you kidding? Get her. Oh, you're a fool. You could have had an Alexander. Did someone come in, Myra? Do you want me to lie to her, Mr. Clover? I most always It's the police, do. Mrs. Conlon. I want to talk to you. Hello. I was about to go to bed. I... Maybe you won't make it, Catherine. 
We'll see Mr. Clover. Myra, I'm sure there's nothing here to concern you. Will you please go? No. Myra... You heard me. No. When you were in my office, Mrs. Conlon, there was a question we never got finished with. It concerned your husband and the woman with whom he was found dead a year ago. And a man named Joe Gruber. I, I don't at all understand what you're talking about. Mother. Mama. Mom. Don't you have a date tonight, Myra? Every night. It'll keep. They always keep. All of them. All the time. You still haven't told me what I want to know, Mrs. Connell. Well, my husband shot himself. Because of me. Because of my child. He was ashamed of what was going on with that woman. He killed her and then shot himself. That's Daddy. That's my car. Shut up, Myra. Shut up. I've never laid a hand on you, but I... Mother. Mother, dear. You're talking like a mom. Never talked to me like this before. The woman found with your husband was his first wife. Did you know that, Mrs. Connell? My husband's first wife? That's not true. Why did you find out he wasn't divorced? Why, it's not true. When Mildred Gruber showed up? Daddy had such bad taste in women. Myra... Myra, I'll... You'll hit me? Go ahead. You... I'll... Myra, Myra, please. You found them together, your husband and Mildred. Killed them. Made it look like murder and suicide. Why? Listen to me. Then Joe Gruber showed up. A long lost brother looking for his sister. Looking for Mildred. Found the name Mrs. Hugh Conlon in the phone book. Thought his sister was you. Please, please, listen to me. When you met Joe at the bar, and he saw that you weren't Mildred, he began to figure, and it started to build into money. That's what he wanted when he tried to break into your house. Myra, child, try to understand what I wanted for you. Gruber got away from us. Hold up in a room. Called you for money. You came to his room. Stabbed him to death. You did all that, Catherine? For me? Just because Daddy was a bigamist? Just because all these years you haven't really been married to him? For you. For you, darling. For your name, darling. Wait. When you're married and have children of your own. Wait. Wait. Mother. All for you, darling. Don't you see? I, I couldn't let that woman destroy what I built for you. Or that man or your father. The years. The good name I wanted for you. I... Wait till Charles hears this. Myra. <laughs> Charles will die laughing. Wait till I tell him I'm just nobody. <laughs> He'll float the evening in champagne. He'll be here any minute. Wait till I tell him. I'll marry him, Mom. His last name is Tobin. Then I'll have a name, Mom. Myra Tobin. <laughs> Midnight's a happy time on Broadway. It's a place strung into the night like some phosphorescent alley. And they're heaped there, the bright-eyed kid, the voice that whispers from a doorway, the poet, the dregs. It's crowd, and it's laughter, and a Nickelodeon where you get pie in your face. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My beat. Remember, friends, for refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. There's lots of lively, real mint flavor in it to cool your mouth, freshen your taste, and sweeten your breath. And chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, at work or play, always keep delicious Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy. For refreshment while you work, for enjoyment anytime, chew a stick of Wrigley Spearmint gum. The makers of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum hope you've enjoyed tonight's story. And that you're enjoying Wrigley Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this same time when Detective Danny Clover returns again with Broadway's My Beat. Broadway's My Beat, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Gum, is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. The program is written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia, and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. 
In tonight's cast, Barbara Whiting was heard as Myra and Irene Tedrow as Mrs. Conliff. Featured in the cast were Lou Krugman, Martha Wentworth, Norman Field, and Jerry Hausner. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If Mike Shane were a painter, right now he might be gazing raptly from his office window at the sun setting directly into San Francisco's Golden Gate. If Mike Shane were a poet, he might be gazing dreamily at Phyllis Knight, his office associate. Being simply a very practical private detective, Mike's eyes are focused upon a typewritten letter on his desk while he and Phyllis share the telephone talking to the inspector of homicide. And it goes this way, inspector. Dear Mr. Shane... My life is in great danger. I dare not come to your office for fear I shall be followed. This note is to acquaint you with the fact so that when I telephone to you, you may come instantly without question and well armed. And it's signed with the initials R.E.M. Hmm. When'd you get it, Mike? A week ago Tuesday, Inspector. No return address given and it's typed on the very cheapest paper. Sounds a little different from the usual crackpot thing, Mike. But I think that's all it is. Mm. Our department gets a dozen of those letters every day. Mm, I know, Inspector, but this afternoon I got a phone call from the guy. Still wouldn't give his name. Said he was in really desperate peril now. He was going to risk coming to see Mike anyway at 4 o'clock. And so? Well, it's 6 o'clock and we're still waiting. And forget it, Mike. Guy's just a screwball. If it had really been serious, he'd have gotten in touch with the police. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Oh, uh, by the way, Mike, what are you doing this evening? Oh, Mike and I are going to go to dinner and maybe a movie. You want to make it a force? Well, my wife is spending the night down on the peninsula with her folks. Okay, Inspector. Look, I'm going back to my apartment and change shirts. Say, uh, what do you say you meet us there in a few minutes, huh? I'm on my way there right now. Hope you kids don't mind my inviting myself along like this. Oh, nonsense. We love to have you. But I make one condition. No shop talk from you kids tonight. Deal. <laughs> well, it'll be a painfully quiet evening, then. <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me see. Any mail in my box? Uh, uh-uh. No, not today. All right, make yourselves to home, children. It won't yeah. take me a minute to shave and put on a clean shirt. What under the story... Mike! Huh? There on the floor. Holy... Mike, what do you want... Where did you get it? It's a head. A mummified human head. Yeah, it's been shrunk. The head's no larger than a baseball. And the skin, it's almost black. That long hair. Oh, that gives me the shudders. Mike, how in the devil did it get in here? Somebody pulling a gag on you? Blame if I know, Inspector. From what I've read, I'd say it's a trophy of some headhunting tribe. Probably Sarawak or uh, Borneo. The cheekbones look more like an Indian's to me. Mm. You know, they say they have headhunters in Martinique and up the Amazon. You're right, Phil. It's a South American Indian. But how did it get in here? The front door was locked. Well, the same goes for the windows. Unless maybe the one in the bedroom. Inspector? Yeah? Hmm? Yes. Look. Look on my bed. A body. These slight markings on the throat are conclusive, Mike. He was strangled. Yeah. And with a good deal of finesse. It was done with something, some soft noose, a, a garot gar- or something. First we find a mummified Indian head and then a man strangled. Well, kids, there must be a connection between the two. Yeah, Phil, but what? Did the killer leave the head for Mike, or did this man drop it? Hey. Hey, there's something on the floor. Yeah. Huh? The man's wallet. 
The driver's license gives his name as R. E. McIntyre, 1198 California Street, born April 5th, 1896. Listed as married. R. E. McIntyre. R. E. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. The initials on that letter. R. E. M. R. E. McIntyre. This is our man. Yeah, but what in the blazes was he doing in your bedroom? I thought he was to meet you at your office. Well, maybe he was being followed, Inspector. Decided he'd be safer if he could hide in Mike's apartment till Mike came home. Yeah, it's yeah. dizzy any way you look at it. There's almost a hundred dollars here in his wallet. He's dressed like a Knob Hill millionaire. Yet he wrote to me on the cheap paper a schoolboy would use. Yeah, let's go through his pockets and see what else we can find. Okay. First, the wallet. Here. A gold pen and pencil, initialed R-E-M. Yeah. Here's a checkbook. Key ring. Gold knife. A couple of dollars in small change. One pack of cigarettes. Match folder. That's all. Yeah, it doesn't tell us anything. Hand me the phone, Mike. I'm going to call headquarters for the squad, and after they get here... We're leaving for 1198 California Street and the lady who is Mrs. McIntyre. <laughs> When did I last see my husband? Well, we ate luncheon at the Palace Hotel, and then Mr. McIntyre said he had some business to attend to. What time was that, Mrs. McIntyre? Mm, I would say two o'clock. Well, that's just about when he telephoned the office. He told me he was coming to see Mike at four o'clock. Did uh, your husband tell you, Mrs. McIntyre, that his life was in danger? That apparently he was being followed everywhere he went? Mr. McIntyre never talked over his affairs with me. However, I, I did notice that the past several weeks he seemed very nervous. I thought he was brooding over some business matter. And just what was his business? Mining. He and his partner, Anthony Locke, own a big tin mine in South America. South America? That's where the dried Indian head came from. It did mean something. Mrs. McIntyre, do you know if your husband had any enemies? I've answered that. Mr. McIntyre did not talk over his affairs with me. Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly provided a beautiful and expensive home. Mrs. McIntyre, can you explain why he should write us that letter on the cheapest sort of paper and then sign only his initials? <laughs> Max done that trick before. Mm -hmm. He wanted you to think he was a poor man, so you might work for him at less money. Oh. He would even introduce himself by some false name that would fit his initials. <laughs> yes, he thought that much of a nickel. Except when he could spend it on himself, huh? I presume, Mrs. McIntyre, your husband left the will. Mr. Shane, I'm getting very weary of repeating this. Mm? My husband did not talk over his business with me. Of course he had a will. And of course I'm the beneficiary. You must realize, Mrs. McIntyre, that I we're... realize that for one half hour I've been subjected to highly impertinent questions. I know nothing which can help the police department. And there the matter ends. <laughs> Mike, for two cents, I'd go back to the house and haul that royal lady down to headquarters. I think she'd decide to answer our question. Look, let's forget her for the time being, Inspector. We've got to talk to McIntyre's business partner, Anthony Locke. Hey, kids, I just saw a man duck behind that front gate. You did? Okay, let's have a look. Hey, he got in that car. Quick, we'll follow him. Here, jump in. Hi. Mike started. He's getting away. He's gotten away, Angel. The wires have been pulled loose from my ignition switch. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Many motorists have been amazed at the way the new 76 gasoline performs in traffic and on hills. Well, the reason is simple. It's because the new 76 contains components of the same 100-octane gasoline Union Oil Company's refineries produce for the Air Forces. That means the new 76 gasoline for your car is packed with extra power, greater than pre-war. You'll notice its instant response as soon as you come down on the accelerator. You'll like its quieter, faster action. And you'll like its price, too. For 76 is a non-premium gasoline and still sells at regular prices everywhere. So for a real thrill in driving, put in a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. Nearly all Union Oil Minuteman stations have the new 76 on hand now. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. <laughs> 
Tonight, a triple mystery, dogs Mike and Phyllis. Why was a mummified Indian head left in Mike's apartment? Why was a man strangled to death in Mike's bed? Who pulled the ignition wires loose in Mike's automobile? Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have gone to the home of the murdered man's partner, Anthony Locke. The dining room door opens. Mr. Locke asks if you would please join him in the dining room. Why, certainly. Thank you. Ah, good evening. I was just beginning my dinner. Hope you haven't eaten. I'll have water set extra plates. I'm afraid you don't understand, sir. I'm the inspector of homicide. This is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, private detectives. Oh, really? Well, I uh, misunderstood, Waters. Bit hard of hearing, you know. Too much quinine, touch of malaria. Sit down, sit down. I despise eating alone. Happy to have your company. Mr. Locke, this is not a social call. No, can't recall inviting you. Don't know what you're doing here. But uh, how about some terrapin soup? It's excellent tonight. Sir, I'm from the police department. Your partner, Mr. McIntyre, has been killed. Murdered. Strangled to death. <laughs> when? Tonight, in my apartment. What? And in the next room, we found a dried, mummified human head. Uh, Mr. Locke? Mr. Locke, are you all right? The sign of death. You know what it means? Yes. Yes, McIntyre came to me with an anonymous letter. It said he was going to die. When was this? Uh, about ten days ago. I tried to get him to go to the police. He wouldn't. Finally, he said he'd hire a private detective. We both knew who sent the letter. But I didn't think he'd actually kill. Hmm? That's what that head means. He? Who? Please, Mr. Locke. His name is Ferd Stockle. He lives in Bolivia. McIntyre and I bought our plantation from him about five years ago. Mm -hmm. Just jungle and bare mountains. Then we dug the tin mine. Stockle said we cheated him out of it. He swore he'd get even. <laughs> this scar on my cheek. He did that with a machete. Then you think he's in San Francisco? He must be. The letter was postmarked from here. But, gentlemen, this isn't the end. I have received the same letter. The hmm? same death threat? Yes. Okay, let's have a look at that letter. Well, that's a strange thing. I had it on my desk, then suddenly it disappeared. Then we better move fast. I want a description of this third stock. Well, I can give you that. He's about five feet seven. He has black hair, black eyes, very dark skin. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd be about uh, 40 now. He speaks English with a peculiar hissing accent. Good. Now, Mike, we better get moving. But, but, but how can you catch him? What can you do? Plenty. We're going back to headquarters and broadcast a general alarm. All right, boys, that's the man's description. Get that on the radio right away. See that all squad cars are contacted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Smith, your men will cover all airports, train depots, bridge control stations, and highways. He may try to skip town. Yes, sir. Russell and you boys go over the registrations at all hotels. See if you can get me the immigration authorities. Yes, yes sir. that's all. Get busy. Inspector, we made an inventory of everything in McIntyre's pocket. So did we, Sergeant. Oh, then you know about the folder of matches. Matches? What about? Address on the cover there. That's the third rate place down in the Embarcadero. Hardly a place for a rich man like McIntyre. Mm, you're right, Sergeant. Not only right, Inspector. I suggest we visit that third rate hotel on the Embarcadero right now. <laughs> That's what I said. Ain't nobody name of Ferd Starkle registered here. Well, he may be under another name. You got any man registered from South America? Well, let me think now. South America? Well, yeah. Yeah, room 307. That great big guy with the beard signed in from Lima, Peru. When? Oh, maybe two weeks ago. Name's Ed Badger, he says. Two weeks ago. Mm. Time fits if the description doesn't. Okay, I guess this time we walk up. <laughs> Yes, I come up from Lima. What about it? Before that, Mr. Badger, by any chance were you in Bolivia? Oh, now I'm on. You've been talking to McIntyre. What's Mac doing, running to the police just because I, uh... uh well, I, uh, I thought he had some sense. You were going to say just because you what? Well, now, Judge, it was a good deal. I figured Mr. McIntyre and Mr. Locke wouldn't mind owning the second tin mine down in Old Boliv. I could fix it so they'd get hold of a really big one. Mm -hmm. A few thousands played in the right place, you know. <laughs> a 
But if Mac is going to turn Sunday school boy on me... Mr. Badger, you, uh, you work for McIntyre and Locke? I was boss of the mine, madam, until uh, they were looking for an excuse to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. But Edge Badger is not one to hold hard feelings. When did you last see McIntyre? Well, he come to the hotel here yesterday. Now, I'm not one to do Mac dirt. You ought to know that. So if you gentlemen will give me an idea what this is all about. Mr. McIntyre has been murdered. Been be oh, that's not so good. No, no. Uh, Mr. Badger, do you mind telling us where you've been for the past three hours? Oh, I see what you mean. Well, I've uh, been right here in my room. And, uh, oh, maybe a couple of trips to the bar. Did Mr. McIntyre tell you that he'd received a letter threatening his life? No. A letter, there. Eh? So that's what was worrying old Mac. I figured he was having trouble with his wife. While you were down in Bolivia, Mr. Badger, did you know a man named Starkle? Ferd Starkle? Oh, did I know Ferd. There's a cutthroat for you. Oh? Now, if you were to ask me if Ferd Starkle would kill Mac, I'd say yes. I, Mac and Locke, really crossed him up once. Uh, have you seen him in San Francisco? Here? No. He's down in Bolivia. When did you last see him there? Why, a couple of months ago, I say. Yeah. You mean you think he's in town? I wouldn't like that, gents. He's a bad one. You said a moment ago you thought McIntyre was having trouble with his wife. Uh, where did you get that idea? Well, I, uh, I, I only thought. I don't know. Go on, go on, please. Well, I, I don't know anything. Mac just said something about his wife nagging him. I, I hope you gentlemen won't tattle that to her. I may have to do business with her in lock. Hey, you won't say anything, will you? That's for us to decide. Uh, Mr. Badger, is there anything further you can tell us? Anything else that comes to your mind? Mm, no, I can't think of anything. Mm-hmm. Inspector, yeah, I Mike. think I've got a slightly different angle on this case. I'd like to go back to McIntyre's house and have a look at his private papers, whether Mrs. McIntyre likes it or not. I mean, I know what you're thinking, Mike. You figure Ed Badger is in this deeper than he'll admit. Now you want to get some proof in black and white. Well, that's part of it. Yeah, he told us just what he wanted us to hear and no more. Mm -hmm. So he's a shady character. But probably he's never risen above petty larceny and confidence games. No, he doesn't look like the... The type, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, someday, Angel, the inspector and I are going to take you down to Rogue's Gallery and show you the pictures of every convicted murderer for the past ten years. You'll say most of them look uh, as innocent as the inspector uh, or myself. That's no recommendation. Oh, get her. <laughs> Here we are, kids. I'll pull up in the driveway. Stop and... the car. Quick. What? There's that man, the man who tore the wires out of Mike's car. Yeah, he's running down the walk. Hey, you, stop. Stop or I'll shoot. That stopped him. Come on. Inspector, if you've hit him... Don't worry, I aimed at the pavement. He's pretty shaky in the legs. What's the big idea? Try to kill a man. Listen, if I wanted to hit you, I couldn't miss at that short range. You can't get away with this. Sticking up a guy right... I'll have the law on you. You're talking to him, buddy. I'm inspector of homicide. Now, we want to know why you were sneaking around outside this house. And why you pulled the wires loose in our car. I'm a private detective. I was paid to watch this house. Who paid you? McIntyre. I'm watching his wife. Oh, is that so? Then, Inspector, suppose we give him a chance to do uh, more than watch her. Suppose we make him talk to her. <laughs> man's lying. Why would my husband hire a detective to watch me? Well, we don't know that he is a detective. I got a license. Here, see if he is so. Mm-hmm. Your name Andy Blackmore? Yeah. License was issued last month. I never heard of him before. So what? I never heard of you before. I'm new in San Francisco. Mr. Blackmore, when did Mr. McIntyre hire you to shadow his wife? Last week. It's preposterous, I tell you. He's lying. My orders were to watch her and a fellow named Locke. Well, get McIntyre. He'll tell you if I'm lying or not. McIntyre was dead. But murdered. He's what? Mr. Blackmore, just what were you supposed to find out about Mrs. McIntyre and Locke? Well, I don't know. I was supposed to keep track of her and everybody she was in contact with, especially Locke. And what happens? I get myself half strangled to death and then you shoot at me. Wait a minute, hold on. Who strangled you when? Oh, some big guy with a beard. He was leaving here a couple of nights ago and when I... Hello? Is the inspector there? Yes, he's here. It's for you, Inspector. Thank you. Hello? Inspector? Yes? Mr. Locke just phoned headquarters. 
Says he's discovered a very important clue. All right, Sergeant. Tell him we'll be right over. You meet us there. Mike, I, I don't like this at all. Mr. Lux's front door open, the electric lights off. Not only off, there's no electricity at all. Listen, you guys aren't going to mix me up in this. I'm going out and waiting in the car. You're staying right here, mister. Mr. Lark. Mr. Lark. Not a sound. Where are the servants? I want to find the telephone. Mike, throw your flashlight around. Oh, Mike. Huh? Throw it this way. I just kicked something. It, it, it rolled. There it is. A head. Another head. Yeah. And right behind it. On the couch. Mr. Lark. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. We don't say that driving with the new 76 gasoline will eliminate all your traffic problems, but we do say it will make your driving a lot more pleasant. Even the oldest cars perk up and come alive when you put in the new 76. That's because this new post-war fuel contains components of the same 100-octane gasoline that Union Oil Company's refineries are producing for the air forces. That means it's packed with extra power, greater than pre-war. You'll notice this as soon as you come down on the accelerator. You'll like the quieter, faster action of the powerful new 76 gasoline. And you'll like its price, too. For 76 is a non-premium gasoline and still sells at regular prices everywhere. So for a real thrill in driving, put in a tank full of the new Super 76. The new 76 gasoline is now going on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. <laughs> In the darkened house of Anthony Locke, Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have discovered a second mummified human head. But this time, the murderer has failed. Our trio have arrived just in time. Anthony Locke himself has been revived. In the yellow light of Mike's flashlight, the victim gasps out his story. Uh, thank heavens you got here. You thought he had killed me. Well, we did, too. The garage was still wrapped around your neck. Did you see who it was? No. I, it, it was Starkle. Heard Starkel. It must have been. But you couldn't see him. No. Now I came home and, and found the servants gone. I got scared. I phoned the police. Then I heard a window smash. Where? The breakfast room. In there. Suddenly the lights went out. Somebody grabbed me. I felt something tighten around my throat. And that's the last I remember. Well, he left you for dead, then ran out the front door and left it open. Well, it must have happened in the past 15 minutes. You were all right when you phoned us. Uh, yes. Oh, Please, that, that flashlight hurts my eyes. You can light the candles on the mantel. Uh, I'll light them. Who, who's that man there beside you? Andy Blackmore. I'm a private detective. He claims McIntyre hired him to shadow Mrs. McIntyre and you. McIntyre didn't... No, no, he's lying. I tell you, it's the truth. Now, listen, you guys aren't going to rope me into this. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke, you said on the phone that you had discovered some important clue. Yes, I, I found the letter. Good. Oh. The letter threatening my life. I, I, I've got it in my pocket. Good. It may be the key to the whole case. No, I'm sure I... No, it's gone. I, I had it right here in my pocket. He took it. Doggone, just when we thought uh, we... You've got to catch Starkel. You've got to. He's mad. He'll try again. We'll do our best, Mr. Locke. But I'm worried about these missing servants... How many are in your employ? The butler and the French cook. Why would they disappear? Is that the front door? Inspector! It's the sergeant. Oh. And Ed Badger. And why not? Gentlemen, I was suspicious. I couldn't see any lights except a couple of candles. Because somebody pulled the light switch. And tried to murder Mr. Locke. To murder? No. Mr. Locke, too. Are you all right now, sir? He is. But uh, what were you doing outside? Why, I was coming to see him. After you gentlemen left me at the hotel, I figured I'd better talk over my business with him personally. He's the man I was trailing the other night. He's the one that tried to strangle me. You again. Now look here, friend. Remember what I told you about messing the things that don't concern you? Inspector. Yeah, Mike. Before the trail gets hot, uh, uh, we'd better look for clues. 
The killer may have dropped something. Right. Let's start with a broken window. Mr. Locke said it was in the next room. There's the glass scattered all around the window. Yeah. Double sliding window. Now, let's raise it and check for footprints outside. And a luck. Cement paving. Oh. He smashed the glass, crawled through the window, but he didn't cut himself or snag his clothes. Well, let's look around the room. Mike, let me have that flashlight a minute. Oh, what is it, Angel? Look. Look, this window has an upper and lower half. Yeah. And the bottom half is smashed. Yeah, but there are little pieces of glass scattered along the wooden frame here on the top of the lower half. Mm. Now, how could glass from below the frame get on top of the frame? Angel, Angel, you hit it. Hmm? The top half of the window was lowered first. And when it was raised again, the glass was transferred from one frame to the other. Then that window was smashed from the inside. Wait a minute, kids, wait a minute. Remember Mr. Locke said he got a threatening letter just like McIntyre's? Yeah, the one he just said was stolen for the second time. But only McIntyre did anything about it. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mr. Locke. Yes? Mr. Locke, where is the uh, power switch that turns on the electric lights? Why, down in the basement. And immediately after the window was smashed, the lights went out and somebody grabbed you? Yes. Mr. Locke, it would take several minutes to get from that window down into the basement, then tumble back upstairs in the dark. What? Why, why uh... You why... faked the whole thing. You broke that window yourself. You got rid of the servant. No, no, it was Ferd Stockle. He you was... built up a dramatic story for us to swallow. What? But your own partner didn't believe it. That's why McIntyre hired a detective to watch his wife and you. You were the one who insisted on going to the police about McIntyre's threatening letter. But you also got a letter. You never went to the police. You didn't hire a detective. Because you knew there was no danger, Mr. Locke. Because you are the murderer. No, no, no. Somebody followed McIntyre to Shane's apartment. Somebody climbed through the window and strangled him. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Thank you. As sweet a confession as I ever heard. None of us told you that the killer got into my apartment through the window, but you're perfectly correct. Well, Inspector, I guess that's all the proof the DA will ask of you. <laughs> Do you realize we haven't had a single bite of dinner tonight? Oh, my stomach won't let me forget it. Oh. The inspector told me he'd meet us at Fisherman's Wharf as soon as he finishes at headquarters. I hope he can find out where Locke got those gruesome Indian heads. Oh, he probably brought them with him from South America. Well, maybe so. Anyway, Mike, I think I can guess Locke's motive for the killing. He was in love with Mrs. McIntyre. He wanted the husband out of the way. Uh-huh. Locke's elaborate build-up was just to disguise a very simple, sordid murder. No. I don't believe Mrs. McIntyre had the slightest interest in Locke, or even suspected his intentions. Well, it just goes to show you, Angel. When some men are in love, they'll stop at nothing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. But that's not my problem. Hmm? Mm. It's when some men are in love and will do nothing. Why, Angel... again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company.
This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, 20 Fathoms Under. I was standing out in front of my cafe tambourine getting a little of the afternoon sun. A lemonade seller with his jingling urn drifted by. I was enjoying myself till I looked down the street and saw a guy feeling out his sea legs on the narrow sidewalk. His weather-beaten face slit with a grin from ear to ear. I hadn't seen him for three years. And I didn't especially want to see him now, so I ducked inside. But he sailed in behind me like a schooner in a high wind. Ahoy, Mitchie! Rocky! Rocky, lad! Oh. Hey, hello, Sandy. Well, no, that's better. You wouldn't be forgetting old Sandy McQuill now, would you? Eh, three long years, now I'm back. Eh, come on to a table. We'll be drinking on it. Uh, on you this time, Sandy? Ahoy, bartender. Bring us a bottle. Look alive! What do you want, Sandy? Eh, what do I want, lad? Rocky, I've sailed every port from Shanghai to Cape Town. But I wouldn't be passing up an old friend now, would I? Oh, not if you had an angle. I know you to be an honorable man. And I'll give the belay and pin to the man that's as different. Uh, yeah, here we are. <laughs> oh, uh, Sandy's paying for this, Chris. Aye, lad. Uh, this is a great day for us, Rocky. Now then, lad. To the old days. Yep. It'll cost you 24 piastres. Uh, you'll get it, lad, and plenty more. Uh, Scud up alongside, Rock. Oh, I can take it from here. What are you asking for, Sandy? Oh, skin rock here. Nothing of the kind. Listen, did you ever hear the Mandara? She was sailing for the sewers three months ago, loaded to the gunnels with a cargo worth a king's ransom. Oh, save the yarn, Sandy. Wait, lad. The Mandara sailed into bad luck. Rocky, didn't you read of this? A stray mine from the war blasted the Mandara, and it went down off Rasab and Funderak and all its cargo with it. Yeah, maybe I did read about it. Well, why tell me? It's ours, Rocky. Free booty of the high seas for them that gets it. It's there, waiting for us. Salvage? Oh, no, no. I can handle it, Rocky. And I'm letting you in. 50-50. <laughs> of course, nobody else thought of bringing the Mandara up. That's just it, lad. The brig was off its course. It went down in a fog. Nobody knows exactly where it is. But you do. Aye, Rocky, that I do. Right to a compass point. How'd you find out? <laughs> a man sailing the seven seas has ways of learning things, lad. Here, I'll show you the map. <laughs> Who gave you that, Captain Kidd? Yeah, cast your binnacles on this now. Look, there's the Suez. The Mandara followed a course through the Red Sea. And there's Rasab and Funderak. The Mandara went down there. Yeah, see the mark? Yeah, there's what Davy Jones got her. Twenty fathoms under. Oh, sorry, Sandy, but my money's all tied up in Abyssinian grasshoppers this year. <laughs> yeah, you don't follow me. It's not money I'm after. What else? Yeah, you've got a motor launch still tied up at Port Said, I'm thinking. The one you sailed down from Istanbul. Yeah, only because nobody'd buy the tub. Is that all you want? Aye, Rocky. It's good enough. I'll rig it for diving and man it with a couple of buckles from the Said wharves. Well, that's all I'm asking for, Rocky. What do you say? Sure, why not? And I hope it sinks before you get out of the harbor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, never you worry. Sandy McWill can sail any brig with a hull. Yeah, you'll sign the papers to get me out of port? Yeah, and out of the tambourine. 
And there'll be some papers for you to sign. Uh, wait. Uh, the smart brogue. Look at it well. Uh, just get it off the table. Now. Only you and I know, lad. We'll keep it that way. Hey? Sure, but... Hey, what are you doing? Hey. There. Just a little precaution, lad. Yeah, the map's burning merrily. Yeah, that calls for a chaser, I'm thinking. Look, burning a map gets too corny, Sandy. Suppose you move along now, huh? Yeah, hi, Rocky. Well, hoist anchor. You'll wait for me here? Sure, sure. Come back in another three years. <laughs> You'll hear from Sandy McWill again, lad. And so... Hey, wait a minute. What about the drinks? Chris made a move from behind the bar to stop him, but I said not to bother Sandy McQuill had a habit of barging into my life every few years. Whatever the pitch, he never got off with very much. I figured this time he was just around for free drinks. He hadn't told me where he was going, and I didn't care. Well, by the next evening, I hadn't heard from him again, and I was real glad. McQuill was clear out of my mind when the office phone opened up. Uh, Cafe Tambourine. Mr. Rocky Jordan? Uh, Jordan speaking, lady. Thank you. My name is Ming Lee. What can I do for you, Miss Lee? I am calling at the command of my father, Sen Wang Lee. Oh, do I know him? No, you have not met. My father instructs me to tell you that he wishes most urgently to talk with you. Well, all right. He'll find me around the bar most any time of day. My father is unable to meet you there. It is his wish that you honor him with your presence in his most humble home. What does he want, Miss Lee? My uh, father wishes to talk to you about the Mandara. Hey, wait a minute. What makes your father think I know anything about the Mandara? He read it in the paper, Mr. Jordan. Look, Miss Lee, I don't know what this is all about, but tell Mr. Lee I've got nothing to do with the ship. But, Mr. Jordan, the paper said... I don't care what the paper said. It's a mistake. But my father... Just tell your father to forget about the whole thing. There's nothing to it. At all, Miss Lee? Yes. I will tell him, Mr. Jordan. Goodbye. I made it out to the corner in ten seconds flat. I grabbed the evening edition of the Cairo Mail, flipped a couple of piastres to the newsboy, and started looking. It didn't take long. When I turned to page three, my picture jumped out at me. And the story below my picture, written in newsy Arabic, didn't miss a thing. Rocky Jordan, noted proprietor of the Cafe Tambourine, reported financing an expedition from Port Said to salvage the ill-fated Mandara. Oh, there were a lot more details, and all a build-up for Rocky Jordan. It wasn't long till all sorts of people came driving around. A fellow wanted to sell me a diving helmet. Another called to sell me a home on the Nile. And a lady came in for a contribution to the home for aged camel drivers. Oh, there were a lot more calls, and I didn't like it. I finally left the receiver off the hook. Just then, I saw a stout, bald-headed man in a new suit looking in from the office doorway. Mr. Jordan, I am Jacob Matson. Oh, I see you got a paper, too, Mr. Matson. What? As a matter of fact, that is what I came about. I am with the Continental Insurance Company. Sorry, I'm not in the market for insurance or anything else. I'm afraid you don't understand. You see, my company issued a policy on the Mandala and its cargo. Sit down, Mr. Matson. Thank you. <laughs> Now, what's the trouble? No, no trouble, Mr. Jordan, but we are naturally most interested in your plans to salvage the Mandara. Oh, it's free booty? Of course. You see, we paid off in full for the loss of the ship and its cargo. That's what puzzles us. I don't follow. The cargo of the Mandara consisted only of tea, rice, and other perishables. That's uh, hardly worth salvaging. Go on. Naturally, my company is interested to learn if there was something else. Something not mentioned in our policy. I oh, wish I could tell you. <laughs> I see. After releasing such a complete story to the newspapers, Mr. Jordan, we felt that you might be willing to discuss this matter. It's a fact, Mr. Matson. I'd tell you if I knew. Uh, you know where the Mandara went down? More or less. Would you be willing to reveal the source of your information? I wouldn't. Oh, by the way, uh, why don't you talk to whoever collected the insurance money? Well, that's hardly possible. He has uh, disappeared. Any idea where? Who knows? Perhaps like others who knew too much about the Mandara, he is dead. Yeah. You understand my company's interest now, Mr. Jordan? Maybe. I'll let you know what I find. I don't think so. Good day, Mr. Jordan. 
Jacob Matson put on his pinched glasses. They dropped off again, and he went out. Right then, I decided to toss the ball at the Cairo police before they started coming to me. I found Captain Sam Sabaya inspecting a long row of newly fumigated cells. I got the feeling he was laughing at me when I showed up, but his face didn't show it. Well, how convenient, Jordan. I've been trying to call you. Oh, my phone's been real busy. Ah, well, such is the price of fame. Anything uh, special you called about? Yes, Jordan. It is about the item in the afternoon paper. Hey, do you like my picture, Sam? <laughs> it should attract a certain type of clientele to your tambourine. I don't know quite how to take that. That one is okay. Jordan, how did you come by this information about the Mandara? Well, in the first place, Sam, I didn't put that item in the paper. I'd like to know who did and why. Then you have no intention of this salvage operation? Uh, a friend of mine thinks he knows where the Mandara went down. I said he could use my boat, that's all. What does he think he'll find? I don't know. Could you not ask him? Sure, and I will. After I found out what you've got in the Mandara. The information in the newspaper article is correct, Jordan. The ship was reported sunk by a mine, obviously still floating from the war. This cell will do. Anything more, Sam? Yes, and this will perhaps interest you, Jordan. Only the captain and four of the crew escaped from the sinking ship. Since then, three of the crew have suffered violent deaths, all in the same manner. Yeah, I am interested, Sam. What else? The captain and owner of the Mandara is not to be found now. Perhaps he also has been killed. Oh, well, what about the fifth one? The first mate, a man named Pete Limbo, is still living in Cairo. We have questioned him repeatedly. Get anything out of him? No, nothing. Well, inspection complete. I am sure he knows, but he will not tell. We've been watching him. Where does he live? We're not frequenting the bars. He can be found at a place on Sharia Naga. Yeah, let's have another talk with him, Sam. Sometimes Sam surprises me, like this time. Without batting an eye, he called for his black limousine. In about 15 minutes, we were driving down Sharia Naga, trying to miss the bumps. An excited cluster of natives were crowded around an open doorway as we pulled up to the curb. When they saw the police car, they scattered like ducks in hunting season. It looks like something's up. Better get in there, Sam. Perhaps you're right. Come along, Jordan. Here. This is Limbo's room. Open up! Open up in there! Close the door. That beat Limbo? It was. Didn't watch him any too well, Sam. We could not watch him every minute, Jordan. Yeah, I know. Somebody sure took care of him. Exactly as the other three, Jordan. Hung by the thumbs and then the knife. Sam began rounding up the other folks in the building, but there was nothing to be learned from them. Me, I wanted to round up a certain Sandy McQuill and get a few answers. So I went scouting for a taxi. It was dark by now, with no traffic along the narrow Sharia Naga. I spotted a dim light a couple of blocks up and made for it. As I passed an alley, I knew I should have stayed with Sabaya. Two powerful shadows moved out quick and pinned me to the wall. I tried to make it interesting, but right then I felt a cord wrap around my neck. A silken cord, drawn tight. I stopped fighting real quick. You're smart, Jordan. You got respect for the cord, huh? It can get awful tight. Yeah. All we gotta do is pull... A little too hard. Maxi pulls his end. I pull mine. Look, what's the big idea? Shut up. All you gotta do is listen. Yeah, we got information. So get it, Jordan. Keep away from the ocean. You might get seasick. I'm not going anywhere. That's right, Jordan. You know something about the Mandara? If you do, forget it. Forget real fast. Nobody's diving for the Mandara, Jordan. Especially not you. Know why? Because there's nothing there you want. Nothing. Go back to the tambourine, Jordan. Stay there, you'll live longer. Do you know what if you don't? Next time we'll twist the cord. Tighter! <gasps> and tighter! <gasps> and tighter! They both gave a last twist. My breath was gone and I went spinning off to the moon. The curtains were closing in when the cord loosened. Then they slammed me back into the alley and were gone. <laughs> Thank you. 
You are listening to 20 Fathoms Under, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. You'll find the chills colder, the excitement sharper, and the stories better on CBS Mystery. At 9 tomorrow night, enjoy thrilling mystery on Inner Sanctum when the creaking door opens and exposes a man returned from the dead. Then on Tuesday night, remember Mr. and Mrs. North at 8.30, followed by Mystery Theater at 9. Yes, you'll find colder chills, sharper excitement, and better stories on CBS Mystery. And now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, 20 Fathoms Under. It was all started by a sea dog named Sandy McQuill who wanted to salvage the sunken freighter Mandara. The cargo of the Mandara was supposed to be nothing but tea and rice. And after the sinking, members of the crew had been killed one by one, all in the same manner. I didn't want any part of it, but the story got spread all over the newspapers with my picture. Then a couple of guys gave me the silk cord treatment with threats to lay off and dump me in an alley. I finally got my breath and was working on the idea of trying to get up, and I noticed a round, soft face looking down at me. Her eyes were curious, but not afraid. What is it that has happened here? Don't you know? Your neck. The silken cord. And you live. Say, uh, haven't I heard your voice before? I do not know. I am Ming Li. Ming Li? Uh, you called me on the phone this afternoon. And you are Rocky Jordan. Just where did you come from? I was searching for you. I'll bet you were. Mr. Jordan, I am but obeying the command of my father, Sen Wang Li. He wishes to speak with you. He doesn't give up easy, does he? My father feels that it is most important. Will you come with me now? Maybe I've been pushed around enough for tonight. But my father does not wish you harm. Just questions, huh? Perhaps more. Come, let me help you. All right, Ming. Let's go see what Sen Wong Lee has on his mind. This way, Mr. Jordan. Ming Lee tripped ahead, and I followed her down a twisting lane. She took me into the Chinese sector, where the houses overhanging the street almost touched overhead. At one of the doors, we turned and went in. Ming led me down a dimly lit hall, off another corridor, and finally into a room rich with tapestries. A little heavy on the incense for me, but furnished in the dignity of the upper-class Chinese. Standing in front of a teakwood desk was an old Chinese in Mandarin dress. But something else caught my eye as he took a couple of steps toward me. He was the first Chinese I'd ever seen with a pig leg. I have obeyed your command, my father. You honor my house, Mr. Jordan. That is all, Ming. I am Sen Wang Li. Look, Mr. Li, I'll clear up a couple of points real quick. I don't know what's on the Mandara worth salvaging. In fact, I don't know where it went down. And yet we have read that you plan to find the Mandara. Mr. Li, what I want to know is why you and a couple of dozen other people in Cairo care whether I salvage the Mandara or not. The interest of other people is not my affair, Mr. Jordan, but for me it is most imperative. Enough to set two muscle men on me with a silken cord? Mr. Jordan, let me explain. The captain and owner of the Mandara insured the ship far beyond its worth. It was his plan to sail to Shanghai and take on a cargo of tea and rice. Go on. Sailing back into the Red Sea, the captain then conspired to sink his own ship, report the disaster from a floating mine, and collect the insurance. But I still Wait, don't... Wait, Mr. Jordan. While in port at Shanghai, the captain was approached by my brother, a most respected man who had to leave China secretly and quickly. The captain accepted a high fee to bring my brother and his wife to Egypt. Uh-huh. Only they never got here. Only the captain and four of his crew came off the Mandara when it went down. Now you understand my interest in your venture? Yeah. And maybe why the escaping crew of the Mandara have been wiped out. Chinese retribution? Uh, Mr. Jordan, my only interest is to recover the body of my brother and his wife. So that someday I might bury them with their ancestors. Mr. Lee, I think I should talk this over with Sandy McQuill. A man by that name was seen two days ago talking with the first mate of the Mandara. 
The first mate was quite drunk. Yeah, he gave McQuill a map, and now he's dead, too. I can also tell you where Sandy McQuill is living. Sandy McQuill's address turned out to be a third-rate hotel, past the Frank Quarter and near the Hassan Bazaar. I took the steps up two flights and slammed at McQuill's door. Oh, Rocky lot. That's right. We got a salvage deal, remember? Well, uh, sure, Rocky. Well, bags all packed and ready to go, I see. Well, sure, I am shoving off right away. For Port Said? Ah, let's go. On the way, you can clear up plenty. Eh, uh, uh, no, Rocky. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've changed my mind. Uh, the Mandara's no good for us. Uh, wait a minute. We made a deal to salvage that hulk. You said there's valuable cargo aboard. Forget it, my boy. Forget it. Uh, I'm setting my sails for Marseille. Uh, there's a little girl that's waiting. Uh, you know, I... Cut it, Sandy. Cut it. Just why did you change your mind? It was like I told you, Rocky lad. Answer me something, will you? Did a guy named Pete Limbo give you that map to the Mandara? You seen Limbo? Yeah, I saw him. Hanging by his thumbs. A knife to the rest. Yeah, you see, Rocky lad. Uh, we're getting out of this. It was that story you put in the newspaper. You queered everything. Yeah, it's another thing. Just how did that story get in the paper? Uh, I don't know. Rocky, don't you see? It's best I'll that tell you what I think. I think you put it there to set me up as a kingpin. I don't know just why, but... Oh, no, Rocky lad. Would I do that to me old drinking mate from Frisco days? Come to think of it, maybe you never planned to take my boat out after all. The whole deal was a cover-up for something else. Oh, it ain't so, Rocky. Suppose I get it in the papers just who does know where the Mandara went down. You, Sandy. No, Rocky. For what good reason? Think about it. Pete yeah. Limbo might not be the last to hang by his thumbs. Oh, you wouldn't do that, lad. You wouldn't do that to Sandy McQuill. All right, then. Grab your bags and come on. Uh, where are we going? We're catching the night train to Port Said. You're going to go diving for the Mandara if I have to let you down by the heels. <laughs> You are listening to 20 Fathoms Under, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. The Unafraid, an emotion-filled screenplay, is presented by Lux Radio Theater tomorrow Monday night at 6. Burt Lancaster and Joan Fontaine star in their original roles. So don't miss the radio adaptation of The Unafraid with Burt Lancaster and Joan Fontaine on Radio Theater Monday night at 6 on CBS. <laughs> Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, 20 Fathoms Under. Well, when McQuill and I got to Port Said, we found we couldn't have sailed my motor launch in a bathtub. So I rented a salvage rig at the docks, dug up a couple of bumps to help man it, and we headed down the canal. McQuill steered and seemed to know where he was going. It was early the following morning, far down the Red Sea. The sun was just beginning to cut through a fog that had followed us all the way from Shadwan Island. Hey, what's that to the starboard, Sandy? Uh, the best I can make out through the fog, that's the point there, Rocky. That's Ras Harbin Funderak. Now listen, Rocky lad, I'm telling you again, this ain't for us. You'd better find it, Sandy. Cut the motors! Oh, is this a spot? Hey, hey, matey. The Mandara's below. Look, Sandy, if you've steered wrong, you'll find that ship if you have to dig up the Red Sea. It's here. I'll lay me word to it. Okay, let's not lose any time. It'll be light enough before long. Get into your diving suit. Well, Rocky, there's no rush about it. But just listen to me. We didn't come all the way down here to talk, Sandy. Let's go. Rocky, I, 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 I can't do it. Why? I promised somebody. That's all I can tell you. If we cut it off now, there'll be no harm to any of us. Here's the diving suit. Take off your jacket and get it on. No, 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 Rocky, let go. Let go. I warn you, me. Diving now, Sandy, if I have to break your neck. No, no, Rocky, I'll get it. That's mine. Oh, something you're hiding in your jacket, huh, Sandy? Neat little bundle. It's nothing, lad. I give it me now. Ah, as soon as I've had a look. Ah, neat stack of 20-pound Egyptian notes. Enough to take you a long way. Where'd you get it, Sandy? Way. It's mine, Rocky. Uh, just me life savings. Oh, it's real clear now. This money's a payoff, right? Well, uh, I tell you... Who are you blackmailing? 
A missing captain of the Mandara, maybe, huh? He's a dangerous man, Rocky. Sure. You had a great way of bringing the captain to terms. You threatened to salvage the Mandara, then splash my picture all over the papers. While I was a sitting duck, all you had to do was sit back and wait for the payoff. I was going to split with you, Rocky lad. With me hanging by my thumbs, like Pete Limbo and the rest of the crew? Now, matey, you wouldn't suggest that I did that. Why not? What do you know of a Chinese named Sen Wong Lee? Uh, nothing at all. But, but the captain did it, Rocky. He wanted rid of them that knew the Mandara's secret. Who is the captain? Where do we find him? Yeah, Rocky, you know I can't tell you that. I made a promise. I'm a man in my word. Uh, Get the port, sir! Look, Rocky. Coming out of the fog. There's a big ship. Suppose they see us? Aye. She's drawn in close. But she don't turn alongside. Now, Rocky, wait, yeah, wait a minute. Rocky... No, it is. Easy, Sandy. Maybe I do. Yeah, it's Maxson, the insurance man who came to my office asking about the Mandara's cargo. He had a beard before that, Rocky. It's the captain himself. I see. Better answer him, Sandy. Talk fast. Ahoy, Captain! It's a mistake. I wasn't meaning to cross you. <laughs> you won't be crossing me, McQuill. Or John neither. Fuck me to hurt! Matson, turn him off! He's coming at us! He's going to ram us! Get off this tub, Sandy! Jump! Get it! Well, after that, there was a lot of splashing around. I saw the captain swing about to get a look at the results and maybe try for us again. And just then, we heard another sound. And the sun's rays cutting the fog pointed out a speedy Egyptian Coast Guard cutter bearing down. The captain changed his course, but he was way too late. Their warning shots were enough. The captain cut his motors, and it was all over. A few minutes later, the crew of the cutter pulled us out of the water. It seems Sam Sabaya had been way ahead of me again, and had tipped off the Coast Guard to watch for trouble. Well, there was nothing left for Captain Matson, whatever his real name was, except to make a full confession, including the murder of his crew. Not long after that, a government salvage boat brought up the bodies of Sen Wong Lee's brother and his wife. But so far as I know, McQuill's money is still floating around the Red Sea. Well, back at my tambourine in Cairo, I had no more than settled down in my office when I heard a tap on the door. Real gem. Come in. Mr. Jordan? Well, Ming Lee. Yes, Mr. Jordan. I come at the command of my father, Sen Wang Lee. Oh? My father sends me with a gift from his house for your kindness. This ancient wind bell. Oh, but this must be of great value to your family. I didn't ask for anything. We'll honor my father by accepting it. Why, of course. Give your father my regards. Also, Mr. Jordan, my father wishes you to know that he feels deep gratitude and devotion to you. Wait, Ming. Yes? How do you feel? I feel that my father is most wise. It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with story by Gomer Cole and Larry Roman. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The F.W. Fitch Company presents Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Laugh a while, let a song be your style. Use Fitch Shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair. Use Fitch Shampoo. The F.W. Fitch Company, makers of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo and Ideal Hair Tonic, presents Dick Powell as Private Investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. Rogue speaking. This Saturday night, I'm going spellbind you, Vogue. Caught me while spending a week and the fee from my last case in zestful living at a summer hotel, which was so swanky that the help hardly spoke to the guests. For $25 a day, I had one of the 50 bungalows on the hotel grounds. For 30, I could have had one with a window. Well, anyway, there was a girl up there. Isn't there always? She was named Janice Cole, a sort of a social secretary to the hotel. She was about 28. Her eyes were so big and blue they made you think of mountain lakes, and her hair was as black as a jealous rage. She had a figure that made you think you'd seen her before in a swimsuit. Oh, she was real quality. Much to my high blood pressure, she was engaged to a society playboy with a dollar for every suntan in Florida, and his name was Clint Hayes. There was dancing going on in the ballroom of the hotel, and Janice was dancing with Clint. But she was watching me. I thought I saw fear in her eyes. They finished their dance right in front of me. Well, I certainly enjoyed that exhibition, Clint. Glad you liked it, Rogue. Dancing with Janice is a wonderful way to spend an evening. I believe that. Well, how about the next one, Janice? Oh, uh, I, I can't, Richard. I, I don't feel very well. Oh, really, darling? <laughs> yes, I, I think I'll go to my cabin, Clint. I... I have a terrible headache. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, dear. Is there anything I can get for you? I've got some aspirin. Oh, no. I think I'll just lie down for a while. I'll be back as soon as I feel a little more like enjoying the party. After Janice Cole left, I ducked Clint and mingled with the crowd, fencing in and out of polite conversation and keeping up a gay front to cover the worry which was stampeding around in my mind. I couldn't forget the lost look in the eyes of Janice Cole. A look that was so full of fear and hopelessness that it haunted me. I decided, after sweating out 30 minutes of wondering why she was so frightened, to drop by her bungalow and have a fatherly chat with her. I casually worked my way along a chain of conversations to the open door and faded unobtrusively out into the night. There was a light in Janice's bungalow. I walked rapidly toward it. The door was ajar. When I knocked on it, it swung open. And I saw Janice lying there, a red pool expanding on the Navajo rug under her head. I took a few steps into the room. Oh! I was on the inside of a giant bell, clinging to the clapper with a strength of desperation. It swung through eternity like a giant pendulum. And at the end of every arc, the universe was shattered by the sound of the tolling. I couldn't stand the noise. I let go on the tremendous upsweep and was catapulted through space at a terrifying breathless speed. The ringing of the bell grew fainter and fainter. And then, there was quiet. I drifted peacefully for a while and landed as gently as a snowflake on a sparrow's wing. And I rested on cloud eight in the blackness of complete oblivion. (laughs) Hey, Chiefy! Chiefy! You better come out of it! Oh, go away, Yugor. No, I'm sorry, Rogi, but you've got to get back on the ball or you're going to find yourself behind it. Come on now, come on! Oh, Yugor, go away! I'm not well. I've been hurt. There are things going on that you ought to know about, Rogie. I don't care. I'm on my vacation. You're in trouble, Rogie. Bad trouble. Remember that dead girl? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Well, what are you going to do about it? Let him get away with it? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. Let me alone. Well, well, 
Well, I guess you've been hit on the head once too often, Rogie. Lost your nerve, huh? What do you mean, midget? No fight left in you. Hmm. It's too bad. I've got plenty of fight left in me. What's going on down there? Well, you better go down and see, Rogie. Come on. I'll help you over the side. Okay. Come on. Give me a push, you go. Oh, you're a fine alter ego, and I'm proud of you. I try to take care of you, Chiefy. Over you go, Rogie. Over you go. <laughs> I dreaded opening my eyes because I remembered that dead girl lying there. But I opened them at last. And what I didn't see made me think I'd lost my mind. Where the body had lain, staining the Navajo rug, there was a Navajo rug, but no stain and no body. I wobbled to my feet. My knees were made of soup. I grabbed the bed for support and threw my massive intellect into high... There were strange things happening here, and they were happening to me. I decided to stay mum and get back to the dance to see what I could discover from the behavior of the inmates. I took out my pocket comb, dressed my hair around the bump on my head so I wouldn't look like I had two, wiped the bed and the doorknob clean of my fingerprints, and looking much better than I felt, rejoined the party. Clint was talking with Nancy Bowman, another luscious lady on the hotel social staff. Hello, Rogue. We've been looking for you. Oh, hi, Clint. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Richard. Where have you been? We're getting a little fresh air. How about this dance, Nancy? Can't. I promised Clint. Oh, go ahead. I'll be noble. Janice should be coming back soon anyhow. No. All right, then. You're on, Mr. Rogue. Oh, for you, my dear, both of them. See you later, Clint. Bye. <laughs> You know, Nancy, that Clint's a lucky man getting a girl like Janice. She's what the boys in the back room call a dish. Ah, I suppose Janice isn't lucky getting a man with a million. <laughs> Not my type. Now, I don't have the million, but no, I'll... Well, then a... let's just dance. Oh. Now that Janice has her millionaire, I'm out to get mine. You girl's old friend? No, oh, I've worked up here with her summers for a couple of years. She's a grand girl. Everybody loves her. She's engaged to this, uh, this creep with the millions? Yes, they're going to be married in two weeks. Don't you ever read the newspapers? Oh, I guess it wasn't on the sport page. Probably not. Though the way Janice stopped him, it could have been. Kitty, 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 kitty. May I cut in? Hi, Frank. That's up to you, Richard. Well, I never give up beautiful ladies to strangers. You don't know Frank, the ladies' home companion? That can be taken care of. Introduce me, Nancy. Mr. Rogue, this is Frank Pitts, friend of Janice. Oh, glad to know you, Mr. Pitts. Thank you, Mr. Rogue. Where is Janice, anyway? She promised me some rumbas tonight. Well, uh, she wasn't uh, wasn't feeling very well. She went to her bungalow to get a little rest. You insist on cutting in? Unless you have some very fine arguments against it. Well, I, I guess I haven't. Nancy, I hope I'll see you later. Uh, you will. This is a temporary thing, Richard. <laughs> oh, what happened to your dance, Rob? A man cut in on me. Oh, uh, that's Frank Pitts. He doesn't belong here, Rogue. It's all shoulders and no money. Hmm? I understand that he and Janice are old friends. That's right. Frank Pitts has been in love with Janice for years. They're from the same town back east. No kidding. Oh, yeah. well, he was in love with her too, huh? Desperately. But I don't feel sorry for him. He's not good enough for a girl like Janice. No, no, Clint. A girl's entitled to old friends. <laughs> you seem to be the jealous type. No, I used to be a little like that about Betty Callahan. I'm not I... jealous, Rogue. You just hate to see a girl like Janice making a fool of herself over a no good like that Pitts. Ever since he arrived today, she's been moody and dejected. Oh, that's and... the way it is. Oh, that's the way it is, huh? You and Janice had a spat over the old flame. We and... did not. You're being most impolite, Mr. Rogue. Janice and I are happen to be Mr. in love. Rogue. Yes? There's a man outside who would like to talk with you for a minute. Why? It's most important, Mr. Rogue. Please come with me. Okay, excuse me, Clem. Well, you look a little upset. What's the matter? Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. May, may I ask what you're talking about? No, I, I can't tell you, Mr. Rogue. But in all my years in hotel management, this is the most terrible thing that's ever happened to me. Here he is, Mr. Mills. Mr. Mills is our district attorney, Mr. Rogue. Oh, oh well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Mills. What can I do for you? You're Richard Rogue, the private investigator from Los Angeles? That's right. Why? Well, I'd like to talk with you, Mr. Rogue, about a murder. 
Oh, yes, why, sure, sure, Mr. Mills. Always glad to lend my talents to law enforcement. That's nice of you, Mr. Rogue, because you can help a lot on this case. Why did you murder Janice Cole? <laughs> We'll return to our story in just a moment. First, dandruff on the shoulders and coat collar of a well-groomed person is as out of place as snow in July. That's why so many persons who want to have a smart, well-groomed appearance use Fitch's dandruff remover shampoo regularly. For Fitch shampoo has a special solvent action that dissolves unsightly dandruff. When you apply Fitch's to your hair and scalp before adding water, this solvent action goes to work. So it's important to remember not to wet your hair before the shampoo is applied. After massaging your scalp briskly for a few minutes, then apply water. An abundance of cleansing lather will form to carry away the dissolved dandruff. Then the lather rinses out easily and completely, leaves the hair immaculately clean without a trace of dandruff. Yes, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is a real aid to good grooming. Use it regularly. You can buy an economical bottle of Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo at your drug or toilet goods counter, or have a professional application at your beauty or barber shop. Now, back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. <laughs> My guilty conscience was calling me names and giving me bad advice as I stole out of the ballroom with the D.A. He had accused me of murder. I knew who was murdered. I'd seen her in her bungalow, dead. Janice Cole. The D.A. was as quiet as a grave during that walk and not a bit more cheerful. I made a couple of abortive attempts at conversation, but I might as well have been talking to a totem pole. I couldn't understand why he was heading for my bungalow until he opened the door. And I saw Janice lying there on that blood-stained Navajo rug, just as I'd seen her a half hour before in her own bungalow. I tried to say something, but the words couldn't get by the lump in my throat. I just stood there, my mouth hanging open, and my stomach frozen in a hangman's knot. I could feel the DA's eyes boring into the back of my head. Well, Rogue... Why'd you do it? Well, I didn't. I didn't kill her. How do you explain the fact that she was killed here in your cabin? She wasn't. Now, look, Rogue, you better organize yourself, huh? You're supposed to be a smart investigator. Give me a gun. I haven't got it on me. It's in that drawer there. Yeah, we found that one. This girl was shot to death with a twenty-five automatic. Any prints on it? <laughs> We're going to take yours for comparison. Am I under suspicion for this murder? At the moment, that's all you're under. I finally hope you'll be under arrest for it the next half hour. Oh. You know, Mills, in a homicide, you usually have to have a motive. Be- hey, what's that? Why are you waving those newspaper clippings in my face? What are they? Uh, the motive. You were blackmailing Miss Cole, Rogue. We found these clippings in your briefcase. What do you mean I was blackmailing her? I didn't even know her. Now, look, Rogue, you're smarter than that. Here's a whole envelope full of clippings covering Miss Cole's trial for the murder of her first husband back in Passaic, New Jersey. Her name was Jane Sherman then, and she was released for lack of evidence. Remember the trial? Of course I do. Poisoning. But what's that... So you found out that this Jane Sherman, now known as Janice Cole, was all set to marry a million dollars. And you've been blackmailing Oh, I don't know anything about it, I tell you. I don't know how those clippings got into my briefcase. It must have been planted there when I was knocked out in Janice's bungalow. It's a switch, Rogue. You were knocked out in her bungalow, eh? When? Uh, look, Mills, I, uh... I know this whole thing's going to sound fantastic, but I want to tell you the whole story. I came up here on my vacation. I never saw Janice Cole or whatever her name was before tonight. Disbelief walked across the DA's face as I unspun the web of circumstances which tied me into this murder. As I listened to my own story, I knew I wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't been there. I showed him the bump on my noggin. He just nodded. I talked on, and as I talked... I realized that I was acting like every murderer I'd ever questioned. I know my face was red, my eyes were shifting as I browbeat my brain into trying to think of some circumstance which would at least give me the benefit of a reasonable doubt. Finally, I, I stopped talking. He took my fingerprints and we went to Janice Cole's bungalow. There I got my first break. All right, Rogue. Now, where was the body lying when you first saw it? Right here, right here, come here. Look, look, look here, look under this rug. 
Uh-huh. And blood on the floor where it seeped through the rug that's now in my bungalow. Do you see it? Yeah. Blood, all right. Well, Rogue, that's the first thing that's made sense since we got together. I suppose there is an outside chance that somebody's trying to frame you. Enough of a chance so a conviction would be hard to get, Mr. D.A. Look, you know me. I've got a little standing in my profession, a little substance. Give me 24 hours to get this thing hung around the right man's neck. All right. If I don't have you locked up tonight, will you try and have the right man for me in the morning? I'll have him. Now, tell me, who knows about the murder? Well, the maid who went into your cottage to turn your bed down for the night. And the manager. Well, I've told them both to keep quiet until I give them the go-ahead to talk. Then none of the guests know about it yet, except the killer. That's right. As far as I know. Oh, okay, Mel. Okay, now. You keep it that way until morning, and I'll come up with a guilty man for you. Big talk. I had been framed with loving care, like a sweetheart's picture. The DA shoved off to take care of the grisly details of moving the body from its temporary resting place on my bungalow floor, and I started shaking Janice Cole's bungalow down. There were particles of curved glass on the floor near where the body had been lying. I picked them up carefully and fitted the larger pieces together. They could only have been the crystal of a small, square wristwatch. It might be the clue to the killer. I went back to the main hotel building. The Saturday night party was still going strong. I rejoined the merry throng and looked for Frank. He seemed to me to be the logical suspect. He was from Janice Cole's hometown. He would have known about her trial for murder. I found him talking with Nancy in a corner, and he had on a large, round wristwatch. Nancy's watch was a dainty <laughs> diamond and ruby affair, small and oblong. Hello, Rogue. Nancy's been beating the bushes looking for you. I have not. I just was mildly curious about where you disappeared to. I wanted to get rid of Frank and finish that dance with you. Well, this is as good a time as any. May I have the next one? You may have all the rest of them if you like. Well, what's the matter, Richard? You have a pensive look. Well, I was, uh, just trying to figure something out. Oh? I was supposed to have a dance with you at 9 o'clock. Where were you? I was here. I got here just at 9. Didn't I, Frank? Don't try to prove anything by me, baby. I don't know. At 9 o'clock, I was having a drink with Clint Hayes in my bungalow. Hmm. Well, <laughs> there goes your alibi, Nancy. You weren't here. Alibi? Why would I need an alibi? I was here. You weren't. I looked all over for you. Oh, now, let's not argue about it. Let's have the next one, huh? I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> no tricks now. <laughs> Hi, right, Clint. What? Oh, how come you're sitting this one out? Oh, I am. Uh... Hello, Rug. Well, I'm sorry I startled you. I was just in a deep fog. Hmm? Nancy come back yet? No. Nancy, uh, I just changed her name there, if you don't mind. Yeah. I'm kind of worried about her. Well, she's subject to headaches like this, poor kid. Maybe you'd better run over and have a talk with her, huh? Oh, I hate to bother her when she's feeling bad. Look, uh... Clint, just to settle a little argument, yeah. were you and Frank Pitts having a drink in his bungalow at 9 o'clock? Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, we were. How'd you know that? He just told me. Just a silly little argument. I wish Janice would hurry back in time for the last dance, at least. Clint Hayes had on a large, square wristwatch. And he and Frank had unbreakable alibis. Nancy had none. They were my three prime suspects, and it looked to me like Nancy was about to be elected. I was sitting there looking for Nancy and carrying on a pointless discussion on headaches, their cause and cure, with Clint, when Nancy came running over. <laughs> come on, Clint. You too, Richard. We're all going down to the pool for a moonlight dip. And I, I don't think I want to, Nancy. Oh, come on. Just because Janice is feeling rocky tonight, there's no reason for you to be grumpy. Come on, Richard. Get your swim trunks and give the girls a treat. Huh? All right, all right. I'm in. Come on, Clint. A little dip will do you guys. No, I, I don't oh, think Oh, come I... on, Clint. Oh, might as well, Clint. Sounds like a good idea, doesn't it? Well, Nancy, have we got it all organized? Yes. Richard and Clint are crazy about the idea, aren't you? Oh, okay. I'll join you for a while. Mm, nice man, Clint. Hurry up now. See you at the pool. <laughs> We'll continue our story in just a moment. First, a word to the ladies. Are you planning to have a new permanent to help you achieve that cool, crisp look this summer? If you are, here's a good point to remember. Shampooing with Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo will put your hair into grand condition for that cold wave or permanent. That's because Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo is such a thorough cleansing agent. It gets the hair immaculately clean and dandruff-free. 
Then, since it's completely soluble in water, it rinses out easily, leaving no dull, soapy film. Your hair is left radiant with no dirt, dandruff, or soapy film clinging to the hair strands to obstruct the work of the waving solution. Yes, permanent wave equipment manufacturers, such as the Realistic Permanent Wave Machine Company, E. Frederick Incorporated, and Duart Manufacturing Company all agree that really clean hair is the first requisite to a successful permanent wave. For a soft, natural-looking wave, prepare your hair first with Fitch, F-I-T-C-H, Fitch's Dandruff Remover Shampoo. Then use Fitch's regularly to keep your wave looking lovely. Now back to Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. My performance in the pool that night made Nero's fiddle solo in the light of a burning Rome seem like the height of propriety. Here was Richard, the fall guy rogue, swimming and laughing with Frank, Clint, and Nancy, a bunch of murder suspects. A matter of hours before the law put a pair of stylishly plain bracelets on me and claimed me for its own if I hadn't solved the murder of Janice Cole. But there was method in my madness. That swim gave me the information I wanted. In fact, it gave me the murderer. I left before the swimming party broke up and went to one of the guest bungalows. An open window made the job of getting in as easy as falling in love. I found what I was looking for in a chest of drawers. Then I sat down and waited for my victim to come in and turn on the lights. Rogue, what are you doing here? Waiting to talk with you about a murder, Clint. Shut the door. Come in and sit down, Clint. I want to know all about what happened to Janice. Janice? Something's happened to Janice? Yes, Janice, and don't act so innocent. What do you know about her murder? I didn't kill her. What makes you think I killed her? I didn't say you killed her. But I'm sure you know something about it. You know, you shouldn't get involved in murder, Clint. It's too complicated. You're just talking, Rogue. You killed her. You were blackmailing her and you killed her. Ah, no, 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 Clint. You weren't supposed to know anything about that. In fact, you couldn't have known anything about it unless you were the guy who framed me so nicely. I'm a little mad at you for that, you know. And I'm going to get a confession of that murder out of you some way or other. Now, do you feel like talking or do I have to beat it out of you? What makes you think I did it, Rogue? Take off, uh, take off your wristwatch. Now. Now. Look at your wrist. What? Right. You see that small square of white skin where you used to wear your small square wristwatch? That was the giveaway, Clint. You see this watch here, the one I found hidden under the shirts in that chest of drawers there? The crystal's broken, Clint. And it was broken in the struggle which, with Janice tonight just before you shot her. The broken glass was found on the floor of the cabin right where the body was before you moved it to mine. Now, do you feel any more like talking, Clint? Why did you kill her? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. Hmm? I got until morning for you to start talking. And I've got more socks in a ten-story laundry. Now, let me know when you want to start singing. You know what happened in that room, and you're going to tell me. I didn't kill her. I didn't, I swear. I didn't, Rogue. I was there. Sure, I was there, but well, I... you didn't kill her, who did? I can't tell you. Come on, Clint. You're not smart enough to work out that frame on me. Who was in this with you? <laughs> I wouldn't answer that if I were you, Clint. Drop the gun, Rogue. Oh. Uh, oh, hello, Frank. Well, you're mixed up in this, too, huh? Well, maybe we can arrange a double execution. I didn't tell him anything, Frank. I didn't tell him a thing. I know it. I was listening. Sit down, Rogue. Sure, sure. Glad to, glad to. You were the brains of this deal, weren't you, Frank? It's pretty obvious that that quivering mess over there wasn't, isn't it? It's a good thing I was keeping my eye on him tonight. You see, Rogue, when he opened the door and turned on the lights, I saw you sitting there, and that's why I came in the back way. I was afraid that Clint would talk too much. You think of everything, don't you? I try. What are we going to do now, Frank? This, this Rogue, he, he knows I was there when Janice was murdered. Knows you were there? Well, you might just as well know that you shot her then, huh? You did, you know. Well, it was an accident. Was it? I'll decide that. Aren't you forgetting me, fellas? Oh, no. No, we're not forgetting you, Mr. Rogue. It really doesn't make any difference who killed Janice as long as uh, you disappear with all the evidence pointing to the fact that you did the job. No, 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 Frank. I don't want any more killing. Well, shut up. I'm handling this affair. What? I'm going to keep you out of the gas chamber, Clint, if you'll just shut up and do as I tell you. Take Rogue's necktie off and tie his hands. We're going to knock him off and throw him over a canyon where he'll never be found. Well, you are? Well, I might as well take a crack at it. <laughs> Give me that gun. <laughs> Grab him, Clint. Grab him. <laughs> well, 
Hey, well, well, thanks, Clint. You were very handy with that chair. How come you hit him? I couldn't. I couldn't let him hit him. I just couldn't. Oh, well, all right, all right. Take his necktie off and tie his hands with it. We're going to take him for a ride down to see the district attorney. I killed her, Rogue. I killed Janice, but it was an accident. I swear it was an accident. Well, you'll have a dandy chance to explain that to a jury, Clint. Now, come here. I've, uh, I've got something for you. Oh. That's for helping to frame me. Oh, brother, is that DA going to love me? Well, that was the end of the case. Frank had been blackmailing Nancy, uh, Janice Cole ever since her engagement to wealthy playboy Clint Hayes was announced. And that night, when Frank went to Janice's cabin, Clint followed him. When Clint arrived on the scene, jealousy took over. Frank drew a gun, and Clint jumped him. In the struggle which followed, Janice was shot while the gun was in Clint's hand. Helpful Frank accused scared Clint of the murder and talked me and talked him into framing me. Frank saw lovely visions of many happy years of blackmailing a millionaire. That broken watch crystal was the only thing that kept the frame from working. So I get my brains beat out. I put the arm on a killer and blackmailer. My vacation is broken up like a drop light bulb. And I didn't make a dime. Oh, well. <laughs> Let's face it. If I hadn't been so clever, I'd be doing a life sentence instead of Clinton Frank. I would like that. No. I've heard... I've heard that stone walls do not a prison make, nor iron, iron bars a cage. But it's hard to illustrate the truth of that old saw to a guy who's behind the former looking through the latter. You know what I mean? This is Dick Mushmouth Powell again, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed our story tonight. Ray Buffum wrote it. Leith Stevens composed and conducted the music, and Dee Engelbach produced and directed. Be with us again next Sunday, will you? We have a story for you about a doctor, a dentist, and a miserly old lady who comes up dead. We call it, Where There's a Will, There's a Murder. Thanks for listening, and now here's James with a hair doyle. Listen again next week at this same time to hear Dick Powell as private investigator Richard Rogue in Rogue's Gallery. And by the way, Dick will soon be seen in his newest Columbia picture... Johnny O'Clock. Laugh a while, let a song be a style, you bitch. Shampoo. Don't despair, use your head, save your hair, you bitch. Shampoo. After and between Fitch shampoos, you can keep your hair shining and manageable by using a few drops of Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic every day. Fitch's Ideal Hair Tonic is not sticky or greasy, yet it gives your hair that well groomed look. The National Broadcasting Company presents The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective. Sam Spade, Detective Agency. Hi. Sam? Who else? Did you wind it up, Sam? Is it all over? If you're talking about the usual happy ending with the villains dead and buried and the lovers joining hands while the camera does a slow fade, it is not all over, sweetheart. What do you mean, Sam? The villains in this piece are for real, still doing business at the same old stand from one end of the country to the other. Oh, Sam, you sound so grim. Only because I have a grim tale to tell, little one. So warn all within earshot that if they seek bluebirds of happiness, sweetness and light, and love conquers all, to try another detective. Because even now, I am on my way with something that might butt into your sleep for the next few days. To wit, my report on the Denny Shane caper. <laughs> For NBC, William Spear, radio's outstanding producer, director of mystery and crime drama, brings you the greatest private detective of them all, starring Stephen Dunn in The Adventures of Sam Spade. <laughs> Effie! Sam? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Sam, I didn't hear you come in. Ooh. Oh, tired, Sam? Yeah, yeah. You look pale. I guess maybe I'm a little sick, too. Now, Sam, I warned you about heavy lunches when you're on a cage. Not that kind of sick, Angel. 
This kind starts at your shoe tops, runs up your backbone, and kicks around in your head till you're... Where's the book? Right here, Sam. Okay. Uh, the date, fill it in. Two? To John Q. Public. From Samuel Spade, license number 137596. Subject, the Denny Shane caper. Dear John Q. She was sprawled in the corner chair when I got back from lunch. A kid of 16 or so, complete with bobby socks, hair ribbons, and shoulder bag. The kind you see every afternoon in the drugstore near the high school, making jive talk over a soda. But she looked up as I walked in, and the eyes didn't look like jive talk at all. There was trouble in them. You're Mr. Spade? Yep. The detective? Well, according to some people. Fine. I need a detective. You're sure now? Mm Mm-hmm. Positive. What would you be doing with a detective? Your ad in the classified section said you find people. Well, sometimes. They're not too badly lost, that is. Who do you want to find? Did you ever hear of Denny Shane? You don't really want to find Denny Shane, do you? Why not? Well, most people want to lose him. Then you do know him. I'm glad. Here's $20. Now, wait a minute. Hold it, honey. Don't get anxious. What's the matter? Don't you want to be paid for this? Not if I don't do it. What do you mean? Let's talk about you. What's your name? Mary Johnson. Does it make any difference? Mm-hmm. Mary Johnson. Where do you live, Mary? Well, I've, I've never been in San Francisco before. I just got in yesterday. Staying with a friend out in the marina. My home's in Denver. Denver, Colorado. 2028 14th Street. Okay. Here you are. You want to sign the contract? Oh, all right. Where do I sign? On the line here. Oh. Uh, no, 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 no. The right name. Sally Joan Michaels. How did you know that? Next time you use an alias, leave the identification bracelet home. Oh. Don't tell people you're fresh out of Denver when your coat label says it's fresh out of Ruse Brothers, San Francisco. Now, let's try it again, huh? What about Denny Shane? Well, I... I want to find him, that's all. Well, that's a lot. Why? I'd rather not say. Well, in that case, Sally, I recommend another detective. You'll find there's an ad in the classified section just below mine. You mean you won't do it? Sally, if I may get pontifical for just a moment, Denny Shane is not the kind of character I would pick out for a kid like you. He has a reputation for booking horses, which is illegal, and welching his bets, which is worse. He is associated at one time or another with almost everyone in the files of the Kefauver Committee. And as for the girls he runs around Stop with... Stop it, will you? Oh. Oh, so that's it. No, that isn't it. I've never seen Denny Shane in my life. If we do find him, you'll have to point him out to me. Really? He's... He's been good to me. You see, all my life he's been good to me. Mm Mm-hmm. And you've never seen him? No. Denny Shane is my brother, Mr. Spade. My mother died when I was born. I was adopted. But Denny went to an orphanage, and I guess he sort of... Ran wild after he got out. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean he's been good to you? Sent me money on birthdays and Christmases, sometimes in between. He always said if I needed help to tell him, but I I never knew where to find him. We need help right now, Mr. Spade. My stepmother has to have an operation, and I know Denny will give me the money if I can find him. Why did you tell me all those black lies? I was afraid you'd call my folks. They'd be horrified if they found out... Oh, mm -hmm. this is the truth now, Girl Scout's honor. Yes, Mr. Spade. Okay, you run home and study your algebra, and I'll look up Shane and Court. No, no, I've got to talk to Denny myself. You're sure you want to come along? Oh, yes. Okay, but I'm going to have to leave you outside while I talk to his friends. Let's go. I hadn't seen Shane since three years ago when he conned a client of mine out of $3,000 on a phony mining stock deal. I knew it was waste motion, but I checked the hotel where he was living then and found he was long gone. Came next in the following order, one gambling joint in South City, one saloon in the Mission, and one very dubious apartment on Turk Street, run by a charming wench wearing wedgies, culottes, and peach brandy. She gave me a peachy smile. <laughs> oh, Denny Shane? <laughs> Don't step on your laughs. You've seen him lately? Funny you asking about Denny. I saw him yesterday. 
first time in two years coming out of Augie Dano's. Oh, who's Augie Dano? Runs the gym exercise studio, reducing setup on Sutter Street. You know, work a little, lose the middle. <laughs> Get it? Yeah, I got it. But uh, anyway, thanks. <laughs> So we took off for Augie Dano's. We'd been together two and a half hours so far and exchanged maybe two and a half sentences. she just sit quietly in her corner of the cab with her hands folded on her lap, looking straight ahead. Sally. Hey. hey. Oh. What's the matter, honey? Nothing. Oh, now, come on, come on. You can tell your Uncle Sammy something's eating you. Now, what is it? I told you. You're sure it has nothing to do with Denny and you? We settled that. I don't know, did we? You know, I, uh, I got an ache in my bad knee. Is that good? Nope. I only get it when things are going sour on me. Well, here's Augie Dano's. Come on, you can go in, too. This, uh, this place looks respectable for a change. The gold lettering on the door said, Augustine Dano, Masseur, Scientific Reducer. And inside was an expensive-looking reception room with birch paneling, potted palms, and antique leather chairs, into one of which I stored Sally while I made bold to enter a door at the rear marked private. Oh, Oh, now, there. Look what you made me do. I am sorry. Oh, dear me, you should be. Uh, My best perfume all over there. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to slam the door, lady. The draft. This is a private office, sir. There is a button outside, clearly marked, ring and wait. That I did not see, and once again, I am so sorry about spilling the perfume. Oh, my. Who's yours, my regret, TV? Hmm? $12 an ounce. Well, I regret TV, too. Now, look, how about announcing me to the professor? Well, now, if you mean Mr. Dano, he's quite busy with now, another... Mr. Rudnick, if the envelopes are ready, uh... Oh, who's this? You've got me. My name's Spade. Spade? Spade. The detective? Yeah, Detective? I... Well, what... what, uh, what just what... a minute, Miss Rudnick. Would you have your nerve barging in like that? I thought you were a client. I... All right, Miss Rodnick. All right, here. Well, Four bits. Now, buy yourself another quart. Well, I never. This I can believe. Well, what do you want, Spade? Well, I'm looking for Denny Shane. Someone uh, saw him walk out of here yesterday. Shane? That's right. Well, what's the matter? Some trouble or something? No, no. His kid sister's trying to look him up. Oh. <laughs> That's funny. What? Well, that someone saw him coming out of here. I'd never heard of the guy. Of course, we got people in here all the time. You know, salesmen, agents, friends of clients, you know. But no shame. Not that I know of. What's he look like? Oh, about my height, blue eyes, pale complexion. Too thin to be coming here as a customer. (laughs) Well, I wish I could help you, pal. But like I say, so many people come in and out of here, you know. Sure, sure. Thanks anyway. Bye. Bye. Any luck? No, I never heard of them. Come on. Too bad. Where to now? Oh, there are a couple of more places. After you. Cab's gone. When I told him not to wait, I thought we might have something to eat across the street. I'm not hungry, thanks. Look, you better call your parents. No. No, don't. I, I, I told him I was spending the night with a girlfriend so they wouldn't worry. That's another big black lie. Look, I'm tired of playing this way. I want it all. I told you. You're eating your heart out over something, and it's not Mama's operation. It's something bigger, and it hurts worse. And don't tell me any different because it's written all over your face. Please. Please don't ask me any more, please. Ah, skip it. Where's the cab? Don't take me home. That's just where you're going, honey. I'm... Well. What's the matter? Look, coming up the street. Is, Is that... Yeah, Denny Shane. You sure? Of course I'm sure. I've got to be positive. I'll prove it to you. Denny? Huh? See? Yes. Denny, come here a minute. Oh, Sam Spade, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you recognize the kid? No. He's your little sister. Sister? What are you talking about? I haven't... (laughs) 
all happened in less than a second. So hard, so fast, so horrible, it froze me in my tracks. The shoulder bag flew open, there was an automatic in her hand, and then Denny Shane was dead on the pavement, and she was turning toward me, her face a sick gray color, handing me the gun, handle first. There, there, it's done now. You can take me to the police. You are listening to the weekly adventure of radio's most famous detective, Sam Spade. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Whether it's comedy, music, or drama you're after, you'll find it on The Big Show this Sunday. The dynamic Tallulah is your hostess, and her guests include Fred Allen, Jimmy Durante, Vivian Blaine, Jane Morgan, and Rudy Valley. You're invited every Sunday to The Big Show. And this Sunday also brings you a one-hour adaptation of F. Scott Fitzgerald's exciting novel, This Side of Paradise, presented by Theatre Guild on the Air and starring Richard Widmark and Nina Foch. <laughs> Now back to the Denny Shane caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. I won't try to give you the play-by-play for the hour following the shots on Sutter Street because I was in no shape to remember things in sequence. In less than a minute, we were in the center of a milling crowd. Cars jammed up. Horns began to blow. Then the morgue wagon and a squad of homicide dicks and flash bulbs going off like firecrackers. And Sally, standing them all off with a frozen gray expression on her face that never changed. While I stood at her elbow, me, Sam Spade, who'd seen Lord knows how many murders with rubber in my knees and a feeling in my stomach like I was going to be sick. Finally, the squad car picked us up and headed for Dundee's office. Mr. Spade? Yeah? I've been waiting for you to ask me why I did it. I thought I'd leave that for the professionals. It won't do any good to ask me, Mr. Spade. Please tell him that, will you? It'll save all of us a lot of trouble. Everything I told you was a lie. I had to make a take to me to him some way because I didn't know what he looked like. I hope you know what kind of a stew you've jumped into, Sally, because from here on it's going to be pretty tough. I don't care what they do to me. I've had nothing to live for for a long time now. What do you mean? Sounds stupid, doesn't it? Sixteen years old and nothing to live for. Ah, oh, Sally. Tell him not to ask me any questions. Tell him I'm guilty. Sentence me to do whatever they do. I'll, I'll never tell him why. I'll never tell him why. <laughs> Give me a cigarette, Sam. Yeah. Why did I have to grow up to be a homicide, Dick? No dice, Lieutenant? No dice. It's her old man's gun. Hooked it out of his drawer this morning before she left for school. I still think she's mixed up with Shane somewhere. Dundee, believe me, that's one thing I can guarantee. She didn't know Shane from Hopalo and Cassidy. Well, I'm only falling back on the standard answer to this kind of a clam bake, Sam. This is not a standard clam bake. Uh, you're telling me. You know, Sam, it kind of scares you. What the Sam Hill's happening to our kids? A 16-year-old girl still in high school walking up to someone on the street. Shut up, Dundee. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's got me, too. <laughs> She's resting on the couch in there. Stick around till I get back. I gotta go down and wait for her boat. Oh, excuse me. I saw the lieutenant go out and I... Yeah, come on in. Sit down. I, I'm a friend of Sally's. Do you think I could talk to her for a minute? Well, I don't think she feels like talking. Look, I, I, I got to, mister. I, I, I gotta talk to her. What's your name? Eddie Tucker. I go to school with Sally. I've been waiting for three hours outside for a chance to talk to her. Can I, please? What's it about? It's kind of personal. 
Okay, through the door there. Oh, thanks. And uh, leave it open. Oh, yes, sir. The minute he went in, I slid along the wall into a corner between the door jam and a file case. And through the doorway, I could see them both in a mirror on the far wall of the inner office. Sally. What are you doing here? I, I had to see you, Sally. I heard about it, and I, and I had to see you, that's all. You're wasting your time, Eddie. It's all over, and you know it. You shouldn't have done it, Sally. You, you know what I promised you. I know what you promised me all the other times, too. This was for keeps, honest. So are the other times. All right, look. Look at this, see? Out the window. Watch. Now. Now do you believe me? Eddie, it's not your fault anymore. I don't blame you, honest. All those promises... I'll keep this one, Sally. Honest, I will. No. You're a zombie, Eddie. You know what a zombie is? Someone who moves and walks around, but who's dead inside. Go away. Now. <laughs> Go away. He got up slowly and walked past me out the door. Rosy cheeked, 17, with a tired old man look in his eyes. A few minutes later, the matron came by and I left her with Sally. The window in Dundee's office opened onto a second floor roof below and directly beneath it, I picked up what Eddie had tossed out. A set of car keys and a leather case, plus a third one that looked like it belonged to a school locker with a number 339 on it. And written in ink on the leather inside like a memo was Denny Shane, 778 Turk Street, apartment 4. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how are all the jackers? You gonna wait for an invitation? You done me wrong this morning, honey. About Denny? Yeah. Said you hadn't seen him in two years. Ah, I told you about Augie Dano, didn't I? Anyone told you about Denny, Shane? Ah, no great loss. Pox for biscuits. Oh, <clears throat> would you like a drink? Uh, thank you, No. Now, what about... I had it coming to him sooner or later. Never made an honest buck in his life. How did he have it coming to him? Like he got it, like they all get it. What was his racket? Numbers. You know how it works? You buy a number Yeah, and... yeah, yeah. How do you know all this? Curiosity. Intellectual curiosity. I want to know things. All the time I want to know things. Follow? So one day, when Denny leaves his suit to be cleaned and I find a book in his pocket, I ask the questions. What and... book? His numbers book, stupid. What's that? Oh, you know, with the names and numbers of all his customers. You uh, wouldn't know where it is, would you? Oh, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, <clears throat> um... Oh, yes, yes. How does five bucks look? Bourbon is awful high. Yeah, you probably drink it straight. Ten. Better. Come on. I think it's, uh, I think it's in his top drawer. Uh, let me see now. Um, ties a little, uh, oh, <laughs> there you are. That little black book. See? All the names, all the numbers. All the names, all the numbers, and one other feature. It was divided into sections, labeled Galileo, Balboa, Lowell, George Washington, and a couple of more fellows who passed on long before the numbers racket was invented. Under each was a list of names. Eddie Tucker's was on the page headed Thomas Jefferson, and after it was number 339-7th Street. At this point, several bells rang. The odd key in Eddie's case didn't belong to a locker. It went with a box in the main post office on 7th Street. Hey, now look, fella. It's 11 o'clock yeah, at night. Yeah, my name's Spade uh, Clerk. Look. See? The license. I don't care about the license. The rules and regulations of the United States Postal Service... I know. Through uh, rain and sleet and snow and hail. But there's been a murder, you see. Murder? Yeah. Oh, well, in that case, I... I suppose we great, can... Great, great. Where's the mail for the boxes? Uh, uh, on the table over there. But it isn't distributed... If you'll wait a shake... I'll wait a shake. 
It took more than a shake, but we got to it just before midnight. A scented envelope it was, addressed simply to Eddie Tucker, Box 339. And in it was the answer to everything. The tired old man eyes on the kid Eddie, the zombie. And Sally, who figured her life was over at 16 because Eddie was through. But who had sent it to him was something else again. Just a plain white envelope, the kind you get for a nickel a pack in the dime store. I looked at it a little closer, wondering what manner of stationer would deem it fitting to sprinkle perfume on the kind of envelope most people made their bills in. And finally, a possible explanation took shape in my mind. You don't have to hit spade on the head with a baseball bat. Any large-sized mallet will do. Not just a minute, Spade. I deserve an explanation. You'll get it. You'll get it, Augie. I'm in bed asleep. What do you get off buzzing my bell this time of night? Patience, patience. But look, You're alone? Yeah. Good, good. Well, what are you taking your coat off for? Just relax, Augie. There's the coat. Tie. And now the shoulder holster. Shoulder holster? Here we are. Uh, wait a minute now. Well, what, what is all this? Well, you know the old saw, Augie. Work a little, lose the middle. What I need is exercise. Great. All right, you come around to the studio sometime. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Are you crazy? Yeah, get up. I want to try it with a right hand. Look, Spade. They I... got ground rules over at headquarters now, Augie. No white lights, no rubber hoses, but they don't apply to private dicks. Get up! Listen, if you're looking for trouble, I... <laughs> the right's even better. Okay, up you go now. Come on. Up against the wall. Now. Let go of me, Spade. Let's talk, huh? Talk? Yeah, about Denny Shane. About the kids he smeared with his filthy hands. High school kids from Balboa High and Lowell and George Washington. Good kids. Straight kids. I don't know nothing about... <laughs> Your outside man, wasn't it? Your roper. Turning up in drugstores and jive joints with those dirty little packets of heroin he passed out as headache powders. No. I don't know nothing. So he got him hooked hard, huh? Hey, uh, there was no more, and then they got a mailbox number and a key. Then they raised money any way they could. I got nothing to do with it. My studio. Yeah, your it's... studio's a front. Does a dame down there know what's in those envelopes she mails every day, or does she think they're statements? Come on, talk, Donald. Talk! 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 he did, a full hour's worth in Dundee's office, and a harrowing tale it was. I felt like printing up a million copies and mailing it out to every father and mother in the country. They'd taken him downstairs when I happened to glance out of Dundee's window, and down on the second floor roof, a point of light was moving back and forth slowly from one end to the other. Eddie. Where are they? Where are those keys? I've got to have them. Here. I... Oh, thanks. Uh, my car. I, I couldn't get home in my car, you see. You don't need to kid key. me, Eddie. I know all about it. Oh. I... I can't do anything about myself, Mr. Spade. I'm helpless. I... What she said. Zombie. You're not helpless. You can't handle it alone, maybe, but you're not helpless. Other guys have licked it, and you can, too, if you want it bad enough. I... I want you... I just... Good, that's all you need. We'll take care of the rest. Let's go, huh? Like I said, this one doesn't have bluebirds at the end. Not yet, anyway. The bold fact is that Sally Joan Michaels is facing the juvenile version of a murder rap. However, the best criminal lawyer in town has volunteered to defend her, and the state will be represented by the most half-hearted prosecution that ever set foot in the courtroom. Eddie Tucker is entering a sanitarium tomorrow, making him luckier than some of the other kids in that little black book. What about yours, John Q? Hmm? Period. End of report. Well... I don't know what to say, Sam. I feel so awful. I guess I'd better not make any comments at all. Me too, sweetheart. 
Let us lose ourselves in our work. Me and this cheap novel you were reading, and you and the merry chatter of that 1906 model, Oliver. Scoot. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This Sunday, there's fun for you with two delightful families, the Blandings and the Harrises. Mr. and Mrs. Blanding stars Cary Grant and Betsy Drake as the troubled but proud owners of the famous Dream House. And the Phil Harris Alice Faye Show brings you Phil and Alice, plus brother William, darling child Julius, and the ever-present Frankie Remley. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, not really, Sam. There's nothing amazing. Uh, 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 uh. Don't sell yourself short now. Well, I'm just a plain garden variety secretary, Sam. Look at that. Immaculate. Not a mistake. Oh, Sam. And in 26 seconds flat, in just the time it took that man to read a short announcement, you type out five copies of a 28-page report. In my book, that is amazing. All right, I admit it, Sam. I'm amazing. Good, good. And another thing. What's that? I'm hungry. Oh. And tonight is sauerbraten night at Schroeder's, and, and Max Nishi's letting girls in now. Uh, Cherub, as you may have gathered, I didn't collect a fee off this one. Oh, but Sam, I still have ten dollars you gave me last week to, to cover my back salary from six weeks before that, so we... Schroeder's it is, oh. yes. Let me go home and put on my other shirt. And I'll get my sauerbraten hat. <laughs> Good night, Sam. Good night, sweetheart. She is amazing. The Adventures of Sam Spade are produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Sam Spade is played by Stephen Dunn. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. Also in the cast were Kathy Lewis, Paul Fries, Kathleen Freeman, Lou Merrill, Bill Tracy, and Jerry Hausner. Script for tonight's adventure by Harold Swanton. Musical scoring by Lud Gluskin, conducted by Robert Armbruster. Join us again next week, same time, for another adventure with Sam Spade. You can help in the fight to conquer cancer. Strike back at cancer by joining the 1951 Cancer Crusade of the American Cancer Society. Help science help you. Give generously to your local unit by mailing your contribution to Cancer, care of your local post office. Cancer is a major problem and the fight against it deserves major support. Laugh with the Magnificent Montague and Duffy's Tavern each Friday on NBC. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Well, once again, it's time to keep that weekly date with our old friend and genial host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. As you can see, I'm quite ready for you. A crackling fire in the grate, some port in the decanter over there, and although I smoke a pipe myself, I think you'll find those cigars rather special. All the fixings for a session of storytelling, eh, Dr. Watson? Well, which particular Sherlock Holmes adventure have you selected for tonight? The story that I call The Strange Case of the Persecuted Millionaire. Hmm, sounds promising. In some respects, my boy, I think it was one of the one of the oddest adventures that we ever had. It was a case in which Sherlock Holmes narrowly prevented a shocking tragedy, and yet, at the conclusion of the affair, he appeared in a most unusual role. The role of a rather lean and elderly Cupid. This I've got to hear. But before you begin, Dr. Watson, do you mind if I, uh... Have a word with our listeners? Of course not, Mr. Bell, of course not. Men, neat-looking, well-groomed hair does so much to give a man that air of success, to say nothing of adding to his good looks. And I'm sure you'll be interested in hearing more about this modern trend in hair grooming, which has become such a nationwide favorite. It's called Cremel Hair Tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic contains a combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. 
Yes, that's exactly why Kremel gives a man's hair such a natural, well-groomed look and keeps it in place longer. Keeps every lock in perfect order from morning till night. Yet Kremel never gives hair that cheap, greasy, patent leather look. Kremel keeps hair looking mighty handsome with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet it always feels and looks so clean on your hair and scalp. Men, if you aren't already using a hair tonic, try Kremel. If you're using some other hair dressing, change to Kremel. Just see if your hair doesn't look much better than it ever did before. Better groomed, better looking. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I want to hear about the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. Well, Mr. Bell, that adventure began in Baker Street on a gray November day at the turn of the century. Sherlock Holmes and I had just finished our lunch, I remember, and were sitting each side of a blazing fire just like you and I are tonight. The great man, his feet thrust out before him, was lying back in his chair, his long, thin hands locked behind his head and a curved pipe jutting out the corner of his mouth was emitting great clouds of grey-blue smoke. After a few moments, I noticed that he was gazing at my boots with very marked attention. But why Turkish, Watson? The boots are English. I got them at Latimer's in Oxford Street. And not the boots, the bath. Why the relaxing and expensive Turkish bath rather than the invigorating homemade article? Well, because for the last few days I've been having some nasty twinges of rheumatism. By the way, I'm sure the connection between my boots and a Turkish bath is perfectly obvious to you, Holmes, but uh, I'm completely mystified. You're in the habit of doing up your boots in a certain way. I observe that on this occasion they're tied in a double bow. You have, therefore, had them off. Who has retied them? A bootmaker or the boy at the Turkish bath? But your boots are nearly new. Then what remains? The bath. Absurdly simple, isn't it? <laughs> when you explain it... Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? It's a note for you, Mr. Holmes. A messenger boy just brought it. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Who's it from, Holmes? I swear that only reigning royalty can be as presumptuous as an American businessman. Read it for yourself. I shall be at your lodgings at two tomorrow. Be there. And it's signed John V. Harden. Be there. Huh. Sounds an extremely arrogant fellow. What makes you think that he's an American? The use of the initial for the middle name is peculiar to that country. Oh. I do. It's, it's nearly two o'clock now, Holmes. Yes. Let's see what we can find out about the gentleman. Where's that Cyclopedia of American Biography? Ah, here it is. H.H.A. Hanley, Hanson, Harden. Here's our man, Watson. John Vincent Harden. What does it say about him? Born in Chicago, 45 years old, unmarried. Chiefly noted for his tremendous tobacco interests and his addiction to fishing. It's an odd combination. And this is odder. He made his professional debut as a violinist 30 years ago. A millionaire musician. Ah, that must be him now. Yes, there's a most impressive broom and pair outside. Then, since my client is a violinist, I think I'll welcome him appropriately. Hand me my instrument, will you, old chap? Uh, here you are, Holmes. Funny way to start a business interview, I must say. Uh, uh, Mr. Harden sounds like an aggressive man. And uh, music hath charms to soothe. Mr. Harden to see you, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Come in, Mr. Harden. I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, sir? How do you do? If we're to do business, Mr. Holmes, for heaven's sake, put that violin away. I heard you scraping away as I came up the stairs. <laughs> so you... you don't care for my friend's playing, sir? <laughs> I don't care for anyone's playing. I loathe the fiddle. Curious. I was under the impression... Listen, that... Mr. Holmes, I haven't come here to discuss your musical impressions. I've come here to talk about my personal safety and my sanity. Then pray talk about it, Mr. Harden. I'm being persecuted. Somebody's trying to drive me crazy. Oh, really? Just what form does this persecution take, Mr. Harden? Yeah, it began about a month ago. My horse ran away in Rotten Row and threw me. Maybe it was an accident, maybe not. I've heard of burrs under saddles. And then, last night... Something else happened? Someone destroyed Methuselah. Methuselah? An old retainer of yours, Mr. Harden? Or a pet? 
No. Methuselah was the finest, largest, oldest tarpon ever caught. Uh, Stop, fish. You are Sherlock Holmes? Quiet, Watson. I'm sure that a great deal more lies behind this. Please continue, Mr. Harden. Everything was going fine, Mr. Holmes, until these persecutions started. Early this year, I bought a fine old house in Cavendish Place. I'm engaged to be married to Alicia Edwards, uh, the Honorable Alicia Edwards. She's Lord Brentwood's daughter. My life was perfect until I began to get these notes. What sort of notes, Mr. Harden? Uh, they kept turning up in odd places. My coat pockets, under my pillows at night. I found them on the upholstery of my carriage. You brought these notes with you? Of course. Hmm. All in the same handwriting... And all the messages seem to have the same theme. Oh, what do they say, Holmes? The first one says, You thought he had no one to avenge him, didn't you? And this one says, You murdered him, you will pay for it. And this is curious. It will have blood. They say blood will have blood. That quotation is from Macbeth. Oh, then that means the note was written by an Englishman. Not necessarily, Watson. It's possible that they've heard of Shakespeare in America, you know. Oh, I suppose it might have. Mr. Harden, all these messages threaten your death. Can you think of anyone who might wish to kill you? No, I can't. I've never heard anyone, much less killed a person. The notes don't make any sense. Do you recognize the handwriting? I've never seen it before in my life. You mentioned that your prized tarpon was mutilated. What members of your household might have had the opportunity of performing that uh, act of vandalism? Mm, three people. My secretary, Margaret Bates, Stephen, my brother, and my fiancé. They were all at the house last night. There seems to be a clear pattern to this case, Mr. Harden. I suggest that you return to your home and obtain for me samples of the handwriting of the three people you've mentioned. When I've examined those, I shall be in a better position to advise you in this matter. <laughs> Holmes, you've spent three hours with a magnifying glass and those samples of handwriting that Mr. Harden brought back. Have you found a clue? Nothing positive, Watson. It's quite curious. The handwriting of the threatening note seems to be that of a male with an American education. Oh, why do you say that? Observe this note. Who dies unavenged can never sleep with honor. You'll notice that honor is spelt without a U. That's the American way. Then that means that his fiancée didn't write him. She might have deliberately spelt it that way to remove suspicion from herself. No, I'm afraid these samples prove nothing. Then we're no nearer finding out who's responsible. Well, at least we've ruled out an obvious possibility. Come in. Yes, Mr. Hudson. It's a telegram, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Yes, sir. Better get your coat and hat, Watson. It's from Mr. Harden? Yes. He says, a worse blow has fallen. Come at once. I'm Margaret Bates, Mr. Harden's secretary. How do you do? How do, you do? What happened, Miss Bates? We left as soon as we received his wire. I don't know what happened, Mr. Holmes, but I'm terribly worried... He rushed out here, dictated that telegram, and then went back and locked himself in the study. He says he'll see no one but you. Hello, Margaret. Oh, Stephen, you startled me. What's the matter? Do you think I was listening at the keyhole? Oh. Introduce me to our visitors, won't you? This is Stephen, Mr. Harden's brother, Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? Hello. Sherlock Holmes and his friend, huh? I've heard about you. Don't tell me Brother John has fallen foul of the law. No, sir. He needs its protection, I fear. <laughs> Don't be too sure. I'm thinking of taking him to court myself on a charge of woman stealing. Your brother a kidnapper? Great Scott. No, no, Dr. Watson. It's perfectly legal. It's just that I saw Alicia Edwards first, but then, of course... I don't control the hardened millions. Let's go to the study, shall we, Mr. Holmes? An excellent idea. Perhaps we'll see you later, sir. Perhaps. And don't take John too seriously. Oh, he's hateful. Always making fun of John, uh, his brother. And yet Stephen's never done a day's work in his life. This is the door to the study. Who is it? Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson are here. Of course, sir. Come in. Thank you, Margaret. I'll see you gentlemen later. 
What form did the new attack take, Mr. Harden? This time it's theft. My safe was rifled last night. What was stolen, sir? An extremely valuable document. It was the key to my agreement with the British Tobacco Trust. The loss of the paper represents a million dollars to me. But that isn't what upsets me most. Money I can afford to lose, but my sanity is more valuable. In the safe, I found another note, Holmes. May I see it, please? Here. Hmm. The coffin is made, the funeral parlor is ready, the time is ripe. The croaking raven doth bellow for revenge. Good Lord, what a frightening message. And once again observe the odd combination of Shakespeare and American idiom. Funeral parlor is what we refer to as an undertaker's. And the croaking raven comes from Hamlet. Holmes, I'm not a weak man, but I'm frightened. You've got to protect me. I shall do my best, Mr. Harden. Who was here last night? My secretary, Margaret Bates, my fiance. She went back to London this morning. I uh, met your brother, Stephen, just now. I noticed that he was carrying a valise. Was he leaving the house or returning to it? Returning. He went out of town last night. Oh, then that rules him out. Not until we investigate his alibi, Watson. Mr. Harden, I'm a constant and thorough reader of the Times. The engagement of a peer's daughter to a prominent American would be striking news. And uh, yet I've read nothing about it. We're announcing it formally tomorrow. I'm giving a party at Claridge's to celebrate the event. Then I think it would be a wise precaution if Dr. Watson and I attended that party. I was about to suggest the same thing, Holmes. I need to have men about me I can trust. I think this is a deliberate plot to drive me mad. <laughs> Holmes, Dr. Watson, I want you to meet my fiancée, Miss Alicia Edwards. Alicia, my dear. Yes, John. I want to introduce Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you How do? do? May I congratulate you on your engagement? Yes, indeed. A union between the old world and the new is an encouraging sign of the times. I wish you could convince Papa of that, Mr. Holmes. Whenever he meets John, he always behaves as if he expected him to be wearing feathers and carrying a scalping knife. <laughs> feathers and a knife. That's very funny. <laughs> I don't find it so. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Excuse me. I want to talk to the officer. Dear me, now I've upset John again. He's ridiculously sensitive. Americans are really rather touchy. And yet you're going to marry one? Papa's estates have eaten up a lot of money. And that's a commodity with which John seems well endowed. I think you understand me, Mr. Holmes. I'm sure I do. Personally, I may say that I'm always glad to meet an American. I'm one of those who believes that the folly of a monarch and the blundering of a minister in far gone years should not now stand between two nations... Mr. Holmes, I find you pompous and dull. Goodbye. Oh, my soul, what an unpleasant, heartless young woman. She's obviously marrying Harden for his money. Obviously. Though I don't think she has an aversion to uh, all Americans. Oh? Why do you say that? She has been dancing with Mr. Harden's brother, Stephen, most of the evening. At this moment, he joined her at the door, and uh, they're leaving together. Wait, Scott, you think that the... Uh, I don't understand for this. Hello. It's a What's happening up there on the orchestra? John Harden, he's arguing with one of the violinists. A musician. I won't take any more of it. Look, look. He snatched the instrument out of his hand. Ah, oh, get out of here. You're not fit to fiddle at an Irish wake. I'll play you. The rest of you, go on, play. Holmes, he's behaving like a madman. He's rushing out to the musician and brandishing the violin as if he's, as if he's going to brain him with it. Yes, Watson. But that quarrel with the violinist was not a totally sane act. If the anonymous correspondent's motive is to undermine Harden's reason, he may be succeeding. But who has a motive? It might be the brother, Stephen. He's obviously jealous of the girl. And he probably is next in line for the Harden million. But I checked his alibi for last night. He was out of town. Stop the music! Stop playing! What the devil's wrong now? Holmes. Holmes, where are you? Here I am, Mr. Harden. Well, come with me at once. What's wrong, sir? It's Alicia. I found her in the corridor. She's been strangled. In just a moment, we'll find out what happens next in the strange case of the persecuted millionaire. 
Hair specialists constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget that if you want your hair handsome and healthy looking, one of the first requirements is a hygienic scalp. So why settle for just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra advantages of this highly specialized Kremel hair tonic? Kremel contains a unique combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair preparation. It keeps hair attractively groomed at all times, looking so neat and orderly. But Kremel does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. A Kremel massage stimulates circulation right in the surface of your scalp and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated, as fresh as a daisy. At the same time, Kremel removes dandruff flakes. It's excellent to lubricate a dry scalp. And if your hair is so dry that it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kremel actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable. So men, take better care of the hair you've got. Buy a bottle of Kremel at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kremel daily for better groomed hair, for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kremel Hair Tonic. <laughs> Well, Dr. Watson, so the Honorable Alicia Edwards had been strangled at her engagement party. What happened next? Well, I applied first aid, Mr. Bell, and found that the girl was not dead. We rushed her to the hospital, and a few hours later, we were able to talk to her, and, uh, but we found that she could give us no clue. <clears throat> when we left the room, Harden was waiting for us in the corridor. How is she? Is she going to be all right? Oh, don't worry, Mr. Harden. She'll be all right, but she's... She had a very narrow escape. But why attack her? Why not me? The pattern becomes increasingly clear, Mr. Harden. Your enemy has struck uh, at your fishing, your business, and now at your fiancé. So every blow is at your wealth and position. And my sanity. Mr. Holmes, you've got to find out who's behind all this. On the occasion of the mutilation of the fish, three people have the opportunity. Your brother Stephen is clear on the second attack, and on this last one, I think we may reasonably assume that your fiancée did not strangle herself. Yes, I'll wager my medical reputation on that fact. And that means that only one person who was present on all three occasions was... No, you, you can't mean... Your secretary, Miss Bates? Where is she? In the waiting room. Splendid. Then Dr. Watson and I will take her back to Baker Street. I have an idea that she can be of invaluable help to us. <laughs> A little more tea, Miss Bates? No, thank you, Dr. Watson. Then please go on with your story. As I was saying, Mr. Holmes, I've known John, Mr. Harden, all my life. My father was the Harden coachman. And as I grew up, I thought John Vincent Harden was the most wonderful man in the world. Well, I imagine that he was quite different then, my dear. Very different. He was young and romantic, and he loved music. He took violin lessons, and it turned out that he was a prodigy. I understand that he made his professional debut at the age of 13. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I was only a little girl then. But he used to tell me that he wasn't John Vincent Harden, the heir to the tobacco millions. He was Giovanni Vincenti, the great violinist. Giovanni Vincenti? Odd. Uh, pray continue, Miss Bates. For five years, it seemed that he would be a great musician. Then... On his 18th birthday, his father gave him a lecture on his family obligations, told him that it was his duty to go into the business. John broke his violin across his knee, Mr. Holmes, and he's never played since. Miss Bates, I don't need to be a detective to deduce that you, uh, that you love him. Of course I do. Or at least I love Giovanni Vincenti. And maybe he's still there. Somehow. Somewhere. Of course. I've been an idiot. A numbskull. What do you mean, Holmes? The case is solved. Come, Miss Bates. We must return to Mr. Harden as fast as we can. I only hope we're not too late. But why doesn't he answer? The servant said he locked himself in the study again. The yeah, door's locked. I don't like the look of this. Oh. Come on, Watson. We'll break it in. Once more. Oh, look! He's lying crumpled over his desk. There's a revolver beside him, Holmes. Oh. Miss Bates, please leave us. My friend's a doctor. He'll take care of him. He's only wounded. Yes, it's 
just grazed his scalp. Oh, thank heavens. I'll be waiting outside. Uh, obviously, this was attempted suicide. They finally succeeded in driving him mad. Did they? Read this note lying here. It's in the same handwriting as the other messages. I might try to fool another detective, but not you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I admit I shot John Vincent Harden. I'm sure you'll have no difficulty discovering how I escaped from a locked room. Good Lord. You'll observe that the note was written and blotted on this desk. Watson, I'll see to getting Mr. Harden to bed and summoning his own doctor. I want you to return to Baker Street. To Baker Street? Why? Though the case is solved, I have some heavy thinking to do. And I must do it here. So be a good fellow and go back to our lodgings and get me two ounces of shag tobacco. And uh, my violin. <laughs> How are you feeling now, Mr. Harden? Weak, Holmes. But I'm all right. You still can't remember anything, sir? No. I, I felt half out of my mind since that attack was made on Alicia. They told me she'd be all right. I, I do faintly remember coming home from the hospital and locking myself in the study. Oh, the rest is a blank. What did happen, Mr. Holmes? I'll give you the complete answer very shortly, Mr. Harden. Come on, Watson. Very well. Try and rest, Mr. Harden. You've been through quite an ordeal. I'll try, Doctor. I'll try. Holmes, you left your violin in Harden's room. Did you mean to? I meant to. And in the meanwhile, we must talk more seriously to Miss Bates. Well, she's down here in the sitting room. Yes. And Brother Stevens with her. I you to be the first to know the good news, Margaret. And may we inquire what the good news is, sir? Oh, didn't see you fellas coming down the stairs. Well, there's no reason why you shouldn't hear it, too. I've just come from the hospital. Alicia's broken off her engagement to John. She's going to marry me. Indeed. My congratulations. Yes, sir, but I suggest you don't tell your brother the news. He's a very sick man. Oh, I won't. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to celebrate from the sparkle in your eye, Miss Bates, I can see that you're just as excited as Stevens is. Of course I am. But tell me, Mr. Holmes, have you found out who attacked John? Yes, Miss Bates. At last I know the name of Mr. John Vincent Harden's enemy. On the incident of the mutilated fish, you or Stephen or Alicia might have been guilty. On the stolen document, you or Alicia. And on the attack on that lady, you or Stephen which seemed to leave only you. But I was having tea with both of you in Baker Street when John was shot. Precisely. As perfect an alibi as I've ever known. Then no one person was responsible. There must have been accomplices. No, Watson. Oh, sir. Remember another fact. The note, supposedly written after the attempted murder, was blotted at the very desk which the wounded man was slumped over. Isn't it clear? Frankly, no. The persecutor and the would-be murderer of John Vincent Harden is Giovanni Vincenti. <gasps> But they're one and the same man. Miss Bates told us so. They were the same man. But Harden forced the dominant part of his character into annihilation. When he destroyed his violin, he thought he had destroyed Giovanni Vincenti. But his alter ego was still dormant. Yes. And after the shock of the riding accident in Rotten Row, Giovanni Vincenti emerged, hunting for revenge. You mean that poor John really has a dual personality, Mr. Holmes? Yes, my dear. No one person seemed to have the opportunity of committing all the attacks. But we left one person off our list. John Vincent Harden himself. But why, Holmes? For heaven's sake, why? Giovanni Vincenti struck at the fish, the document, and at the fiancé. All symbols of what Harden had gained for himself. Finally, he attacked Harden's life. <gasps> but, Mr. Holmes, what will happen now? He's out of his mind, but... They won't send him to an asylum, will they? I think not, Miss Bates. There's a possibility that this second shock, this uh, self-inflicted wound on the skull, may cure him. Uh, don't you agree, Watson? Yes, I do. It's perfectly <sighs> possible there'll be a complete reintegration of personality. Listen. It's John. And he hasn't touched a violin for ages. So that's why you left your violin in his room, Holmes. Exactly. Now, Giovanni Vincenti and John Vincent Harden are again one man, one whole and sound man. I trust he may create a new life for himself. And I'm convinced that he has here 
the woman who will help him. Ladies, you certainly must notice how men are attracted by bright, shimmering highlights in a woman's hair. Then why not follow this beauty tip from the famous Million Dollar Powers Models, girls noted for their glossy, bright hair. Powers Models wash their hair with Cremel Shampoo. This amazingly beautifying Cremel Shampoo has been especially developed so that it actually glamour bathes each tiny strand of hair and uncovers all its natural radiant luster. Yes, and Cremel Shampoo never dries the hair. In fact, it has a beneficial oil base which helps keep the hair from becoming dry or brittle. Its luxurious active foam thoroughly cleanses the hair and scalp and removes all loose dandruff as well as the dirt. So, ladies, buy a bottle of Cremel Shampoo at any drug counter. See how easy it is to glamour bathe your hair to a vision of tantalizing loveliness, hair shimmering with natural brilliant luster. K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Shampoo. Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I'll tell you about one of the most exciting adventures that Holmes and I ever had. I call it The Adventure of the Haunted Bagpipes. Haunted Bagpipes, huh? Where did you hear them? In Edinburgh, Mr. Bell. In the same room with three naked corpses. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Solitary Cyclist. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kreml Hair Tonic and Kreml Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the haunted bagpipes. This is Boy Scout Week. Let's all back our scouts and their theme. Scouts of the world, building for tomorrow. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Broadway's My Beat, from Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. In the time before dawn, Broadway is an island of silence torn from the blazing neon, the midnight sun of the spectaculars. The river mists mingle with the vapors rising from manhole covers. Through them move the rejects, the stragglers, the wanderers, the men without sleep. One detaches himself, scavenges in a trash bin choked with the remnants of night, finds nothing, moves on to the next. It's the time of the endless search, the restlessness of an anguish you can't understand, on the street built for the purpose. You walk it, and a shadow whimpers, and you hurry on, close your heart to it, because the whimper was yours. And finally, you must put aside whatever it was you were looking for, because on a side street, a man waits for you to give you the nighttime's departing gift. The boy, lying dead against the iron gate of the tenement's basement court. Pablo Molari, Danny, from uptown, West 109th Street. Carried one of those handwritten identification cards. Find anything else on him? Not much. Five dollar bill in his wallet. His saint's medallion he's wearing on a chain around his neck. That's about all. Now you question the people in the... Yeah, Danny, every door. No one ever heard of the kid. Had nothing to do with him. Didn't want to talk about him. You know, most of them were trying to sleep, to heat, the kid squalling, you know. Yeah. Beaten. Jaw broken. This bruise on his throat. Must be the one that killed him. Here, come down here, Danny. Huh? What? Take a look at the sign on this door. Hudson Club, Johnny Hammett, president. I guess it's one of those street clubs the kids make up for themselves. This neighborhood's loaded with them. You think what happened to this kid is part of it? Yeah, I think. 
What do you think? Maybe. Check it, Mugger, and I'll get back to you. And wait now for the decent hour. Give to someone a few more hours of sleep before breaking the news about the death of a young man. And at 8.30, to an address on West 109th Street. Climb four flights and be careful of the rotting steps and the three-year-olds at play. The door opens to your knock. And the woman who pinches her shawl close to her throat doesn't understand what you're saying. And calls a neighbor who understands. Who explains to the woman, the mother of a murdered young man, explains what must be done. Accept the fact of death. Identify the body. Bury her son. Then walk away from all of it. You've started a new day. Call headquarters. Detective Muggerman gives you an address. Looked for and found and checked by the night shift. Johnny Hammett, president of the Hudson Club, a tenement on West 43rd near the docks. Johnny's glad for the company. I dislike having my coffee alone, Mr. Clover. You work, Johnny? Yeah, here and there. Mostly on Broadway, sir. People always want things done. You mean you run errands? No, if you think all it is is running down to the corner drugstore, no. Broadway, Mr. Clover. It's full of tourists. Anybody else live here with you? Yeah, my father. I think he still does. I hardly ever see him. How's the Hudson Club coming along? Oh, fine. Fine, thank you. What kind of club is it? Oh, a little bit of everything. Sports, dances, beach parties. The girls do most of the arranging. Girls? <laughs> Isn't that funny? About a month ago, I mentioned girls to my father. He had the same expression on his face as you do. Yeah, girls. I'm 19. I don't chalk walls anymore. Johnny, a member of your club was murdered last night. A boy by the name of Pablo Malari. Oh, is he dead? Nah, he wasn't a member of the club, sir. He just hung around. What about him, Johnny? Who killed him? I didn't. And no one's come up to me since last night and said he did it either. Where were you last night? We had a meeting at the club, a special one. Initiations, plans for the summer. Broke up about two. I came right home. I want a list of your members, Johnny. Names, addresses. No, sure. And before you go. Look, where was Pablo found? Outside your club, in the vestibule. Nelson might know. Nelson? Toby Nelson. We had him in front of the door last night to keep away undesirables. Where can I find him? Works at a cigar and magazine counter in the Flick Building lobby. I wish there was more I could tell you. I really do, sir. Hey, sis, don't forget your change. There you are, baby. Good luck at the track. What's yours, Buster? Your name, Toby Nelson. Someone send you to ask an important question? Police. That buzzer could stand a little metal polish, mister. Don't worry about it. Oh, sure not. Uh, tell me what I should worry about. About a boy named Pablo Molari. Uh, yeah, I've been reading him in the newspapers. What's he to me? He was found beaten to death in front Hudson of... Hudson Club, I know, I know. It says so in the papers. What went on there last night? I'll have to read the minutes of the meeting. I was outside making these two big muscles that Tatsu wanted in and couldn't get in. What happens at these initiations, Toby? Eh, kid stuff. You swear to do this and that and be a nice Hudson. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I was embarrassed for the kid. Who are you talking about? Paula. Paula got taken into us last night. Johnny Hammond wanted it, so I arranged it. Paula Chopak. Which makes us fellow members. Which makes me happy, happy. This Paula's your girl. Manicures my pinkies. Look. Pretty job, huh? Gives me locks of hair. Gets me argyles. Oh, it's a nice thing we got. Tender. Paula Chopak. Uh-huh. I've got her name on my list. She was on top of the grocery store, corner 11th Avenue and 46. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Toby. Anytime. Oh, here, take a scratch sheet, mister. For free. Go ahead, take it. It's last Monday's. And bring to the top of the list Paula Chopak. Climb the stairs, knock on a door with the curtain panels of glass, and hear the furtive scurrying behind it and the slam of another door inside. Then hear a woman's steps approaching, and an instant of silence, then the fumbling with the catch, and the door opens. And the woman had not finished making herself presentable to the caller. The wrinkled cotton housedress needed another smoothing, 
The graying hair needed to be pressed back again from the forehead. The tired voice. There was nothing to be done about that. Yes, something. I'm from the police, Danny Clover. It's good you're here. We not think police come so soon. Please to come in. Please that chair. I sit by window in it by evening. It's comfortable, clean. You be cool. Please, mister. Thank you, but I'd like to... to... By my daughter to speak. By Paula. Paula, is she here? Yes. By room, listening to records. But uh, first, please, mister, first. You want to tell me something, Mrs. Trebek? About Paula. You, you see what I am, mister. But Paula... By Horish great beauty, by the face, by the rich black hair. Mrs. Choka. Like crown she wears it, my Paula, my baby. I comb for her, brush, wash, put in braids by night for sleep. My Paula is good, clean, respectful to me, to such as you never trouble, never bring me tears. Will you call her, please? Go to her. She wait for you. She say me, policeman, come this afternoon. I have much thing to tell him. My Paula say this to me. <laughs> what my Paula got to say to policeman, mister? <laughs> what? In that room? Yes. You see, my Paula tell you her thing. Then you, policeman, go away from us. Ah, huh, mister? Paula, I'm from the police. I know. I heard. Your mother said you had something you want to tell me. Mom's wrong. I don't think so. Tell me, Paula. Mom can hardly speak English. Sometimes she doesn't understand the things I say to her. I've got nothing for you. Besides, I'm busy. Brushing your hair? Let it alone for a while, Paula. Talk to me. A boy was murdered last night in front of a club where you were initiated. Pablo Molari. Is that what you wanted to tell me about? What's the matter, Polly? Scared? Look at me. You think you could scare me? Toby Nelson talked to me. He said... He told you I was sweet to him, maybe. Told you I joined the Hudsons because he asked me. Because I used to jump when he asked. That he told you? That, too. Well, next time you see him, explain to him it's finished. Through, wiped off my memory book. Is it last night? What happened last night? I got initiated in the club. What else can happen to a girl? Murder, maybe? A murder she saw being committed, maybe? Something she's afraid of? I said it once. I got nothing to tell you. So go tell Mom I got nothing to say to a policeman. It'll cheer her up. I hope you're right, Paula. For you. For your mother. I hope you're right. Danny, I give you the evening's greetings. Thanks a lot, you know. Hey, you're here so late tonight. Why didn't you go home after you saw the Chopak girl? Mm, I had some work to do. Uh-huh. Uh, Danny, would you mind very much if I regaled you with a tidbit that happened early this evening at the house of Tartaglia? Please do. Cousin Stanley from Gay Paris showed up after ten these many years. Not him. Oh, him it was. And with arms akimbo with goodies. Nicks for Mrs. Tartaglia, Max for the kiddies, and for me, a great big bottle. <laughs> Champagne, huh? Had a call, Danny. Fifty-one. From Paris? <laughs> Those continentals know how to live. Gino, did you have that list of the Hudson Club checked? Indeed I did. And each and every member swears on the bylaws of the club that they know nothing of the murder of Pablo Malari. Danny Clover speaking. Squad cars downstairs for you, Danny. Paula Chopak was washed up on the beach at Far Rockaway a little while ago. Maybe an accident, maybe homicide. You going, Danny? Right away. The night wind off the sea was soft, warm. It sighed against the flames of the beach fire strung along the coast, riffled the sand across driftwood, across the litter. It brought close the far-off sounds of a summer beach at night. The laughter from behind screen porches, the siren call of the ukulele gently strummed, the distant screeching of gulls, and closer, 
the other sounds, the lash and wash of the surf, the opening and setting up and adjusting of the mechanical devices that attend the dead, and then the trembling voice of the boy who tries to tell you about the girl lying there, how it was, why it was. We were swimming, sir. Lost her someplace out there in the dark. And I heard her kind of scream. Just you and Paula, Johnny? Yeah, it was a beach party, like the ones I told you about. The other members left. Paula wanted to stay. Asked me to stay with her. You said she screamed. Why? She hit her head on one of those rocks out there. The high tide covers them up. I didn't know I hit the beach. She was dead. I tried to... Dead. She is, isn't she? Look at me. I killed Paula. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Tonight's the night. Yes, beginning this evening, there'll be a new host on Songs for Sale. He's affable Steve Allen, a young comedian whose likable personality you're really going to enjoy. Steve Allen becomes head salesman on Songs for Sale, introducing new songwriters and their tunes tonight over most of these same CBS stations. <laughs> On an early summer's night, Broadway stands on a corner, leans against the orange juice stand, and sums up the day. Some days are better than others. Some days you break even. You only had one end of the daily double, but the new blonde in the office looked over her shoulder at you and smiled. And later, when she dabbed on her lipstick with a finger, she smiled again. <laughs> it was quite a day today. The Dodgers passed a miracle. You forgot to pay the check at the cafeteria and got away with it. And a girl... The song of a girl was washed up on the beach at Far Rockaway. Here is maybe a tragic day, but here is a day. It was 11.30 toward the end of it when we got Johnny Hammett back to headquarters. Sit down there, Johnny. Cigarette, kid? No. No, thank you. Well, maybe you'd rather have one of Danny's. Yeah, here. Here, have one, Johnny. I don't want one. Guess Johnny doesn't like the brands we smoke, Danny. I just don't want to smoke, that's all. Can a man not want to smoke? Take it easy. Sure. Sure, relax, kid. Am I under arrest? You said you killed Paula. It was my fault. I shouldn't have let her swim out that far. Did you kill her or didn't you kill her? It was my fault. Who killed Pablo Molari? You think I did? Did you, Johnny? You think I killed him, don't you, Mr. Clover? There you go again, Johnny. Look, look, kid. A couple of your friends were killed. We're police. We're asking. I didn't kill anybody. You don't have to explain to Johnny Muggerman. He knows why he's here. He knows we need his help. Yeah, help, Johnny. That's what we want. We're not asking for a confession. <laughs> Who's kidding who? Were you in love with Paula? She wasn't around long enough. She was around tonight. What happened tonight? You know what happened. What's the matter with you? Look, Johnny, I'm going to tell you something. You're not talking to your little hoodlum friends. You're talking to a policeman. Nobody's trying to intimidate you. Nobody's trying to make you say things you don't want to say. You're talking to a policeman that's trying to do his job. What happened tonight? We had a... Beach party. The Hudson's? Yes, sir. That's better, Johnny. Paul and I came late. The others were already there. Toby Nelson? Yes, sir. Toby wanted to take Paula home. Paula wanted to stay. So we stayed. Paula and I. We were the last ones there. What made Paula want to stay? She'd never been swimming at night. And she swam out past the breakers and a wave washed her against a rock. Is that what happened? Yes, sir. All right, Johnny. Can I go now? Uh -huh. Good night, Johnny. Thanks. What do you think, Muggerman? You believe him? I don't know. I'm going to check. I'm going to talk to Toby. Toby? Toby. Who wants me? Oh, you've got a long nose, mister. Your landlady told me you were up here on the roof. Hers is even longer than yours. What's a guy have to do to get a square foot of air to himself? Your girl's dead, Toby. Paula's dead. You're stale, mister. The smooth voices on the radio have been telling me Paula's dead. For an hour now. Up here, I thought I couldn't hear him. I hear him. 
Johnny Hammett says it was an accident. That makes it an accident. You were at the beach party, Toby? Never miss it. Gives me a chance to show off my muscles to the members. You did that. Then what happened? Well, let me think now. Uh, yeah, after that, I roasted the hot dogs for the group. We all ate hearty, then it broke up. I came home. And left Paula alone with Johnny? Yeah, that's the other thing I did. Paula was your girl. How come Johnny took her to the party? If she was alive, you could ask her. I wouldn't know. Johnny says you wanted to take her home. Why didn't you? Because she slapped me across the mouth when I asked her. They all left. Johnny, too. Then she laughed harder than anybody. That's how I got the message she didn't want me to take her home. She wanted Johnny. Up to the night of the initiation at the Hudson Club, she was your girl. What happened there to make her turn on you, Toby? She's dead. Paul is dead. What else do you want from me? What else do I have to give you? How much can you... She's dead, mister. That's all I got. All right, Toby. And leave the boy alone. Give him the time and place of his grieving and the quality of it that's bled out of a tenement rooftop in a city stretching into the hours after midnight. Go away. Resign yourself that another day is over. The next morning, and the legwork, going out to a corner of the city where the sign says 11th Avenue and 46th. Climb the steps and stop at a door. Intrude upon two rooms newly filled with grieving. Please. Please come in. Of my daughter? Mrs. Chopak, the police are not satisfied that Paula... Of my daughter, Paula? There's a possibility that it wasn't an accident. Paula is in another room. The others. Neighbors by me. We have only boxes to sit on. I want you to try to understand what I'm saying. Nothing. Nothing I understand. Only up to yesterday. To yesterday when Paula said to me, Mama, I'm going to swim with this boy, this Johnny. Johnny Hammett? Johnny. He called for her? At first, my Paula, she said she would want to stay home, rather. Then the boy said something to her. Bent down low over her ear. Paula took her suit for swimming, her cap not to get her hair wet. Then she said what I said to you. I see. Just one more thing, Mrs. Chopak. The night before last, your daughter went out. Do you know where she went? To some place. To party. My club has party. What time did she come home? Late. I don't know what time. Did you talk to her when she came home? Only when I tried to give her help. Help? White. Like ghost. And sick. I hear this. I get out of my bed. I come to her. I say... Paula, you're sick. Mama, get something. She tell me, go away. Like I'm someone she never see before. Was she drunk? Sick. There's no whiskey I smell. Sick. White. Sick like ghost. I see. She's dead now. Paula is. And the neighbors by me. They're in the next room. They sit. They cry. They touch my shoulder. They don't talk. They don't know what words to say to me. Then walk the tenement street and have your passage greeted by the sudden silences of the yelling kids, the turning of backs after the furtive gesture of insult, because somehow you were guilty of that anguish over the corner grocery store. Once you had been welcomed by a mother, and for that you had left her a dead child. And on that street the guilt was yours. So I got away from it. At headquarters, read, reread the file on Mullary, dead of a beating. On Paula Chopak, dead of a head wound while swimming at Rockaway. And finally, read away the daylight and sit in darkness till a man comes in, looks at you for a moment, turns on a light. You don't mind the light, huh, Danny? It's all right, Gino, thanks. Uh, I agree with you that this killing, this dying of kids, makes one wish to sit alone in the dark. However... You got something for me, Gino? 
Danny, all I can give you is a comment upon the children of today. The clubs they must make for themselves. The things they do in said clubs. The hurt they bring upon themselves for so doing. Go on, Chino. Well, it's in all the papers, Danny. How they go out of the way for new thrills, new sensations, new emotions. Only this morning, while shaving, I was bending an ear to the comment from the radio. I called in the Tartaglia You got crowd. something, Mugerman? I don't know, Danny. Maybe yes, maybe no. What? Gordon and Technical gave it to me to give to you. See if the big man can figure it, he says to me. I got news about Gordon. I actively dislike What did he give man. you? Now, he's been studying the bathing cap Paula Chopak wore at the beach party. He says it's curious. Why? He says the girl didn't have the cap on when she went into the water. Paula was proud of her hair. She'd have worn the cap. Why does he say she wasn't wearing it? Because there was no blood stain inside it. Gordon says if she was wearing the cap when she hit the rock, it would have held some of the blood. Which means, he says, that the cap was put on her after she was carried to the beach. It means another thing, Mugman. What? Paula was murdered. Get me a squad car. <laughs> Not open. It's the police. What do you want? Let's go inside, I'll tell you. Inside, Toby. Are you the only Hudson here? Hey, Johnny, look what's here. We got a call it, Johnny. Good evening, Mr. Clover. Nice clubhouse you've got here. Uh, can I show you around? Where's everybody? I thought you had quite an organization. They'll be around. When you leave, people will start swarming in here. I'm glad you came, Mr. Clover. Thanks. Hey, what's with you, Johnny? You buy a cop for a friend? Don't pay any attention to him, sir. He doesn't know about policemen. He doesn't know they have a job to do. You understand all about that, though, don't you? Hey, what's going on? Too bad about you, Toby. Huh? I said too bad about you. Your muscles, your temper. The mad you had on the other night. Hey, Johnny, what's he... You never saw Toby work over a guy, did you, Mr. Clover? No. Tell me about it. Once, a boy tried to get in here. Tried real hard. Toby was in front of the door. The boy never made it. Pablo Molari? Johnny. It wasn't premeditated, Mr. Clover. Toby didn't mean it. He was just angry about something. You're under arrest, Toby. Put out your hands. Gotta do something first! Don't be a fool! Take him off me! Yeah, yeah! Take him off! Thanks. Thanks, Mr. Clover. That's just the way he went after that boy. He would have killed me. Toby will rest a while. What are you doing, Mr. Clover? Frisking him. Nice cigarette case. Cigarette, Johnny? Are you kidding? I don't smoke those. Don't blame you. Marijuana brings you grief. That's what it brought Paula. Paula? Uh-huh. Paula was a sick girl after she got home from her initiation. You have to smoke this stuff to become a member of your club? Oh, now look. You look, Johnny. Paula was Toby's girl. You wanted her. That's why you insisted she become a member. Put her on this stuff, she'd lose her sense of values. You think I'd do anything like that? Yes, I do. You know me better than that. I know you killed her. I told you what happened out there on the beach. You forgot to tell me why she went there with you. What were you going to do, Johnny? Tell her mother she was smoking marijuana? Is that why she went with you, stayed at the beach after the others left? I don't know what to say to you, Mr. Clover. You're wrong. And I think you ought to take care of Toby here. Paula had beautiful hair, Johnny. I'd go along with that. She'd have worn her cap into the water. You killed her before she went into the water. How, Johnny? With a rock? Mr. Clover. Then you threw her in the surf, saw her suit to be wet, pulled her back, remembered about the cap, put it on her. Why did you murder her? She was so beautiful. She was so beautiful, Mr. Clover. She refused more of your cigarettes? Funny. Worked before. Let's go, Johnny. It always worked. You know it. Got so they'd come around here begging for the stuff. A young man like me, connections, is like a king. 
I'll tell you another funny thing. I wouldn't touch this stuff. Come on. Yes, sir. Broadway looks clean. The winds of the evening have swept away the litter. Everything looks sharp. Sharp. Like a knife at your heart. You walk against it, and it plunges deeper. Deeper until there's no pain at all. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway. My Beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program was produced and directed by Elliot Lewis with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's story, Dick Crenna was heard as Johnny Hammett, Bill Tracy as Toby Nelson, Peggy Weber as Mrs. Chopat, and Michael Ann Barrett as Paula Chopat. On July 8th next week, Broadway's My Beat will be heard on a new day, Sunday. Beginning a week from tomorrow, be sure to listen to Broadway's My Beat and the adventures of Danny Clover, starring Larry Thor. Bill Anders speaking. This is CBS, where Phil Regan brings you the serviceman's own show every Sunday on the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Mosque Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Cafe Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men. Alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, The Two O'Clock Man. It was around five minutes till two o'clock in the morning. I was in bed trying to catch up on some sleep when I heard noises out front. I rolled over, ready to forget the whole thing, when the sound became too loud and too familiar. I slipped on a pair of trousers and headed for the bar. It was dark, but not empty. Somebody was playing Halloween out of season. From somewhere behind the bar, I could hear his breathing as he scratched around on my register. I moved around the end of the bar toward the short, panting breaths. Then he saw me and made a dart. Don't go in no place, buddy. Let me go. Let me go. Sure, buddy, you're going. Ow. I hit him and he crumbled like arches on a fat man. I flipped on the light to see what he looked like. He was small and wiry. He wasn't Egyptian or Arab or European, but he seemed like a mixture of all. He coughed a couple of times and then sat up. His big black eyes stared angrily at me and I could see that he was very young. You are pig. Infidel. All right, Sonny. I'm sorry I hit you. Come on, up on your feet. Let me go. I can get up myself. Come on, kid. What's your name? What are you doing here? My name is Joseph. And it is obvious what I do here. Yeah, I guess it is. But you're not very smart about it. People don't leave money in their cash registers at night. That's what they got safes for. Well, what do you think I ought to do with him? Whatever you wish. I am not afraid. You're too old to be spanked and too young to be slapped. You know, you ought to give up this second story work while you're still an amateur. It's got no future. I will worry about my own future. You're not very talkative, are you? I am of the sacred family of El Rakam. I do not talk to infidels. Great, but you steal from them. That is my business. It's mine, too, when you start picking the tambourine. Talk, talk. Do with me what you will and stop talking. Look, Sonny, I've seen kids like you all over the world, starting with a little petty snatching and winding up in jail. You are a pig! Why, you little... You will die. Sure, we all will. Now, come on. 
Where'd you take me? Someplace where you'd have a chance to brush up on your manners. The police station. Inside half an hour, we pulled up in front of the Cairo police station and got out. Joseph, member of the sacred family of El Rakam, whoever he was, hadn't spoken. We went inside. Sergeant Greco, underling to Captain Sam Sabai, was sitting behind the desk dozing. When he heard us come in, he snapped to life real fast and became very official. Oh, well, Mr. Jordan, I was not expecting you. Yeah, I could see that. Did you have a pleasant dream? I was not sleeping. I was simply resting my eyes. <laughs> sure. I bet she was a brunette. Will you please show some respect for a servant of the people? <clears throat> now, what may I do for you, Mr. Jordan? You can get me Sam. Captain Sabaz had a very difficult evening. He is very tired. He is preparing to leave for his home this very moment. What may I do for him? I told you, get me Sam. Mr. Jordan, I have just I got said... someone I want him to meet. This boy? Yes, this boy. Now turn up Sam for me, or do I have to go in and get him myself? What is going on out here, Sergeant? It is uh, Mr. Jordan. Jordan, yes. what are you doing here this time of night? Business, Sam. He has uh, brought this boy for some reason. I told him, Captain, that you are too yes, tired yes, to... Yes, uh, yes, 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 Sergeant. Yes, that is enough. Now... What is it you want, Jordan? Sam, I caught this boy doing a one-man floor show at the tambourine about an hour ago. Jordan, I am not interested in your entertainment problem. You will be, Sam. This kid dropped in half hours on his own. I found him scratching around my cash register. Oh, I see. What is your name, young man? You're a pig, too. I... But of all the... I uh, forgot to tell you he had a nasty habit like that. Sir. Never mind. If he does not choose to talk, we can wait. Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. Lock this youth up until morning. We will interview him then. Hey, yes, Captain. Come along, boy. You do not have to push. Now, come along, Hands boy. Off of me. I uh, wanted you, Sam, because I didn't want to leave the kid in Greco's hands. He's over eager. Yes, George, and I know what you mean. You do not like taking children to police stations, do you, George? What do you think? I, I think that I am very tired. Hey, uh, he said he was a member of the sacred family of El Rakam. that mean anything to you? El Rakam. Oh, does not. But suppose we discuss this young man's family tree in the morning. Oh, but Sam... Jordan, you are concerned for nothing. This boy is what you Americans refer to as a juvenile delinquent. There, there is nothing more to it. Now, please go home and get some sleep so that I may do the same. Yeah, I'll do that. Good night, Sam. I walked out of the police station and started up the street. I'd taken just about six steps when I heard it. It started from somewhere inside the police station and sounded like a cyclone on a weekend spree. By the time I'd taken a few more steps, the door of the police station flew open and Joseph came running out fast like a super chief on a holiday weekend. He darted toward the corner full blast and Sam and Sergeant Greco came running ten paces behind him. I followed. We were halfway to the end of the block when the kid turned the corner. The three of us stepped up our pace, turned the corner after him, and Greco pulled his gun. Before I could yell at him, the thunder broke. <laughs> kid dropped to the sidewalk. He was still. When we got to him, Sam bent over to look. Joseph, member of the sacred family of El Rakam, was dead. Oh, there was no need to shoot. Since when does the Cairo police department shoot down kids? But, Captain, I did not shoot the boy. What? I did not shoot him. My gun. All the shells are there. It has not been fired. Uh, let me see that. Uh, that's right, Greco. All the bullets are here. There you are. Now, might I suggest, Captain, that since I did not shoot him and since you did not even draw your gun for holster, we examine Mr. Jordan... You know I don't carry a gun, Sam. We know no such... Sergeant, Sergeant, you will call the coroner and you will arrange for the photographer to take some pictures of this scene. We will begin an investigation immediately. Yes, Captain. And you, Jordan, go home. Look, I brought the kid here. You don't wish me off that easy. Jordan, this is no affair of yours. The Cairo police will do everything possible to unearth the killer. I don't like going to bed with a dirty taste of Jordan, this is an order. Now leave at once. We, we do not need your help. Uh, maybe not. But you may be getting it anyway. I left, headed back to the cafe tambourine and went to bed. But I didn't sleep. The sight of Joseph, a fresh kid, crumbled in the street, stayed with me. It was a long night. I 
got up around nine and had breakfast. But the strange death of Joseph was like too much salt in my eggs. Along about ten o'clock, Chris, my bartender, told me there was a visitor in my office to see me. I went over and opened the door. The smell of Emir caught me. She was blonde and tall and slim, except where she shouldn't be. She was wearing a white linen suit and a white hat. And it was all there. All very nice. So, you are Mr. Jordan? I uh, didn't get your name. The name is Ilya Renault. Oh, what can I do for you? It is not what you can do for me, Mr. Jordan. It is what you have already done. <laughs> I'm afraid you'll have to start over. A boy, a young boy was murdered last night. In case you don't remember, Mr. Jordan. And it seems pretty clear to me you are responsible. Hey, now, wait a minute. I will not wait for your lies and your feeble excuses. There is no alibi for murder. A boy was killed needlessly. And their blood is on your hands. Hey, hold on there. I'll admit I feel at least partially responsible, and the whole thing was pretty unfortunate. Unfortunate? But... Oh, yes, unfortunate. That is your only answer. Where do you fit into this? Where I fit? Mr. Jordan... That boy, Joseph, was my brother. My half-brother. Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Renault. If you had not taken poor Joseph to jail, if you had what not... What if he hadn't broken into my cafe? Have you thought of that? I, I'll admit the boy was wrong. Joseph was not himself. He was not a bad boy. These, these past few months, we had grown so far apart. He, he behaved so strangely. Nevertheless, you are not vindicated in having him murdered. Joseph was not shot by the police. He was not shot by me. He was killed by a person or persons unknown in the official language of the police. And I suppose that makes it all very proper look, and usual. Look, look. Both the police and I would like very much to know who killed Joseph. Captain Sabai will do everything he can to find the murderer. And you, Mr. Jordan. What about you? What are you doing? Well, I... Just as I thought, nothing. Except being sorry. Miss Renault. Perhaps you have an idea who might have wanted to kill Joseph. No, I have no idea. Joseph and I were, were never that close. His father divorced my mother many years ago. Joseph's mother was an Egyptian noblewoman. For the past several years, I've been in France. Then I moved back to Cairo to take care of Joseph. Doesn't it seem strange to you that he'd turn to a robbery? That he'd break into my cafe at two o'clock in the morning? Of course it does. I told you it was not like him. I, I just cannot understand what made him do it. Uh, you're not much help. Then... Then you are going to do something. You really are interested. I sort of have to be, don't I? Oh, thank you, Rocky. Please, forgive me for... for misjudging you, for saying the things I did. <laughs> you ought to hear what some other people say about me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm living at 65 Sharia Nefar. Hmm. Well, I'll, uh, I'll let you know when I get something definite. She left, and later in the day, I had visitor number two. A man I wanted very much to see. His name was El Rakam. He was tall, lean, and dark. He wore purple robes and a silver chain with a fancy emblem around his neck. And he had a muscle man with him. Peace be unto you, noble sir. My card. Oh, thanks. Uh, have a seat. My assistant is known as the Turk. He will join us. Yeah, sure, Jim. Uh, sit down, gentlemen. Now, what's on your mind? My name, as you know, is El Rakam, master of all that is worthy, leader of the new light, bestower of the sacred learning. Your car doesn't say all that. <clears throat> Mr. Jordan, a member of my sacred family was slain early this morning. I understand you were present at this deplorable occurrence. You would tell me how you are involved and exactly what you have done. Do I make myself clear? Joseph was one of your boys? Joseph was a member of the sacred family of Rakam, a disciple in the way of the advanced learning. You call breaking into the tambourine advanced learning? Mr. Jordan, I shall try to be patient. When a member whom I hold in high esteem dies, I must have the complete knowledge of his death. Okay, the boy was shot trying to escape the police. Only the police didn't kill him. They don't know who did. And this you call the complete knowledge? Yeah. Mr. Jordan, these facts I have learned from the police myself. I would like to know your connection, please. 
Also, why you found it necessary to take Joseph to jail. Look, Rakam, I've told you all I know. I'm a busy man. Maybe you better talk to somebody else. Mr. Jordan, I had hoped I would not have to come to this. However, you obviously refuse to cooperate. It is the desire of El Rakam and his followers that all matters be settled in peace. Violence is barbarian and uncivilized. Yet you force me to act. When, when Elder Rakam acts, the world can fear the repercussions. You're a pretty big man, Rakam, according to you. Far too big to waste your time talking to mere peasants like Rocky Jordan. Mr. Jordan, I hold you responsible for the death of a member of my family. There is no greater crime... And the punishment is quick and certain. Heed well my words. Okay, Rakam, take your words and get out. You're disturbing my customers. As I am Rakam, leader and omnipotent head of the sacred family. As I am this and more. So shall you, Mr. Jordan. So shall you die to avenge the death of Joseph. <laughs> You are listening to The Two O'Clock Man, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. If you like radio mystery, thrilling stories, exciting characters, and the kind of suspense that keeps you absorbed until the final gripping moment, you'll want to spend your radio listening time with CS. Because at the CBS spot on your dial, you'll find that kind of mystery. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, the two o'clock man. It all began when somebody shot down a kid who I turned over to the police for breaking into my cafe tambourine. Then a couple of people showed saying I was responsible. The kid's sister, Ia, and a guy who called himself El Rakam. That joker was thirsting for revenge. Well, El Rakam and his silent sidekick, the Turk, made a grand-type exit out of my office. Just outside the door, they were joined by two burly-looking bodyguards who could have passed for the Tarzan twins. Then the four of them marched out of the cafe. As far as I was concerned, El Rakam, spelled backwards, was phony. And it also spelled answers to questions concerning murder. I decided to follow. It was as easy as tailing an elephant in a clothes closet. The purple robes drifted down Sharia El Reyes, turned left three blocks up, and entered the lobby of the Hotel Continental. The two bodyguards split off, and El Rakam and the Turk took the elevator to the fifth floor. I went and caught the next car. The trail ended before a door marked 505. I was debating my next move when suddenly the door opened. Come in, Mr. Jordan. We have been expecting you. Standing in the doorway was six feet four of man, El Rakam's right-hand man, the Turk. I went inside. He was there alone. You were a fool to be trapped so easily, Jordan. You were led here as one might lead a sheep for slaughter. Maybe, friend. Time will tell. No, the time is now. We will teach you to murder big man was on top of me like a tent in a windstorm. His hands grasped at my throat and his fingers dug in. I gave him a kick and another one, but the fingers dug in deeper. I was seeing red and then blue and then purple. I brought my knee up and caught him in the belt. He rolled back from me. Then a shiny object came flying into the room. The Turk doubled up, grabbed at his middle and pitched forward to the carpet. Everything got suddenly quiet, like visitor's day at the morgue. I bent over him. He was dead. Protruding from his stomach was a knife. An ordinary kitchen knife, but one I'd seen before. It was from the cafe tambourine. Oh, it was too perfect, too well set up to stick around. Everything neat and in place for Rocky Jordan to take the rap. It took me two minutes to decide where to go next. A guy named Bill Morley, a reporter at the Cairo Record, might be of some help. Inside of ten minutes, I was sitting across from him at his desk. Nothing but trouble when you walk in here, Rocky. What's up? You know most of the characters in this town, Bill. I need some information about one of them. Yeah? Name's uh, El Rakam, the sacred family of Rakam. You know him? 
know him. I wouldn't touch him with a ten-foot pole. He's dynamite. Oh, why? Look, Rakam arrives in town a couple of months ago. One of the papers gets a front-page interview with him. They play him for all he was worth. And what happened? Rakam slapped a million-dollar libel suit on him. And he'll probably collect. He well, doesn't like publicity? Wants no interference at all. Not like the rest of these phonies who do anything to get their photos on a big spread. This guy works in the dark, and he does better that way. Uh, that's all you know about him? Well, what he's got isn't a new religion or even vaguely connected with it. It's pure mystic and pure hope. He just talks to the customers and they shell out. They never know what hit him. That good, huh? The two o'clock man is darn near perfect. What'd you call him? Two o'clock man. That's what the papers have labeled him. He holds his meetings in an old temple at two o'clock in the morning. Nobody has anything on him? Well, just once. They got a picture of him and a kid during a riot in Alexandria a few months ago. Cop was killed. El Rakam had a gun. That sounds almost too good. What happened to it? Yeah. Take a look yourself. You'll see why nothing happened. Ah, I see what you mean. Everything about it points to El Rakam. Except he happened to have his back turned. Sure, it's Rakam, all right, but you can't see his face. And no court in the world would count that photo as evidence. Uh, what about the kid in the picture? Well, that's Joseph, the kid who was shot the other night. You knew him. Yeah. How about letting me borrow this photo, huh? Just for a day, I'll, I'll bring it back. Sure, it's no good to me. Oh, excuse me, Ross. Sure. <clears throat> Hello? Yeah. What's that? The Turk? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'll be right there. One of our reporters calling in a story. El Rakam's right-hand man, a guy named the Turk, has just been knifed in the Continental Hotel. Really? Yeah, you want to come down with me and take a look? No, no, I'll buy a paper. Uh, thanks for the photo, Bill. Oh, and by the way, if I should happen to run into the murderer, let you know. It was after 11.30 when my taxi pulled up in front of a small sandstone apartment house on Shari and Afar. Ilya Renault's apartment was 2C, and it took a little while for the door to come open. Rocky, what, what you doing Let here? me in, Ilya. I want to talk to you. Oh, no, 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 Rocky, I can't. I, I've heard on the radio the police are looking for you. If I let you come in, I would have to phone Ilya, you. listen. The police are looking for me. It's all tied in with Joseph's murder. Now, there's some things you'll want to know. About Joseph? You, you found out about Joseph, Rocky? I didn't say that. Please, let me in, Ilya. But, Rocky, I'm not dressed. I, I've been asleep. Oh, oh very well. Just a moment. Uh, you may come in now. Rocky. Rocky, did you have to lock it? Ilya, I think I know why Joseph was killed. Yes? He was mixed up in a phony cult racket. Now, the head of this outfit is named El Rakam. He took Joseph on as one of his assistants. El Rakam? I think I've heard Joseph mention that name. Uh, Rakam has been bilking the local citizens for some time now. He tells them he's giving them a new way of life or some such. In the meantime, they're giving him the dough. And and Joseph was connected with this? Uh, Joseph was on the inside until last night. Maybe he decided to quit. I don't know. That's my guess. Rakam couldn't let him, undoubtedly, because the kid knew too much about Rakam's activities. Then, then Rakam murdered my brother. Either that or he had one of his followers do it, which is more likely. Rakam had an assistant named the Turk. I think he's our man. The Turk? But but this is the man the police say you killed, Rock. Right. Rakam or somebody planned it that way. They get rid of the Turk and me at the same time. Here, here, I want you to take a look at this photograph. Here. Why, yes. Yes, it is Joseph. And Rocky, who is this man in the long robes? El Rakam. But here, it shows clearly the gun in Rakam's hand. No, will you? It shows a man in a robe firing a gun. Another man is being shot, okay. But Rakam's is back turned. And the, there is nothing. Ilya, I think I've got a way to break Rakam. Anyway, it's worth a try. Open in the name of the law. Oh, Rocky, it's the police. Shh, shh, shh. No, this is Sergeant Greco. I know you're in there. Open or I shall fire through the door. You'll do it, sir. Rocky, Rocky, the back door. If you do not open the door at once, I shall shoot away the lock. Do not be a fool, Jordan. Come peacefully. Rocky, the back door leads to an alley which will take you to the Sharia Shama. All right, Ilya. I'll see you later. Do not say that I have not warned you. As Greco came through the door, I went out the window and down the alley fast. Greco yelled at me to halt, but I wasn't stopping for anything. I had a date for a showdown with a two o'clock man. (laughs) 
You are listening to The Two O'Clock Man, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. The time has come for us to help the Red Cross. Great numbers of our people are suffering from the worst cold wave in 50 years, and the suffering doesn't end with the cold. You can help by contributing to the Red Cross today. Now we take you back to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, the two o'clock man. Well, it was one o'clock when I wandered into El Rakam's temple, an hour before the big meeting, and the place was almost deserted. El Rakam's dressing room showed at the end of a dimly lit hall. I went inside and waited for him to put in an appearance. Came sooner than I expected. A few moments later, from outside the door, I heard the voice of Rakam giving instructions to a couple of his bodyguards. I ducked into the shadow so he wouldn't see me when he first came in. You can come out from your hiding place, Jordan. I know you are here. Uh, you must have your own special brand of radar. You were observed entering the temple. One of my guards has been following you all day. Don't I bother you at all? Why should you, Jordan? The police will find you and then you would no longer be any bother to me. Now say what you have come to say and leave. All right, I'll say it. You will not mind my preparing myself for tonight. Uh, never mind the gun, Rakam. The gun? I was not reaching for the gun. I was going for my makeup. Well, then uh, I'll just hold it if you don't mind. It is yours, with my compliments. Now say what you have to say and go. You're thrilled, buddy. That has been said to me many times before, but it has never been the case. That's all being changed. Remember the photo of you killing a cop in Alexandria? Oh, yes, that one again. The police have tried to prove with that once before that I was guilty of murder. But you see, it was a failure. My face was obscured. That's what's changed. And all because of a kid named Joseph. You see, there was another photo of you killing that cop. A photo Joseph had. But you know that, don't you? You know that Joseph had a clear picture of you killing the cop, and that's why you had to take care of the kid. If you were finished, Jordan, go. Well, what you don't know is that Joseph mailed that clear photo to his sister Elia before he was killed. She has it, and I just saw it. And if you really had your boys tagging me, as you say, you know I just came from her house. You think I'm a fool, do you not? Look, Junior, I don't care whether you believe me or not. It's a buyer will, and that's what counts. You're lying, Jordan. It is nothing but an attempt Think so? Get... Okay, I'll show you. This telephone. You think the cops want me for murder, huh? I'll just pitch my murder rap against yours. We'll just see who the police want. Uh, hello, Captain Sabaya, please. Sam? Jordan? No, no, wait a minute. Quiet, will you, and listen. Ilya Renault is on her way over to the station right now with Joseph's photo of Rakam's killing. Yeah. That'll give you all you want. Uh, no, I'm with him now in his dressing room at the temple. <laughs> Don't worry, Sam. He's looking right into his own gun. So if you want him, come and get him. Relax, buddy. It'll be a few minutes yet. Jordan, uh, uh, perhaps we could discuss this under more favorable circumstances. Not interested in talking. I'll read about it in the papers. Jordan, I, I am a wealthy man. Something could be arranged. Your forehead's getting moist. I did not kill Joseph. You had the Turk do it, and you killed him. That does not matter. Come, let us leave here. Let us go out. Kind of anxious to get me to use that door, aren't you? Uh, uh, Could it be that you got your boys out there ready to throw a knife into me when I walk out? Jordan, this is not the place to talk. Let us step out. I'm laying ten to one. The first guy out that door winds up with a knife in him. No, no, you are wrong. Why don't you go out? There's nothing here for you but me with a gun. And the police are on their way. I don't believe it. You didn't even call them. It was a fake. You would be too frightened to call the police since they are after... Sounds like Sam, all right. The police will never get to El Rakam. No, it is I, El Rakam, your leader, master of the Libya. Uh, 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 leader in the path of new light. Uh. Well, that was it. El Rakam got it from his own men. And that was the end of his organization. Sabaya showed up in a few moments and rounded up the knife throwers and everything was cleared up. The Turk killed Joseph on orders. 
Rakam killed the Turk to set me up, and then his followers took care of him. It was a regular round robin. Sam wanted to know about the photo I told him about on the phone, and when I said it was a gag, he didn't mind. His case was closed. Well, the only unfinished business was Ilya. I went over to her place to tell her how things worked out. Yeah, I guess it must have been a long story. It took me quite a while to tell it all. It's CBS, again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's story by William Frug, edited by Larry Roman and Gomer Cool. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Podcasting System.